This happened on June 7, 2013, when I was a freshman in college. It was a regular day where I had three classes. I finished one class and had an hour between one class and the beginning of another. I always went to our campus library. But on my way to the library, I received a call from my brother. He told me that he saw a man shooting at a bus in the middle of the street. I expressed to him how crazy I thought that was. He also told me that the car sped away. He doesn't know where they went. I got to the library and I told him that I would call him back. As I was sitting in the library with my head in a book, I happened to see a random car park in the middle of our campus and two people got out. One man and one woman. The woman was running frantically and the man got out wearing all black with what looks like a rifle in his hand. I then thought back to what my brother just told me, thinking that this might be the same person. At the same time, I thought to myself, why is this police officer getting out of that random car? He was dressed just like a SWAT officer, sort of. I sat there trying to figure out what was going on as this man walked across the courtyard. Then all of a sudden, he walked up to this woman, who I knew from one of my classes, and without hesitation, he shot her and continued to walk toward our building. I began to yell out to everyone that he has a gun, and I was pointing outside. I saw a few people react when I did, due to the sound of the gunshot. They began to yell also. It all happened so fast and a lot of us began to hide because we couldn't get out. Some people got out, but we didn't have time to. I hid in an aisle. I saw the man enter through the automatic doors with his rifle to his side. He was yelling out that he was a police officer, but he didn't hold his weapon like one. But once he said that a few students came out from hiding, he grabbed his weapon and they ran, but he didn't shoot. I peeked my head out more as the man walked to the front desk. I can see the librarian peek her head around, but she looked confused. The man saw her as he were walking past the desk. He stopped and he looked to where she was, but she just so happened to move away. She actually walked away instead of run for some reason. He walked through the doors into a hallway where she went into. I came out from hiding and placed myself where I could see the hallway all the way down the hallway. He followed the librarian. She went into a closet with other people and the shooter started to bang on the door, but he kept saying that he was the police. He told them to open within a few minutes or he'll shoot, but within a few seconds, he began to fire into the door. I heard people screaming and I wanted to help, but I felt that would be suicide for me being that I didn't have a weapon. I heard people saying that the police are coming. The man stopped shooting and started to bang on the door even more. He then left that door heading back toward us. I went back into hiding, but could still see. He walked through the room where we were and he went out into the first set of doors and the cops were right there. The cops and the shooter began to fire at the same time and then it all stopped. The cops dragged the man outside and escorted all of us outside. Out there, it was pretty chaotic. Eventually we found out who the shooter was. His name was John Sawari. He went on a shooting spree within our city that day. This happened in 2013, but it still feels like it just happened yesterday. This happened on the day after Christmas in the year 2000. I worked at Edgewater Technology in Wakefield, Massachusetts. The day started off pretty normal. I clocked in and went to my station. We all did. I can remember that the aura of the day was off, but I might just be saying that due to what happened that day. After working for a little bit, I had to run to the bathroom due to my Christmas food from the day before. TMI, I know. I was renting a magazine, using a restroom, and out of nowhere, I heard people yelling and running and saying that he has a gun. Then I heard the rounds go off. It scared the crap out of me, literally. I got up without wiping. Then I heard more shots, but they were closer than before. A few people burst through the bathroom door and they were saying that he's right there. They closed the door and they put the trash can in front of the door while pushing against it. They were also saying that Mike has gone crazy. We heard someone stop right by the door but he was pleading and then we heard another shot, but he was still making noises, then another shot, and then we didn't hear him anymore. 
And then it got silent. He was right in front of our door. We heard a gun get cocked and someone touching the door handle, but he stopped. There was no more shooting, but we could hear screaming and the fire alarm going off. Everyone in the bathroom was crying and it got worse when the blood was coming in the bathroom from under the door from the person that was laying there. About a minute later, we heard police in the hallway and they were in front of our door, but we were still afraid until we heard them assess the person that was bleeding by our door. They said he was gone. They opened the door and told us it's okay. They got him. The shooter was waiting for the cops in our reception area. His name was Michael Morgan McDermott. He actually worked with us. I don't know why he did what he did, but I can say that it was the worst day of my life. But what I won't forget is the scene once we left the bathroom. So many people were hurt, and the looks on the faces of those who got in his way would never leave my memory. What really confuses me is that I saw Michael right before this happened, and he was joking around with everyone. This situation really made me not be so quick to trust individuals, no matter how long I've known them. This is the worst day of my life. I was eight years old in the third grade, and my younger brother Lucas was in kindergarten. Our school had three different lunch times, kindergarten and first grade, first period, second and third grade, second period, and fourth and fifth grade, third period of lunch. Once the first period of lunch was over, I remember we were doing a weekly assignment. Usually those take about 20 to 40 minutes to finish. 40 minutes later, right as I had finished it, I remember the dean's voice played on the speaker. He sounded scared and panicked as he said, all students and staff, this is not a drill, go in a lockdown. I felt worried and started to panic myself, as my somewhat cool and laid back teacher seemed to panic as well and rushed to the door to lock it, close the blinds and whisper to hide in the blind spot away from the windows. As we all sat in silence for what seemed like hours, we heard a knock on the door. A few girls and boys, including me, all jumped a bit. The slight knocking soon turned into loud banging. A few girls started to panic to only make the already scary situation worse. Minutes felt like hours for him to finally leave. After 15 minutes of hiding in pure terror, the dean finally came over the PA system telling us to walk in the single file line to the entrance of the school to be greeted by police. By the time me and my brother Lucas went into our mom's car, I looked to my brother. He was pale and looked around frantically. When we got home, I asked what was wrong and he said something that still scares me to this day. When that guy was pounding on my brother's classroom door, my brother peeked out from the sink. He saw a tall man looking through the window. He said his teacher literally pushed his head down frantically to hide him so he wouldn't be seen. He mentioned that the door had a window and was barely covered. I also want to say that this was 2013, so I vaguely remember most of the details and had to ask my friend if he remembered the whole incident. I want to show you the layout of the school. The yellow line is where my class is. The red is where my brother's class was. Now we came to the conclusion that he either entered into the, where the orange line is or the blue line. To give you context on where those lines are located, the orange line leads to the back entrance where there is a fence that is easily able to climb over. The blue line shows a way back between the school grounds and some houses. There's a tiny gate, which is also easy to hop over. Now I wanna clarify that those were assumptions on how he could have entered the school. If he went through the orange line, he must've went to my classroom, then hit a few more classrooms, then went to the kindergarten area, which is where my brother's class was. Or he did vice versa, if he were to enter where the blue line was. Since this was back in 2013, we don't remember if this guy was caught or not. But all I hope is, is that he was caught. My name is Shelly and 10 years ago, I wanted to make my own money because I was tired of asking my parents for money. I put in a lot of applications and I ended up getting hired at Chick-fil-A. I'm not going to lie, I was definitely excited because of all of the chicken nuggets I was going to be eating. 
Anyways, after I got hired, I started to get the hang of the job. It was pretty easy. I worked outside in the drive through line a lot because we were the busiest fast food restaurant in our town, and people really liked my personality. After working there for a few months, my dad's creepy friend Tyler would come there every day at the same time and go to the same drive through line, which was weird because I worked there after school and there were two drive through lines. The drive through line he'd always go to was mine, and he would always call me Shell Shell, which I've hated since I was a small kid. The thing is, he'd always order small stuff like a small fry or small cookies and cream milkshake. A few times he came into the line, pull up to me, and then he'd say that he forgot his debit card and he would just try and talk to me. I'm not dumb. I knew exactly what he was doing. Ever since I turned 13, he always acted weird toward me, telling me that I'm growing up into a woman or that I look like a young woman now. There was this time when my parents were having a get together with family and friends and I yelled out to my parents that I had to pee and I ran upstairs. I swear a few seconds later Tyler burst through the door, looked at me and said wow and stared at me. Then he straightened up real quick and said sorry my bad and closed the door. Like I said he was weird. So we closed at 10 p.m. but we always take orders up until around 9.59. One day, we were inside cleaning up, and it was around 10.30 p.m. There were about five or six of us in Chick-fil-A at the time. I was mopping the floor, and a few of us saw a car pull up to the drive through but turned around at the entrance because we put cones out there after 10 p.m. The car drove around our parking lot at least 10 minutes, and I noticed that it had temporary tags on it. After a while, our manager went outside and went up to the car due to it stopping in front of one of our windows every time it drove around. I watched the manager walk to the car as the driver rolled down the window. The window was all the way down before my manager reached the car. And to my surprise, it was Tyler, my dad's friend. He had a new car that I didn't recognize. But what made this very weird was that even when he rolled the window down, he never looked at my manager. He was staring directly at me talking with my manager. I was standing behind the entrance door. He saw me looking at him, looking at me, but he never turned away like a normal person would. My manager walked back in and told me and my coworkers to hurry up so we can get out of here. I was the last person to get done with my closing, so it was just me and my manager. My manager told me to make sure the doors are locked. I told him okay, then I went to the bathroom. I figured I'll lock them once I'm done. As usual, I was on my phone while using the bathroom, and the bathroom door opens. I thought it was weird because my manager is the only other person in the building, and he's a guy. I yelled out that he's an idiot and he's in the wrong bathroom, but the thing is, he never left. It got weirder because I can hear him breathing by the door, but then I heard, Shell Shell, it's me, Tyler Poop. Are you in here? I picked up my feet so he couldn't see them, but then he started to push open every stall door, saying my name. I texted my boss and it literally said, help, bathroom. Then Tyler got to my stall. He attempted to push the door open and then he laughed. He said that he knows that I'm in there. He looked in the crack of the door and said, there you are. He then got down on his hands and knees, reached his hand under the door and attempted to unlock the stall. I kicked his arm and he said, it's me, Uncle Tyler. As he said that, he proceeded to crawl under my stall door. I started to climb above my stall, then my manager burst through the door as I was screaming and crying. Tyler and my manager began to fight. I called the cops. After a few seconds, Tyler was unconscious on the bathroom floor. When the cops and the EMS got there, he was cuffed and loaded up into the ambulance. He was hit with a few charges and was recently released from jail. That situation just heightened my awareness of my surroundings. Back when I was living on the streets, well technically in my car, I would always post up by fast food restaurants because people would always give me their change or some of the food that they had recently purchased. 
One day I posted at the entrance of a plaza, and in that plaza the busiest place was a Chick-fil-A. Throughout the day I received a few bucks and a lot of chicken nuggets. After being out there for a few hours, I noticed a car that left a few times and came back to park in the Chick-fil-A parking lot with covered license plates. But the person never got out of the car. Of course I thought it was weird, but I didn't think anything of it. Throughout the day, I'd take my food to my car and I'd eat. Around 8 p.m., most of the plaza was closing up and the traffic started to slow down. Finally, when Chick-fil-A slowed down for a few minutes, a man in the car got out and he walked up to the door of the restaurant and took a picture of the inside. A few seconds later, what looked like the manager came outside and it looked like she was arguing with the guy. She went back inside and the man got back in his car, got on his phone, and left about five minutes later. FYI, I was parked about 25 feet away from the Chick-fil-A parking lot and could see everything that was going on. So a few hours go by and the place was closed. From the outside, it looked as if the employees were cleaning up. I was trying to fall asleep, then I saw that car from earlier pull up. Then it woke me all the way up. There were two cars left in the parking lot. His car and some other car. And some people left. The only person I saw inside was the woman that he was talking to earlier. I saw the man get out of his car at this point. He was wearing dark colors and with gloves on and I saw the lights get turned off inside of Chick-fil-A. The man was standing on the side of the building by a dumpster, but in a way where he can't be seen. He was in the shadows. At that point, I leaned my seat all the way back so no one could see me. The woman walked out, turned around, and began to lock the door. As soon as she turned around, that man sprinted toward her, yanked her hair, and started to yell at her as he took her back inside. I leaned up a little bit to get a better look, but I couldn't see anything. There was nothing for about 10 minutes until the man walked back outside. He went straight to his car, but instead of driving away, he drove up to the door and went back in with his trunk left open. A few minutes later, I saw something that I would never forget. The man was dragging the woman's body, but there was no head. He struggled to get her in the trunk, but eventually he got her there. He went back in there and came out with a Chick-fil-A bag full of something and threw it in his trunk. He went back inside again for what seemed like 20 minutes. He came back out, locked up Chick-fil-A, and drove away. Someone else came back for the other car in the parking lot. A few days later, I went to a Starbucks to use the restroom, and on the news was a story about a missing woman. They showed the picture, and it was the woman who worked at Chick-fil-A. They were interviewing her husband, who was crying during the whole interview. What creeped me out is that her husband was the man that I saw with her that fateful night. I know he killed her, but he was on the news as if he didn't have anything to do with it, and like he doesn't know. Seeing that lady that night has haunted me since. It was Halloween of 2012 and I was closing at work, which is Chick-fil-A. We were a new establishment in the area that we're in, and the neighborhood was pretty bad. In and out all afternoon and evening, I saw hundreds of people dressed in their costumes. All of the cliche costumes, Jason, Freddy Krueger, and Michael Myers. At around 7.30, there was a long line inside, and out of nowhere, there was some commotion. My manager came out to break it up. When he broke it up, some guy in the ghost face costume from Scream ran out of the door. That person that ran out of the door got into it with a woman that was dressed as Meg. Meg from Family Guy. At least that's what I thought she was until she told us that she wasn't in costume. She was just ugly. Anyway, this woman told our manager and the cops that some person in a ghost face costume tried to lure her seven-year-old daughter out of the building to his car. The little girl was running back and forth between her mother, who was in line, in the play area inside. I guess the man in the scream costume told the girl that her mom told her to wait in his car, and he grabbed her. The mom turned around and saw it, then she started to yell and scream. A few hours later, we locked the doors, and then some guy knocked at our drive through window. He had on a ghost face costume from the movie Scream, but I don't know if it was the same guy from earlier. I yelled out that we're closed, and this guy tries to bust through the drive through window. 
I screamed and the manager ran out. And then that man ran to our front door banging. Then he stopped and just stared at us. At that point, it was just my manager and I. My manager called the cops and the man left and popped his trunk of his car. He grabbed something out of his trunk and put it under his costume. He then walked back up to the front door. He stared for another 30 seconds and pulled out a gun from under his costume, aimed it and pulled the trigger. We both ducked and screamed, but nothing happened. We looked up and he was fumbling with his gun. He was loading, unloading and reloading. It had jammed. Then the cops showed up with their guns drawn. He got on the ground and they arrested this guy. We found out that this was a dangerous guy and he had a huge rap sheet and we were pretty lucky that nothing happened to us that night. It may be cowardly, but I quit that job soon after that happened because of the neighborhood that, that Chick-fil-A was in. I'm originally from Mexico. For reasons that will become very obvious, I wish to remain anonymous. I used to be involved in the Mexican cartel. I mainly transported drugs across the border into the United States. To make a long story short, I was caught and cooperated with the feds in exchange for immunity and asylum. Before I go any further, you can go ahead and label me a snitch if you want to. I don't care. I personally feel pretty good about writing out a bunch of drug dealing murderers that work for an organization that is responsible for destroying so many of my fellow Mexicans' lives. I was forced into this life at a young age. I've always hated the cartel and was already plotting a way to flee Mexico with my mother and two younger sisters. You could say that it was a good thing that I ended up getting caught. The story is not about how I got out of the cartel. It's about the closest call I ever had during my time with the cartel. This happened during the early days. It was the summer of 2005. I remember the date specifically because I had just turned 18 a day prior. Even though I was barely an adult, I was a very intimidating looking guy. I come from a long line of very physically strong men. I've been lifting weights since I was a child. I'm an even tempered guy and I don't consider myself to be an aggressive person, but I will put somebody through the wall if they piss me off. It was because of my physical presence and my piece of shit father, who was also in the cartel, made me a target for recruitment. When I first started out, myself and two other guys would drive around Mexico City and collect debts and packages from people who owed money to the cartel or one of our distributors. It was on the fourth or fifth run that we ran into some trouble. There was this particular club we frequented where a lot of business was conducted. To make things simple, an exchange would go down in a back room, and we would come shortly after and collect the revenue and drop it off to our capo. So that night, we entered the club and began making our way to the back room. It was a fairly busy night for the club. This DJ from out of town was performing there, so people from all over were there to see him. To get to the back room, we had to go through the main dance floor to the opposite side of the building. There were some renovations that prevented us from using the back entrance. We got out onto the dance floor and started making our way through the crowd. When we were about halfway there, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed directly at me. I quickly ducked, and not a second later, I heard the gun go off. Unfortunately, an innocent girl who was standing beside me caught the bullet. She was shot at point-blank range, and I don't mean to be insensitive when I say this, but the poor girl's head was blasted apart. I remember several things happening simultaneously after the shotgun went off. All of the partygoers immediately fled the club. From my position on the ground, all I saw was a wave of moving legs. When I stood up, I saw a deserted club, my two co-workers with their guns drawn, cursing up a storm, and, unfortunately, the corpse of the young girl who was just shot. I assumed that the shooter got away in the chaos. We quickly busted into the back office to find another bullet-ridding corpse. It was a club owner, who was our contact. We immediately fled the scene before the police showed up. 
I was never informed as to what happened with the club owner and who almost took my head off with a shotgun. I was on the lowest rank of the cartel and they kept us in the dark about a lot of things. I'm grateful that I'm no longer a part of that life. I would like to end things by saying a big fuck you to that asshole who tried to kill me and ended up shooting an innocent girl that night. And to all of those cartel members who got locked up because of me. You got what you deserved. And I'll see you in hell. I'm a 20 year old male and this happened to me in the winter of 2018, the day after Christmas. Me and my parents were on vacation in Maine, visiting my grandmother. As you can probably imagine, being in the state of Maine during the winter, it was freezing. We came up from Texas, so this was definitely not my climate if you know what I mean. My parents had gone out to visit a friend who lived in the area while me and my grandmother stayed back and watched some movies. My grandmother turned in at about 8 o'clock, and I eventually got bored of watching TV, so I decided to put on my coat and go for a walk outside. My grandmother's neighborhood has this neat stone maze, complete with angel statues and fountains. It was really cool, and something you really don't see a whole lot in neighborhoods these days. My grandmother's neighborhood was one of those 50-plus communities, I doubt you could have something like this in a neighborhood full of kids without it getting defaced with spray painted pictures of penises or something. For me, I actually admired works of architecture like this and was impressed by the amount of effort it must have taken to construct it. It was open from dusk till dawn, however, my grandmother told me that there was no neighborhood security during the holidays and no one would say anything if I wanted to go through the maze after hours, so I did just that. I brought a flashlight with me of course, and it took me about 5 minutes to reach the entrance of the maze from my grandmother's place. The maze wasn't massive, but it was big enough that you could get turned around, at least for a little bit. If I could give you guys a somewhat accurate visual of this maze, think of the maze in Resident Evil 4, where Leon had to fight off those dogs and gather puzzle pieces. That's roughly the same size as this maze. When I walked through this maze during the daytime, I would usually listen to my headphones, but something told me not to put them on that night, and it's a good thing that I followed my instincts. After I'd say it was about 10 minutes, I suddenly heard the sound of metal scraping against the stone walls. As soon as I heard the sound, alarm bells went off in my head. I froze in place and carefully listened for any other sounds. The scraping noise came again, except this time there was a deep voice that followed it. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. This sent chills down my spine, realizing that I was now in a maze at night with a possible maniac. The maze had these areas where a statue or a fountain would be. In these locations, there was shrubbery that lined the maze walls. There was just enough space between the wall and the bushes for a small person like me to hide behind. And since I didn't know the best route to exit the maze from where I was, I decided that the best course of action was to hide. I made my way into the area where a statue of David the Archangel was, and I quickly took cover behind the shrubbery that lined the walls. The streetlights located outside of the maze provided enough light for you to see your surroundings. However, it was still dark enough to obscure the details of objects and people. I feel that I needed to point that out, because from my hiding spot, I could see the corridor that I entered from. After about a minute, I watched a dark figure emerge from the shadows and make its way in front of the statue. I remember thinking how awesome it would be if the statue came to life and helped me out of this situation. But that thought quickly faded when the figure made its way directly in front of me. I could now see that it was holding something in its hands. I know that I said that you really couldn't tell any distinguishing features of objects because of the poor lighting. However, it was obvious what the figure was holding, even in the dark. I could make out the distinct shape of a pickaxe. As the figure moved slowly through the area, I heard what I can only describe as teeth clattering. 
This only disturbed me even more, as the dark shadow moved to the other side of the area and disappeared into the opposite corridor. After a few minutes of gathering my wits, I was reasonably sure that if I went back down the way I came, I could backtrack and make my escape. I cautiously moved out from my hiding spot to the corridor. I stopped in my tracks as I heard the sound of metal scraping again. It was coming from the opposite corridor where the figure had vanished. Before I could turn to look, I heard that same deep voice cut through the silence. I see you. I turned my head to see the figure running towards me, pickaxe raised above its head. That's when I took off through the corridor and frantically made my way through the dark maze. There was no time to navigate through the maze properly, so I just had to guess my way through the labyrinth as the lunatic with the pickaxe closed in behind me. After about five minutes of twists and turns, I finally saw the exit. I tore through the snow-covered ground and towards the opening. Just before I crossed the threshold, I heard a loud smash coming from right behind me. I gave a quick glance to see the pickaxe lying in the snow by the entrance. What I think happened was that my pursuer saw that I was about to exit the maze and decided to heave his pickaxe at me, but missed. As soon as I was outside of my grandmother's house, I pulled out my phone and called the police. But like with most stories like this, they arrived too late. Having experienced this myself, I can tell you that this outcome does make sense. My assailant failed to capture or kill me, so I don't think that they would stick around for the police to show up. The officers took my statement and did a thorough search of the area. They also had a squad car patrolling through the neighborhood for the rest of that night. I didn't tell my parents or my grandmother what happened until the next day. I figured that there was no need to worry them that night. I consider myself to be a pretty level-headed person, and that's mainly why I chose to share my story. Situations like this are terrifying, but you have to try to keep your wits about you. If I had lost my composure in that maze, I'm pretty sure that pickaxe would have found its way into my skull. Alexa Sharkey was born in Houston, Texas in the year 1994 to her father, Mike Robinault, and her mother, Stacy. After graduating high school, Alexis initially studied biology education at a university in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but after gaining her diploma, she seemed to be in no rush to get a teaching job and found work at a premium hair and skin care company named Monate. She was still working for Monate when she began to gain a great number of followers on the photography-based social media app, Instagram. A combination of her natural beauty and her champagne lifestyle had users hooked. She and her husband, a wealthy West Texas consultant who was 26 years her senior, were accustomed to vacationing a lot, and Alexis wasted no opportunity to document her travels, sharing pictures with her followers on a daily basis. Not to mention sharing images of the couple's extravagant life around Houston, the place that they made their home. Her posts would be seen, liked, and shared by tens of thousands of people and by December of 2020, Alexis had over 69,000 followers. Now as you may know, Instagram users with large amounts of followers are often contacted by private companies and offered large amounts of money in exchange for advertising their products, and Alexis was no different. Within a relatively short period of time, whilst still working full-time selling products for Monate, which has since been accused of being nothing more than a multi-level marketing company, Alexis was getting sponsorship deals which made her income swell to even higher levels than her consultant husband. But all was not well in the Sharky home. A close friend of Alexis confessed that she had recently confided in her that she was filing for a divorce. Some had always doubted their relationship given that Tom was considerably older than her, and aside from an intense attraction, the couple seemed to have very little in common. Yet for some reason, Alexis didn't move out of the apartment they shared, even though she and Tom were apparently separated. However, she did see an opportunity to get a break away from Tom, as Thanksgiving weekend gave her the chance to stay over at a friend's place for the celebrations. 
she told her soon-to-be ex-husband that she would be back by the weekend. But on the Saturday following Thanksgiving, Alexis's mother Stacy received a call from Tom saying that Alexis was missing and that he hadn't heard from her since Friday. A few days later on November 28th, Alexis's mother posted to the social media site Facebook stating that her daughter hadn't been heard from in over 24 hours, adding that police were involved and that Alexis had last been seen in the Houston area. This was especially concerning for Stacy as she hadn't seen her daughter since the previous Christmas due to travel restrictions caused by the pandemic. Alexis had planned to return home to her parents back in Pennsylvania for Thanksgiving, but as the number of cases continued to rise all over the United States, the family decided it was much safer for Alexis to stay in Texas. But the very same morning that Stacy posted her plea on Facebook, a sanitation worker employed by the city of Houston saw something unusual lying on the side of the road. At first, he simply believed it was some kind of mannequin, due to the lack of clothes and the stiff positioning of the thing's limbs. But the worker's supervisor, a man named John Richardson, later said that the employee had sounded terrified when he called him, saying he'd noticed the apparent mannequin looked a little too real upon closer inspection, and that he suspected the situation to be far worse. John drove down to where the supposed mannequin was lying at the side of the road, then rushed to call 911 when he saw that it was no mannequin at all. That it was in fact a lifeless human body. The moment of realization traumatized him and he later told a local radio station that the sight of the body had been playing in his head every day since he discovered it. Two days later, on November 30th, Houston Police Department held a press conference in which they announced that they had identified the body as belonging to none other than Alexis Sharkey. Her soon-to-be ex-husband got a call from a local coroner's office, asking him to drive over to identify the body of a potential loved one. He knew immediately that it was going to be Alexis, but somehow found the strength to head on over where he found her lying on a mortician's table, dead but with no obvious signs of injury. Yet to his horror, after the news of Alexis' death began to circulate in the news, he began to hear rumors that it was his maltreatment of her that had been the cause of her death. Anonymous accounts from people claiming to be friends of Alexis had told a number of online news publications that the separation from her husband had caused a huge amount of tension in their home, a tension that had soured into hatred. These anonymous friends claimed that Alexis herself had told them that some intense arguments had descended into violence more than once, and that her husband had been putting his hands on her. Suddenly, Tom Sharkey found himself bathed in the media spotlight, and for entirely negative reasons. In what became a lightning-quick trial by media, one which was fueled by social media speculation, tens of thousands of furious people assumed that it was Tom that was the murderer, and he began to receive a slew of death threats. It certainly didn't help that initially Tom had refused to comment on his wife's death, but as the threats against him became more and more tangible, he reached out to give a statement to a local ABC affiliate. She understood me. I understood her. We didn't fight when she left. I just told her she shouldn't drive under the influence, he said, overtly implying that Alexis had been drunk the night that she left her friend's Thanksgiving celebrations. He also seemed to insist that there was no trouble in their marriage and that they weren't filing for divorce at all. This was something that was backed up by Alexis's mother who said her daughter would have told her if she was suffering marital problems. When the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences conducted an autopsy on Alexis's body, they told reporters that they couldn't rule out the possibility of foul play. This only cemented her mother's suspicions that she met a violent end. I believe solely that she was murdered because of the manner in which her body was left, Stacy said. It just drives deep into the soul that something very malicious happened here, and I want to get to the bottom of it. Friends said she confided in them on a recent trip to Mexico that she feared for her life, although she apparently did not say why she held such suspicions. But if this was the case, just who exactly killed Alexis? Police seem to have pretty much ruled out the idea that she was murdered by her husband since he was quick to volunteer his cooperation with them in the aftermath of her death, and has since stated that they believe it to be only a matter of time before arrests are made. 
so perhaps Alexis's murder was related to her career selling beauty products of Monet. Not only has Monet been accused of utilizing the techniques of outlawed, multi-level marketing companies, but the quality of its products has also come into question. In the year before Alexis's death, Monet was allegedly investigated by Florida's Attorney General after hundreds of claims that its products caused a host of hair and skin issues. The company was permanently barred from using false or misleading statements in its marketing and sales of its beauty products, and faced a million-dollar fine on top of class-action lawsuits from those that, after using the products, claim they experience hair loss, balding, and itching. Alexis was a prolific seller of Monet's products, once receiving a check for $10,000 as the winner of a company sales competition. That would certainly make for a lot of women who might blame her for essentially disfiguring them. There's also a decent chance that, since Monet's MLM tactics would leave a lot of people out of pocket, that somewhere down the line Alexis had screwed one of her underlings out of a great deal of cash, perhaps just before the news of Monet's subpar products broke in the media, perhaps leaving a person totally unable to shift a hefty amount of stock they'd purchased. This would doubtless leave a person angry, vengeful, maybe even murderous. And besides, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. If this is indeed the case, and Alexis's death is intrinsically linked to her Monet sales, then it seems that her status as an Instagram influencer actually led to her murder. The influence she exerted over those that followed her no doubt led to increased sales, thus increasing the potential pool of victims for Monet's frankly dangerous products. It's very possible that without Instagram, she may not have made the sale to that one person unhinged enough to seek revenge when their skin began to blister, or their hair began to fall out, or their scalp began to itch unbearably. It seems we'll soon find out who's responsible for Alexis's death, but if it is related to social media, it would be very ironic that a medium that has brought opportunity and new beginnings to so many brought one young woman to her end. The 24-year-old Russian Ekaterina Karaglanova had a life that many of us can only dream of having. She was young, beautiful, intelligent, and highly educated. Practicing medicine as a dermatologist after graduating from the Pirogov Medical University, she also held a residency at a prestigious medical school in Russia's capital, Moscow. And to top it all off, she had recently finished second place in a Moscow beauty pageant. Ekaterina was also a prominent social media personality in her native Russia, regularly sharing images of herself with hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers, known by the handle at Katie underscore loves underscore life, she was known to write a blog detailing her luxurious jaunts around Europe, where she posed in locations such as Italy, Austria, and Spain. In her last Instagram photo, shows her lounging poolside in Greece, detailing her love for international travel. It was very helpful for a few days to escape from heavy rains and cold to the Ionian Sea. She also captioned the snap of herself holding a glass of wine by a pool. Now I prefer to travel very often, but briefly, study and work do not let go. But the impressions of such short trips remain the most vivid. But one of her close friends, Marina Nicotina, began to notice that all was not well with her seemingly perfect life. She claimed to have observed a drastic change in Ekaterina's behavior during the summer of 2019, and when questioned on it, the well-traveled young doctor confessed that she had made a rather dangerous enemy and that someone is interested in my private life in the worst possible way. Then, in July of 2019, Ekaterina's family contacted the Moscow police concerned with the fact that they had not heard from her in several days. Friends remarked that she had recently started a new relationship and had been planning a trip to the Netherlands to mark her birthday on July 30th. Most other people might have been busy with travel arrangements or might simply have been too occupied with her actual vacation to get in touch. But as we know, Ekaterina posted to her Instagram account almost religiously, and the fact that she hadn't done so for several days was the thing that alarmed her family the most. Deeply worried for her well-being, 
Ekaterina's family contacted her landlord who, after some convincing, allowed them to access her apartment. There they found no sign of anything amiss. Her belongings seemed to be all in order and there was no obvious signs of violence. But in the hallway was a heavy-looking suitcase, stuffed with something far more than just expensive clothes. Her family were horrified at what they found when they opened it, because what fell out in front of them was Ekaterina's decomposing corpse. She had been dead for almost a week, with a large slash across her throat and several other devastating stab wounds to her chest and abdomen. Upon examining the crime scene, police were unable to locate any obvious murder weapon, and there were no signs that there had been a break-in or any kind of serious struggle. Naturally, police checked her Instagram account for any clues that might point them in the direction of why she was killed. They saw that Ekaterina had alluded to a potential romance on her Instagram account, sharing photos of bouquets with notes attached to them. Another surprise from Mr. X, she captioned the latest photo, adding, For several weeks now I have been receiving bouquets and little notes from a secret admirer. I wonder who it could be. It was then speculated that such a public display of romantic interest could have angered a former lover, perhaps someone that couldn't bear to see the young doctor in a new relationship. Police then discovered CCTV footage had captured an ex-boyfriend of Ekaterina's who seemed to have paid her apartment a visit in the few days before contacting her became impossible. Ekaterina had only broken up with 32-year-old Maxime Garieva a few weeks prior, and she had confided in friends that he had not taken it very well at all, and that he was a wolf. The man enters the Moscow apartment block wearing a baseball cap, apparently to cover his face from CCTV cameras. He is then seen leaving the apartment around four hours later, wearing a completely different outfit, which police speculated was because the one he'd entered wearing was now covered in blood. Police soon caught up with Maxime, who told police that the breakup had been hard on him, with Ekaterina repeatedly insulting and humiliating him, despite the fact that he had given her a sizable amount of money in the course of their relationship. Maxime said that she had told him he was ugly and that even a plastic surgeon could not help him. Before they parted, Ekaterina allegedly told him that it would have taken a year before he could save up enough money for them to meet again. This had given rise to theories that the young doctor had taken to resorting to a kind of selling of herself in order to fuel her extravagant lifestyle, charging men exorbitant amounts of money to go on dates with her. It was then that Maxime confessed that he could not stand the kind of treatment and had snapped. He then confessed that he stabbed Ecterina in the neck and chest area with a knife at least five times, saying he regretted what happened and promised to cooperate with the investigation. She half turned and I struck her in the neck, he says in recorded confession to Moscow police. She tried to escape to the bathroom and lock the door. I pulled her out of the bathroom. Her blood was dripping down her body. Then in the corridor she started screaming. I covered her mouth and stabbed her again in her chest with a knife. She then ran to the living room and started fighting me, but I was in a state that I didn't feel any pain. During the fight, she fell down and I struck her twice again in the neck. Then she had convulsions and died. Maxime was taken to trial for the murder, and he apparently held his face in his hands in court because he looked bad. Such was the depth of his own vanity. Character witnesses alluded to calling him Ken a reference to the Barbie doll because he was so obsessed with plastic surgery in his overall appearance. Maxime insisted the murder was not premeditated and told the courtroom it was a spur-of-the-moment thing, something that came about as a result of the rage that he was feeling that Ecterina had so deeply insulted him in his looks. I want to apologize to Katya's parents. I am very sorry. He told the Instagram influencer's family before he was taken to a prison outside of Moscow. It seems that the world of Instagram influencers, as well as those who are attracted to its veneer of perfection, are just as prone to becoming victims of its vapid, plastic culture as we are. Here was an accomplished young woman who apparently could not bear to be without the trappings of luxury that she evidently felt she was entitled to, who, as a result, involved herself with a man who she believed was so beneath her 
that she could verbally abuse and shame him publicly with no repercussions. In no way did Ectorina deserve to die for what she did, but in delving into the superficial lifestyle of an Instagram influencer, what's clear is that she opened up a kind of Pandora's box that seems to have set her on the path to ruin. When 20-year-old Sinead McNamara from New South Wales, Australia received a job offer to work aboard the superyacht known as the Mayan Queen 4, she saw it as the opportunity of a lifetime. So much so that the Australian part-time model sold almost every single one of her belongings to be able to afford a plane ticket to Europe. She was offered the job partly because she had experience working on similar vessels, but the $190 million luxury boat was by far the most extravagant she'd ever had the opportunity to sail on. It was owned by Mexico's second richest man, billionaire Alberto Bayeres, and it was his home on the high seas as he traveled around Europe, living a life of pure luxury. In August of 2018, the Mayan queen was sailing around the plethora of Greek islands in the Aegean Sea, and Sinead took full advantage of the gorgeous scenery amassing around 20,000 followers on her Instagram account. Sinead posted plenty of pictures of herself too, and it's plain to see why the young lady was able to gain work as a part-time model. Not to mention how it doesn't take a genius to work out why photographs of a beautiful young blonde surrounded by beautiful Greek vistas attracted so many visitors to her page. But despite presenting an image of a perfect carefree existence, it became obvious to some that the life Sinead was living was far from flawless. At one point, the young woman called her mother back in Australia to complain that she had been involved in an intense argument with another crew member working aboard the Mayan Queen, and that she seemed scared for her safety. The very next day, a passing boat spotted the Australian model hanging from the back of the yacht, tangled up in a series of thick ropes. The crew of the Mayan Queen was alerted, and the captain of the boat, who asked not to be named, said he discovered Sinead's body at around 1.45 a.m. and began screaming for help. Doctors and police tried for around half an hour to revive her, but when she began to slip into a coma, she was rushed to an Athens hospital, but she sadly died in the helicopter that was flying her to the mainland. The man that inspected her body, Greek coroner Ilias Bogiokas, ruled that because of the circumstances in which she died, that he initially speculated that Sinead's death was actually her ending it herself. Since no stimulant drugs such as cocaine or sedatives such as cannabis or heroin had been found after the toxicology analysis, it means that the girl was not under the influence of such substances, he said. She had mental clarity and that she was most likely facing social problems and found herself at a psychological impasse. However, we don't know if someone brought her into this situation, if there was a moral instigator. The coroner also made it clear that questions still remained about the case, and would need to know much more about the events which led up to her hanging to make a clear definitive judgment on how and why Sinead died. What's horrifying to hear though is that Sinead's body was in such a state that the coroner advised her family against viewing her body even though this is standard practice to identify a person's remains. What was so messed up about her corpse that Greek authorities might forgo such a crucial part of the identification process? After an initial investigation by the Greek Coast Guard, the Mayan Queen 4 was then allowed to leave Kefalonia after interviews with the yacht's crew. The Mayan Queen 4 is equipped with CCTV surveillance cameras and footage of the incident was seized by Greek authorities. Footage reportedly showed Sinead moments before her body was found, though the video was not made public, and for some reason it wasn't made available to the coroner either. The footage apparently showed Sinead in a very high spirits before her body was found hanging from the back of the boat, that she was dancing on tables and downing cocktails, hardly the frame of mind someone who was about to take their own life. If this is the case, our attention is then drawn to the argument with the other crew members the same one she complained to her mother about in which she confessed to being scared. Was Sinead's murder covered up by somebody who co-opted the Greek authorities into helping them sweep the events that preceded her killing under the rug? It's not entirely out of the question that Alberto Belleris, who is worth around $10 billion, 
would have the financial means to bribe government officials in a country so strapped for cash as Greece. Perhaps even more terrifying than the concept of some murderous conspiracy is the casual indifference with which her death was treated by people online. You live for attention, now you've got it. While another added, unfortunately the steep price you pay with lifestyles like this. But some have insisted there is plenty of evidence to suggest that her death was indeed her taking her own life. In a cryptic Instagram post written just two weeks before she died, Sinead wrote, My head is all over the shop today, along with emojis of a volcano, a tornado, and a needle with blood dripping from it. There was also many who asserted that Sinead had ended a tumultuous romantic relationship a short time before her death, and that this may have contributed to feelings of depression or self-destruction. Her death also occurred on what was reported to be her last day as a crew member on the yacht, raising the question that perhaps she was so depressed to be leaving the lap of luxury, maybe even being forced to return to Australia because there was no more luxury yacht jobs available to her, that she opted to take her own life instead of biting the bullet and return to a life more ordinary, perhaps. And perhaps this is the most terrifying thing of all, that human beings are capable of reaching such height that we're simply unwilling to go on living if we can't continue to live in the way we've become accustomed to. That there's a possibility that at just 20 years old, Sinead had felt she'd peaked, and that everything else to follow in her life would pale in comparison to the time that she spent on the Mayan Queen. So instead of continuing her life with her days on the yacht becoming a happy, albeit distant memory, Sinead may have chosen to end her life in order to, as the saying goes, die young and leave a good-looking corpse. My name is Shelly, and 10 years ago, I wanted to make my own money because I was tired of asking my parents for money. I put in a lot of applications, and I ended up getting hired at Chick-fil-A. I'm not going to lie, I was definitely excited because of all of the chicken nuggets I was going to be eating. Anyways, after I got hired, I started to get the hang of the job. It was pretty easy. I worked outside in a drive through line a lot because we were the busiest fast food restaurant in our town, and people really liked my personality. After working there for a few months, my dad's creepy friend Tyler would come there every day at the same time and go to the same drive through line, which was weird because I worked there after school, and there were two drive through lines. The drive through line he'd always go to was mine and he would always call me Shell Shell, which I've hated since I was a small kid. The thing is, he'd always order small stuff like a small fry, or small cookies and cream milkshake. A few times he came into the line, pull up to me, and then he'd say that he forgot his debit card, and he would just try and talk to me. I'm not dumb. I knew exactly what he was doing. Ever since I turned 13, he always acted weird toward me, telling me that I'm growing up into a woman or that I look like a young woman now. There was this time when my parents were having a get together with family and friends, and I yelled out to my parents that I had to pee, and I ran upstairs. I swear a few seconds later, Tyler burst through the door, looked at me and said, wow, and stared at me. Then he straightened up real quick and said, sorry, my bad, and closed the door. Like I said, he was weird. So we closed at 10 p.m., but we always take orders up until around 9.59. One day, we were inside cleaning up, and it was around 10.30 p.m. There were about five or six of us in Chick-fil-A at the time. I was mopping the floor, and a few of us saw a car pull up to the drive through but turned around at the entrance because we put cones out there after 10 p.m. The car drove around our parking lot at least 10 minutes, and I noticed that it had temporary tags on it. After a while, our manager went outside and went up to the car due to it stopping in front of one of our windows every time it drove around. I watched the manager walk to the car as the driver rolled down the window. The window was all the way down before my manager reached the car. And to my surprise, it was Tyler, my dad's friend. He had a new car that I didn't recognize. But what made this very weird was that even when he rolled the window down, he never looked at my manager. He was staring directly at me talking with my manager. I was standing behind the entrance door. He saw me looking at him, looking at me, but he never turned away like a normal person would. My manager walked back in and told me and my co-workers to hurry up so we can get out of here. 
I was the last person to get done with my closing, so it was just me and my manager. My manager told me to make sure the doors are locked. I told him okay, then I went to the bathroom. I figured I'd lock on once I'm done. As usual, I was on my phone while using the bathroom, and the bathroom door opens. I thought it was weird because my manager is the only other person in the building, and he's a guy. I yelled out that he's an idiot and he's in the wrong bathroom, but the thing is, he never left. It got weirder because I can hear him breathing by the door, but then I heard, Shell Shell, it's me, Tyler Poop. Are you in here? I picked up my feet so he couldn't see them, but then he started to push open every stall door, saying my name. I texted my boss and it literally said, help, bathroom. Then Tyler got to my stall. He attempted to push the door open and then he laughed. He said that he knows that I'm in there. He looked in the crack of the door and said, there you are. He then got down on his hands and knees, reached his hand under the door and attempted to unlock the stall. I kicked his arm and he said, it's me, Uncle Tyler. As he said that, he proceeded to crawl under my stall door. I started to climb above my stall, then my manager burst through the door as I was screaming and crying. Tyler and my manager began to fight. I called the cops. After a few seconds, Tyler was unconscious on the bathroom floor. When the cops and the EMS got there, he was cuffed and loaded up into the ambulance. He was hit with a few charges and was recently released from jail. That situation just heightened my awareness of my surroundings. Back when I was living on the streets, well technically in my car, I would always post up by fast food restaurants because people would always give me their change or some of the food that they had recently purchased. One day I posted at the entrance of a plaza and in that plaza the busiest place was a Chick-fil-A. Throughout the day I received a few bucks and a lot of chicken nuggets. After being out there for a few hours I noticed a car that left a few times and came back to park in the Chick-fil-A parking lot with covered license plates but the person never got out of the car. Of course, I thought it was weird, but I didn't think anything of it. Throughout the day, I'd take my food to my car and I'd eat. Around 8 p.m., most of the plaza was closing up and the traffic started to slow down. Finally, when Chick-fil-A slowed down for a few minutes, a man in the car got out and he walked up to the door of the restaurant and took a picture of the inside. A few seconds later, what looked like the manager came outside and it looked like she was arguing with the guy. She went back inside and the man got back in his car, got on his phone, and left about five minutes later. FYI, I was parked about 25 feet away from the Chick-fil-A parking lot and could see everything that was going on. So a few hours go by and the place was closed. From the outside, it looked as if the employees were cleaning up. I was trying to fall asleep, then I saw that car from earlier pull up. Then it woke me all the way up. There were two cars left in the parking lot. His car and some other car. And some people left. The only person I saw inside was the woman that he was talking to earlier. I saw the man get out of his car at this point. He was wearing dark colors and with gloves on. And I saw the lights get turned off inside of Chick-fil-A. The man was standing on the side of the building by a dumpster, but in a way where he can't be seen. He was in the shadows. At that point, I leaned my seat all the way back so no one could see me. The woman walked out, turned around, and began to lock the door. As soon as she turned around, that man sprinted toward her, yanked her hair, and started to yell at her as he took her back inside. I leaned up a little bit to get a better look, but I couldn't see anything. There was nothing for about 10 minutes until the man walked back outside. He went straight to his car, but instead of driving away, he drove up to the door and went back in with his trunk left open. A few minutes later, I saw something that I would never forget. The man was dragging the woman's body, but there was no head. He struggled to get her in the trunk, but eventually he got her there. He went back in there and came out with a Chick-fil-A bag full of something and threw it in his trunk. 
He went back inside again for what seemed like 20 minutes. He came back out, locked up Chick-fil-A, and drove away. Someone else came back for the other car in the parking lot. A few days later, I went into a Starbucks to use the restroom, and on the news was a story about a missing woman. They showed the picture, and it was the woman who worked at Chick-fil-A. They were interviewing her husband, who was crying during the whole interview. What creeped me out is that her husband was the man that I saw with her that fateful night. I know he killed her, but he was on the news as if he didn't have anything to do with it, and like he doesn't know. Seeing that lady that night has haunted me since. So first of all, I have to apologize for my English because it's not my first language. But this is definitely one of the scariest and most horrible things I've ever heard. A few years ago, we had this big incident here in the Philippines involving Facebook. This guy's wife was over in Canada for her job, and she got into an argument with the husband via Facebook. I think he wanted her to come home to Quezon early because he missed her or something, and she refuses because her contract isn't finished yet. I'm guessing the husband was being really nasty and unreasonable because, for some reason, the wife stops replying to his messages altogether. Now this couple had a seven-year-old daughter together, one whose picture the media showed a lot in the days after the incident. She was so cute and it breaks my heart that anything happened to her, but it also makes my blood go cold that anyone could lay a finger on her, especially the girl's own father. Because in response to his wife ignoring him on Facebook, maybe even threatening to leave him, I don't know, he actually kills their daughter. He stabbed her in the neck and chest, then took pictures of the body and uploaded them to Facebook while tagging his wife in the pictures. Can you imagine how horrific that must have been? To get a notification on your phone or laptop or whatever device, seeing you'd been tagged in a picture, only to then see it was your own dead child. Not only that, but your husband, the kid's dad. The one other person in the world whose one job above all else is to protect them is the one that actually murdered them. That's true horror to me, like I can't even wrap my head around it. There was video released of him in custody, I think his name was Mark, and the police were showing him pictures of what he'd done to his daughter, and this guy is just screaming and screaming, not being able to believe he'd killed his own child. I think he'd just gone temporarily insane, or however you say it, but the idea that human beings are capable of such horrific things, like when they see red and just black out, and then are able to kill someone so precious to them, that's about the worst thing I can possibly think of. And it just makes it even more sick that something as supposedly harmless as Facebook was involved, that social media can enable us to make horrific things even worse. I always think about this case whenever I hear about Facebook, and I know the majority of the site is just candy crush invites and baby photos, but it's tainted my opinion of the site forever. I know Facebook has people that remove all the bad content, but they can't be everywhere all the time, and I wonder how many people saw the pictures of that dead girl before they actually got taken down. Even one is too many, if you ask me. Sometimes Facebook just seems like a powder keg of trouble. They had this weird ability to help exacerbate drama to the point where someone gets hurt. A really good example of this is what happened back in 2012 in the town I live in here in Holland. So there were these two friends of about 15 or 16 years old who went to a New Year's Eve house party together. They ended up getting pretty drunk and having an argument because one of the girls was like making out with the guys and her friend didn't like it. So the next day, one friend basically calls the other a sleaze on Facebook. So the friend who got called sleazy complained to one of the guys she'd been making out with at the party, who said that if she wanted to, he could teach the judgmental friend a lesson. I think it says a lot about how petty and spiteful teenage girls can be to each other, but the girl who got accused of being sleazy says yes to this, that she wanted her friend to regret saying mean things to her. So instead of just sending over some rude messages or whatever, this guy gets in touch with another friend of his, who agrees to actually go over to this girl's house to beat her up or something. Yeah, 
actual violence because of a few comments on freaking Facebook. Only he doesn't just slap her around or whatever. He takes a knife over to the girl's house, rings on her door, and then stabs her repeatedly with it. That's when this girl's dad appears to try and defend her. The kid then stabs him too. The girl ended up dying a week or so later in the hospital, and it was a huge news story here in Holland. But I think the really horrible thing is that the kid who did the actual stabbing only spent a year in juvenile detention with a few years of probation afterward. The two kids who organized the killing ended up getting more time in prison than the actual murderer, but even then it was only two years. I know the prosecutor tried to get them more time in jail, but that didn't work in the end, and these kids basically got off super lightly for legit murdering someone, and all because of an argument that unfolded over Facebook. That was the hardest part to swallow. The Dutch media even christened the whole thing Facebook Mord, as like a nickname which basically just meant the Facebook murder in Dutch. I'm not saying the whole murder wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Facebook, but honestly, there's no doubt that it made it easier to organize. Like I know for a fact that the older guy managed to get in touch with the guy who actually carried out the attack via Facebook, and maybe he wouldn't have been able to organize that without it. Stuff like Facebook is supposedly there to bring us together, right? So it's just a terrible thought that people can then use it to rip each other's families apart. I'm kind of weird about social media these days. I used to be really into Facebook when I first moved to college. It kept me in touch with family and friends back home and it was a nice feeling like I wasn't so far away from them. Building up a collection of photos, checking into places, sharing every little detail in my life so that everyone could see how great I was doing. My entire world was online for all to see. And because I'm dumb, I was pretty liberal about my privacy setting too. So one day I get this message request from someone that I've never heard of before. It just said, hey. I checked their profile to see if they were in the same class as me or something, but it turned out we had no mutuals, and they lived on the other side of the country. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty confused as to why they're messaging me, but I'm also curious. So I just reply, hey man, do we know each other? I don't know what I was expecting him to say when I saw that he was typing a reply. And I remember thinking that maybe he was looking for someone with the same name as me or something. But then his response pops up and all it said was, I'm going to kill you, with a cowboy emoji on the end. I stare at the message for a few seconds, not scared at all, just like, what? I mean, the cowboy emoji was what made me take another look at this dude's profile, seeing a bunch more pictures of him shooting guns and wielding knives in the woods somewhere. I mean, that was at least a little intimidating, but what got me were all these rants that he'd posted about how much life sucked, how unfair things were, and how he'd love to take it out on someone who deserved it. And then the videos that were unplayable because they'd been removed by Facebook admins, but still had captions like, the chainsaw goes through his neck like butter, and a crying laughing face emoji. That's when I started to worry. It didn't seem like this guy was just having fun, playing a prank on a stranger by trying to scare them. He seemed legit crazy and seriously angry. That nutcase could have been studying every one of my statuses, picture posts and check-ins for weeks before he decided to message me. He could have screenshotted all of my stuff too, so it didn't matter if I blocked him or not. He had my name, my school, where I hung out, the names of my family and friends, everything. I thought maybe I was just making a big deal out of nothing at the time, but later on I could barely sleep thinking about it. How horrifying a thought it was that he could have been driving across the country as I lay there in bed, having just picked a person at random to kill and being crazy or angry enough to actually do it. You can call me paranoid all you like, but I just couldn't get this guy out of my head. Like the idea of him hunting me down or whatever was unnerving enough. I mean, he had enough info on me to be able to ambush me at a dozen different places that I just couldn't avoid because they were school or grocery shopping or just my dorm. But what had me freaked out is that creep might have been able to learn so much about me and 
I was dumb or vain enough to let it happen in the first place. I knew the internet was full of crazies. I just didn't expect it to reach and touch me in the way that it did. If I didn't make it clear already, I did actually block the guy, but some weird grim curiosity had me unblocking his account one day so I could sort of check up on him and make sure he wasn't about to do something too nuts. There were no rants, no threatening statuses, just a long series of photo posts that made me think that he'd taken up photography or something. I'm scrolling through them when I started to get this familiar feeling from looking at the scenery. I couldn't be 100% sure, but I'd swear a lot of the pictures he'd taken were of things that were around the town I was living in. There were no street signs or anything, nothing that actually confirmed he'd actually driven across the country, but if he wasn't taking pictures in a town that looked remarkably similar to mine, then I could have been in a whole lot of trouble. I expected that guy to jump me for weeks after, like I was a complete nervous wreck. It messed with my sleep, I lost a bunch of weight, being in an almost constant state of anxiety for the better part of a month. He didn't find me, nothing happened as a result, thank God, but just knowing he could pretty much come and get me anytime he liked got to me in ways I never even imagined it ever could. We put ourselves on front street in a big way with social media and it could literally be anyone out there just lurking on our profiles. So like I said, now I'm kind of weird and cautious about social media, I don't put too much out there, and I don't use any real name, I run the strictest privacy settings possible, and I really recommend you do too. I live here in a place called Mountain City down here in Tennessee. So this is going back about 10 years after I graduated high school when this really messed up story started going around about one of the other kids that I graduated with. It starts in the worst possible way too, because first I heard of it was a buddy of mine texting me saying, did you hear about Billy Payne? I text back saying no, and he then calls me all serious sounding to say that Billy and his baby mom got shot just a few days before. Like someone rolled up to their house, bust open the door and just shot them both right there in front of the television. They were legit executed. Some of the papers said it was a single shot to the head that killed both victims and how Billy's throat had been slashed. We got to wondering why someone might do something like that. If it was a random psycho killer or if he was moving weight and managed to step on someone's toes... I did remember hearing about Billy messing around with drugs a few times, so it wasn't totally out of the question, but he must have done something serious to have whoever it was shoot his baby mama right there too. Like, that's real cold-blooded, you know? But even saying that, he just didn't seem like the kind of guy to get involved with serious gangbangers. Anyway, the cops catch the two guys who committed the murder. One of them is this Vietnam vet who said in court that he was ex-CIA too. Anyway, they get charged, go up in front of a judge, and you know why they said they did it? Because the CIA had told them that the two murder victims were part of some evil group that was planning on killing their daughter. But in reality, Billy Payne and his baby mom were shot dead because they unfriended one of the killer's daughters on Facebook. Can you actually believe that? That someone would take social media that seriously and actually kill somebody because of a friend request? I mean, I didn't. I was convinced that there was more to it than that, and as much as it made me feel like a gorehound, I stayed interested in the trial to find out why they'd done something so horrendous. Like the cops found Billy's baby alive in his mom's arms. Poor kid is going to grow up without a mother and a father. But then yeah, that's the only reason or motive established and the prosecutor brings up Facebook messages detailing intense arguments between Billy, his girlfriend, and the girl who got unfriended. They'd argue about it back and forth for hours with some pretty harsh language exchange too, and then the girl says that she's going to tell her dad. I don't know if the girl just didn't expect her dad to actually go kill them or that she knew he'd overreact, but if it's the latter then she has blood on her hands too, as far as I'm concerned. Like it's the way she told her dad too, she just didn't tell him direct, she invented some fake CIA agent that got in touch with her dad over Facebook to tell them all this messed up stuff about how their daughter was in grave danger. 
I suppose it just scares me that people could take something like Facebook that seriously. But it's obvious that some people out there put so much belief in social media that they're willing to kill over perceived insults or whatever. And that's why I keep my social media presence pretty small these days. Aside from all the ratchety drama that goes on in our timelines every so often, it's just not a healthy place for some people. And it kind of blows my mind that Facebook could be the reason that anyone got shot. On the morning of April 12, 2018... 27-year-old Renita Williams of Shreveport, Louisiana was at home, minding her own business. She lived at home with her mother, Anita, and had just broken up with her long-term boyfriend, Jonathan Robinson. Like many relationships, the breakup had been a messy one, and a great deal of drama had unfolded on social media websites, mainly the most popular of them, Facebook. Apparently, Jonathan had moved on rather quickly from Renita and had recently started dating a woman from Houston, Texas named Sharika Taylor. And although it's not entirely clear what the ins and outs of the social media drama were, there had definitely been some exchange between the two women that had seriously enraged Jonathan Robinson. As foolish as it often is, men sometimes attempt to defend the honor of the women in their lives but no one could have expected Jonathan to take such extreme measures in what amounted to little more than an exchange of harsh words. Because before Jonathan pulled up to Renita's place on the morning of April 12th, he had just driven by his aunt's house to retrieve something he'd previously hidden in the basement of her home, a high-caliber semi-automatic rifle. He was so delirious with anger that he didn't even bother to turn off the engine of the vehicle he'd driven up in. He simply grabbed the rifle from the passenger seat kicked in the dead-bolted front door to the house, and then started shooting. It seems those first few shots were merely to terrify those in the home, because no one was actually hurt during the first few minutes of the attack. Whilst her mother and younger brother escaped from the rear of the home, Jonathan quickly located a terrified Renita, who believed she was about to be immediately executed. But apparently her ex-boyfriend had other plans for her first. Keeping her at gunpoint, he told her to grab her cell phone and begin a Facebook Live broadcast. At first, Renita had no idea why she would need to do something like that, but all slowly became clear when Jonathan began to demand she apologize to Taylor, his new girlfriend. In a terrifying public display of humiliation, Jonathan could be seen pointing the barrel of his rifle at the mother of three's head while he made her apologize over and over again for the perceived offense. She was terrified voice quivering as she complied. Meanwhile, Renita's mother was hiding in the backyard, having had the foresight to grab her cell phone before fleeing from the gunshots. With shaking hands, she hammered 911 onto her phone's touchscreen, then begged the dispatcher to send help in a hushed but terrified tone. Yet the police were far closer than she could have imagined, because Officer Brittany Mackey was actually within earshot of the gunfire. As soon as she heard the shots... She rolled up to St. Vincent Avenue at Natalie Street and got out of her vehicle with her pistol drawn. Jonathan Robinson looked up to see the cops arrive mere minutes after he'd burst into the home, and he was seething with rage. He immediately executed Renita as she kneeled on the floor below him, then walked out of the busted front door and began shooting at Officer Mackey. Using trees and parked vehicles as cover, Jonathan sent round after round of high-caliber rifle fire into the officer's patrol car, forcing her into cover. Mackie immediately got onto her radio and began calling in backup, with her colleagues actually hearing the sound of gunfire over the airwaves. She then got as low behind the back wheel of her patrol car as she possibly could, and prayed for swift reinforcements. Just two minutes later, that backup arrived in the form of Corporals Joshua Pettigrew and Greg Walker. They screeched up the street, coming to a stop just short of Officer Mackey's patrol car. The officers then jumped out of the vehicle, took cover behind the open doors, and sent a torrent of 45 caliber pistol bullets at Jonathan's firing position. The overwhelming firepower pushed him back into the house, and the two corporals lost track of their target. The next two cops on the scene were two special response team members, Corporals Landry Ducto and Michael Gerbine. The pair took off running for the other side of the street, but Jonathan opened fire once again, this time from a vantage point on the second floor of the house he was occupying. 
The air around them cracked and whizzed with 762 bullets, ricocheting off the concrete as they narrowly missed their targets. But luckily, neither officer was wounded. He's in a sniper position. He's in a sniper position, another officer can be heard screaming on a police cruiser's dash cam. Get down. Robinson had the supreme advantage of a concealed, elevated position coupled with high-caliber weaponry, and for almost an hour, he kept every officer pinned down and unable to approach his position. They were so heavily outgunned that the only two shots that managed to fire were to disable the car Robinson left running in the driveway when he barged into the Williams home. Plus, the police had no idea where he was even shooting from and couldn't risk civilian casualties by peppering the entire home with bullets. To the officers pinned down at the scene, waiting for a full special response team to arrive seemed like an eternity. Eventually, a full police SWAT team was pushing up towards the house, preparing to breach and clear the entire structure to locate and eliminate the active shooter. Yet just as the team was cleared to breach, Jonathan indicates to those on scene that he wished to surrender. They hesitated and fell right into his trap. He opened fire on them first and sent a bullet smashing through SRT operative Robert Entrican's right wrist. I've been hit, Entrican cried over his radio. Officer hit. Another torrent of bullets are exchanged for a few moments before a sudden lull in the volume of fire. Then, to the surprise of the attending officers, Jonathan appeared to walk out of the busted front door again, only this time he was unarmed and he proceeded to lie down on the front lawn of the house in a show of surrender. The SR team rushed in, putting cuffs on the shooter before dragging him away. Renita's mother and brother are led away from the scene safely, but heartbreakingly, Renita had succumbed to her wounds before the EMTs could get to her. At his murder trial, Jonathan Robinson pled guilty to first-degree murder and admitted to investigators that he fired on police officers because he wanted to die. He narrowly escaped the death penalty by agreeing to a plea deal presented to him by prosecutors and was later sentenced to life in prison. A hundred years ago, a person would have to drag another into a busy street to perform a public execution, but nowadays all it takes is a few button clicks on a cell phone to have all your family and friends watching as you're executed in cold blood by some deranged killer. And such incidents can happen so fast that there's simply no way of preemptively or actively censoring them, no matter how hard Facebook might try. As long as there's a technology available that allows us to share all the intimate details of our lives, humanity seems to relish in sharing not just the good and positive, but also the darker, more terrifying things too. Stephen Nicholson's arrest as the main suspect in a violent, indecent assault and murder sparked off one of the UK's biggest evidence searches, which involved a trawl of thousands of hours of CCTV footage. He was the prime suspect in the murder of Lucy McHugh, and actually rented a room in her parents' home at the time of her murder. At one point, it looked like the British police might actually have to let him go due to lack of evidence, but in the end, it was a Facebook password that proved to be his ultimate undoing. After he was arrested, the police had just 96 hours to charge him with the murder, or he would have to be released. And given that it would take four weeks to get a key piece of DNA evidence analyzed and sent back to them, the clock was ticking to find something concrete that they could use to charge him with murder. The police subjected Stephen to vigorous questioning, and managed to get him to admit that Lucy had sent him a Facebook message on the night before she was killed. When pressed as to what that message said, he said she told him she was pregnant with his child. He intended this to be evidence that it couldn't possibly have been him that killed her, but when police asked him to hand over his Facebook password so that they could verify his claims, he refused to give it to them. This was his one big mistake. When asked why he refused to share the password with them, Stephen told officers that he was involved quite heavily with some narcotics dealers around his hometown and that revealing his messages would compromise them, possibly even causing them to take reprisals against him. But this didn't wash with investigating officers, who became convinced that the information contained within the account could be used against him. 
It also presented them with a marvelous opportunity. There were two options available to them, one being to seek the compliance of U.S. federal courts to get Facebook to hand over Stephen's passwords to them, but that would have taken way longer than just 96 hours, and by that time, Stephen would be freed. But the other was to make use of some terrorism legislation, what is known as Section 53 of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, colloquially called RIPA among police officers. This means that anyone who seeks to withhold information, such as computer passwords, during a serious crime investigation can basically be charged with obstruction of justice. Right when it looked like Stephen was going to be bailed, he was rearrested, and after pleading guilty to withholding evidence at Southampton Crown Court, he was jailed for 14 months. With that, the police managed to buy themselves more time to find evidence of his involvement in Lucy McHugh's murder. However, while there was plenty of circumstantial evidence that Stephen had killed Lucy, there was nothing to physically link the spot where Lucy's body was found to Nicholson. Whatever weapon he used to kill her remained unaccounted for, and police officers were unable to find any of his DNA at the scene. Once again, investigators were forced to focus on Stephen's so-called online footprint, this time seeking help from an experienced cloud data analyst to try to link Stephen to the scene of the crime. A cloud data analyst's job is to study various pieces of digital information sent from Nicholson's phone to data servers, which are owned by companies such as Google and Facebook. While tracing the phone's route on the day of Lucy's murder, the analyst happened to notice a small blip in an area of Southampton that the police had not yet searched. It suggested that Nicholson had, for whatever reason, deviated from his most direct route home. The diversion took him to a place known as Tanner's Brook, a stream which meanders through Southampton, weaving its way through some pretty dense woodland in the western portion of the city. Detective Superintendent Paul Barton later said to journalists, With the help of the analyst, what we discovered was a slight deviation on his telephone, which didn't match the story he'd given us. You could say it had jumped a mast, so to speak, and therefore put Stephen at the place where we discovered some bloody, discarded clothing. It was a great bit of work from the analyst who pointed it out. The subtle shift in the narrative given by the killer was enough for police to launch one of the largest ever fingertip searches, which involved almost 200 officers from 12 other police forces. By that point, it had been four weeks since Lucy's dead body was found, but on the first day of the search, police got the exact kind of breakthrough that they had been hoping for. They found a discarded plastic bag containing a blue bloodstained hoodie, along with a number of other items that were described in court as Nicholson's murder kit. The blue hoodie contained Nicholson's DNA, as well as Lucy's blood, with Stephen being thought to have dumped the clothing, some of which had been partially burnt, near the brook after getting changed on his return from the murder scene on July 25th. Prior to the discovery of the clothing, police had no other direct evidence of Nichols' involvement in her killing. They attested fibers from every bloodstained jacket and Stephen's clothes, which suggested direct contact with the hoodie, but that simply wasn't enough to actually charge him with a crime. Homicide detectives had already established that hoodies of the same type were sold to two people in the Southampton area, and that one of them was given a present to a man who knew a friend of Stephen's, the DNA evidence was the final nail in the coffin for Nicholson, according to Detective Superintendent Barton. During the course of the investigation, police officers had studied 11,000 hours of CCTV footage, examined over 2,000 pieces of physical evidence, and taken more than 300 written reports. A Herculean amount of work had given them a strong circumstantial case, but in the end, Genetic evidence was what the police really needed to prove that Stephen was Lucy's killer. But had Stephen not been jailed over refusing to hand over his Facebook password, the outcome could have been very, very different. The 14-month jail sentence not only bought the police a great deal of time, but it also potentially stopped Stephen from going back to Tanner's Brook to move the evidence he had dumped there. And it's frankly astounding that the killer of a child might well be walking the streets right now, if it wasn't for something as simple as a Facebook password. Public prosecutors were eventually granted access to Stephen's Facebook account on the first day of his murder trial, but found that he had deleted most of his messages before he was arrested. 
As it turned out, it didn't matter in the least bit if Stephen gave them the password. He still wouldn't be able to be charged based on the absence of the messages. If he'd only gone and given police the password, he might still be free to walk the streets. One of the prosecutors, a Mr. Montague, criticized the protracted process, saying that for him, the personal side, the human side, as we have a 13-year-old child that has been murdered under ferocious circumstances. And for me, it's somewhat frustrating that Facebook seems so unwilling to help with our investigation by recovering deleted messages. Facebook said it had worked closely with the investigating officers, but that they agree that this legal process can be far too slow. We have actively lobbied for reforms to EU, US, and UK laws to allow us and others to directly and more quickly provide information to UK law enforcement authorities, a spokeswoman for the company said. But despite the slow process, police have been able to build a case against an extremely narcissistic, self-centered, violent predator who had torn apart a family kind enough to put a roof over his head when they could have easily turned him away. He preyed on their underage daughter and when it looked like she might actually tell on him, he killed her. But at no point could he have expected that something as seemingly insignificant as his Facebook password would actually be the thing to put him behind bars. For a little background, the events of this story took place when I was 21 years old. I'm a male and have always been somewhat awkward. I was never in the popular crowd and never really found my clique in high school. I've also always been pretty bad at talking to girls and or asking them out. It's not that I'm really overly nervous, I just never really know the right thing to say or carry on the conversation. I have a twin sister who is the exact opposite. She was always popular, had a ton of friends, and was usually in a steady relationship. She was a bit of a social butterfly, and we used to joke around about how different we were from one another. It never really bothered me, and in fact, some of my fondest memories of my childhood was goofing around and poking fun at each other with my sister. Fast forward to when I was 21, right around Valentine's Day. I'm not sure if it was the constant cold weather, or the fact that my sister was hanging out with her boyfriend, but I was feeling especially lonely. I asked my sister if she would help me set up a dating profile on one of the thousand dating websites that are out there. We went through all of the criteria and gave it a few days to see if I got any responses. I received a few messages, but the conversations fizzled after a few exchanges back and forth. The day before Valentine's Day, I received a message from a girl who was extremely attractive and who wouldn't give me the time of day in high school. Her name was Gwen, which I very much liked because it reminded me of Gwen Stacy from the Spider-Man comics. She made talking very easy, which was awesome because I was never good at steering conversations. She laughed at my dry sense of humor and always kept the conversation going. Thinking she was possibly not who she said she was or perhaps a catfish, I asked her to video chat with me and she complied. I was shocked when it was really her, I mean, I couldn't believe it. We talked about a lot of things, the things you ask someone when you're getting to know them and clearly interested in. She eventually told me that I was one of the nicest people she had ever spoken to and that I was different than the other guys she had talked to or been with in the past. We eventually set up a plan for a date and to meet in person. When the day came, I picked her up, but not from her house. She said she had to work and I could pick her up downtown. I didn't think anything of it, so it didn't set off any red flags. We had a few drinks and then went to dinner. We had plans to go to the movies after dinner, but as I was paying the checks, she said, Let's go on an adventure. Confused what she meant by that, I asked her to clarify. She said in the bubbly voice I grew so accustomed and comfortable with, Let's go to Blue Lakes. They have the trails there and the moonlight will be on the lake. It'll be so romantic and way better than any movie. Nervous, but excited, I said, of course. But in my own mind, I liked the idea of the movies because I didn't have to worry about what to say and carry on a conversation. We drove to Blue Lakes, which is the name of this beautiful park in my hometown. It's not actually called Blue Lakes, but because the lake has a deep blue color, everybody in town calls it Blue Lakes. We got there at about 10pm and was starting to get nervous and felt like I was somehow going to mess things up. 
I texted my sister and told her where I was and asked her to give me some kind of advice on what to do or what to say. She didn't respond right away. Thanks, sis. There was a couple of cars in the parking lot, which was weird for the time of night, but I was trying to have fun. She said, Oh, don't be nervous about the cars. It's probably just some couple still celebrating Valentine's Day. She grabbed my hand and started walking toward one of the trails. She could have said anything at this point and I would have went along with her. She let go of my hand and walked on the trail beside the lake. She said very loudly, Wow, look how beautiful this place is. I thought it was kind of weird how loud she said it, but again, I didn't really care. While she was staring at the water, I checked my phone to see if my sister texted me back, and she did. It just said, get out of there now. Thoroughly freaked out and truly not sure why, I looked up from my phone at Gwen, who was standing right there with a smile on her face. What's wrong, Andrew? She said in a soft voice. I tried, but I couldn't answer. I had a hundred things running through my head right now. She said in a flirtatious voice, Don't you want to kiss me, Andrew? I finally had the courage to respond and said, I need to leave. Gwen laughed at me and said, Don't be shy, Andrew. We just got here. I turned around and tried to walk out of the trail and there were two guys standing there. I was frozen in fear, not sure why they weren't moving out of the way. Gwen came up behind me and whispered in my ear, Andrew, we're not leaving yet. My friends just got here. I tried to run, but two more guys ran from the other side and tackled me. I'm a pretty big guy, but I couldn't hold my own against four guys. They held me down, taking turns, punching and kicking me. It hurt, but the adrenaline from being scared kept me from being in intense pain. They tied me to a tree, stole my wallet, took my car keys and hit me a couple more times before leaving. Gwen took my phone and threw it in the lake. Within minutes of being there tied to the tree I saw flashing lights turn into the park. I screamed for help and the police found me tied to the tree. They helped me down and began questioning me when my sister arrived. Apparently as soon as I texted her she had called the cops and rushed over herself. She was at a party and a group of guys were there, saying that they were going to jump some loser at Blue Lakes. They had an entire plan to rob him and beat him up and leave him there. My sister had exclaimed to them that they were lame and jerks and walked away not really thinking about it until a couple of hours later when I texted her. Not taking any chances, she called the police. They were able to find one of the four guys, but the other three they couldn't find, and they also couldn't find this Gwen. All of her information online was fake, so they couldn't track her. My car had some minor damage and looked to have been used for drug usage. I only had minor injuries, including a concussion, a badly scraped arm, and some soreness from where I had been kicked. The thing that still haunts me and bothers me to this day is the motivation for this event. Was it really worth all the effort to beat a broke college kid for his wallet and his car? I had maybe a couple of hundred bucks on me and I cancelled my credit card immediately. It just seemed like a lot of time for a small payoff. Four years later I still have nightmares of that night. Even though the incident could have been worse, I still have mental scars from getting attacked by a group of strangers. I'm thankful one of them did eventually come to justice but there was a strong honor amongst these thieves because the authorities were never able to gather any further information out of him, and all the other individuals had sort of disappeared into obscurity. I have since found an amazing girlfriend and no longer live in my hometown. Hopefully since this story happened, dating websites have made an effort to authenticate their users, so things like this don't happen again. To all outside observers, it appeared that Dr. John Hamilton and his wife Susan had the perfect, loving marriage. In the 14 years of blissful union, John's passionate love for his spouse had led him to lavish her with expensive gifts and luxurious vacations, a brand new Porsche on their wedding day being just the beginning of a long list of romantically motivated purchases. 
But John wasn't just generous with his money. He was apparently generous of heart, too, and spent a great deal of time reminding Susan just how much he loved her in a variety of heartwarming ways. When Susan professed a yearning for employment, for a purpose outside of being a housewife, John gave her a job at his highly esteemed obstetrics and gynecology clinic in Oklahoma City. He was there for her in every way, and by all counts, they were a textbook case of romantic longevity. But that's what makes it all the more horrifying that on Valentine's Day of 2001, Dr. Hamilton's arrival at the family home kicked off a chain of events that would turn their perfect little world into a living nightmare. As you can imagine, in a marriage as loving as John and Susan's, Valentine's Day was held in high esteem. Every single year they were married, they exchanged gifts and cards, often having planned some kind of romantic rendezvous, be it dinner and a movie or a walk around a local park. But on Valentine's Day of 2001, John was needed in the operating room of his clinic, fairly early in the morning too. Any exchange of gifts would have to wait until his lunch break, but just as he had promised, John ducked out of the clinic as soon as he was able and drove home to spend a romantic half hour with his wife, after which he would have to return to another surgery. He called her name as he walked through the front door, but she didn't answer. John suspected that his wife might have some kind of surprise in store for him, and he felt a ripple of excitement run through him as he walked up the stairs towards the master bedroom. He called his wife's name again, but still there was no answer and it was then that something caught John's eye, lying on the floor of the second floor bathroom. It was Susan. She was in a crumpled, lifeless heap, with blood pooling underneath her. Paramedics were called to the scene, but Susan couldn't be revived. Those in attendance noted that she appeared to have been strangled with two of her husband's expensive silk neckties, but the blood on the bathroom floor was undoubtedly from the series of bloody head wounds she had due to repeated blunt force trauma, the wounds being so severe that parts of her brain were exposed while her face was completely unrecognizable. To his absolute horror, Dr. John Hamilton was the number one suspect in his wife's murder from the very beginning. Police have since publicly stated that there were many factors which led them to such a conclusion the first being that there was no sign of forced entry to the home. Whoever killed Susan had the keys to the residence. It was also a crime in which nothing of value was stolen, and one in which there were no bloody fingerprints left in the bathroom which had blood almost everywhere. This meant that there was a distinct chance that whoever killed Susan was extremely professional, incredibly lucky, or had the time and privacy to scrub the scene of incriminating evidence before the body was found. On top of that, while searching the home, police got their hands on a Valentine's Day card that Susan had written to John, presumably that year, and the message inside wasn't nearly as loving and cheerful as you might imagine. I bought this two weeks ago, so I guess maybe it doesn't seem as appropriate, but I do love you. Have a great day, Susan. The contents of the card raised a lot of questions concerning the state of the Hamilton's marriage, Evidently, it suggests that there had been some kind of incident or argument, one that had caused a degree of turmoil and somewhat soured the Valentine's feeling. As it later turned out, this incident involved Susan catching John making phone calls to a woman employed as a topless dancer. Police actually found hundreds of calls to this person on John's cell phone during their investigation and heard from close friends of Susan that she had confessed to considering a divorce. To the cops, the explanation seemed simple. John had murdered his wife to prevent her from running off with half of his money. But at his trial, much of the local community came out in support of Dr. Hamilton and refused to believe that the man was capable of such a horrific crime, especially given that the victim was his own beloved wife. But when the paramedics who attended the 911 call John made were questioned in court, the jury began to notice some disturbing inconsistencies in his story. Hamilton testified in court that after he contacted emergency services, he had gotten to work trying to perform CPR on his wife's bloodied corpse. And this appeared to be true as the paramedics confirmed that when they arrived, John had been performing chest compressions. 
but as people who perform CPR on an almost daily basis, the paramedics noticed something peculiar about John's technique. It was incredibly ineffective. From a regular person with no first aid training, that could be understandable, but, but John was so bad that it almost looked like he wasn't actually trying to revive Susan at all, which for a medical professional is very suspicious. John also claimed that he had tried performing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on his wife, but the paramedics claimed that John had no blood on his mouth or face when they arrived. There was so much blood around the victim's head that there was no way John could have performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth and not gotten any on him. Some of Susan's blood was also found on the steering wheel of Dr. Hamilton's car, and despite his claim in court that he had simply moved the vehicle to make room for emergency vehicles, a prosecutor was able to make use of the overall suspicion to claim that this was evidence that John had been considering an escape attempt. At one point during the trial, the prosecution's case against Dr. Hamilton appeared to be floundering. Hamilton's defense attorney had brought a number of key character witnesses to testify in court, and all had built a picture of John as nothing but a loving husband, and he believed that the nail in the prosecution's coffin would be the testimony of a crime scene investigator named Tom Bevel, an expert on blood splatter at crime scenes. Bevel was essentially brought in to confirm that the blood splatter on Dr. Hamilton's shirt, the same one he was wearing during his attempt at CPR, was consistent with a man simply trying to revive his murdered wife while in a state of extreme panic and grief. At first, Tom Bevel did indeed testify that much of the blood splatter could well have been from the doctor's attempts at CPR, but as it turned out, Bevel had noticed something that other investigators had overlooked. He had made note of the small flecks of blood that could be found on the inside of Hamilton's right sleeve, a pattern he had seen many times before on the clothing of people who had killed someone with a blunt object. In the seconds that followed, the courtroom was deathly silent. An expert defense witness had testified against the person they were supposed to be defending, and in just a few words... Tom Bevel had condemned Dr. Hamilton to prison. When later asked why he had made the decision to essentially act as a witness for the prosecution, Bevel claimed he just had to tell the truth. He said he had sworn on oath something that override any allegiance he may have had to his client. After that, it only took two hours for a jury of his peers to find John Hamilton guilty on the charge of first-degree murder, or after a judge sentenced him to life in prison. Those that followed the case were highly disturbed by the sudden turn of events. John had, and still does, maintain his innocence even to this day, but more and more evidence points to the idea that he killed his wife in cold blood. His defense team even floated the idea that he must have been innocent because the guilty timeline would mean that John went to work and performed flawless surgeries right after murdering the love of his life. This might well be true, but in the light of the guilty verdict, it's all the more damning, because it suggests that Dr. John Hamilton was able to beat his wife's skull in on Valentine's Day, then remain calm and collected enough to go and perform complicated medical surgeries. And if it's true, then maybe a more fitting name for Dr. Hamilton would be Dr. Death. On a rainy Valentine's Day evening in February of 1971, 19-year-old Jesse McBain drove over to meet his girlfriend, Patricia Mann, at her college dormitory in Durham, North Carolina. They had arranged to celebrate their most romantic day of the year by attending a Valentine's dance at the nearby Watts Hospital. Patricia was studying nursing and her practical lessons took place at Watts, so as a potential future member of the nursing staff there, she had managed to land an invitation to the dance. At approximately 11.30, Jesse and Patricia had one last dance, said their goodbyes, and began to walk back to Jesse's car. They then drove over to a deserted housing development area that would later become the neighborhood of Crowsdale. No house had been constructed yet, but a few sections of road had been laid out in an area that was shrouded by a quarter mile's worth of greenery. Those that ventured down there were likely to find collections of beer bottles, cigarette butts strewn among the trees. It was a place people went to screw around, exactly the kind of private, out-of-the-way place the two young lovebirds might need to go to get a little alone time. Patricia's 1am curfew came and went, and 
Her friends back in the girls' dorm assumed she'd sneak back in at some point on her tiptoes, yet little did they know that they'd never see her or her boyfriend ever again. The following morning, Patricia still hadn't returned from her date with Jesse. This was the first time the young woman had ever broken her dormitory curfew, and those close to her were quickly beginning to worry. They knew Patricia to be a deeply mature and responsible young woman who always played by the rules and took authority seriously. And to their knowledge, Jesse was an affectionate, respectful boyfriend, one that Patricia seemed very much in love with. But not even youthful romance would be able to make the young nursing student break curfew. Slowly but surely, as the day progressed, the concern of Patricia's roommates went from mild to grave. What started with a few questions turned to them calling around local hospitals in case they'd been in a car accident. They then filed a missing persons report with the Durham County Sheriff's Department, but were still so anxious that they began to physically search for their missing roommate on foot. They roamed the surrounding area, canvassed her usual hangout spots around town and on campus, until someone had the idea to go search the Lover's Lane over at the housing development. It was here that the searchers would find Jesse's empty car parked in one of the quieter spots on the development. The car was locked, and on the back seats there were two warm coats, presumably belonging to Jesse and Patricia. And there was no damage to the car. Everything about the scene seemed perfectly in order, except of course for the fact that the last two people to travel in it seemed to have vanished from the face of the earth. By this point, local police have informed both Jesse and Patricia's parents that their children are missing. At first, all involved had entertained the idea that the couple's disappearance was nothing more than a misguided but romantic attempt to elope, to skip town, get hitched, and settle down somewhere new. But investigating police quickly began to realize that there was something distinctly sinister about the case. There had apparently been no attempt by either Jesse or Patricia to inform anyone of their plans, not even close friends. And the idea that neither would at least leave a note or letter to a relative seemed highly unlikely. Over time, those closest to Patricia began to assume the worst. I just got the sickest feeling in my stomach, said a cousin of Patricia's. I just knew something terrible had happened. For two weeks after they were declared missing, a team of police officers and local volunteers mounted an intensive search of the surrounding area. Combing through the wooded areas around Lover's Lane for any trace of the missing couple, they followed up lead after lead and tip after tip, but no one could find hide nor hair of Jesse or Patricia. With frustration mounting, police decided to widen the range of the search area and enlist the help of helicopter support and specifically trained forensic divers. But in the end, it was the misfortune of a surveyor in nearby Orange County that provided the police with their most important lead. On February 25, 1971, a full 12 days after Jesse and Patricia went missing, Robert Kirby is walking along a dirt road in the backwoods of Orange County, North Carolina, when something catches his eye. Among the trees, maybe 50 meters or so off the trail, the surveyor thinks he sees what appears to be the limb of a mannequin lying among the fallen leaves. Curious, he wanders over to check it out, but the distinct shape of a human leg he sees is not that of a plastic mannequin. It's real human flesh. He rushes to a nearby roadside diner to have someone call the police, and by the end of that, forensic investigators discovered not one, but two human corpses up in the woods of Orange County, and they turned out to belong to none other than Jesse McBain and Patricia Mann. Finding the young couple and decomposing was bad enough for the searchers, but the manner in which they'd obviously been dispatched of was massively disturbing to them. The couple had their hands tied, and then were made to stand back against a tree so another, larger rope could be wrapped around them. Once their killer had secured them in place, he began to torture them. Jesse's ear and mouth were both found to have blood in them, and a variety of large and small abrasions to his lips and forehead suggested he was beaten senseless before he was killed. At some point, Jesse and Patricia's killer had ripped their eyelashes off before continuing to savagely beat them. Then, when whoever had tied them up had grown tired of beating them, 
They wrapped rope collars around their necks, using a kind of knot that could be repeatedly tightened over and over again. We can only assume that the killer used these rope collars to slowly choke the life out of Jesse and Patricia, gradually tightening the rope collars over a drawn-out period of time until neither was able to breathe. Each of the couple's bodies had all of their valuables intact too. Jesse was still wearing an expensive wristwatch and a class ring when his body was found. Patricia was also wearing jewelry and her purse was left back in the abandoned car. Their deaths were not part of some robbery. Their killer has absolutely no monetary gain in mind when he'd taken them. Neither were there any signs of indecent assault on Patricia. She had a great deal of bruising around her face and neck, but nothing below the waistline. There was no ulterior motive. All their killer had wanted to do was torture and kill. The investigation that followed was severely hampered by different agencies' complete lack of collaboration. For example, the FBI seemed to consider the local sheriffs as frankly beneath them, and a feeling of contempt quickly grew between the two groups. Everybody worked on the case as individuals, as Detective Tom Horn once put it. Not a lot of information was being shared by the various agencies, and the rivalry was tremendous. A lot of work was done, but... It was individual, so there were definitely some missed opportunities. Yet even with the appalling level of disorganization that pervaded, a number of likely suspects emerged as a result of some tip-top police work. Some had to be ruled out after taking polygraph tests which proved their innocence, but one of the men who failed was actually a doctor at Watts Hospital who had previously worked with Patricia Mann. When the police sought to question him again, he completely refused to cooperate and would only release a statement through a defense attorney he began to keep on retainer. This made him the number one suspect in the entire case, and to this day there's never really been anyone else who's garnered such legitimate scrutiny. But without the proper evidence to charge him, very little action was taken against any of the supposed killers. No one ever really zeroed in on anyone, Detective Horn stated, and as a result, the case quickly went cold. Forty-three years later in 2014, Detective Tim Horn was still working for the Orange County Sheriff's Department when a cousin of Patricia's, Carolyn Spivy, contacted him with some fresh information regarding her cousin's murder. Along with his partner at the time, Detective Horn opened up the previously closed case file, poring over old statements in boxes and evidence. They reanalyzed the possibilities of former suspects, considered new ones, and began to condense as much of the multi-agency information as possible into the pursuit of one solid suspect, and they succeeded. Detective Horn then contacted almost every single one of the detectives who worked on the case back in 1971, and gathered them together for a presentation. It was one which would show them how he'd pieced together multiple pieces of a decades-long puzzle, only to come to one solid conclusion, that it was the Watts doctor a man Patricia had actually known, that had murdered her and her boyfriend, Jesse. When the presentation was finished, what followed was a prolonged silence. To all in attendance, Tom Horn's hard work had presented them the best opportunity yet to end a mystery that had persisted for almost half a century. They had their suspect, they had evidence, now it was time to make their move. Using what's known as MVAC, Detective Horn was able to extract a DNA sample from the knotted ropes used to tie up and strangle Jesse and Patricia. An MVAC is basically a wet vacuum DNA collection system that is designed to extract strands of DNA from difficult to reach places. Places just like the fibrous folds in a length of rope. What came back was a DNA sample that didn't match either Jesse or Patricia and so in all likelihood it belonged to the killer. Detective Horn then requested a DNA sample from their number one suspect, the Watts doctor that Patricia had worked with. Horn's argument was that, after all this time, the doctor would finally be able to clear his name and prove that it wasn't him that executed the young couple. But the doctor refused, having his defense attorney contact law enforcement to release a statement in legalese, and that might just be the most suspicious thing about our doctor, because it really does raise the question of what he has to hide. Yet despite such obvious suspicion, 
this doctor has never been charged, and whatever new evidence led to him being asked to provide a DNA sample hasn't been shared with the public. We can only assume the Durham County Sheriff's Department are in the process of putting a serious case against the man and are trying to find some way of forcing him to give a sample of his DNA. And with that DNA sample, law enforcement might just be able to end this 40-year-old mystery of who could be cold and cruel enough to wrench a loved-up young couple away from one of the happiest nights of their lives, only to torture and eventually execute them in a secluded wooded area turning a romantic Valentine's night into the very last that each of them would spend on Earth. This story happened a long time ago when I was about seven. I don't think I have ever told it to anyone, and it was a very short incident, but it's been in the back of my mind ever since. Typically, my cousins would babysit me and my sister during summer and winter breaks. They were about 10 years older than us, maybe 15 to 17 at the time. One day, about a week before Christmas, they took us to the mall to do some shopping. This is one of the largest malls in my area, and it was usually always very crowded, even more so during Christmas time. The day went fine, and they even bought me a small ball, which I started playing around with by bouncing it on the floor and catching it as I walked. Because of this, I was walking behind them, distracted in my own world. After we had finished shopping, we exited through the main doors, which were the most crowded, and just as we were crossing the street to go into the parking lot, some guy, my guess would be about 40 plus years old, grabbed me by the hand and started pulling me to a van right across the street. I remember the van very clearly. It was one of those conversion vans popular in the 90s with drapes on the window, red with thin gray stripes running through the sides, and van doors. One of the back seat doors was open and you could see a woman sitting on the driver's seat. She was about the same age as the guy and you can tell that the engine was running. At the time I didn't really know what was going on. I just thought it was weird in a sort of funny kind of way. Why is this guy grabbing me? As I remembered, I thought he just got confused and grabbed me by accident thinking I was his son or something. So I shot in my cousin's name and she quickly looked my way. She was just a few steps ahead and as soon as she sees me she runs to me, quickly grabs my arm with both hands and starts shouting as loud as she can. It wasn't until I saw her freak out face that I realized that something bad was happening. As soon as she grabbed me the guy just lets go, gets in the van and they drive away. They didn't really tell the cop or call mall security. They were teens so my guess is that they didn't really know what to do. They were just happy nothing happened. As I said, this was a very crowded day. As I got older and reflected more on what happened that day, I would understand more and more the severity of the situation. I wonder what would have happened if my cousin hadn't heard me calling her name within all that noise and multitude that was crossing the street with us. I wasn't even shouting out at the top of my lungs, I just called out her name rather calmly. So I was very lucky that day. But later that year a kid was kidnapped in a local park. It was a very famous case that made headlines all around the county. They never found the kid, and I've always wondered if it could have been the same guy. My grandfather suffered from Alzheimer's disease and passed away two days before Thanksgiving. My grandmother is now living alone, so my mom has spent a lot of time over there keeping her company and helping her out around the house. She went to her house on Christmas to go with my grandmother to church before the rest of the family got there, and while my grandmother was getting ready, my mom was in the kitchen on her phone checking Facebook. Out of nowhere, this old Christmas music box in one of the bedrooms started playing by itself. It was the very last part of the melody to Silent Night, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. It played that one line at normal speed and just stopped before it could loop. I'm a skeptic, and no music boxes can do this for various reasons, but hearing that it only played that one line makes me want to believe that it was my grandfather letting his family know that he was at peace and no longer suffering. Just wanted to share this story because even if it's just the mechanism becoming unjammed, it gave my mom a feeling of peace and relief when it happened. Either way, the story both touched and freaked me out at the same time. Hearing that would have given me goosebumps.
I'm currently 18 and my dad passed away in an accident when I was very little in 2005. A couple of years ago on Christmas, my brother, mother, and me were watching a corny Christmas movie on Netflix for the fun of it. It was the 1998 version of Jack Frost, where a father dies in an accident but comes back to life as a snowman to be with his kid. In the other side of the room we were in, my mom had an iPod that was hooked up to a speaker. Near the end of the film, there was a scene where the dad acknowledges that he has to pass on and tells his family he loves them as he starts to melt. During this exact scene, the iPod somehow turned on by itself and started playing loud music, which startled us a little. We were kind of silent for a while after that, and we've never since talked about it. I think I can only remember it happening one time other than that, which was in the middle of the night while everyone was sleeping. Maybe it's a coincidence, but it's pretty odd that it happened at that exact moment on Christmas. We've moved multiple times since his death, too and that happened in a relatively new apartment. If it was him, it was a pretty sweet thing for him to do. This story happened to my brother, and it's told from his perspective. On Halloween of 2017, I went trick-or-treating with my friends who I'll call Harvey, Michael, and Daniel. We were all around 14 to 15 years old, and really just wanted to make the most of Halloween. As we had so much homework starting the 10th grade, and we probably would never be able to trick or treat again. Anyway, we were all walking down this random street at like 9.30, when we saw one house with insane over the top Halloween decorations that looked like it cost up to about $500. The four of us walked up to the house and rang the bell. Some 50 year old looking man opened the door and said, no need to yell. Just come on in and you'll get your sweets. Daniel told the guy, well, asked the guy, can you just bring the candy out here? The guy didn't even answer. And so the four of us just walked away, not saying a single word. But of course, this story wouldn't be scary if it didn't end here. We were walking down my street when Harvey pointed out, guys, that man is following us. We all looked out behind us and saw the same 50 year old looking man walking about 25 feet behind us. The four of us bolted all the way to the house. We ran to my house, we thrust open the front door, entered my house and locked the door. The four of us were just hyperventilating as if we just ran an ultra marathon. I was starting to settle down when Jason said, look at the window. We all looked and there he was the old man looking through one of my windows. My parents were on a vacation and my brother was at his friend's Halloween party so we couldn't tell them. But what really made this horrifying was that I could see this guy holding a gun in his hand. I yelled at my friends and we ran upstairs to call the police. The officers arrived in about 10 minutes. The man wasn't on my property anymore, but we remembered the house, so that's where we went. The cops went there searched the whole place, and came out with the man in chains. It turned out the house was vacant and the man was a serial killer who escaped from prison a month ago. If my friends and I are able to go trick-or-treating again, we're avoiding the street that this house was on. And who knows what that guy was really going to do if we went in. I'm glad this happened when we were teenagers and not when we were nine years old. All I can say is if you're trick-or-treating, Make sure that the house owner is completely normal. It was my 11th birthday on March 2nd, 2012. I was a big fan of Selena Gomez and I wanted one of her CDs for the radio my grandpa had bought me a few months prior. Anyways. My grandpa took my sister and I to Target after he got out of work to buy me a Selena Gomez CD I've been begging for. At this time, Target in my area had a small food court with a snack bar with Pizza Hut in it, which I always got when I went shopping there. My grandpa, and sister and I, we all order our miniature pizzas, you know, the personal pans. Then we sat down at the table with our food, which happened to be right by the register. After the worker gave us our pizzas, they headed to the back to clean up, I assume. So it was just my grandpa, my sister, and I in the food court. 
Everything was good for about five to 10 minutes while we were eating. But then I noticed my grandpa who was sitting across from my sister and I looked behind me. He moved his eyes side to side as if he was watching somebody. I, with my heart racing because I was so confused, turned around and that's when I seen the most disgusting and creepy looking man I've ever seen in my life. He was tall, maybe about six foot two to six foot four. He was partially bald, had dirty stained clothes and he smelled like pee. He was right behind me, going back and forth eyeing my grandpa. And that's when my grandpa started to yell at the guy telling him to get away. My grandpa then stood up and said, if you don't get away from my granddaughters, I'm going to make you get away. And that's when the guy backed up and he just stared. My sister and I then got up and we quickly rushed over to the other side of the table where my grandpa was. We started to walk away and that's when I heard the guy say, you're very beautiful. Where are you from? You must be from the islands like Fiji or something like that. I turned around and he was looking straight at me. Then he pointed and said, Yeah, you pretty girl. That's when my eyes got wide and my grandpa rushed my sister and I down the aisle to get away from this guy. He was following right behind us saying his name, along with his address telling me that I could come visit him sometime. My grandpa kept a hold of my sister and I making us go down different aisles to lose him. When we finally did, we quickly purchased the CD and went out to the car. When we got into the car, my grandpa was driving out of the parking lot and we saw the guy walk out of the store looking around like he was looking for us, or specifically looking for me. He didn't see us, as we were already driving away. But I was completely terrified because that was something I've never experienced in my life before. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but I seen that guy one more time after that. Two years later, when I was 13, again, I was with my grandpa, but it was just him and I. We were leaving my grandparents' house, and we got into the car to head to the mall. As we were at the end of our street, we seen the guy again, walking down the street. I stared at him wide-eyed, and we made eye contact, which made my heart drop in fear. He then immediately started to scream as soon as he saw me and tried to run after the car as my grandpa drove off, but of course he didn't catch us. Later on, we got back to my grandparents' house. I had found out there was an insane asylum right down the street from my grandparents' house at the time, which is where we believed he lived, since the address he gave matched the address to the place. I'm 19 now, and I never saw that guy after the last time when I was 13, and I'm really glad I didn't because he was seriously ill. This story happened to me about eight years ago when I was in the second grade. I was around six or seven years old at the time and I wasn't really popular with the other second graders. I was always the odd one out with about one to three friends or sometimes less. This meant I was usually on my own after and during school. This one incident happened at the end of the day when everyone was starting to go home. What I would do is I would wait inside the gate of my school until I saw my mom's car pull up. Then I would walk over to her car and she would take me home. On this day though, this car that looked exactly like my mom's pulled up in front of the school. So I walked up to it and almost opened the door. But then I saw the driver and realized that it wasn't my mom's car at all. There was a bald Hispanic looking man inside the car. Average height with jeans on, with a brown tank top who appeared to be in his mid 30s. He saw me and apologized for almost getting into his car and started walking back to the school when he said, hey, I can take you home if you want. I said no thank you and that my mom would come soon, but he just didn't let up. He kept insisting that I go with him, but I said no over and over again. He also said that he notices that my mom usually shows up late, so he must have been watching me for a while. Eventually, he just got so fed up, he just decided to reach out of his car window and grab me. I don't know why, but for some reason, I didn't cry or scream. I just sort of silently freaked out and started scratching the man's arm. The moment I drew blood, he gave up, let go, and drove off. 
I never told anyone about the man for some reason. I really don't know why. When I finally told my mom about this story a few days ago, she said I could have saved some other poor child from potentially being kidnapped, molested, or killed had I spoken up. And now I feel terrible. Needless to say, I never saw him again after that. My mind kind of repressed this memory for the longest time until I just remembered it recently. And now that it's fresh in my mind, I can't stop thinking about it and what he could have done to me had I got in his car. And I always wonder how long he was actually watching me. My name is Brad and this story happened about two years ago. I had recently started a new job and made a few casual friends quite quickly. One day at work, my friend George said he was having a house party on the weekend and invited me to come along. I accepted his invitation. That weekend, I drove to George's house party. I recognized a few faces, but most of the people that were there were his friends outside of work. I wasn't drinking alcohol that night as I was driving, and also I'm not much of a drinker anyway, so I was drinking soft drinks all night. At one point, a man approached me. He was wearing a scruffy leather coat, had a shaved head, bad teeth, and was quite small. He looked a lot older than most of the people at the party. He introduced himself as Jerry and said he was a friend of George's. We talked for a little bit, but the conversation was quite awkward for the most part. I finished my cup and said excuse me as I was going to get another refill. Jerry offered to get it for me, so I accepted his offer and gave me another drink. He came back and we carried on talking. However, it wasn't long until I started to feel sick and dizzy. And it was getting quite late, so I thought I would head home. I said goodnight to George and headed outside to my car. As I approached my car, Jerry called my name and jogged over to me. He asked if I could give him a lift home. I said sure and Jerry got in the back seat. I found it weird that he sat in the back seat and not in the front. But I was more focused on going home. After driving for about two minutes, I started to feel worse, more dizzy and lightheaded. I heard Jerry unbuckle his seatbelt and unzipped his pants. I saw him in the mirror when he was leaning forward towards me. I was about to ask him what he was about to do, but I heard a police siren behind me, signaling for me to pull over. As soon as I stopped the car, I opened the door and threw up on the side of the road. A police officer approached me and told me he pulled me over because he suspected that I was driving under the influence. He also asked why my friend exited the vehicle and ran off. I asked the officer what he meant. He told me as soon as I stopped the car, the man in the back seat opened the door and ran off into the night. I was feeling like crap to think too much about it, but the officer wanted to give me a breathalyzer. I accepted it as I knew for a fact that I hadn't been drinking, and the results came back negative. The officer asked why I was driving that way, swaying back and forth. I told him I had just come from a party and I didn't feel well, so I wanted to head home. The officer looked at me for a moment and then asked how well I knew the person that was in my car. I told him I didn't really know him. I just met him that night and was giving him a lift home. The officer then said he suspected that the man had spiked my drink. It was probably about to assault me. It made sense, and I told him that before I pulled over, he unbuckled his seatbelt and pants and was leaning forward. The officer said he would send out a patrol looking for the man who was in my car. He was very kind and trusted me when I told him that I felt fine and I can drive home. So he let me go. The next day I told George what had happened to me and asked if he knew Jerry. George told me he didn't know anyone named Jerry but he said he would ask around if anyone knew Jerry or recognized my description of him. Unsurprisingly, no one knew him. I often think how lucky I am that the police officer was there and caused Jerry to flee from my car, proving that Jerry had malicious intentions. Otherwise, who knows what might have happened to me that night. Be careful who you pick up. Be careful when you drive around at night. About two years ago, I had trouble sleeping and would get these really bad headaches. I spoke to a friend of mine about it and he suggested that I should go for a night drive as it helped him when he was stressed out. I started to go on night drives whenever I was having trouble going to sleep. One night I was driving and it was very foggy and lightly raining. I looked in my mirror 
and in the distance, I could see headlights. It was a bit unusual to see a car at the time of night, but it wasn't anything suspicious. The headlights faded away and I couldn't see them anymore. About a minute later, all of a sudden, the headlights were back and right behind me driving very aggressively, beeping their horn. I slowed down to let them pass me, but they didn't. They kept tailgating me. So I decided to pull over and see what their problem was, but when I stopped the car, they drove straight past me and disappeared down the road into the fog. I took a breath and then carried on driving. About five minutes went by and I saw headlights in my mirror again. I didn't think it would be the same car as they had just passed me. But when the headlights sped up and were right behind me, once again beeping their horn and tailgating me aggressively, I knew it was the same car as before. I didn't understand why they were acting this way and how they were now behind me even though they drove past me. I didn't pull over this time. Instead, I carried on driving. The driver of the car carried on tailgating me and beeping their horn constantly, just like before. But it wasn't long before the car lost control and swerved off the road and crashed into a tree. After seeing the car crash behind me, I stopped my car abruptly. I hesitated whether or not to get out and check to see if the person was okay. They seemed to be out to cause harm, cause me harm specifically, but I couldn't leave the area knowing someone might be hurt. I turned my car around and drove up to the tree where the car crashed. When my headlights reached the tree, there was nothing there. There was no car, no tire tracks, nothing. I started to think I was losing my mind and not getting enough sleep. I headed home after finding nothing. The following day, I told my friend where I was driving and what I experienced. He laughed and said I might have seen a ghost. I thought he was joking, but he told me the road I was driving on was known as Death Road. I asked him why it was called that. And he told me, apparently, years ago, a drunk driver was aggressively trying to knock a car off the road until he lost control and crashed. He died at the scene. I'm not a person to believe in ghost or supernatural stuff. But what I witnessed was so real, and the fact that I could hear the car right behind mine and hear the crash makes me believe I did experience something paranormal that night. My name is Ken, and the other day I was watching videos on YouTube. One of them was why people experience paranormal activity or feel like they live in a haunted house. One of the reasons that people experience things supernatural or paranormal is for a punishment of an action you did or didn't do. I found it interesting because about four years ago, I had a very strange and frightening experience. The job I worked for was changing things around and it asked me to work later. So for a short period of time, I was driving home late night every night. One night when I was driving, it was cold, raining, and I was very tired. I wasn't used to the late nights just yet. As I was driving, I noticed a hitchhiker on the side of the road with his hand out asking for a ride. I never picked up a hitchhiker and didn't plan to then. In my mind, it was too dangerous. So I drove past him. I didn't look back at all. A few miles down the road, I saw another hitchhiker. It was like it was the same person that I drove past, but this time they weren't holding out their hand. I was having trouble keeping my eyes open, so I stopped at the next gas station I found to get an energy drink. I went inside the gas station, grabbed the energy drink, and stood at the counter waiting for the cashier to come back, wherever he was. As I was waiting, I looked outside and it looked like the hitchhiker was standing in the parking lot looking towards the gas station. At that point, the cashier came to the counter, and when I looked back outside, the hitchhiker was gone. I thought I just needed some sleep. I got in my car and carried on driving home. About five minutes passed when I saw the same hitchhiker standing on the side of the road. I looked in the mirror and briefly saw a man in the back seat watching me. This scared me and made me jump so much I nearly lost control of the car. I stopped the car, got out, and checked the back seat and saw no one. I stood there trying to calm down and catch my breath. After calming down, 
I got back in my car and continued driving. The whole ride home, I was afraid to look in my mirror. Even though I didn't see that man again, I still felt him sitting there watching me. I never came up with a logical explanation of what I experienced that night. Before watching that video about paranormal crap, I always thought it was my lack of sleep that caused me to see things. But now I think what I was seeing was that man on the road and in my car was some kind of punishment for not picking him up. So this happened about a year ago. I know it because it was around Valentine's Day and I'd spend the week leading up to it just dreading it. Stalking my ex on Instagram and generally just felt pretty terrible about myself. We'd split up a few months earlier and she kept the flat we'd lived in, seeing as she did most of the work finding it. Her friend moved in and I moved out. It was a simple but painful arrangement. I ended up finding a flat for myself way out on pretty much the outskirts of the city. I don't know if you've ever been to London, but flat prices are stupidly high, and if you want anywhere that's more than just a bed and a toilet, you have to abandon any hope of living remotely central. So the Valentine's Day season came around, and one weekend I was feeling fairly sorry for myself, working my way through a bottle of Prosecco. I should have really been sharing when I made the decision. I changed the radius on all my dating apps to be as small as possible and tried to see if I could get a Valentine's date lined up. Half the time you matched with someone and they'd reveal that they were on the other side of London to you and your attempt to organize a drink would fall through. It's too far or I don't have time tonight, maybe next week were phrases you'd hear all the time. So I'm not the most attractive guy. I think I'm honest enough with myself to say that and... I have a pretty good gauge of when someone I've matched with seems too hot to be real. Usually my hunches confirm when they send me a message advertising some Russian dating site in the first minute. Anyway, I meet Becca, who seems lovely, and very much in my league, and who lives actually not too far from me. We agree to go for a drink at the Crown the day before Valentine's Day, so as not to have the awkward expectation of anything extra romantic which is pretty much the local for anyone who lives near my overground stop, and I'm pretty excited to be honest. She seems pretty funny. Maybe not wife material, but we get along and for a while the thought of my ex off on her own Valentine's Day seems a lot less unpleasant. So, date night comes and I have my usual beer or two before for a bit of Dutch courage and head off to the crown. I send her a message to let her know that I'm on the way and she says cool, she's almost there. It's a little dark out and there's a thin mist of rain but I shrug it off. It is London after all. The walk to the pub doesn't usually take too long. You have to navigate loads of little back streets that ends up slowing you down a whole bunch and I spend a little extra time to avoid some alleyways just because I've heard stories about people getting mugged around here. But I arrive to the crown only a bit late and send her a message apologizing as I get in. She replies pretty quickly. Instantly, almost. Shoot, she says. Didn't get a chance to message you. There's a bunch of guys in there for someone's birthday, and they're being really rowdy, making me a little uncomfortable. I've nipped over to a restaurant down the road to see if they might have space for us. I mean, she's not wrong. There are a bunch of guys in here being loud and obnoxious, and I guess if you were a small woman, it would make you pretty uncomfortable. Not only that, but a group are smoking outside and jeering, and I could see how you wouldn't want to hang around outside for long. She sends me the restaurant's name and tells me to hurry. They'll save a table for us if I'm quick. This is where I get a little concerned. We never agreed to dinner. Not only that, but when I put in Google Maps, the location gives me two routes. One is pretty quick, and the other adds an extra ten minutes onto your walk time. Easy. The only issue is the shorter route goes right through this old estate that's semi-abandoned. I say semi because although I'm sure people live there, I'm not sure who, and half the buildings are boarded up. I take one look at it and decide that there's no way I'm going through there. There are barely any street lights, if any, and I can barely make out much more than a few dark shapes. 
I decide to take the longer way around and apologize to her but let her know that I'll be a little later. She replies instantly again and tells me that I need to come now and that I should just be as quick as possible. I don't like her tone and tell her there's no way I'm walking through the old estate at night. Now I'm beginning to feel really uncomfortable and am aware of how alone I am on this route. Whilst it passes by several houses and shops, there's no one actually on the street itself. There aren't many people out on the night before Valentine's Day and, come to think of it, I've got no idea why the restaurant would be so full in the first place. I get that funny feeling in my stomach where you know something's wrong but can't quite put your finger on it. And for some reason, I walk in the middle of the road for the last stretch. I think maybe I felt a little safer there, or at least in my head I think I'd be able to see anyone who came towards me. Thankfully, no one did. I did manage to freak myself out a little, catching my reflection in shop fronts and car windows, and have to make a conscious effort to not look at them because I know I'll only freak myself out more. I'd have turned right around, but I realized that I was actually closer to the restaurant than the original pub, and at this point I just wanted to see another friendly human face. I sped up my walking slightly, made sure to text a couple of friends just to be safe. All this time I'm walking, she's messaging me telling me just to hurry up and that the shortcut's fine, she literally just took it. But as soon as I mention I'm almost at the restaurant, she stops replying, just like that. One moment she's telling me to hurry and the next, as soon as it's clear I'm not going to use the shortcut at all, she's gone. Well, they're gone, I suppose. No way of knowing who it was. I get inside and like I suspected, the place is fairly empty. It's definitely not booked out. And when I ask if the waiter's seen any woman like Becca asking about a table, he shakes his head. Not tonight, he tells me. Only a couple of families and an older couple. I think about texting whoever was claiming to be Becca, but even opening the conversation gives me the creeps. The idea that there's a couple of days worth of chatting there, of whomever was on the other end pretending for whatever reason to be a normal person, gives me the chills. It's strangely weirder to think of someone that creepy pretending to be normal in a weird way. I think about walking back using the road, but I realize, looking out the window of the restaurant, that whoever was pretending to be Becca knows my exact location. They'll know I arrived and found out they were lying. I think about the fact that they might be watching me from somewhere, my silhouette in the window, and I ask if I can have a table whilst I order an Uber home. Even during the ride home, I hate the idea of my face near the window, and I try to lean into the middle seat. I get the driver to drop me as close as possible to my house, and my heart races the whole walk home. I never told them my address exactly, but the idea that they know the area I live in is enough to make me start looking at flats on the other side of the city. I think, as soon as I can, I'm going to move. Christmas of 2016 was the most horrifying and worst day of my life. My cousin was hosting a huge house party really a Christmas party to celebrate the holiday on Christmas Eve. All of his friends, some of my friends, and almost the whole family were there. It was the biggest and most insane party I've ever seen. We were all above 21, with the exception of a few kids, so a lot of us were just drinking our asses off and becoming more drunk. There were so many of us just yelling and constantly crashing into things, and others were already passed out on the couches. I went upstairs to play video games with some of my friends, and then I got more drunk while playing. So drunk, I had to stop on one of my friend's recommendation. I personally was so drunk, I didn't realize this random girl was sitting in the living room who I didn't know. I eventually did realize after I sobered up the next morning. I do remember her walking up to me and telling me things I don't remember at all. But whatever she did tell me led to her grabbing my arm and pulling me outside the house toward a white van. I got in the passenger seat and she got in the driver's seat. I passed out in the van a few minutes after getting in. I woke up to find myself in the van, but on an unfamiliar road. I asked her where are we going. She told me that we were going to her house because she wanted to spend the night with me. I looked through the back window and saw my cousin's BMW telling behind us. I quickly realized what was happening and asked the girl to pull over. And I told her that I had to throw up. 
I jumped outside the van and ran to my cousin's car. I made sure to take a picture of the girl's van to get the license plate before getting in. We both sped away and my cousin explained everything. He said he wanted me to join him for a drinking session in his backyard with some of his friends. So he went looking for me. When the sister told him that I walked out with some random girl, he ran outside and saw a white van taking off with me in the passenger seat, passed out. So he got in his BMW and started tailing the van. The fact that this happened to me in the assumed safety of my cousin's house party, and that it actually worked on me, a 23-year-old guy, is what scares me the most. We called the police and showed them the picture of the van's license plate I took. They tracked the van to some abandoned subway station. Five cops went there and my cousin and I followed. We waited outside the station entrance and the officers went inside. Only 10 minutes later, the officers came out with the girl and three other large men in cuffs. They placed them in the cars and one officer searched the white van and the other four searched the whole station. What they found still disturbs me to this day. In the van, they found a bloody ax, chains and duct tape. In the station, they found four bodies and seven kidnapped young adults. Those two men were the killers. I still wonder to this day, where would I be now if my cousin had not saved me? I remember this was a few days into summer break. I was going away to Florida to be with my grandpa the week following, so my friends and I decided to hang out until it was time for me to leave. It was about five of us, three girls, two boys. For this story, I'll call them Miguel, Denise, Maria, and Eric. Miguel and Denise were twins, and the oldest of us, being 15. Maria and Eric were both 14, while I was the youngest at the time, being 12. They babied me a lot since I was the only one still in middle school, while the others were freshmen in high school. I remember it was a Thursday afternoon around 3 or 4. We were sitting on Eric's couch, and we'd been playing FIFA since school let out around 2.05, and Eric suggested that we go to the park. We all agreed bringing our baseball mitts, bats, and ball. The park was only about two blocks away from Eric's backyard. It had a nice-sized playground surrounded by climbable trees. There was a softball field just a few yards from the playground. There a small graveyard in a dense patch of woods. The scary thing is that there are three small private cemeteries along the side of the park, separated by a metal gate. We tend to ignore it a lot since you can't really see it unless you try to. We start our little game. We played about two innings, going into another one with Maria, being the most daring, says with an evil smirk on her face. Let's hop the fence to the graveyard. Miguel and Denise looked at her like she was out of her mind. Miguel asked, are you crazy? What if an undertaker is walking around and we get caught? Maria said, we're not going to get caught, just play it cool. We all were on the same boat for a few minutes. The sky was starting to get dark at this time. We dropped our bats and gloves and walked over some big sticks to the tall gate. Eric was the first one over being the tallest. Then it was Maria, then Miguel, then Denise. As mentioned before, I was the youngest, and I was the smallest. I was also terrified of heights. When all the others hopped over, I squeezed in through an opening of the bottom of the fence. We started to wander around, and not five minutes later, fireflies started to blink around us, and the air got sticky and muggy. The street lights on the block started to come on, though no lights shined in the graveyard. But we still played around catching the bugs and putting them on each other. I, being the daring, idiotic kid I was, I would do front flips off the gravestones. I know it was wrong, but we were considered troublemakers in our neighborhood. We laughed and joked around until Maria suddenly stopped. Look, she says, out in the far distance behind a big tree was something protruding from a small pile of leaves. It looked too weird to be a stick or an old log. I glance at my friends, seeing the curiosity on their faces. Maria starts toward the mysterious object with determination in her steps. We stayed behind, letting the girl explore. As she got closer, I could feel my nerves suddenly getting bad, like something was wrong about the whole situation. Everyone watched as she slows a bit, then stops abruptly right in front of the tree. She stays still for a few seconds, then proceeded with caution. I look over at my friends, 
who are also watching attentively. I started telling them that we should go, then all of a sudden, I was suddenly interrupted by a loud, blood-curdling scream coming from Maria. Eric immediately starts running full speed toward her, and we follow right behind him. My adrenaline was so high, I could hear nothing, but the faintness of our crunching footsteps and my loud heartbeat. My calves started burning as we approached the still screaming girl. Eric reaches her, looking at what she was looking at, and backed up. His eyes were wide in utter fear while we stared at the scene. The others and I stopped before getting too close, groaning and covering our noses. Once an unbelievable smell reaches our sense. Miguel asks what it was. Eric slowly looks at us, body trembling. No, 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 it's, it's not real, Maria said. Maria had turned her body away from whatever she was staring at, holding her stomach and retching loudly. I pushed past the other kids, keeping my eyes to the ground, and I made my way to the frightened pair. What I saw still hunts me to this day. The smell was stronger, almost making me throw up. But once my eyes processed what I was seeing, it's like I forgot how to function completely. It was the body of a white male nude with his body mangled. He was laying in an awkward position. I try my best to describe it, but his leg was bent at an unnatural angle and his arms were broken through the skin, folded behind his head. His face was covered in deep cuts infested with maggots and his whole body was drenched. I stood frozen, watching his maggots crawled on him and flies buzzing around his corpse. Honestly, I don't remember if I was breathing or not. Before I knew it, I felt a strong tug on my arm. Eric told me that we had to go. I saw that the others had already taken off, Miguel picking up Maria and running with her. Before I could even think to move, Eric does the same to me, throwing me over his shoulder and running as fast as he could. We ran along the gate finding the opening that I had crawled through earlier. Everyone was already on the other side. The next hour after that was a blur, but I do remember getting home, mute and shaken. No one knows but us. I haven't spoken to any of them in years, and I'm sure this story has been suppressed in their minds like mine. That night gave me nightmares for years, and now at 22, I still remember that smell. This happened in 2019. My aunt, uncle, and my cousin were driving up to my town to have Thanksgiving with me and my family. They arrived three days early so we could just hang out and see each other since it's been a while. On the first day, I was hanging out with my cousin, who I'll call Anthony, who was 14 and four years younger than I, when I got a text from my friend, who I will call Logan, who suggested that we go hang out the night before Thanksgiving at around 2 a.m. Since Anthony and his parents had been staying with us, I invited Anthony to come along, and we snuck out of the house at about 1.30. For a little background, when Logan would invite me to hang out with him at 2 a.m., it would typically mean we would explore an abandoned hospital. We had been in the hospital three times and would often go up to the roof and smoke. Anthony and I walked over to Logan's house, which was about two miles away, and we got in his car and drove over to the hospital. We would usually sneak in through an open window, but after we saw it was blocked by a large, heavy box, we all had to climb up nearby a tree and leap through one of the windows which Logan kept open from time to time. I thought it was strange that the window we usually went in was blocked off, but Logan assured me that it was probably some city officials trying to prevent kids like us from getting inside. We used our phone flashlights to navigate Anthony to me and Logan's designated hangout spot, the roof, where we had brought a few folding chairs. We sat down and smoked when Logan told me and Anthony that he was going to invite his girlfriend Lucy over and that he was going to go downstairs by the front of the hospital and wait. Logan went downstairs and about five minutes later, Anthony realized he forgot his phone, probably because he was high. I looked down from the roof towards the front entrance and didn't see Logan. I suggested that we both go downstairs to give him back his phone, but Anthony wanted to keep smoking, so I went down alone. As soon as I got into the stairwell, I heard heavy footsteps rush up the stairwell. I assumed it was Logan, but when I heard grunts from a runner, I realized that it could not have been Logan. This man's voice sounded a lot deeper than Logan. And why would Logan be running? 
I immediately ran out of the stairwell and shut the door and pressed against it. There were three loud bangs on the door as I heard the stranger yell, open the door. He continued to bang and scream. Anthony snapped out of his dazed state and pulled out a switchblade that he carried on him. The door was then open, knocking me on the ground, and that's when I saw the man. He was fat, had horrible breath, and was wearing a stained white t-shirt and tore jeans with deranged red eyes like Tyrone Bigham's. He got on top of me and started strangling me, telling me it's time to die. About five seconds to him choking me, Anthony stabbed the man in the back with his blade. He screamed in agony and let go of me. Anthony grabbed my hand and we ran down the stairs. As we got into the hallway, we heard a psst come from behind us. We shined our flashlights to see Logan in the bathroom, looking extremely pale and had a cut on his arm. We all got into the bathroom and shut off our lights, hiding in the one shared stall. Logan explained to us in a whisper that when he was walking down the hallway, the man emerged from the bathroom and grabbed him, chasing him around the hospital lobby in small circles like a cartoon, until Logan lost him and hid in the bathroom he was in. Directly after Logan finished his story, we heard the man run down the stairs into the hallway, screaming like he was insane. His words were incoherent, but I remember him yelling the words murder and die. We hid in the bathroom for a little while as the man ran around the room, but he had stopped screaming. We just sat in silence as we heard his footsteps go from hallway to hallway. I whispered to Logan and Anthony that we should call the cops, but they demanded I didn't because we did break into the hospital, which was against the law. Finally, after one hour of waiting at exactly 3.43 a.m., we all heard the bathroom door open as light poured into the room. I shut my phone and I looked over beside Anthony and Logan, who had tears in their eyes. We saw the man's bare feet walk over to one of the sinks, stand there for a couple of moments, and then collapse. We got out of the stall and saw the man was not moving. None of us dared to check and see if this guy was okay. We hauled ass back through the window and ran back to Logan's car, where we saw his girlfriend Lucy waiting. Logan explained everything to her and to his frustration. She said that she was going to call the police, not wanting to get in trouble. Logan left Lucy and drove me and Anthony back home. We had Thanksgiving the next morning, though me and Anthony were still shaking over the entire thing. Logan didn't answer my text until the night of Black Friday, where he explained that he hasn't heard from Lucy and doesn't know if she called the cops or not. After one week, Logan finally told the cops the story. Logan took the blame and admitted to the police that he explored an abandoned building alone, but he didn't tell the police about me and Anthony's involvement. The cops checked out the hospital and found nothing but a destroyed pink iPhone, Lucy's phone. Logan led the police into the bathroom where a bloody handprint was found in the sink, which he assumed belonged to the man. I don't talk much with Logan anymore. He stopped going to school because of the situation, and according to some of our shared friends, they say Logan once attempted suicide. It's been one year since the incident, and with Anthony now coming back to town, we have been texting a lot about the whole situation. Anthony thinks the man is crazy, a crazy homeless man who lives in a hospital. I try not to think about the whole story because it cost me a long lasting friendship with Logan, who I hope is doing better. So this is a story that happened to me a few days ago. I was at my friend's house for a birthday party. She invited me and three other friends so that was a total of five of us. For this story, I'll name them Carrie, Trina, Kalani, and Jojo. Carrie was the one who was throwing the party, and she was turning 13. Trina was also 13, and Kalani was 14, and the youngest, Jojo, was 12. I was the oldest, being 15. I didn't really know Trina and Kalani, but they were cool people. When we got to the party, we sat and talked for a bit. The normal things girls talk about, like boys. We ate food and began to get bored, so we asked Carrie's mom if we could go and walk around the neighborhood, and she agreed. We went to another part of the neighborhood that had a tennis court, and while we were there, we made TikToks. As we got bored, we ended up going back to the other direction of Carrie's house and saw that the end of the street had a house that had police tape over the trees. It also had a for sale sign, so we thought that there was no one living there at the time. So we came to the conclusion that it was abandoned. The house also had a lock on the door. 
We thought of this crazy idea to go up to the door to see if we could pick the lock and get inside so we could explore. The house had a new window on the left side of the door. It was tall enough to look out through to see if someone was at your house. They told me and Jojo to go up to the door to see because we were the only ones who would accept any dare. As we began to go up to the door, I stated to Jojo that I was afraid of doing this because of the thought of getting in trouble. Even though I was really brave, I was also nervous but still did it because I didn't want to disappoint the others. She had said something I can't quite remember. And after that, I remember saying, what if we go up to the door and there's someone standing at the window? And this is the part where I would never understand. As soon as I said that, someone very skinny in a Santa Claus suit started walking up to the window. And I'm not kidding. I mean, as soon as I said that, someone started walking up to the window. This was strange because although it was getting close to Christmas, it was still in November and we hadn't even endured Thanksgiving yet. Me and Jojo ran away screaming, and so did everyone else. We told the other girls what had happened, and they asked us what the person looked like. That was the moment where me and Jojo looked at each other and remembered that we didn't see the face on this person. I didn't even remember seeing the hands, but Jojo said the hands were white. We went inside our house just to calm down. And 30 minutes later, we went back outside just to take a look at the house again. And I kid you not, when we got to the window that the blinds were in, it looked as if someone was peeking their head looking at us. The other girls thought it was a sticker, but the blinds were also moving at the same time, so I wasn't sure. We went back into the house just to try to put everything behind us. Later that night, we were playing hide and go seek in the dark blindfolded. And when it was me and Jojo's turn to seek, we both felt that something was off kind of like a feeling that someone was watching us and we couldn't shake that feeling off. The other girls don't believe me and Jojo about what we saw and they think it was a prank but I know what we saw and it will forever be buried in my mind. Why was this person in a Santa Claus suit? Why didn't we see a face? How did they know we were coming? So many questions go through my head just thinking about it. Although this might not be your typical scary true horror story. This was terrifying to experience and I will never forget it, nor will I ever go to that house again. When I was a little girl, nine years old or so, I was playing at the school down the street from my house. It was the middle of the summer and myself and my friend were hanging around watching the boys play street hockey. One of the boys called my name and said a man in the parking lot was looking for me. The parking lot was mostly obscured by the building, but I could see an old 70s style van that hadn't been there earlier. I was walking over to the van when the mother of one of the other kids showed up looking for her son and asked me what I was doing. When I told her someone in the van was looking for me, she took my hand and started to walk with me, and the van pulled out and sped away. My friend's mom walked me home, and I wasn't allowed out of my yard without my parents for the rest of the summer. I was so upset and didn't understand why I was being punished. It was only years later that I understood that I was likely being targeted by some scumbag for who knows what. Thanks, Mrs. Gibson, wherever you are. This story happened two years ago when I was 25. I'm a home repairman and I often do work around the wealthy neighborhoods in New Jersey, which is where I live. I used to do some home repairs for a retired rich couple. Their names were Rod and Dorothy. They often went on vacations and allowed their children to rent their summer beach house. But before they would stay there, Rod and Dorothy would hire me to do repairs. This would have been the third time that I fixed the house up. Rod requested that I clean the gutters, fix the chimney, and make sure the beachside furniture would stay dry in the shed in case it rained. Rod and Dorothy allowed me to stay the night in the house in case of the thunderstorm, which had happened once before. I arrived at the beach house around 3 p.m. It took me about three hours to do my normal routine when it started pouring rain. Because the roads would often flood, I knew it would be unsafe to drive, so I called Dorothy and told her 
I would be staying the night. She said that was okay and that I could help myself to anything in the kitchen. At around 7 a.m., I got hungry and went to the fridge to make myself a sandwich. When I heard the sound of a glass breaking from the living room, I grabbed a butter knife and tiptoed to the living room, where I saw a broken window and a rock on the ground. Rainwater started to pour into the living room. Before I could even react to what just happened, I heard a large pound on the front door. I ran to the door and looked through the peephole and saw a man with long, wet, red hair, wearing nothing but shorts and a large, muddy green t-shirt. The man looked deranged and was breathing heavily. For whatever reason, I yelled out to the man, what do you want? The man reacted, looking through the peephole. He actually smiled at me, showing his stained brown teeth. The man said in a very deep voice, open the door. I screamed, I'm calling 911. I ran to the house phone in the kitchen and dialed for the police, but the weather interfered with the service so I couldn't call for help. I ran back to the door and looked in the peephole and saw the man holding a flower pot over his head. I jumped back from the door as the man threw the flower pot at the door, and he screamed like a maniac. I opened the door with the knife in hand and pushed the man down with my shoulder. He fell down the small steps. I held the knife up and yelled, get out of here. The man took off running down the road and was laughing like a madman. I went back inside and locked every door and window. After about an hour of panicking, I noticed the storm settled down. So I took the opportunity to call the police, informing them of the situation. The operator sent an officer to the house along with the sketch artist. I gave my description and they left the house. I didn't sleep much that night. Rod and Dorothy sent their oldest son, Harry, to the house the following morning, so I was off the hook. I got paid an extra $50 for what I experienced, which was a nice bonus, but not worth it. I have no idea who or what that man's intentions were, but I like to think he's locked up somewhere away from people. This happened to me as a kid, maybe around two or three. My mom and I lived in a cheap single wide trailer in a real crappy trailer park. I stayed with my aunts overnight a lot because my mom would work graveyard shifts. Anyway, she picked me up from my aunt's house around 7 a.m. one day and we went back to our trailer. I remember immediately not wanting to go inside, begging to ride my bike, but my exhausted mother just wanted to go to sleep. So we went inside, she laid in bed and being the annoying toddler that I was. I kept waking my mom up asking to go outside and ride my bike, which we usually kept in my room because if we left it outside, it would get stolen. I told my mom I didn't want to go play in my room, so I asked to lay with her. While we were laying there, for some reason I told my mom that there was someone in my closet and he wanted to hurt me. I don't know why I said it. She got up to show me that no one was there. And when she walked in my room, the folding closet door started to open and he got stuck on something. Turns out, a previously convicted child molester had skipped bail in a new trial, watched my mom's coming and goings for a few days, and broke into our house while she was at work. He took my bike in the closet with him, hoping I would come home looking for it. The only thing that kept him from jumping out attacking my mom was when the spokes got caught in the bottom of the door. Needless to say, we ran like hell out of the house and got in the car and drove away. Unfortunately, the guy got out of the house before the cops showed up. There's really nothing to follow up with. I'm just glad we got away. About five years ago, me and my husband went to a couple's holiday to Paris with a few friends of ours. I was awfully excited about the whole thing. A friend of mine had invited us to join her and her husband and some of the links she sent me were just gorgeous. She'd booked a two-bedroom Airbnb in this place called Palaisou, a quaint little French village about 15 minutes drive from Paris, which meant we could soak up a bit of French country living in between a full day's shopping and dining in Paris itself. It seemed like it would be a dream weekend break for me. I mean, there's no place more romantic than Paris, right? So... We get the Eurostar over to Paris, have a bit of lunch there, pick up a rental car, then drive out to the Airbnb. I was just buzzing. 
I'd be practicing the little bit of French I'd learn in school, and although I was a bit terrible, the French people were so nice about it. I'd heard that they'd be really rude, and it was just lovely how that turned out to be just a myth. Lunch was lovely, and the house was just gorgeous. Me and a friend had a nice catch-up while we explored the house, and we let the boys be boys for a little while, fawning over how adorably French everything was. The back garden was amazing too, this big green lawn that just opened up into a dense patch of woodland at the end. I was in heaven. It was still a bit chilly out, but the place was just serene, and it really was so romantic. I had no idea that our little bubble of romantic bliss was about to be so horribly ruined. We had this really lovely dinner in a little local brasserie, then wandered back to the Airbnb in the dark, admittedly a little drunk. Grateful to be back in the warmth, we carry on drinking in the Airbnb's kitchen for a while, and my friend's boyfriend is messing around and exploring all the cupboards and drawers in the kitchen. This is how he finds a flashlight. Quite a cheap one from what I could tell, but it prompted him to want to explore the dark woods at the end of the garden. We were all just joking about how he'd obviously be the first one to die in a horror movie, but unfazed and a bit tipsy, he goes out nonetheless to explore the end of the garden. He's out there for about 10 minutes and meanwhile we're all just chatting away, planning our little day trip into Paris the following morning and we just hear this scream. We all go quiet, realizing it's my friend's boyfriend who just screamed at the top of his lungs. He then comes running into the back door and starts asking, Who speaks the best French? Because we need to call the police right now. My boyfriend accused him of trying to pull a prank at first, but... You could just tell he was genuinely scared and he honestly went white as a sheet. He's like, I swear on my mom's life, this is not a joke, we need to call the police. A bit of panic ensues before he finally blurts out that we're not in any obvious danger but we still need to get the police out to us because there's an actual dead body in the woods at the back of the house. Our jaws are on the floor at this point and my boyfriend was still in such a state of disbelief that he demanded to go out and see it for himself. My friend's boyfriend, who was the one who found the body, starts saying, You don't want to do that, man. Honestly, she's not in a good way. The reason he was so freaked out is that it wasn't just a dead body, some poor elderly person that had fallen over and hit in their head or something. The guy said it was really obvious that this person had been killed, like they were a mess. We got the police out and thankfully one of them spoke really good English so my friend's boyfriend could tell them how he found the body. While that's going down, the rest of us are just looking for somewhere else to stay for the night, settling on a four-star hotel in central Paris. The entire trip was ruined. We thought we could just duck out and enjoy the rest of the weekend but the police wanted to talk to us the next day too. Apparently if it wasn't for the obvious foul play, we'd have been free to leave. But basically, we'd wanted a romantic weekend away and ended up sort of being suspects in this random French person's murder. Obviously, we were finally cleared and we were able to travel back home, but the whole thing was just terribly horrifying. Weirdest thing was is that the owners asked us for good reviews afterwards, even though we found a dead body on their property. Of all the surreal, insane aspects of that trip... That took the cake. My family loves Christmas. We're some of the most annoying people that start putting up the Christmas decorations in mid-November. And playing Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You for the first time every year has become a bit of a ritual. My husband and my three daughters always wear their matching pajamas, which I love, and although cooking Christmas dinner can be a bit stressful some years, I just adore being that family that all the relatives flock to when the festive season comes around. There's only one big problem. We're Australian. Time for a quick explanation. In America and Europe, Christmas takes place during the winter, obviously, but the months surrounding December are some of the hottest in the Aussie calendar. Down under you're more likely to be sunbathing with your Santa hat on than sipping warm eggnog by a log fire. But just like everywhere else, pretty much all of our festive imagery consists of snow-covered winter wonderlands, fields caked in snow, 
and little robins red-breasted nestled in the bough of a pine tree. But where we live, in a place called Darwin, it's a lot more palm tree than pine tree. Like my two kids have never even seen snow, and in 2019, we wanted to change that. So even though people called us crazy for doing it, we booked flights over to a freezing cold Europe in late November. The whole trip was absolutely amazing. I found the flights to be a bit of a pain, but seeing some of Europe's most incredible sights, given a festive twist by a dusting of snow, it was worth every minute of being stuck in that cramped demon tube. We saw Prague, Berlin, Rome, Copenhagen, Paris, and London. But what my family seemed to be looking forward to the most was seeing Ireland for the first time. The kids seemed to have it in their heads that it was some magical place full of fairies and such, and could barely contain their excitement. While the prospect of drinking Guinness straight from the tap had my husband almost as giddy as our two little girls. We arrived at this little Airbnb out in the suburbs of Cork, a semi-detached rental that looked like something out of a storybook, and before anyone even puts their bags down, they're clamoring for the Wi-Fi password. No, my husband works in IT and internet safety is something of a passion of his. Not just because it's his occupation, but because he knows to help keep our daughters safe from some of the darker things that are out there in cyberspace. You'd have to ask him for all the details regarding the thing he does, but whenever we arrived at an Airbnb somewhere, my husband would like to scan the network to make sure it had parental locks and was otherwise secure. So, he's tapping away on his laptop as I'm having a quick cup of coffee when I notice this particular look on his face. One I'd come to recognize his meaning. I don't like this at all. I take a seat next to him on the couch, leaning over to take a look at what's bothering him. All I can see is computer nonsense on the screen. I've never been very tech savvy, so much to my chagrin, I have to ask him to explain to me. He points to this line of text and explains that it told him that there was already a device connected to the Wi-Fi network when we arrived. He shows how he could account for all our phones and his laptop being connected, but there was one mystery device somewhere. Then he opens up another window and points towards a little icon, one that was clearly a little picture of a camera. Me being me, I try and see the positive side, suggesting that it's a security camera installed on the exterior of the property, but my husband does a lap of the building and says he couldn't see any kind of device anywhere. It's at that point that he starts trying to work some of his IT magic, and a few minutes later, I hear him call me back into the kitchen in one of those dad voices like, something is wrong, but... I can't tip off the kids. His eyes are all wide as he points towards his laptop screen again and on it is a video feed of the bedroom our girls were planning on staying in, like a top-down view as if the camera were on the ceiling. We just go running up to the girls' room to find that the camera had been hidden inside a smoke detector that was directly over one of the beds. We still don't quite know who, but someone had been planning on watching our daughter sleep, which is just about one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me and the family. My husband calls over the owner of the property right away to ask him why there was a camera installed in one of the kids' bedrooms. At first, the owner denied having CCTV on the property in the first place and had the nerve to suggest that the video feed was coming from another property in the area, as if I wouldn't recognize my own bloody children. My husband had to actually threaten to send them a screenshot of the video feed to get them to admit it, and then they came out with a load of garbage about simply wanting to protect their assets. My husband then accused the person of being a voyeur and that he'd be reporting them to Airbnb, at which point they got all tongue-tied and couldn't think of anything to say, and then they just hung up. We called them out on being a creep, and they didn't have a word to say in their own defense. We were absolutely furious and thoroughly creeped out, having only narrowly avoided having that absolute dog staring at our kids all night. And even though it was quite late in the evening at that point, me and my husband got the kids to pack their things while we looked for a hotel nearby. It took us a good few months of emailing back and forth with Airbnb's customer complaints department, but we eventually got the refund we were most definitely entitled to. Airbnb also reassured us that They'd banned the homeowner from renting properties using the service, which 
did far more for my peace of mind than any amount of cash would have. I know there are people out there with those kinds of twisted desires and stuff, but never for a second did I ever think I'd run into one myself, let alone on our dream Christmas vacation over to Europe. The only thing that really worries me now is Airbnb's ability to keep this person and people like him off their platform altogether. My husband and I have pressed them on the systems they have in place to ensure their customer's safety, but they simply don't have any satisfactory answers. We made the point that this horrible voyeur could easily set up an account in the name of a friend or relative and simply continue recording people's kids against their knowledge, and the legalese email we received in response basically said, we have no idea what to do about it. And that's the fear I'm left with, that somewhere out there is a little girl, lying peacefully in her bed, who has no idea that some Irish creep is watching them, doing God knows what while he does so. Me and a close friend of mine decided to get an Airbnb in New York for a week's worth of birthday celebrations one year, and we were both really excited about the whole thing. The listing my friend had managed to find us consisted of the two top floors of an old townhouse, and it looked absolutely stunning. I think people are so focused on the sleek skyscrapers and other modern amenities that we associate with NYC that we forget how old it is too, and how a lot of that history is written into the architecture of some of the city's oldest buildings. So, we catch a flight over, arrive at the Airbnb, and it's everything we could have wished for. Even better, the owner lived on the ground floor of the building, so if we needed anything, he was just downstairs. Brilliant, right? Nope wrong. Like most things, you don't really know what you're dealing with until you're actually rubbing noses with it. The guy's checking us in, asking if we have any questions or anything and otherwise being perfectly welcoming. Then all of a sudden, just as we're saying thanks and all that, he's like, oh, girls, by the way, there should be a large duffel under one of your beds. Under no circumstances are you to touch it. A little awkward silence follows where me and my friend are kind of like, WTF? And then we ask him if he doesn't want us to, you know, grab the bag before we settle in, since it's obviously something quite private. He then responds with, no, that's where it lives. Where it lives? What the actual F is that even supposed to mean? What is it, anyway? It sounds stupid now but we just sort of laughed it off. We were in New York after all, in a city where everyone was a little bit crazy, we thought. Why let a little bit of kookiness ruin what would otherwise be an amazing birthday week, I thought. So, first night, I did actually take a peek under the bed and discovered that it was actually my bed that had the bag sitting under it. Lucky me. It looked perfectly clean. No weird smells coming from it, so no dead body winning, I thought. It didn't seem particularly stuffed with anything, but there were definitely things in it. Nothing that jingled or ticked like one of those old cartoon clock bombs, so whatever was in there couldn't be all that bad. And besides, it wasn't any of my business. Second night, and I'm a little bit more curious, but still, I can control myself and I just leave the bag be. Third day, me and my friend actually talk about it a little bit, trying to imagine what it could be in there. I mean, there was no way he really and truly didn't want us to look in the bag, or he'd have taken it out of there before we ever checked in, right? But the question remained, what exactly was in that that he either did or didn't want us seeing? I started feeling really uncomfortable about the whole thing, especially since it was under my bed and not hers. My friend can read this in me easy peasy and start saying stuff that it's, all the fellas' murder weapons and that I'm going to be his next victim. Maybe that had gotten a response in the past, but under those circumstances, not funny in the least bit. And as you might have guessed, by the third night, the horrible curiosity had been gnawing away at my gut and getting the better of me. I'm lying there in bed, totally unable to sleep, and I can hear my friend snoring from the other room. Not that the walls were thin or anything, she just snores that loud. All I'm thinking is, I can take one look, 
One little peek and the guy's never going to know, is he? I don't bother to wake my friend up. I'm just thinking, in and out, pretend it never happened, job done. So I slip off the bed as quietly as I can, reach for the bag. I'm honestly like a ninja with how quiet I'm being, like pulling the zipper open super slowly so it doesn't make any noise, and the whole time the tension is rising for me like, God, what's in the bag? When I finally saw, I had to bite my fist to stop from laughing. The first thing I see when I look into the bag are toys. Toys of an adult nature. And that's all we'll say about that. I think it was just the break in the mood for me. Worrying it was the mummified corpse of his mother or something when it was just a rubber knob. But looking back on it, even that was super creepy. But the thing that actually made me wake up my friend to be like, I think we need to get out of here, were the clothes that I found in the duffel. I'll be honest, my curiosity got the better of me and... In for a penny, in for a pound, as they say. I shouldn't have just started going through this guy's stuff, but... Oh my god, am I so glad I did. Because aside from the toys was stuff that actually made the hairs in the back of my neck stand on end. Pacifier. Adult diapers. Oversized adult pajamas with a colorful childish pattern on them. There was a lot of other stuff too, but lots of it was honestly too upsetting and messed up for me to want to write about. Thinking about what this fella got off to knocked me sick. Look, I'm not one to king shame or anything, but I think we can agree that that kind of stuff is just wrong. Weird at the very least. So there I am. It's about half past one in the morning and I'm wide awake with my mind going a mile a minute. The thing that swung it in the end for me was the fact that he brought the bag up in conversation to us. It's not like I was just being nosy and happened to be going through his stuff. No, like my friend said, if he really didn't want us to go through it, he wouldn't have mentioned it, and he wouldn't have stashed the thing in one of the rooms we'd be staying in. I just didn't feel safe there anymore, and I knew my friend wouldn't either once she knew what was in the bag. Cut to an hour later and we packed up all of our stuff, again being as quiet as possible. The plan was just to leave the keys on the kitchen table sneak out and then just explain the situation to Airbnb and hope for a refund. We could just get out of there, clean break, never have to see him again. But that would have been way too easy, wouldn't it? Because right as we start carrying our heavy bags downstairs, we make way too much noise. I remember how hearing the bolt on his front door working just made my blood run cold. But we were trapped on the stairs, we couldn't leg it. We just had to walk past him, trying not to make eye contact. Leaving early, are you? He said to us. I just had to grit my teeth and nod. Then he said, He looked in the bag, didn't you? As soon as the words left his lips, I had to make eye contact with him. Something about how brazen he was about it. How he just knew what was going on. It was so freaky. I think he must have read it in my face too, like the shock of how hard what he'd said hit home. He knew I had. He knew I hadn't been able to help myself. And he just smiled. This smug, sickening grin just stretched across his face and he didn't say another word to us as he filed out of the apartment building and started off down the sidewalk. The whole thing actually ruined our trip for a couple of days. It was all we could talk about, all we could think about. And even when we just tried to forget about it and enjoy ourselves, it followed us around like a dark cloud. It wasn't until we got in touch with the police and told them what I'd found that we were able to regain any peace of mind. Obviously, the police couldn't do anything about it. Owning stuff like that wasn't a crime, no matter how perverse. Like he didn't have any pictures if you catch my drift, so all they could do was recommend that we take it up with Airbnb. I do still worry about it, though and I really hope he hasn't hurt anyone. We got him kicked off Airbnb after he wrote a really rude review about us. I emailed a member of the customer service team back and forth and explained exactly what had happened. So, there was some small silver lining. It's the only time it happened too. All the other hosts we've dealt with on Airbnb have been fantastic. But that being said, it only takes one bad experience to really paint your opinion of something. 
doesn't it? There was a point a couple of years back where I decided that discovering Airbnb was the best thing that ever happened to me, and the weirdest thing was that the whole thing had blossomed from one of the worst things to ever happen to me. I've known friends and colleagues that have lost a parent and just sort of took it on the chin. Their death came at an advanced age or after a long illness, it was something they could accept. But when I lost my dad out of the blue in 2017, it hit me really hard. He was fit and healthy, a really careful sort of bloke, and I doubt anyone could say the same for the drunk driver that plowed into him that Thursday evening. The only thing that was supposed to cushion the blow were the savings and life insurance payouts that the family got. I mean, it was a lot of money. Dad must have been squirreling it away for years, enough to pay for my little sister to go traveling for what turned out to be a heck of a long time. But I didn't want the money. I just wanted Dad back. I had to wait for the grief to subside before I could decide what to do with it and instead of just splurging it away, I decided to make an investment. It was around that time that a friend mentioned Airbnb and how an uncle of hers was making a killing from renting out a flat they owned in the city center. It was a bit daunting spending that amount of money but I took the plunge. Then after refurbishing the flat and posting an advert on Airbnb, I had my first booking within a week. The income was unreal. Within six months, I'd made half the money back, so I invested in another place. A year in, I was flush with cash, and even though I kept my full-time job, it got to the point where I didn't actually have to work anymore. Cue fancy holidays, a huge car upgrade, life was good. Then, boom, COVID hits, and my Airbnb income completely dried up. Remember when we all thought COVID would be over in a few weeks or months? What sweet summer children we were, and I was no different. I had no idea it'd get so bad that I'd have to straight up rent one of the flats to be able to keep up my lifestyle. But luckily, it was a seller's market. You wouldn't think that'd be the case during a pandemic, but it suited me just fine. I was inundated with applications for one of the flats. I mean, I got literally hundreds of people applying on that open rent website. Finding the right tenant was a lot more work than I thought it would be. Interviewing all the various applicants was a pain. There was some right weirdos applying for the tenancy, and the more I dawdled over who to choose, the more money I was losing. But then, one morning I wake to an email from a prospective tenant telling me they'd be willing to pay 350 extra in rent every month, but that they'd have to move in by the end of the week. They didn't even want a viewing. They were happy enough to move in based on the photos I post online. 350 quid extra was 50% over the odds and way too good for an offer for me to turn down when I gave the bloke a ring. They seemed normal enough. It was a pretty much done deal. All I had to do was hand him the keys. But when I actually met the bloke last December to do a masked up sanitizer soak socially distanced key handover, they seemed anything but normal. I'm all for wearing masks and stuff, don't get me wrong. I think we should be doing all we can to defeat this, but this guy was completely covered from head to toe. Black gator over his face, hat on, hood pulled over, gloves, the works. I had absolutely no idea who I was handing the keys to, really, just that they identified themselves as Stefan, and the same name as the account that contacted me. He barely spoke, and the whole interaction gave me a bad feeling, so... I tell him I'll come by in a couple of days to see how he was doing. He'd already paid me two months rent on top of his security deposit, so I was basically stuck with him for the time being. I was starting to think my desperation for cash was about to get me in a lot of trouble. About a week later, I give Stefan a ring to make sure he's settling in alright. I have to call him like six times before he answers and when he finally does, he seems in no mood to talk but he still somewhat reluctantly agrees to let me stop by. I start worrying about what sort of state the flat is going to be in, but little did I know that I wouldn't be seeing it at all. He refuses to open the door to me, citing social distancing and stuff, which I understand and respect, but there are ways to conduct a flat inspection without violating the whole six-foot rule. I insist, 
He refuses. I insist some more. He refuses some more. And by the time it got to him threatening to call the police, any potentially good relationship we might have had goes right out the window. Right when he says that, I whip my mask down to make myself heard more clearly and I catch this horrendous smell in the air, one that's so bad that it actually silences me for a moment. I find myself putting my mask right over my mouth and nose and the argument with Stefan trundles along with him agreeing to send me a video of the flat's current condition. The conversation ends, but I hang around for a minute to try to work out where the horrible smell is coming from. It seemed to permeate the entire corridor, like it was almost impossible to work out its exact source, and with it being so intense, nor did I want to. I just prayed it wasn't coming from the apartment I just rented out. As you can imagine, I'm quite annoyed at that point, and as I walk back across the street towards my car, I turn back to have a look at the window of the apartment. Now, my eyes are terrible, but I could suddenly see that this Stefan character had all the curtains closed, but had opted to hang a weird kind of mask in the window. I think it was a paper mache or something, and it must have been really old because it looked all shriveled, with long, wiry black hairs framing this pretty creepy-looking face. I remember letting out an audible sigh like, Christ Almighty, this is going to get so much worse before it gets better. And suddenly the mask just disappears back into the curtains, it wasn't just some creepy old piece of decor. Someone had been wearing it and watching me while they were doing so. Stefan then sends me a video of the flat which looked fine, only there was one corner of the living room that he apparently refused to show me. I pressed him on it. He pretended not to know what I was talking about and I just decided to quit while I was ahead. It took a week before I started getting complaints. Other tenants in the building who must have gotten my number from the management company started calling me up to complain about the noise and the smell coming from flat 20, the one I own. But then after a while, the calls stopped being complaints and started being more like warnings. Warnings about the things they'd heard coming from Stefan's flat and how the smells had gotten considerably worse. But still, Stefan refused any kind of formal flat inspection, and he still does even now. I drove past the flat about two weeks ago now, one evening when I was driving home from work. I'd had a late one at the office, so it was about nine at night when I decided to take a little detour to check out the flat. I was met with almost immediate regret. Apparently Stefan only uses red bulbs to light the flat after dark, and I'm staring up at the window like, what's this freak up to now? When I see two people, like, running or jumping around the living room, completely naked by the looks of things. He's obviously not the only one living there now, despite there only being his name on the lease. I suppose this isn't even really a story because it doesn't have an end yet. I've already decided that I'm not going to renew Stefan's lease of the flat and that when his two months are up, I'll ask him to leave or else get the authorities involved. But that's about the only thing I'm certain of right now. I have no idea what he's doing in my bloody property, what's making that bad smell or who the other person is. Things have gotten pretty bad at this point as I knew they would, but I have a really grim gut feeling that they can get infinitely worse and that getting Stefan out of the flat is going to be much more trouble than I ever imagined it would. It's not even worth the money anymore. No amount of money is worth finding out that he's done something truly awful in there. I'll try to keep you guys updated in the future if I'm still in a fit state to do so, because only God knows what untold horrors await for me in that flat, and God knows what Stefan will resort to in his efforts to keep me and everyone else from finding out. Wish me luck, guys. Things are definitely about to get weird. My son used to be very active on something called Discord, which, from what I understand, is a messaging app for people who play video games. It allowed him to talk to people from all over the world that play the same games as him. So at some point, he broke the news to us that he'd been talking to a girl over in the UK named Lori. She and he had become friends, playing some sort of pirate game, playing together most days and talking pretty much all the time when they weren't at their computers. 
and eventually he just up and asks her if she wanted to be his girlfriend and she says yes. It was definitely a new concept for someone like me who grew up at a time when cell phones weren't even a thing, but I understand that we live in the digital age where new methods of dating are coming to the fore, so I just tried to be happy for him as any mom should when their kid gets their first girlfriend or boyfriend. Plus, with an entire ocean between them, it's not like I have to worry about them getting accidentally pregnant or something. However, one Sunday afternoon, my son emerges from his boy cave for what seemed like the first time in days, walks into the TV room where me and my husband are sat, and with a very concerned look on his face. We asked him what the matter was, and he just kind of shrugs, tells us everything is cool, and then just kind of wanders out again. So as you can imagine, me and my husband give each other a look as if to be like, what was that about? My husband gets up, follows our son into the living room before gently prodding him about anything that might be bothering him. From what he told me, our kid was just doing that typical boyish thing of pretending that everything was fine, but in a way that tells us that he's obviously upset about something. My husband then told me he asked after Lori, with our son responding in an almost visceral way of like, why are you always in my business, blah blah blah. He'd obviously touched on a sore subject, so our general conclusion was that he and Lori had broken up, and he just didn't want to talk about it. We weren't about to press him on it, so we kind of just left him to it to get over and move on to someone new. But over the next month or so, our son seemed to get increasingly depressed. He'd spend more and more time up in his room, only ever coming out to go to school or eat dinner and then just retreating back to his little boy cave. Like I said, we figured this was because he'd split up with his internet girlfriend, but one time my husband was walking past his room and blatantly heard him talking to someone via his little voice chat discord thing, addressing them as Babe and at one point, Lori. So apparently they're still talking at that point, but we still assume that they were having relationship issues, putting it down to the fact that they were like thousands of miles apart. I know long distance relationships don't work at the best of times, even when people were just a few states away from each other. But these kids had an entire ocean separating them, so God knows how hard that must have been on them. Only, as we came to learn, that wasn't exactly the problem. It was something much, much darker. So as I said, our son seemed to be getting more and more depressed over the course of the month, and it got so bad that at one point that me and my husband discussed getting him a therapist or something to nip the problem in the bud before it could morph into something less easy to deal with. But suddenly, out of apparently nowhere, he just perks up. One day he's looking better, feeling perkier, and is considerably more talkative. He actually seemed keener on spending more time with us too, which for a 16-year-old boy struck us as very unusual. I mean, not that we were complaining. It was nice seeing him feeling better about things and we put it down to him meeting a new girl or just shutting out Lori from his life. This kind of sunny behavior carries on for like a week or so until one Saturday, when after coming down for breakfast, we don't see her here for him for the rest of the day. Late in the afternoon, my husband goes up into his room, knocks on the door, and asks our son if everything is okay. He comes back down into the TV room, tells me there was no reply after knocking, then asks me if I had seen him leave the house at all during the day. I tell him no, that if he had gone over to a friend's house or whatever, that he certainly hadn't let me know. Then my husband just kind of shrugs, tells me he has a headache, then walks off to the downstairs bathroom to get an aspirin from the medicine cabinet. Next thing I know, I can hear him springing down the hallway and up the stairs, his feet like boom, boom, boom as he rushed up to our son's room. I'm super confused, like what's going on, before walking out into the hallway. From where I'm standing, I can actually see into the downstairs bathroom and what I see makes my blood run cold. We usually kept all our pain pills and other such medication in a little plastic first aid kit style thing. We kept that thing stuffed to the gills and there it was, lying on the bathroom floor, almost completely empty. Then like my husband before me, it hit me what had happened. So I sprint up to my son's room where I find my husband leaning over our boy's bed shaking him like, wake up, can you hear me, wake up. There's a pole of puke sitting on the bed next to his head and he's completely unconscious, and there are empty pill trays lying on the floor nearby. 
As soon as I walk in, my husband runs back downstairs to call 911, and I take over the shaking and the wailing, begging him to open his eyes. Now the only light in the room was coming from his computer monitor, so at one point I look over to it and see one of the most haunting things I've ever seen in my life. On the screen is a webcam window from the Discord thing I mentioned, and it displays the body of a young girl that's just kind of dangling in midair. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at, but when I did, I almost screamed the house down. She was hanging from something. I tried not to look, I really did. I just tried to focus on my boy as his dad ran back upstairs with emergency services on his cell. I should have told him not to look, but I was just distraught. I could barely speak as he walks back into the room and starts describing our son's condition to the dispatcher on the other end of the line. He's frantically talking away when he does pretty much the same thing as me, turns around to see the webcam window open and the girl's body hanging on the screen. He just froze and stops talking, long enough for me to be able to hear the dispatcher say, Sir, are you there, sir? At which point he snaps out of his daze and carries on talking to the person on the other end. It was he that then had the same presence of mind to turn off the computer, all the while giving the EMTs her home address and begging them to arrive as quickly as possible. Our son was taken to the hospital where he promptly has his stomach pumped. We stayed all night, waiting in the visitor's area, and when a doctor finally approached us with an update on our son's condition, I found my heart racing as I prepared for the worst. But thankfully, we'd gotten him to the hospital just in time, and the nurses were able to pump his stomach and administer the necessary medication to counteract the effects of the things he'd taken already. He survived, barely, but the same couldn't be said for the girl on the computer screen, who we assumed was this Lori girl he'd been in the long-distance relationship with. When our son woke up and saw us in the hospital room, he burst into tears. He apologized over and over again, and we all just cried it out together. He then proceeded to spill his guts to us about what had happened, and I honestly couldn't believe my ears. It turned out that they'd formed a kind of pact together just the week before, right around the same time he seemed to have perked up and gotten out of the funk he was in. Apparently, that was what did it. That she and he had figured out a way to escape the pain they were suffering, and that the revelation had been some kind of boost to him, as morbidly insane as that sounds. We went ahead with booking him into therapy, and he's doing much, much better now. We don't monitor his online activities, as he figured he'd just find a way to subvert us, but we definitely don't allow him to have a computer in his bedroom anymore. And since then, me and my husband have made an effort to acquaint ourselves with the darker corners of the internet, and believe me, there are some days I wish I hadn't. Because my god, are there some horrendous things out there things I wish I'd never seen, and that I'll never be able to get out of my head. I used to play a lot of Insurgency Sandstorm with a fixed set of guys and a few girls, and we used to organize using a Discord server. People came and went as time went by, but there were a couple of us that actually stayed in touch quite frequently outside of just organizing gaming sessions and became pretty good friends. Insurgency, for those that haven't played it, is one of those hyper-realistic military shooters that tends to get really, really intense and occasionally downright terrifying when it's at its best. I'm not saying we had this proper Band of Brothers vibe going, I know it's only a video game, but like I said, a handful of us ended up being pretty good friends and bonding over the intense level of teamwork required to win rounds, not to mention the sweaty-palmed, adrenaline-fueled firefights. One of these was a lad named Colin. One day, Colin tells us that he wouldn't be playing Insurgency for a little while because he had taken a job teaching English as a foreign language out in Indonesia. He had wanted to do some traveling for a while but just didn't have the money available to him and getting qualified to teach English gave him an opportunity to see some more exotic areas of the world whilst getting paid for it. We were pretty gutted to hear the news. He was one heck of a sniper and many a time we'd been pinned down by some enemy machine gunner only for the gunfire to stop suddenly, followed by a little laugh from Colin and a have that in his Scottish accent. We absolutely loved him for moments like that, but we were also really happy for him, 
and since he promised to stay in the Discord server, we'd be able to keep in touch and hear some stories of his adventures out in the tropics. So a few months go by, and we're enjoying hearing the stories of his travels, along with being updated with photos of him exploring some pretty remote parts of Indonesia. It was the photos of him with the school kids he was teaching that really made me smile, though. He looked like he was having the time of his life, especially when we saw some videos of him teaching the kids some pretty obscure English phrases. Not only that, but occasionally we'd hear some of the kids actually repeat the phrases back kind of in a Scottish accent, and the idea of a bunch of Indonesian kids learning to speak English with an Edinburgh accent was absolutely hilarious to us. I mean, imagine it. Some American wishing an Indonesia fellow good morning or something only to hear, You alright, pal? Who's it going? In response, it still makes me chuckle even now, to be honest. Then, in September of 2018, I woke up to the news that there had been an earthquake in the sea just off the coast of Indonesia, causing an earthquake that had resulted in a massive tsunami that had destroyed huge sections of the country. Immediately, I thought of Colin. I jumped onto Discord using the app on my phone and sent him a message asking him if everything was alright and hoping he'd not been caught up in the tsunami. Obviously, there was a huge 7 or 8 hour time difference between the UK and Southeast Asia, and occasionally Colin didn't reply for hours, so the fact that he didn't immediately reply wasn't a massive concern to me. But he didn't reply all that day, to the point where I started expressing concerns to some of the other lads in the server, sharing the news of the tsunami with them and mentioning that I was worried Colin had been caught up in it. We knew from the news stories about which areas of Indonesia had been affected, but we didn't know exactly where Colin was, only that he was in some remote areas and didn't always have immediate access to Wi-Fi, another reason for us to not immediately worry. But he didn't reply the next day either, or the day after that, and it got to the point where a week had gone by and we'd heard nothing back from him. No one had seen Colin, even online, since we got news of the tsunami. That's when we really started to worry, and as the days went by, we got more and more frightened that something had happened to him. It's around then that I started going back through some of the messages he'd been sending over the previous month or so. He'd been all over Indonesia, and had spent his first few weeks in the capital city of Jakarta, which had remained relatively unaffected by the earthquake and subsequent tsunami. But then I found out that he'd traveled to a place called Palu to teach English there, and as far as I could tell, that's where he'd been at the time of the disaster, when it struck. I then cross-referenced the name of the place with any stories about the tsunami, and found out that it had been one of the worst affected by a destructive tidal wave that apparently reached 23 feet in height. 23 feet of rushing water that had destroyed pretty much everything in its path and caused the deaths of over 15,000 people, and in all likelihood, Colin had been one of them. We were devastated, but the worst part is, even to this day, we still have not had any closure about it. We knew Colin quite well, but he kept his online and personal life pretty separate. We never knew his last name or the names of any of his family, so it's not like we could get in touch with them to find out if he really had died or not, or to see about any funeral arrangements if he had indeed perished during the tsunami. But I think the fact that even now his Discord account lies inactive is evidence of the fact that he did actually lose his life out there. Maybe he's okay, and he just never bothered to get back on Discord. Maybe his close encounter with death made him realize that video games were just a waste of time or something. But I think that's just wishful thinking on my part. In my heart of hearts, I know he's probably dead. I just hope he's at peace now, and whatever family he had are okay. Rest in peace, Colin. We still miss you. So a few years ago, I matched with a girl on Tinder who I ended up having some serious chemistry with. We go for coffee coffee ended up being drinks, drinks ended up with sparks flying, and then boom, we're in the middle of this whirlwind romance. We're texting all the time whenever we're not just spending days at each other's apartments, fantasizing about taking vacations together, all the stuff two young people do when they got that new relationship energy going. But then one day, 
Right when I think things couldn't get any more perfect, she sits me down with the obvious intention of having a pretty serious talk. I figured it was like a breakup type thing, so I braced myself for the worst. Only it's not quite as bad as I feared. It was just, well, weird. She tells me she's Polly. At the time, I had no idea what that meant, so I just sort of stared back at her with this confused look on my face, prompting her to explain that Polly is short for polyamorous. For those that aren't entirely savvy with the term, it's basically a fancy word for when someone practices open relationships. The girl says she can commit to me, but that she'd have to be free to see other people, albeit in a less serious capacity. Being young, dumb, and totally besotted with her, I agreed to it, and it ended up being the worst decision I'd ever made. I started off by telling her she could do what she wanted, but only as long as she didn't tell me about any of it. She agrees to this, but as the weeks went by, I did start to get a little jealous. She sought to remedy this by introducing me to the app that she'd used to find other polyamorous types to hook up with, a little thing called Discord. Now apparently it's primarily used for communicating in video games, but I learned that people use Discord for all types of weird stuff, including hookups. The girl tells me I'm welcome to join the server she was a part of and look for someone who was open to something casual. Fair is fair, I thought, so I did. I made an account and got her to invite me to a little server that was innocuously called The Farm, despite having absolutely nothing to do with anything remotely agricultural. So upon joining, the girl introduces me as her partner and gets a few of the members to walk me through all the various channels and such. They were actually pretty nice, talking me through some of the elements of polyamory and waxing lyrical about how nice the girl I was seeing was, which, I don't know, kind of warmed me up to the whole idea. I get talking to another girl on there, we vibe a little, but I can't see anything happening with her. I basically just did it to make the girl I was seeing happy, which apparently it really did. I gained myself a lot of brownie points from it. So all is well that ends well, right? Mm, nope. About a week into being on the Discord server, I get a message from someone at first I assumed was a girl. We swap greetings and make a little small talk, then I get a picture message coming through. It turns out this was not a girl at all. It was a dude, and the picture was the only thing I really, really did not want to see. What exactly it was, I'll leave up to your imagination. But just imagine the worst possible thing a perverted dude could send you over the internet, and yeah, you got it. He follows the picture up by saying he wanted to hook up with me and my girl at the same time. I just ignore the messages, assuming the dude is going to get kicked from the server for rule-breaking or something, and eventually bring it up with my girl. She, on the other hand, vouches for this guy, saying she's been talking to him for a while, how he's normally perfectly nice and polite, and that I'm making a big deal out of nothing, claiming I'm just being jealous, etc. I tell her I'm super uncomfortable with the idea of a three-way hookup, how I want nothing to do with it, but, again, that she's welcome to do whatever she wants, just as long as I don't have to hear about it. Drama smoothed over, and I think that's the end of it. Only, it's not. Not by a long shot. Cut to like a month later, things are still basically going strong with the girl, and I'm out doing some grocery shopping when I notice something that catches my eye. It was one of those things that you just don't really pay attention to unless it happens. Like, it's hard to describe. Pretty much every single person who walks into a grocery store either grabs a cart or a basket, right? And people just running in to grab one or two items are in and out in like a minute. So I remember seeing this one dude just kind of walking up and down the aisles with nothing in his hands and thinking like, what the heck is this guy doing here? But he's not doing anything too weird, so I just sort of move on. Only time and time again, I'm in an aisle grabbing things off of shelves and I see him just kind of idling and a few times we make eye contact. Nothing too creepy, just like a casual glance, but this happened over and over again to the point where I was like, is this dude following me? Anyway, I get my shopping done, walk back to my apartment, and forget all about it. A few hours later, and I'm sitting in my apartment alone, just chilling and nursing some big food baby from a local Chinese place I got delivery from, I hear footsteps on the stairs outside my apartment. Heavy ones. Nothing unusual as such, but then the front door to the apartment just goes boom, 
shaking from some heavy impact on the other side. At first I thought it was a neighbor or something, so I shout out like, What are you doing, dude? But there's no reply. Just another loud bang against the door. They're not trying to get my attention. They're trying to break in. And I just about jump out of my skin, just like instinctively grabbing my phone to dial 911 while I run in my bedroom, kneeling down to the safe under my bed which has my 40 caliber in it. I tell the dispatcher what's going on. She then says the cops are on their way, but I have no idea how much time I've got, so I run back into the hallway with my pistol locked and loaded, aiming at the door and shouting that cops are on their way. But this does nothing to deter whoever's on the other side. They just keep slamming against the front door, and each time it seems like the door is closer and closer to just giving way. Only when I'm like, I got a 40 here, buddy, don't make me do it, does the banging stop. And this is like perfectly time to hear approaching sirens too. I then hear more heavy footsteps on the stairs outside, and then all is quiet. A short time later, I'm giving my statement to the cops that arrive. I have my phone in my hand and I see a notification come up from the girl that I'm seeing that just says, I'm sorry. I wait until the cops leave to call her to be like, why are you sorry? Is this us breaking up or whatever? And when she answers, she's in tears. Through her sobbing, she tells me something that makes my jaw drop. And here's basically a summation of what she said. She's been hooking up with the guy who'd sent me the unwanted picture, who had apparently gotten super weird once he was in her apartment, telling her she needed to break up with me because he wanted her as his main partner. He went off about how I wasn't down with polyamory, how I wasn't good for her, blah blah blah, and when he's gotten aggressive about it, she'd kicked him out and told him not to contact her again. This guy is from a city on the other side of the state, my girl figured that he'd just drive back home. Only he doesn't. And apparently he'd gleaned enough information about me from her, maybe even gone through her phone to get a look at some pictures of me to be able to actually track me down. And that's when it hits me. It was him in the grocery store, who had then followed me back to my apartment, waited until it was dark, then tried to break in to do God knows what. Confront me, beat me up, kill me, God only knows... Now this polyamory stuff wasn't just making me jealous, it was putting me in actual freaking danger. If that guy had only been a little more patient, waited for me to go outside to take the trash out, anything like that, I legit might not be around to type this experience out. And that scared the life out of me, as I imagine it would any of you. Me and the girl broke up shortly afterward. It was kind of sad, sure, but... The whole experience had totally soured the relationship way beyond any kind of repair. We never talked again after that, but not before I told her to tell that creepy SOB that we'd broken up, that I wanted nothing to do with any of that anymore, and to leave me alone, or he'd be going back to his hometown in a wooden box. Now just hearing or reading the word Discord leaves a bad taste in my mouth, as I know the kind of creeps that are out there, using the internet for far worse than just some innocent kink stuff. A few years ago, I was part of a True Scary Stories server on Discord. It was a place where people would share their own personal stories of scary or spooky things that happened to them in their lives, and for a while, it was honestly a lot of fun. Sure, a lot of the stories sounded made up and generally involved stuff like I saw a shadow figure at the end of my bed and other stuff that sounded like they were lifted straight out of a bad horror movie. But every so often someone would share a story that didn't have a hint of the supernatural in it, something that was actually believable and, occasionally, these stories were genuinely terrifying. I read a lot of seriously spine-chilling stuff on that server, but a lot of it I've forgotten over the years, probably because although they were creepy, they just weren't disturbing enough to actually stick with me. But there was one story in particular that I've never forgotten, because it's genuinely made me shudder to read. I hope the user in question doesn't mind if I share their story, and if they happen to read this, I'd like to think that they could let me know in the comments and maybe correct anything I got wrong, because I'm telling this from memory. But anyway, here goes. The poster began their story by assuring us that their story wasn't just some fabrication, and although they were pretty young when it happened, 
just thinking or writing about it as an adult was a pretty stressful experience for them. They went on to explain that their early years were marred by tragedy, how their dad had died when they were real young from a drug overdose, so they were raised by a single mom living in a small apartment just down the street from their grandma's place. Mom did some dating though, obviously trying to do the right thing and find them a stepdad to give them some kind of father figure in their life. The incident in question happened while she was out on a date. Usually speaking, their grandma would babysit for them anytime mom needed to go do anything that meant she couldn't bring them along. But on the night of her date, the grandma was working, so although it wasn't ideal, nine or ten year old storyteller was left unsupervised in their mom's ground floor apartment. Sounds kind of irresponsible at first, but the storyteller was quick to reassure the members of the server that this was back when Yu-Gi-Oh was popular. As long as they had their cards and a box set of cartoons to keep them occupied, being left alone for like an hour or two certainly wasn't an issue for them. It's not like they were going to wander out of the apartment or get up to any mischief while their precious Yu-Gi-Oh was keeping them busy. But at some point during the evening, they're sitting there playing with their cards and watching TV when they heard a tapping on the window. Remember, they lived in the ground floor apartment, so pretty much anyone could have just walked up and started tapping on the glass. No climbing or levitating or any of that stuff was involved, so there was nothing inherently worrying or creepy about someone knocking on the glass. The storyteller then gets up, walking towards the window before drawing back the curtains, only to reveal the face of a complete stranger. Not their grandfather, not their uncle, but a complete and utter stranger. Surprised and confused, they back off from the window, letting the curtain slide back into place before this horrendous crash sounds. Broken glass tumbles onto the carpet at the foot of the curtains before another smash sends more glittering shards onto the floor in front of them. At that point, they said they just tossed their Yu-Gi-Oh cards onto the floor and bailed. Rushing out of the back door of the apartment and over to a neighbor's house, pounding on the door in a state of abject terror as they looked over their shoulder every so often to ensure the mysterious predator wasn't hot in pursuit. But thankfully, the neighbor answers the door, lets our storyteller in, before taking the time to calm them down to get the full story out of them. Naturally, they called the cops immediately, who rushed over since they were given the description of a home invasion in progress. The neighbor then gets in touch with the storyteller's mom to let them know the awful news, who immediately rushes home to comfort their terrified son. Then after that, both the neighbor and storyteller's mom accompany them back to the apartment, where the cops are still searching the property and surrounding area for any sign of the attempted intruder. Apparently one of the cops approaches the mom at this point and shows her something in a clear plastic evidence bag. Mom stares at it, turns pale, then kneels down and hugs her storyteller tight, fighting to hold back tears as the neighbor guy is just like, my god. They both ended up staying at the grandma's place for like a week after while the window was repaired. And if that seemed like a bizarre amount of time to fix a window and that something else might be behind them staying away from the apartment for a while, you'd be right in thinking that. Our storyteller had their suspicions for a little while, but they were too young to really understand the implications of what had happened. The kind of danger they'd been in wasn't clear until many years later, when their mom explained to them just what happened that evening. You see, it wasn't just the window that was being replaced. The entire apartment was being fitted with new, incredibly sturdy locks, CCTV cameras, just about everything short of a panic room, all being paid for by grandma and grandpa. The whole family was absolutely terrified and it was all down to the piece of evidence that the cops showed to the mom that night, the little thing in the clear plastic evidence baggie that made her turn ashen and squeeze our storyteller in a big, trembling bear hug. What was in that plastic bag was a photograph. A photograph of a young boy curled up in bed, sleeping soundly, and that boy was our storyteller. The mom told a much older storyteller that the photo couldn't have been taken long before the attempted break-in. Something about the sheets on the bed being fairly new or something, I can't quite remember. Or maybe it was a new haircut storyteller had gotten. But either way, it was some detail in there that made it clear that the attempted intruder had broken into the apartment somehow, maybe only a week prior, 
and taken a photograph of our storyteller while they slept. I can only imagine they had done so to several other children too, making a little catalog of potential victims, perusing them for hours on end before finally deciding on one they liked the most. I think that's what made my blood run cold back when I read their story. The idea that the intruder had taken this perverse liking to them, one that was strong enough for them to be unable to resist their urges, or whatever kind of sick, twisted desires had them smashing that window in that evening. The family only felt safe again when they heard the news that the creeper, whose M.O. was eerily similar to their own experiences, was caught by police and jailed after being extradited to another state. But they kept the whole thing a secret from our storyteller until he was in his late teenage years. There was no more details after that. There wasn't any grand conclusion, just that it was something that had haunted him for years. I never read anything as horrifying as that on the Discord server. It made everything else seem tame in comparison, and I stopped reading shortly afterward. It's weird how we seek out scary stories sometimes, just to give ourselves a little thrill but end up being genuinely traumatized, not by the spoopy skeleton stories, but by things that we know could have easily happened for real. Number 1. Across the Bane Submitted by Caleb Sharp Not too long ago did I work at Subway, my first paying job that I would grow to hate. I needed the money though, and the thought of facing customers finally broke me out of my shell. I guess in a way it did. I got the job around late April of 2016. My brother-in-law and sister had been wanting me to get a job so I could break out of my depression and hopefully alleviate some stress. At that time, my grandmother had a vicious stroke and it was up to me to take care of her. I ended up having to drop out of school, and it made me very homebound, as she could not be by herself too long. At first, I loved it. Everyone was very nice and kind, from customers to the employees. The minimum wage thing didn't bother me too much, as I was happy to be making money for myself for once. All was happy and good, until November that year. Around then, I knew what I was doing. The sandwiches, the prepping. I didn't have a problem with that anymore. I had even made some friends and I couldn't complain with my job. But every now and then, I would have this regular. Not surprising as I live in a small college town in the South. He was an athletic man, a toned one, but he had a strong lisp and would often converse with the men on our staff such as I. Personally, I didn't mind him at first. His jokes were okay, I'd guess, but it would seem that he had a deeper reason for making them. Now, I'm pretty dense and have problems picking up on social cues, but after I made his salad and he had left, one of my coworkers pointed out that the guy had been trying to hit on me. I laughed it off, but it kinda dwelled on me, to be honest. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't dwell on it because I have a problem with gays, I don't. In fact, one of my childhood mentors was obvious with it. He was a man I looked up to, and we shared the same humor. No, this guy, he was weird. As time would go on, I'd realize he was just hitting on me. And eventually, he would start calling the store and would usually request to talk to me. He would start asking me personal questions, like how my day was, if I'd eaten yet. Then he would start asking about my dog, at that point, I was angry, because how in the world did this stranger know about my dog? When he said that, I kind of broke. I told him to F off, and I told my manager what was up. Luckily, she took my side. She eventually blacklisted his number and had a no-serve order on him. Only a few of the employees even knew about the guy, and they were college kids my age. Usually getting drunk or high and are pretty reclusive, these college kids had no clue, and to this whole situation, they were equally as freaked out as I was. Luckily, we didn't see or hear from this guy again. That is, until he really crossed the line. One night, I was on the closing shift. It had been about three months in the freezing season of February. This dude had stopped coming here since around January, and my grandma had passed away recently. 
so my mind was focused on other stresses. It was really late, and I had skipped my break during a rush and was told to enjoy a 30-minute one before we closed. Not one to argue about a break, I stepped out back for a cigarette with my phone in hand. I'd been reading something my friend wrote for a minute when someone suddenly taps on my shoulder. I hadn't seen anyone out there. I thought I was alone, so when I felt that tapping, I jumped back and nearly crapped myself in the process. And when I saw who it was, I was far from relieved. It's the same guy, standing there in some tracksuit. I called him out, telling him he's not supposed to be here. He laughed this condescending laugh for a second, then asked me about my nieces. Now I live with my brother and sister, and I'm a very active uncle in their lives. They often see me as their older brother at times. When he mentioned them, my blood began to boil. He then asked me simply to hand over my phone and wallet. I, I refused, and more so I told him to remove himself from the premises before I did it for him. Just then, the guy reaches into his track pants and pulls out a freaking crowbar. What went through my mind at first was to allow him to get the first hit so I could hopefully dodge it or grab the weapon, but all in all, I wish he just wasn't there. Before this guy could make another move or attack me, whatever he was going to do, I noticed that my brother was sitting outside of his car. Now, my brother is no army guy or a cop. He is a hardworking man and a determined hiker, and wherever he goes, he carries his five and a half foot walking stick with him. He's kind of self-trained for self-defense, I mean, all you gotta do is whack him hard with the walking stick, right? Well, I stepped out slowly onto the parking lot with my hands up, and this guy was not far behind me. I looked towards my brother with an expression of distress, and that's when he noticed the guy. Getting out of his car, my brother grabs his stick, yelling while also beating it on the building wall, grabbing the man's attention. I honestly didn't know what he was gonna do when he saw that. Would he realize that a crowbar might beat some walking stick and escalate things? Or would he simply give up? Well, when he saw my brother, he turned tail and ran away. And I let out a sigh of relief. Honestly, I didn't know what that guy was going to do. When we went back inside, I told my boss what happened, but she didn't seem to take it too seriously. Or so I thought. Because about a week later, some of our usual boys in blue came in. We put on our gloves to make them a sandwich, but they told us that they weren't there for the sandwiches. Just to pass on the info to our boss that they caught the trespasser with 20 pills of stolen Xanax. I caught on quickly and agreed to pass it on, knowing the guy they meant was the one that attempted to attack me. It's been three months and I've quit for reasons that were unrelated but after contemplating the situation, I realized that I usually stand at the edge of the outside wall behind the store, making it pretty easy for anyone to just stand behind the corner unseen and watch me as I'm oblivious taking my break. Number two, closing shift at Subway. Submitted by Donutsio. I'm 20 years old and I live in Canada. This story took place during the 2016 clown craze in October, about 10 to 20 minutes before my subway store was going to close. To make things a little easier to understand, I've gotta give a brief explanation of the layout of our store. So there's the front door that customers walk through, which is completely made of glass. Then there's the windows to the left, if you're standing behind the counter facing the front. The bathroom is beside the swinging door that employees use to get to the sandwich unit. This all began while I was finishing doing dishes in the back room. I was the only person there because they rarely had more than one employee for the closing shift, unless of course it was for training purposes. Really, only one employee is needed, even though it might not be a smart decision. There hadn't been any customers for a while and I really had to go to the bathroom so I started making my way to the swinging door by the sandwich unit, when all of a sudden, I heard the bell ding at the front door. 
indicating that a customer had entered. I was honestly a bit annoyed because I'd been putting off going to the bathroom for a long time and obviously I can't leave someone unattended in the front store. Before I even turned around to take the person's order, and I know it's going to sound odd, but I heard the generic sound of a clown's nose honking. It sent shivers and goosebumps through my entire body as I hesitantly turned around to confirm what I had just heard. There was someone standing at the door with a bright orange afro and white face paint. Beyond that, they were dressed extremely casually, though in a plain green zip-up hoodie and black jeans, which almost made it creepier. They stared at me and smiled from ear to ear. Before I could even think of doing anything, they gave me a sinister little wave before quickly running out of the store and around the left side window. I was frozen in place. I was wondering, was this really happening? Or better yet, why was this happening? I didn't know the clown craze reached my small town. I just stared at the window for what felt like 10 minutes. Once I came to, I ran to the front door and just locked it. There was no way I was letting anyone in, even if we weren't closed yet. But before I did, I poked my head around the corner to make sure that lunatic was gone for sure. Well, I didn't see anything. He was gone, I thought. I couldn't see him anywhere. The parking lot was empty save for my car. So I went back in the store and locked the doors, counting the seconds until the actual closing time was here. But not 10 minutes until closing, a couple of cops were knocking at the door. I was nervous, yet relieved to see them. I immediately unlocked the doors and let them inside. Apparently, they were there to just ask me a few questions. They wanted to know if I had seen someone dressed with an orange afro and white makeup. Uh, yeah, I was excited to tell them that some creep was out there so that they could catch this guy. Well, they explained that someone called not too long ago, saying that they drove by and saw someone matching that description in the subway parking lot, kneeling behind a green sedan. They were holding a carving knife. My heart seemed to stop. That was my car. The psycho was waiting for me behind my car. If the cops hadn't scared him away by showing up, he'd still be out there. What would have happened if I walked out there alone at closing time? I was scared more than I'd ever been, but the cops offered to walk me to my car and even check it if I needed them to. I happily obliged. Then I got out of there and stayed the night with a family member nearby because after that horrific experience, I couldn't be alone. The clown craze was always hilarious in my eyes until something actually happened to me. There was just something horrifying about the contrast of the clown hair and makeup, along with normal everyday clothing. Better yet, what would have happened if I was already in the bathroom, defenseless and unaware? I'm so thankful I held it for as long as I did and that some stranger drove by and saw this weirdo. I'm happy that I didn't find out what this lunatic was capable of. You can bet I don't work the closing shift at Subway anymore. Number three, Subway Spooks, submitted by Michael T. Back when I was just out of college, me and a friend of mine, let's call him James, decided to eat at a subway. After all, it wasn't far from James' little apartment he lived at. When we arrived, I could already feel this weird vibe of the place. This was a little normal, since James lives in a poor, run-down part of the city, so I normally felt like this when I drived around this area. Well, we went inside the subway and it was pretty normal. I ended up getting a tuna and James got a steak and cheese. And all of a sudden, this guy walks in. He was really pale and skinny and was wearing a dirty wife beater with ripped track pants. He was balding and looked to be around 40 or 50 years old. He came up to the man working behind the counter, then just stood there staring right at him, doing literally nothing, just staring. Me and James were a little freaked out about this and we felt a little bad for the guy working behind the counter, but we tried to ignore him while we ate our sandwiches. 
It was none of our businesses at the time. Around one minute later, the men working the counter decided to try and get the man out. Since the guy was obviously not there for an order, besides the place didn't have much of security, no guards or cameras, so someone this sketchy could have been a liability. The guy came around the side. When the creepy man suddenly ran out of the store, I mean he bolted. But as he ran out, he passed us and he locked eyes with me. It gave me a very nervous feeling. I just wanted to blend in with the background and enjoy my sandwich. But there this weird guy was making a scene and looking right at me as he ran past and exited the store. He managed to get out of the store without a hassle. Though he looked at me as he exited, he never even looked in front of him, yet he didn't trip or run into anything. This guy was some kind of freak. Five minutes later, we heard a car alarm go off really nearby, and maybe 10 seconds later, I realized what was happening. I saw lights coming from the window exactly where I parked my car. It wasn't that great of a car, but it's all I could afford at the time. So I ran out of the store along with James, and we were honestly about to beat the crap out of the person who was trying to break in our car. But when we got outside, nobody was there at my car. So we decided to call it a night before anything else crazy happened. We hopped in my car, not even finishing our food. We didn't even want to at that point, and we were about to drive off. But the moment the car started and the headlights turned on, we saw him. The creepy guy from the subway was in front of our car now. I had no idea where he'd been hiding before, but I swear to God we didn't see him. He was about to jump on the hood of my car. He must have been some junkie or something since he didn't jump until we backed out. We sped off on the way to James's place until he said he didn't want to go home. He lived too close to the subway and the last thing he wanted was that guy to see where he lives. I couldn't say I blamed James. I think I would have done the same thing, but it was weird coming from James because he was the bravest person I knew. So I told him that he could stay at my place, then we went home. Honestly, that was the last I saw of this creepy subway guy. I don't know what was wrong with him, and I've never seen him again, but probably because of him, I'll never be going back to subway, at least not that one. One scary day, my mom and I went to Subway for a quick snack. When we reached our destination, we got out of the car and went inside. Inside, I sat at a table near the only window there. I'd always liked the window seats. My mom was ordering, and I was just watching like the little stalker I was. But as I watched my mother deal with the cashier, the situation seemed to get weird. I could hear them talking from where I was when I suddenly heard the words sex and children. I was starting to get nervous, so I went up to the counter and rested my arm on my mom's head. I'm a lot taller than my mom. The cashier looks at me with an angered look and says, who the F are you? I hadn't even said or done anything, and he's treating me like that. I'd gone to anger classes before, and I did pretty well, but even still, it took everything I had just to say, I'm her son, why? I wanted to say so much more to someone that rude. The cashier was wide-eyed. He's your son? My mother said, yes. Then the cashier pretended that nothing happened, even though I wanted to snap his freaking neck. My mom saw my anger and said to calm down. I just didn't know why this guy was being so disrespectful. The cashier is staring at something under the table, and I look suspiciously at him and look over the table. The cashier noticed me looking at him, so he lifted his head up fast, like he was looking at something in secret. I was still trying very much to fight the anger from this rude person. I don't know what he and my mom had been talking about, but he still had no reason to treat us like he did. Suddenly, and I still have no idea what set this guy off, maybe he was crazy, he pulls out a pistol that he had apparently taped under the counter, and he began to point it at the two of us. And when he did, I let anger take over me, and I jumped over the counter and began fighting with this guy. I felt like if I didn't, someone was going to get hurt, and I wasn't going to give up until that gun was out of his hand. Taking quick glances to check on my mother, she seemed extremely surprised, and she was still like a statue. As I'm struggling with the cashier, 
He whips the arm holding the gun toward my head, and I flinch and feel something smash into me. It hurts, but I don't stop fighting with this man. My mom at this point was running out of the store, and before I knew it, I feel another crushing thud against the back of my head, and then everything slowly got dark. I came to in a hospital bed. Confused, I got up, but at that moment, the only thing I felt was pain. I dropped myself back onto the bed. A doctor walked in and said that I had a concussion. He told me not to worry, that I'd be fine within about a month. All I have to say is that I'm glad I didn't get shot. We are along with several others, pressing charges against this freak. Apparently, the guy just snapped, and no one knew he had been hiding a weapon in the store. Number 5. Subway Watcher Submitted by Orion I'm here to share with you a really strange story. This is not my own experience. It's my friend's story. And let's call him James. James has been working at a subway for a year, and he really hates his job, but it pays pretty good. Well, on February 11th of 2016, he almost quit because he was just having a regular day until this one customer comes in. It's a big guy, very rough looking. He welcomes the guy, saying that he'd be with him in a moment because he had to finish up another order. Eventually, they get to his order and James rings him up at the register. Once everything is done, he hands the guy his sandwich bag, but the guy doesn't move. He doesn't try to take the sandwich. He tries to get the man's attention. Maybe he just zoned out for a second, but the guy completely stops. He doesn't blink. He's just staring straight ahead into nothingness. James was wondering what happened because it looked like the guy glitched as if he was an android that stopped working. James even clapped his hands in front of the man to see if he would blink, but he didn't. He didn't react to anything. Freaking out, James runs to his manager to see what needed to be done. Maybe this guy had a health condition. Maybe they needed to call an ambulance. For all James knew, he was having a strange seizure or something. But as he and the manager approach the front of the store, the man isn't there, and the sandwich bag is still on the counter. The manager is annoyed, thinking that James made this up to freak him out. But James is serious, so he talks the manager into showing him the tapes to prove his point about how weird this guy was. They go together since the store was closed to check the security footage. And get this, the guy never shows up on the tapes. James was dumbfounded when he saw it because there was James making the sandwich for no one. Now my friend may be a stoner every other weekend when he can, but he's definitely never been known to hallucinate. He still doesn't know what happened that day. In January of 1992, Kelly Day Wilson was just a 17-year-old senior at Gilmer High School. With her well-coiffed curly blonde hair and extravagant jewelry choices and bright blue eyes, Kelly Day was a pretty picture and had no problem making friends after she relocated from Natchitoches, Louisiana to Gilmer, Texas so she could live with her mother and stepfather. She hit the ground running and struck up an on-again, off-again relationship with a young man by the name of Chris Denton, and the two spent a great deal of time together in the lead-up to the new year. It seems Kelly's life was going swimmingly well, and it's clear that no one could have possibly expected what fate had in store for her, something that would raise questions among true crime enthusiasts that pervade even today. On January 5th, 1992, Kelly finished her shift at the Gilmer Square outlet of Northeast Texas Video, closing the store at around 8.30pm before heading over to a local bank to deposit the store's daily takings. This particular bank branch's security cameras showed that an individual did indeed make the night deposit for that evening, but the captured footage didn't provide a clear enough image of the person for a positive identification of Kelly, simply showing an arm in her car. We can presume it was her but we can't be 100% certain. After locking down the store's shutters with their manager, Joe, he wished Kelly goodnight before driving away in his truck. The last he ever saw of her, she was last seen wearing cut-off stonewashed jeans, 
a purple rugby shirt with gold trim and brown loafers, and was getting into her car in preparation for her night drive to the bank. But Kelly didn't arrive home that night, nor did she check in with any of her friends. Her mother became so worried that she sent her stepfather out into the night to aid in the police search that ensued. And like grim providence, it was him that found Kelly's abandoned car in the northeast Texas video parking lot at around 5 a.m. The car was sporting a single slash tire, and all of Kelly's personal belongings, including her purse, were inside of her car. Only she and her keys were missing. At first glance, what happened appeared to be a complete mystery, but it was one that local law enforcement was determined to get to the bottom of. For two years, the investigation into Kelly's disappearance was headed up by a Sergeant James Brown. One of the first people investigated was obviously Joe, her manager, and the last person to see her alive. However, not only did Joe have multiple alibis, he passed several lie detector tests issued by the police, and as a result, he was rolled out as a suspect. Sergeant Brown oversaw a team consisting of hundreds of police officers and local volunteers, one of which poured thousands of man-hours and into an intensive search of the surrounding area. Yet despite such a thorough search, as well as hundreds of tips from the general public, not a single trace of Kelly was ever found. Police believed that they were close when they arrested 17-year-old Michael Bibby, who was taken into custody on misdemeanor charges in an incident of alleged tire slashing. Michael was guilty of many, many things, but as police discovered, slashing Kelly's tires wasn't one of them, and in the end, he too was ruled as a suspect in Kelly's disappearance. Investigators then turned their gaze to another suspect, Kelly's on and off again boyfriend Chris Denton. The couple were said to have been going through a rough patch at the time of her disappearance, and with people saying that Chris had something of a short temper, there was a period where he became the case's prime suspect. However, through the course of the investigation, circumstantial evidence would clear him of all wrongdoing, and the police would be forced to look elsewhere for their abductor. Unbelievably, in a number of interviews conducted in the process of their investigation, police had heard a handful of stories alluding to a satanic cult that called Gilmer home. But since the accusations named members of law enforcement as members of the cult, specifically Sergeant James Brown himself, the claims weren't taken seriously by those that heard them. Yet, in 1994, the local community was rocked by almost 50 indictments against 10 different people, all on charges of child abuse. And given some of the evidence presented against them, police proceeded with charges of aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, and capital murder in connection with Kelly Day Wilson's disappearance. It's at this point that Kelly's story seems to intersect with that of the Kerr family, because in 1990, a man named Wendell Kerr told his wife Loretta that he wanted a divorce, kicking off a chain of events that would bring prosecutors their one best chance at finding the perpetrator. Wendell Kerr was one of six adult children of Eugene and Geneva Kerr, a couple who were briefly married in the 1950s before a hastily divorce. Geneva Kerr went on to marry two other men, both of whom died before Geneva remarried Eugene, making him both her first and her fourth husband. According to their children, Eugene and Geneva Kerr abused their children on a daily basis. A relative later confirmed their claims of carnal abuse and spoke of witnessing daily incidents of indecent assault. This same relative also confirmed that they'd witnessed Geneva Kerr's interest in satanic practices, including daily readings from the satanic Bible and an interest in both animal and human sacrifices. In exchange for law enforcement's help escaping the Kerr family, one of their grown-up son's wives offered to tell investigators everything. She claimed she was kept as a slave to the family for ten years, couldn't drive a car, constantly threatened by Geneva and Danny, and her only form of identification, her birth certificate, was kept by Danny in his wallet. In her own horrifying words, her role was simply as a breeder. Cut back to Wendell asking his wife for a divorce. Loretta strongly began to suspect that Wendell was trying to ditch her for a younger woman, and if that was the case, she was going to burn his entire life down before she left. She went to the police with accusations, and as a result, Wendell was arrested, placed on the offender's register, and forced to serve out a period of probation. A state welfare worker assigned to the case later concluded that ritualistic, satanic abuse was endemic in all branches of the Kerr family. 
and over the next several years, almost a dozen of the clan's children were taken into the care of Child Protective Services. The social worker also mentioned in a horrifying affidavit that in October of 1992, two of the children took us to show us where the devil meet people to abuse and hurt babies. In 1994, the escaped Kerr wife was interviewed by the Harrison County Jail in Marshall, Texas, in which she described in gruesome detail the torture that Kelly Wilson would receive for approximately nine days before she was ritually sacrificed and then cannibalized. She described Geneva as the leader and said that several of the Kerr clan, along with Sergeant James Brown, were all present during these events. Connie Martin and Wanda Kerr both had stated in interviews that Kelly Wilson was a birthday present for Geneva Kerr and that the matriarch reveled in the poor girl's torment. Yet in light of the accusations, it came to light that information was allegedly coerced from the Kerr children as well as some of those indicted in the disappearance. Some of the children were allegedly programmed to tell the stories the investigators wanted, while the prosecution tried to coerce a confession by offering life in prison in opposition to the death penalty as long as they confessed to the killing, best summarized in a quote from a state official that reads, Investigators working on little more than hearsay have created a mythology about a satanic cult, leading to what some describe as a modern witch hunt. They indicted a whole family and even a police investigator destroying his law enforcement career, straining his marriage and prompting death threats. The Texas Attorney General, finding no evidence any of the charges were true, instead uncovered suggestions that the whole cult theory was the product of coercion by overzealous investigators, even to the point that they physically restrained children to elicit allegations of satanic activity. Ultimately, the Attorney General's office were forced to dismiss every single one of the charges alleging satanic abuse and sacrificial murder. The satanic cult was found to be a complete fabrication, nothing more than a fantasy concocted by the Kerr children under the influence of police investigators. Chris Denton, Kelly's old boyfriend, tragically died of cancer in 2004, but there were rumors that he had made a deathbed confession. The close family dismissed these allegations as thoughtless, malicious hearsay and maintained Chris's innocence to this day. Joe Henry, the owner and manager of the Northeast Texas video and the last person to see Kelly before she vanished, stayed mostly under the radar for a number of years. But in a despicable twist in the story, Joe was arrested on charges of possessing indecent images of children. However, police have emphasized that in spite of the nature of the charges against him, he had never been considered a serious suspect in Kelly's case. For all the twists and turns, trials and confessions, finger pointing, and numerous suspects, Kelly Wilson has never been found, despite 20 years of searching. She is presumed dead but a body has never been found and no valid charges have ever been made in connection with the case. Without a body or Audrey's jeep being recovered, there's simply no way of coming up with any definitive explanation as to why she disappeared. There must be a rational explanation as to why she vanished, but given the circumstances, for all intents and purposes, Audrey and her vehicle basically dropped off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. I was on Snapchat for like 20 seconds when all of my friends had already reposted these really weird messages saying that a senior had then threatened to shoot up the school. The message by the guy had said, Mothers will mourn, siblings will cry, fathers will remember. I'm going to kill someone this week. God help me. Then there was a video of him shooting an AR-15. I was understandably totally creeped out. I started calling my mom and dad crying and begging for them not to make me go to school. Luckily, they said they heard about it and that me and my sister didn't have to go to school. There were about three kids that ended up being arrested for the plot of the threat, and nothing actually happened that day. I don't know what happened to the guy who said that, but all I know is that I hope he got the help that he needs. It's really crazy to think about what could have happened if he would have succeeded. I've been trying to have more of a social life. I spend most of my days off from work at home and in bed. It's gotten so bad that whenever I attempt to go out, I immediately get overwhelmed and I always have to leave. 
I've even downloaded a few apps that are strictly for platonic relationships. And because of this interaction, I'll definitely be uninstalling them. It doesn't really take much for me to be friends with someone. I guess I'm really naive and look past any possible red flags if there are any. I met someone that I used to work with in the same building, and we both thought, wow, who would have guessed that we'd cross paths? Then boom, instantly became friends. Let's call him Josh. Josh told me I was pretty during a couple of times during our first interaction, but I brushed it off and I told him that I only wanted a friend, and he seemed to be okay with that. One thing that really stood out to me was how easy it was to talk to him. We talked every day constantly for about a week via Snapchat, and I really enjoyed our conversations. It was enough for me to want to hang out with them. Last night, I got out of work a little earlier than expected, so I thought that I'd go to a bar since it was still happy hour. I had a good day, and I really wanted a beer. One beer turned into like eight, and the drunken outgoing, not so socially awkward me came out to play. I pulled out my phone and then started looking through my contact list for anyone to invite. I messaged Josh and sure enough, he was down. He requested an Uber and within about 10 minutes, he showed up. The initial meeting was pretty fine. The alcohol flowing through me made it really easy. He wasn't really interested in doing any drinking, so I closed my tab and I had a really brilliant plan. Let's freaking go to Walmart, I exclaimed. I don't really know why I wanted to go to Walmart, I just wanted to do something. Josh happily agreed though, so we walked to Walmart. When we got there, Josh had told me that he had to use the bathroom, so while he did that, I walked around the store waiting for him. A lot of time passed, so I decided to message him and ask what's up. Josh then replied with, I went to the bathroom to jerk off. When I asked him why he told me that and why he told me he had a boner, it was really awkward and he said that he was trying to get rid of it. I don't really know what exactly was going through my head at the time, but I remember muttering, what the hell, to myself, over and over again. Shortly after, he messaged me a bunch asking me to help him, saying that it was because of me, telling me just how much that he really wanted to screw me and how he was really close to coming out of the bathroom and kissing me. Just really gross stuff. I started hyperventilating. My heart literally felt like it was going to jump right out of my chest. My flight or fight mode then kicked in and I just started running out of that Walmart. I ran back to the bar I was at and got another beer. I also told the bartender everything that happened just in case he decided to come back. Then I requested an Uber to go home. I'm sober now and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it all. I actually decided to go back and read our messages and I was way too freaking nice about it. I just kept saying to him that it's okay, I'm just a bit uncomfortable, and also apologizing afterwards. I decided to text Josh about an hour ago. I wanted to let him know that his behavior was not okay, and that I screenshot the messages. He apparently shops pretty frequently at the store that I work at, so I know that I'll eventually have to face him again, and it really sends shivers down my spine. Just great. When I was 13 years old, my mom had a breakdown and she couldn't work for over a year. This caused us some economic issues and we lost a lot of things in our house. Our car was the main problem. It broke down and my mom didn't have enough money to get someone to fix it, so all she could really do was get rid of it. Without a car, we all started taking the bus and train pretty much everywhere. Me and my brother took the bus to school, and our school was actually kind enough to get us taxis to drive us home. One day, about two or three years after my mom's breakdown, I was waiting outside for my taxi to come. The taxi usually comes out about 15 minutes after I end the last lesson, but on that day in particular, it was about 50 minutes late. Then when it finally came, I jumped inside and he drove off. I was a little sour that I had to wait almost an hour, but I didn't really complain since I was really just happy to finally be on my way home. Now, since I took the taxi home pretty much every single day of school, I had started recognizing the drivers. The driver on that day was pretty new. I had never seen him before. He had a full beard and an ACDC cap on. 
The first thing he did after he drove off was apologizing for being so late. I told him it was okay and he started up a conversation. He asked me if I wanted him to put on some music and I said sure. I discovered quite quickly that he actually had the same taste of music as me, so I felt right at home. No real worries at all yet. About a week or so later, I was waiting outside for the taxi. I realized the taxi was then late yet again, and a thought came to my mind that maybe it was that driver. He had become my favorite driver since he had been so friendly and really talkative, but I hadn't really seen him since that one time. And just as quick as that thought came to my mind, the taxi arrived, and surprise, surprise, it was him. I decided to sit at the front this time for some reason, and we started up a new conversation. I remember his phone's notification tone. I thought it was funny, so I laughed a little, and that started up a new conversation about how he found himself to be funnier than most guys out there. He asked me if I agreed, and that's when all of the red flags started going off. However, I decided to shake it off. Everyone says weird things sometimes. It's okay, right? After a bit of talking, he then asked me about my age. Really just viewing it as an innocent question, I then answer him that I had just turned 15. He pulled out a piece of paper as well as a pen, and then he asked me a question. Do you have Snapchat? I kind of got silent for a while. The alarm bells were wailing like crazy, and I just knew this was wrong. He was like 30 years old and I was 15 and he was my taxi driver. Why would I want to talk to my taxi driver on my spare time? I was so scared to turn him down though. I really didn't know what he would do if I turned him down. It's not like he was forcing it on me or that he was trying to be intimidating, but I just didn't trust that it would turn out alright if I turned him down. So I said yes and then I wrote my username on the paper. When I finally came home that afternoon, I felt really guilty about it. It just didn't feel right. I got into the house, got into my room, then sat down on my bed with my phone right in front of me and just stared at it. I was really terrified that he was going to add me and then start talking, but also that I had misspelt my username and that he would probably question me about it the next time he picked me up. And then after about 10 minutes, I got a notification. He added me. He had sent me a hey. I tried pulling myself together and then started chatting with him. Now at first, it was pretty innocent. Then of course, it started getting weird. For everything I said, he would come up with a way to compliment me or try and be flirty. Example. So where do you live? I asked. Since he knew where I lived, I thought it wouldn't really be a big deal to ask where he lived. I live in a small town right outside of yours. Why? Do you want to come visit sometime? He said. What do you do on your spare time? I like to go fishing. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. Oh wow, I've always wanted to try that out. Maybe we can do it together sometime. And then came the creepiest question. I had started catching on what he was after, so I then started to question him about it. Why did you even add me? What? I thought you liked older men. Yeah, it was creepy, and no, I didn't like older men. He had apparently thought that since I liked having a conversation with him, that I liked him or something. So the very next day afterwards, I was absolutely terrified that he was going to pick me up. I thought about blocking him or telling him to stop talking to me. But I was only a 15-year-old girl, and he was a big 30-year-old grown man. What if he got mad at me? God knows what he would do to me the next time he picked me up if he was in a sour mood. To my absolute relief, the taxi that picked me up that day was a different driver, and as quick as I got inside, I told him what happened. I had asked him to tell his boss or whatever to maybe reassign him so that I wouldn't have to see him, but luckily the boss was a lot smarter than that. The next day afterwards, the driver had told me that the man was fired and he was never going to drive another taxi for the rest of his life. I really hope that's true. Apparently he had been preying on a lot of other young girls too, but none of them had spoken out about it. I blocked him on Snapchat, and I haven't seen or heard from him since. Thank the Lord. A couple years ago, when I was 15, I was really big into Snapchat. 
I was kind of obsessed with building my snap score, so I would add random friends and accept random requests to do so. It was pretty weird, I know, but being that young, my snap score was a number that mattered to me for whatever reason. Now, a lot of my friends from school and I have this group chat. I remember it was a Saturday when one of them mentioned we should go to the mall. A lot of them agreed, and I wanted to as well, but realized I didn't have a ride. So, I posted it on my story if anyone was able to pick me up and take me. I was more so expecting someone I knew to respond, like my cousin or something. But I got a Snapchat back from this guy I'd never talked to before. Or at least his bitmoji was a guy. But either way, I didn't know who it was. It said he was my friend on Snapchat, but we had never had a single conversation or even shared any pictures back and forth before. He texted me something about how he was bored and had nothing better to do. I remember responding to him, asking if he even lived in the same state. It turns out he did, but the town he said he lived in was at least a two hour drive from me. I told him not to worry about it, and I didn't want him to drive two hours just to take me to the mall. But he quickly responded saying why not. At this point, the whole conversation felt off to me, but he insisted. I finally ended up agreeing. I told him he could come pick me up, but only if he was willing to send me a picture of himself. I was just trying to be cautious. A couple minutes later, he sent me a snap. I opened it, just to see some 30-year-old guy looking back at me. The guy had on a really dirty hat smiling at the camera, though like half of his teeth were missing. The caption on the snap said he was on his way. I sat there for a second thinking it over in my head. How did the guy know where to pick me up? He didn't even ask for my address. That's when my heart dropped, realizing I had my snap map on meaning that anyone I had as a friend on the app could easily find my address. I panicked and quickly responded to the guy apologizing, saying I actually had a closer friend willing to take me. Now, obviously that wasn't true, but the fact that this guy was willing to drive two hours to pick someone up he had never even met before, just from their location on the snap map alone gave me an off vibe. Plus, the guy looked insanely creepy, definitely not someone I'd feel comfortable being around. The guy opened the snap a couple minutes later, but never responded. As far as I know, he never showed up. Though, I live in a cul-de-sac, and usually we wouldn't get any cars passing by our house. But I swear, for at least the next few days, there was this same black SUV that would constantly drive by. Whether that was related or not, I don't know. Though, about a month later, I was on Facebook scrolling through my feed. I passed a news story that had one of those attachments meaning it was sourced on a different website. I almost always scroll past those things, but I couldn't help but stop for this one. There, on my Facebook feed, I could clearly see a picture of that guy from Snapchat. There was no doubt in my mind it was the same guy. The headline of the news story read that he was arrested for attempted murder. This whole experience makes me think I dodged a major bullet by trusting my gut and not accepting a ride from the guy. The whole situation shook me up for a while, and nowadays I try to be a lot smarter and only allow people I trust to see me on the snap map. I'm a female, and when I was a sophomore in high school, I took a lot of different classes. One of them I don't think I'll ever forget. It was a history class, and the regular teacher for the class had another job on top of teaching. And because of this, we would often get a substitute teacher for the class. It was always the same guy. I would say he was at least in his mid-50s. Nothing ever struck me as odd about him, since if I'm being honest, I rarely even ever paid attention in that class. That was until one day. I was in the middle of working on a project he assigned, but every time I looked up for my paper, he was just staring at me. Every time I would look at him, he wouldn't even break eye contact and try to play it off either. One of the times I looked up, I noticed he had his phone pointed in my direction. It looked like he was taking pictures of me. I of course was creeped out, but didn't say anything in case I was wrong. Anyway, a few weeks later, somehow, which I still don't know how to this day, the guy found my Snapchat username and added me. I knew it was him too, as he had his full name on the account. I didn't know what to do, but I still regret the decision I made. Knowing he had an influence on my grade, I ended up adding him back. A few minutes later, he sent me a snap saying hey. He had his face in it and everything. At this point, I knew something wasn't right. I took a screenshot of the snap and left him on red. 
He quickly followed up with another snap, this time a black screen with a question mark as the caption. I again left him on red and forgot about the whole situation. Over the next few weeks, there were multiple occasions where I would check the snap map just to see him not far away. And this would happen anywhere too, not just at school. I would be at the mall with my friends for example, and see he just so happened to be at the same mall. Or even sometimes at school, when I knew for a fact he didn't work that day. Though, overall, for a solid month, nothing but those supposed coincidences took place regarding the whole situation. But of course, a few days later I would get a random message from him. I could tell it was a chat this time, and not a regular snap. I opened it, and I was absolutely horrified. He sent around 50 pictures of me in pretty much any situation. Some were of me at school, but others confirming my suspicion about him following me on the snap map were of me not on school campus. Obviously, I left him on red, screenshotted everything, and blocked him. I instantly told my parents, and they notified both the school and the police. It's been two years since the situation. I'm a senior now, and ever since he sent the pictures, I'd never seen him again. I can only assume he was fired, as we actually got another substitute teacher who was really nice. Overall, the whole situation was really disturbing. The fact that I had someone following me around and taking pictures of me just based on my location on the snap map for a good month of my life absolutely terrifies me. I deleted Snapchat shortly after the whole experience, and like I said, I haven't seen the guy since, so I'm not entirely sure whatever ended up happening to him. This happened about two or three years ago when I was still a minor and in high school. I was walking home alone and I think it was starting to get close to daylight savings. It was around 5 p.m. and it was starting to get dark. I was making my way past downtown since I live nearby. My high school is in the dead center of downtown, so most people have to either drive or walk through it to get back to the neighborhoods. So as I was walking back, I was minding my own business and started listening to a podcast. I think that I might have been crossing a street or a stoplight when I then laughed at whatever I was listening to, and this weird guy then kind of shoots me a weird look. I ignored it and just kept walking down the street, assuming that he wasn't going to bother me since he seemed to be going in a different direction than me. I was about two blocks down when I see the same guy now jogging up to me, and I was really put off by him since he was some older guy, maybe in his 30s. Hey girl, I just ran a mile to come talk to you. I kind of just rolled my eyes at him and then said, You ran like two blocks. <laughs> I guess I was just exaggerating. Anyways, I just wanted to tell you that you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. How old are you? I'm a minor. Well, this didn't stop him. Oh, so you're younger. I really dig that in a relationship. At this point, I really wanted to tell him to screw off. But there was nobody around since I was on the edges of downtown and it was starting to turn into apartments. I just asked him what he wanted so that I could leave and he asked me for my number. I felt like it was the safest option to give him what he wanted, but instead I punched in my snapchat. He let me leave after this, and we both went on our ways. At this point, I thought that he would maybe only shoot me about two or three messages and then give up. Not even two hours later, this dude actually messages me about three times asking to take me out to a bar and drink, and I then felt disgust boil up inside of me. I reminded him that I'm a minor and that I couldn't really do that. He continued to say some pretty nasty things to me, telling me I was hot and how he wanted to mess around with me. I was starting to get really pissed off, but instead of blocking his number, I really wanted to give him a piece of my mind. So I told him he was gross and that he shouldn't even be talking to me since I was a minor, and the fact that he was preying on younger girls was really nasty. Then he said, Oh damn, I really love that you're so fiery and sassy. I hope our babies are just like that in the future. You're going to be a really great mother to my kids. Let me pick you up from your high school so we can mess around. My skin ran cold at this remark and I instantly blocked his snapchat. I never actually told him that I was even in high school or what high school I was going to. For a while, I always made sure not to walk that same way home and I always watched out for him 
but I never saw his car again. Thankfully, he left me alone. I'm guessing to go prey on some other young girls. I really just want to warn other young girls of this predatory behavior, and if you think you're in danger or that someone might come on to you, always make sure you have some form of self-defense. If there's no way out of the situation, try to resolve the issue and get out of there as quickly as possible. Before anyone asks me why I have a stranger on my Snapchat in the first place, I'm going to clarify that whenever people add me, whether it's for my Instagram or just quick ad, I always add them back. However, I don't remember adding this guy back. So basically, this started yesterday when me and my cousin just got home from a party around 10 p.m. We were sitting in my living room for a while, just watching Netflix, and nothing seemed really weird during that time. At one point, I jokingly said to my cousin, Look behind you! Because we really like to mess with each other like that. However, this time she was pretty sure that she actually saw something in the window actually move behind her. Not really thinking anything of it, I just figured she was trying to scare me back, and pretty much just forgot about it. That was until out of nowhere, my dog jumped up, ran to the front door, and then started barking really aggressively. We kept trying to yell at her, trying to get her to stop, but she didn't leave it alone for at least another three minutes. I thought that maybe she could have just heard a noise from the TV or something that scared her. But the movie we were watching had ended like 30 minutes ago, and we were both just sitting in silence on our phones. Keep in mind, all of this happened around 12 a.m. After this happened, I was kind of nervous and pretty confused, but my dog had done this a few times before. So once again, I just tried to ignore it and not really think too much about it. It was now around 1am when me and my cousin decided to go upstairs and start getting ready for bed. I was laying down and on my phone checking out Snapchat when I decided to open Snap Maps. Then I saw it. Someone was at my house with me. I started thinking of all of the different possibilities of who would be that close to me. This guy's name was Sebastian. At this point, I was really confused and starting to get worried because I don't even know a Sebastian. And like I stated at the very beginning of this story, I don't ever even remember adding back a Sebastian. I decided to go back downstairs to check and make sure that all of the doors were locked. In my house, we have an alarm system where every time you open a door, it will chime to let you know. For some reason though, it was unplugged, meaning if any of the doors were being opened, whether it would be the shed door, backyard gate, or just any other door leading to my house, no one in our house would be notified. I had asked my cousin if she was the one that unplugged it, and she didn't even know we had it. I was genuinely worried now, because when I checked the snap map, it said that he was last seen an hour ago. And that very same hour ago was the same exact time when my dog started viciously barking at the front door, for no reason. The more that I thought about everything, the more that it seemed connected, but there was really nothing I could do, as I had already checked downstairs and already locked all of the doors. I actually do have multiple cameras around my house, and I decided I would just check them in the morning because I needed to get the password from my mom anyway. It's currently the afternoon now, and I'm still waiting to check the cameras, but nothing really weird has happened since last night. Although, when I last checked Snap Maps, it said that he was last seen 11 minutes ago and still at my house. I did send him a chat and then said, Who are you? And he just replied back with, Who am I? Who are you? So I didn't answer. His Snapchat score is 28,000, so it isn't really likely that this is a fake account. I won't know anything else until I check the cameras, but if I do find anything... I'll definitely insert pictures and screenshots of the chat and snap map if necessary. I'm not really sure what to do because I don't really have any proof that I could bring to the cops. It just really seems like everything is just some weird coincidence and I'm really creeped out at being at my house now. But like I said, I'll let you know if I find anything. Alright guys, so I have an update. Okay, so today has literally been crazy. Me and my cousin both have been really freaked out. I'll start with last night. Me and my cousin had been hearing some really strange things all night long. I even thought that I heard people talking outside my house around 2am. Also, for everyone that keeps telling me to call the police, we actually did that today. 
But the reason we didn't do it last night or the night before is because at the time, we thought that we were just being paranoid. That is, until now. Sebastian wasn't on the snap map at all last night, so we both figured that he wouldn't be anywhere near us, and like I said, we were just getting paranoid. However, we were really wrong. We finally got the password to check the cameras, and fortunately, we didn't really find anything from the night before. Then we checked the footage that was from last night around 2am. The camera picked up a figure, and I have multiple pictures you guys can look at. The figure looks white, but I think it was actually all black and the camera inverted it, but I don't really know. Here's some of the photos and screenshots of when I first noticed that he was on the map. Anyway, for those of you who kept telling us to call the police, we did. They came this morning and they checked the footage. They also looked around our house just to make sure that nobody was still lurking around. They said that they would patrol around our neighborhood when it got dark for the next few nights. They made a report on the man trespassing and we gave them as much information as we could, and hopefully they can find him. We both feel a little bit better now, but it's really unnerving to know that somebody was actually lurking around our house last night. Neither one of us can figure out what he was doing or trying to do. He looked like he was just walking around, but like I said, we really have no clue what he wanted. Anyway, Sorry for not updating sooner, but I couldn't get into the camera footage sooner, and I was really just worried and didn't really want to think too much about it. Also, I've been trying to answer your questions. So to all of you that keep telling me to turn off my Snapchat map of myself, well, it was never on. I have no idea how he got my address in the first place, or even if he knew it was my house. And I definitely don't know anyone named Sebastian. This entire ordeal has been very stressful and scary for me, my cousin, and the rest of my family. I'm still very shaken up and really worried that he may return with worse intentions. But I really hope that doesn't happen. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. A couple of years ago, me and my boyfriend were looking at this budget Airbnb for a weekend in Berlin. It wasn't the nicest place we'd seen, but to us it was just going to be a place to get some sleep in between hours of exploring Berlin. We'd hardly be there basically, so we figured we'd go for it. When it comes to paying for the rental stuff, there's a problem with my boyfriend's card details, so we decide to use mine. Then there's a problem with my card details too, so we try using PayPal. That doesn't work either, and we can't work out what's going on because we definitely had the money in our accounts. It must have been a problem with Airbnb's payment services or something. But tell that to the owners, who ended up getting really annoyed with us because we'd already basically agreed to rent the place via verbal agreement. By the time we got our bank stuff sorted, turned out it was fraud on both our accounts. They weren't interested in renting to us anymore, so we missed out. Or so we thought. Ages and ages later, my boyfriend sends me a link to an article from a German newspaper telling me to get it up on my iPad so I could use Chrome to translate it. But before I actually used the translate feature, I scrolled through the whole article like, why did he send this to me for? And lo and behold, there's a picture of the Airbnb we wanted to rent. Only then did I translate the text, so it was only after that that I read that two parents and their young baby had died in a carbon monoxide leak that occurred overnight in the bloody Airbnb we were going to stay in. I'm not religious or anything, never have been, but I kind of get what people are talking about now when they mention guardian angels or whatever. If it hadn't have been for that annoying fraud, we'd have rented the flat, and it might have been us that were there when the gas leak happened. I was just absolutely horrified when I read through the story, and I was crying like a baby by the end of it. It said the owner had been arrested over it, that he was going to be charged with some variant of manslaughter or whatever, and rightfully so if you ask me. I still get chills when I think about it though, and obviously we just stick to hotels these days. Not that they're any safer, but it just makes me feel safer, you know? Because when I picture that poor family, who went to bed one night and never woke up again, all because some cowboy landlord was too cheap to service the flat. Ugh. It doesn't bear thinking about. In 
In October of 2017, the 36-year-old Australian Ramis Januzzi was going through a rather rough time in his life. He had been working as a bricklayer in recent years, but a long drawn-out struggle with illegal substances had resulted in Ramis's lifestyle and health deteriorating rapidly. Drastic measures were needed and fast, but to his credit, Ramis had the presence of mind to understand that he needed to break from his old life entirely. And so, Ramis downloaded the Airbnb app and started browsing affordable, rentable properties around his home city of Melbourne. Ramis didn't have a particularly large budget, so when he found a room for rent at a very reasonable price, he leapt at the chance to rent it. To Ramis, it didn't matter that the place had a couple of less than glowing reviews. He didn't care if the atmosphere wasn't friendly. He didn't care if the plumbing looked dodgy. He just needed somewhere that was away from his old haunts so he wouldn't be tempted to feed his addictions. What exactly happened during Ramis's first two weeks in the property isn't exactly clear, but it seemed that Ramis's roommates and he didn't exactly see eye to eye. There was no kind of confrontation or animosity between them, but we know for certain that at some point, Ramis complained to a friend that he didn't like the vibes between himself and his housemates. Yet despite their apparent bad vibes, Ramis chose to extend his stay in the property which added an extra 210 Australian dollars to his bill. Yet on his final day at the property, Ramis was horrified to find that he had no money in his bank account. It was later claimed that this was because his employer had forgotten or neglected to pay him, but regardless of the reason, Ramis had to face the music and tell the landlord that he didn't have the money to pay him. The landlord, a man named Jason Colton, was no fan of Ramis. He was apparently extremely suspicious of his demeanor and had long suspected that he would be unable to pay the extra money to stay in the property's spare room. Yet there's no way that Ramis could possibly have suspected the extreme nature of Jason's reaction. He figured they'd be able to work something out, delay payment by a couple of days until Ramis could get in touch with his employer but it seems that Jason was not in the mood to discuss the matter like a gentleman, and what should have been a simple discussion turned into a living nightmare for Ramis Januzzi. Just as Ramis was planning on talking to the landlord about his current financial situation, Jordan and the two other young men who lived at the property burst into his room to confront him. They had heard Ramis packing his belongings in the bedroom and assumed he was about to do a runner, as one of them later phrased it, which is why they seemed to be heading him off before he could do so. Ramis apologized profusely before showing Jason a banking app on his phone, illustrating that he didn't have the money he owed. He offered to get in touch with his employer, and that he could probably get the money over to Jason over the days that followed. As he spoke, Jason's features turned from pale pink to deep red, and as he finished talking, his rage erupted in a fiery display of pure wrath. Jason grabbed hold of Ramis by the throat and pushed him up against the wall, choking the young man violently as he tried in vain to free himself. Jason wasn't exactly a giant, but he still towered over the small stature of Ramis, on top of being considerably stronger than him. It was with Ramis being in this completely helpless position that Jason began to pummel him mercilessly, throwing his fists into his face over and over again until his nose and cheekbones were broken. What became clear much later is that Jason simply did not believe that Ramis didn't have his money. The landlord had gotten it into his head somehow that Ramis was trying to somehow get one over on him by showing him an empty bank account when really he had the money stashed somewhere else. Jason continued to brutally assault Ramis with the help of the two other men that resided at the property and at some point the confrontation spilled out into the front yard. The neighbor that had called the police later said that they saw a man limping from the front door of the property, one who was trying to scream but was unable to do so thanks to being choked by the enraged Jason Colton. Ramis tried all he could to escape, but Jason continually dragged him back onto the lawn, demanding that he check his bank account again to prove he wasn't lying. But when Ramis once again showed him an account with less than 10 Australian dollars in it, instead of calming down and figuring something out, Jason's rage was renewed. Only this time, he wanted not just to physically hurt Ramis, but to humiliate him too. The landlord then took a plastic pencil case from Ramis's belongings, 
stripped him half naked, then proceeded to shove the pencil case somewhere it really didn't belong. But Jason wasn't done yet. He began choking Ramis, demanding he pay the rent money that was owed, but Ramis was in no state to form a cohesive sentence. Instead of letting go to give him a chance to speak, Jason continued to keep Ramis in a chokehold. Ramis passed out, never to awaken again. With Ramis in the mortuary, Jason was charged with first-degree murder. A neighbor of his later testified that the disturbance was so loud that she could hear it from a few houses away, the distinct sound of a man screaming at the top of his lungs. It sounded like aggressive male behavior, she told the prosecutor, and I wasn't going anywhere near that. The prosecution had ample evidence of Jason's guilt, as his police interviews are a disturbing mess of lies and counterclaims and until he is confronted with the fact that his victim had actually passed away. At that, Jason stated that Ramis deserved everything he got. But Ramis didn't fight back. He didn't pose a threat to the landlord at any stage. He was mercilessly beaten and choked to death on the front lawn of a small suburban home, all for just a few hundred dollars. The jury saw Jason for what he was, the lowest kind of scum and convicted him of murder before a judge handed him an 11-year prison sentence. When we use services like Airbnb, we take a great deal of comfort in the flashy website and lose ourselves in the glossy photographs of our potential rentals. We're quick to forget all the company is doing is hooking us up with other regular people and that pretty much anyone can post an advertisement. How many other people like Jason are out there? How many other violent psychopaths are renting rooms to unwary strangers who would turn from tenants to victims at the first provocation? We should definitely all be careful who we interact with on websites like Airbnb because we might be renting rooms we'll never leave. Okay, so this might sound like a bit of a weird one because it's not like a spooky story. Our Airbnb wasn't haunted or anything, and I don't believe in stuff like that to begin with. But when me and my girlfriend stayed at an Airbnb in Belgium, something happened that creeped us out so much that we had no choice but to leave the apartment and check into a hotel. I've had a mate of mine tell me I overreacted over this, but just put yourself in my shoes. First proper morning of our little weekend getaway to Bruges. Me and the old ball and chain are getting ready to go out for breakfast, we realized that neither of us had packed any toothpaste. It was one of those I figured you'd do it kind of things. But it was no big drama since we could just brush our teeth and help ourselves to sketchy mints the owners had left for us. But I do remember my girlfriend looking around in the bathroom just in case the owner had left us any and saying some throwaway thing like, I wish they'd left us some toothpaste. Boring, I know. I'll get to the point. We go after breakfast have a wander around Bruges, grab some toothpaste, then head back to the Airbnb. That night, I go to take a shower before bed and saw that my girlfriend had picked up the weirdest toothpaste that I'd ever come across in my entire life. Honest to God, it looked like something you'd get out of a Second World War ration pack with this eye-watering, old-fashioned menthol smell to it. I have my shower, walk back into the bedroom where my girlfriend is half asleep and I kind of poke fun at her for buying vintage toothpaste. She's knackered and half asleep like, what are you on about? Telling me to shut up and go to sleep, etc, etc. I had a wee giggle to myself, then got into bed and tried to get some sleep. It was the weirdest thing because how did she not realize she picked up such weird old toothpaste? And that's when it hit me. She didn't. She didn't realize because she didn't buy it, which means someone else bought it and then put it in our room, which meant that someone was listening to my girlfriend when she was in the bathroom, and it's not like the place was small and the bathroom was near the front door to the apartment or something. God forgive anyone who wake up my missus in the middle of the night, but I decided the circumstances warranted waking her up. She was annoyed at first, telling me to leave her alone, but once I explained the situation, she just sat up rigid in bed, like completely freaked out. We racked our brains as to how someone might have heard us, but couldn't come up with anything. 
Like I said, the place wasn't small and the walls were pretty thick. So how had someone heard us? The landlord lived miles away and as far as we knew, no one else had keys. It's something that bothers me to this day to be honest. They still can't work out how someone heard us. And I did ask the landlord about it who told me no one had been in the apartment. We were convinced it was him though, enough to just pack our stuff and leave. I know he hadn't exactly brandished a knife at us or anything. What happened would most likely make for a terrible horror movie, but like I said before, put yourself in my shoes. Someone is listening to you when you go to the toilet, and for all you know, they're watching you too. And God knows why they're doing it, but it can't be a good wholesome reason. A thousand nopes, seriously. Just thinking it over had me and my girlfriend getting out of there. It didn't ruin the trip too much, like we realized early what was going on, so I think we got off quite lightly. The extra hotel money was the real scary part, though. This past Christmas was me and my girlfriend's three-year anniversary. We don't typically do much, so this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Wyoming, and we rented a cabin in the snowy mountains for the weekend. We found the cabin on Airbnb with a hot tub, and we were instantly sold. The cabin was in the middle of pretty much nowhere. The nearest other house was a half mile away. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road. We got to the cabin, and we both looked at each other, not thinking it was going to be that desolate. But we quickly brushed it off, as the cabin was amazing. We went inside, and there was a booklet with all the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season to not be surprised if their contracted snow plowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Alright. Well, that was fine, we both thought. We unpacked, and quickly realized there was no service on either of our phones. Though, the booklet in the cabin told us that there was a landline if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire, playing board games and drinking wine. It was honestly really nice. The weekend was exactly what we needed. Now, at this point, it was only 6pm. We planned to spend the next night in town, and this night, I booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone for quite a while, not returning till about 10. Dinner was great, and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne and hot tubbing to end off the night. Now, something that should be mentioned is it had been snowing all day. As we were driving back, we both took notice to how much more snow had piled up outside. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway, though I stopped the car in front of the house with my headlights shining. My girlfriend looked at me confused. There were clearly fresh tire tracks on the driveway, and I asked her if she saw them too. We both knew this couldn't have been us, as we hadn't even driven on the driveway itself, just the nearby street. Immediately though, we remembered the snowplowers that could have stopped by, but the issue was, we saw the tire tracks because of the snow, and who plows the snow in the pitch black dark? We also knew that once we were at the cabin, we had no cell service on our phones. We both agreed to head back into town and message our Airbnb host and ask him if one of his friends had stopped by the cabin. We got into town and sent over a text. We proceeded to wait for a reply, but unfortunately, we didn't hear back. We could have called, but at that point it was past 10 and we didn't want to be disrespectful guests. We figured we blew the whole thing out of proportion and might as well head back to the cabin. We just figured we must have been psyching ourselves out over nothing. We drove back. And this time we actually drove up on the driveway. As we got out of the car, my stomach dropped as I noticed fresh footprints on the property. From what it looked like, someone had drove up on the driveway, parked, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had also now driven on the tracks, we couldn't find where the footprints ended. The property was quite large, with tons of trees and bushes. We knew that the footprints could have gone anywhere. We decided to call the police, as the whole situation was too weird. We figured it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go up to the property with us and check everything out. We drove down the road till we got service, called the police, and waited for their arrival. When the policeman showed up, we led him to the footprints. He scanned the property, and even partly in the surrounding woods, but determined there was no one out there, or anywhere near. Obviously, we were a little shaken up, but thanked the officer as he left. Needless to say, neither of us were in the mood to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after the whole situation. Instead, we locked the doors and watched a movie I had downloaded on my laptop in one of the bedrooms. 
though, we were both tired from the whole day and had passed out not too far into the movie. Fast forward to 3am and I woke up. I remember seeing my laptop had finished the movie with my girlfriend fast asleep right next to me. I shut off the laptop and set it on the nightstand. Though, I was pretty confused as to what woke me up, as I'm a pretty deep sleeper and won't wake up to almost anything. That's when I heard a slight bump on the bedroom window. The curtains were closed, so I couldn't see what produced the sound. I figured it must have been a small clump of snow falling on the window, and proceeded to lay back down to fall back asleep. But not even 10 seconds later, the sound came again. This time a little louder. At that point, I thought it best to get out of bed, pull back the curtains, and see what was making the noise. And so I did. I got up and opened the curtains, but there was nothing. I turned on my flashlight on my phone to get a better look, as honestly all I could see was darkness. I had to open the window so the light wouldn't glare, and right as I did, my light revealed fresh footprints in the snow right under the window. I was instantly put on edge. I proceeded to point my flashlight into the darkness. I swear, I could see a figure just standing there in the snow maybe 10 yards out. The footprints under the window led exactly to where the figure was standing. My heart dropped, but I stayed calm. I closed the window and woke up my girlfriend telling her we had to go. She asked me why, but I didn't tell her, knowing she would freak out. I just said we needed to pack our stuff and leave immediately. Confused, she complied. About 10 minutes after I had seen the man out the window, we both had all of our stuff at the front door and were ready to make a dash for it to the car. And so we did. I opened the door and we dashed outside to the driveway with all of our stuff and got inside. I started the car and was starting to reverse out of the driveway when my girlfriend screamed. I looked to where she was looking in reaction, and there the figure was, right beside the house, now just watching us leave. I booked it out of there, not looking back. Once we got far enough to have cell service, we sent over a text to the Airbnb's host explaining the whole situation. And later that morning, we would get a text back from the guy. He said that he went to the cabin, and there were indeed footprints all around the building. He said the footprints stopped at every window. This freaked us both out, but realistically it was out of our hands now. We never heard back from the guy, so we never ended up knowing if anything ever came of the whole situation. But that figure, and just the whole experience in general, still terrifies me and my girlfriend to this day. I'm 18. And I just recently moved out of my parents' house to go to an out-of-state college in California. Now, my flight flew in a few days before the school dorms actually opened. So, me and a few friends thought it would be fun to rent an Airbnb until then. So we did just that. We bought the cheapest one we could find, as we were just broke college kids. On the first day when we arrived, I couldn't help but notice how sketchy the area was. You could easily tell we weren't in the best part of town. But I guess that's what we get for buying the cheapest option. It was the second night, and all my friends went to a nearby house party. Though, I decided not to go, as I had a pretty bad headache and didn't feel like doing much. So I was left home alone. It was around 9pm, and I was just coming out of the bathroom when I heard the front gate to the yard swing open. I saw someone run past the porch window and into the backyard. From what I could see, it looked like a deranged guy hunched over wearing all black. In reaction, I ran to the window facing the backyard. I didn't see anyone, though I never saw the guy return, which meant he must have been somewhere in my backyard. I stood there looking out the backyard window for a good few seconds, when I heard a knock on the front door. I jumped in reaction, but walked over to see a pretty normal looking dude in his 40s. I went right up to the security bars, and the guy proceeded to ask me if I'd seen his son. I replied saying, Yeah, I think so. I just saw someone go into the backyard. He responded saying his son ran away and he'd been following him trying to catch up to him. It struck me as weird though, as the first guy didn't look much younger than the second. I thought there was no chance he was this guy's son. The guy walked off towards the backyard before I could question it though. I waited by the front door for a bit, until I saw both of the guys fidgeting with the door in the back. I went up to ask what they were doing, and they stopped for a second and just replied with, Hey man, my son really has to use the bathroom. Could you unlock this door and let us in? The guy stood there staring at me, dead in the eyes, waiting for my response. I told him no, as these guys really gave me an off vibe. And that's when the second guy threw his whole body at the front door in an attempt to break it down. I jumped back in response, and ran upstairs to grab my phone to call the police. I stayed up there till they arrived, though the two men were gone when the police arrived. The two officers proceeded to tell me 
that two other break-ins were reported in that area not even an hour ago. I never knew if they ended up catching the two guys. It's likely that the first guy ran into the backyard to try to find a way in the house, and the second guy went to help him. What disturbs me most is the fact that they didn't want to break in just to rob the place. They weren't even scared off by the fact that someone was home. They clearly wanted me to open the door so that they could get inside and do who knows what. I'm a male living in South Korea. My cousin, Nari, used to be an Airbnb hostess here in Seoul. The site's become massive. There's something like 2 million properties listed on it, so no matter where you're traveling to in the world, chances are that there's somebody with a room, or a condo, or even an entire house to rent. During her time hosting, Nari met a whole bunch of colorful characters. There were the sweet older couple that came to stay with her eight times while visiting friends in the city. There was the guy who insisted on bringing his dog with him. This little rat-sized chihuahua that was about half the size of my cats. There were a few people who were high maintenance, and there were a few who were really chilled, and ended up joining us for drinks at the bar down the street. I never hosted personally, but I'd help Nari out with her bookings if she had to work late and needed someone to meet her guests. Well, for all the good people, there was Mr. Park. He was this creepy, balding guy that stayed with Nari for a week while he was in town on business. At least, he said that was his reason anyway. I think we were both relieved when he left. I'd met him once, and didn't like the vibe I got off the guy, and there wasn't much she could do to kick him out early or anything, lest he gave her a bad review and dropped her score on the site. After he left, Nari discovered a weird plastic thing he had left in the shower. Turns out, he had left his slimy, fake vagina masturbation aid sitting next to her soap. I took one look and had to explain to her what it was. I remember her picking it up in a plastic bag, like the way people scoop up dog shit on the street. From then on, Nari was pretty picky when it came to who she let stay. One weekend... Nari had to leave for a business trip, so she left me the spare key. She had a booking coming up, a young woman named Sumi, and I was to play host. We'll just call her Sue from here. Sue checked in, got the key from me, and put her suitcase in the spare room. I didn't see any more of her that Friday, or for the rest of the weekend, and I figured she was out enjoying herself. Not too long after that, I could have sworn I saw Mr. Park in our local grocery store. Same balding head, same vibe, but he was at one end of the aisle and I the other. I got that feeling like I was being watched, but when I looked directly, he was gone. At the time, I shrugged it off, figured it had to be some other balding guy, and I was just projecting my anxiety. Now, the building I live in is fairly old which means that the walls are pretty thick, and noise tends to only travel in the hallway. If I'm waiting for the elevator, I can occasionally hear someone's TV if it's really loud, but that's about it. That Monday morning, I was woken up far too early by a pounding sound. It was maybe 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and the sun was barely up. At that point, I was pissed. I threw on a house coat and yanked open the front door without bothering to look in the peephole. I was greeted by two very tense policemen. They asked for my name, and if I knew the young woman who lived across the hall from me, pointing to Nari's apartment. Without thinking, I ran across the hall and through the open door, just knowing in my gut that Nari was supposed to be returning that morning, and that something must be wrong if there were police at my door. The cops yelled for me to wait, but I was on autopilot. At first, I thought someone had robbed the place. Her TV was smashed, her couch was ripped apart like it had been mauled by a bear, her photos were buried under broken glass, her laptop had practically melted into the floor. And then I realized, in some part of my brain, that her TV and laptop wouldn't be here if it was a simple robbery. 
and that's when I smelled it. Death has a certain stench to it. Sometimes, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, like a hospital corridor, you'll get a whiff of it. What I smelled was a full-on, closed-handed fist slug into the face. In a panic, I couldn't stop myself. I flung open the first bedroom door. Nari's room looked just like the living room, but she wasn't in it. By this time, the officers had caught up with me and were trying to steer me back out of the unit, but I broke free of their grasp and flung open the spare bedroom door. Inside was what was left of Sue. We get so desensitized to violence on TV that when we're actually confronted with it in real life, it seems almost absurd, like it's totally unreal. She had literally been torn to shreds with a knife. Just from smelling the air alone, I could taste that metallic flavor of blood in the back of my mouth. I showered several times a day for the next week and could not get that taste, that smell out of my hair or skin. It turns out that Sue had been there since Friday night. Nari got home a few hours later. By that time, the forensics team had already been in and out and were starting to clean up the scene. I couldn't tell her about what I'd seen. I just remember hugging her. While investigating, the police had found a second set of keys. This meant there was actually a third set of keys to Nari's place. And those keys had prints. Three guesses as to who they traced back to. Mr. Park. Park had made a set of keys while staying at Nari's, and he wasn't here on business as he had claimed. It turns out he lived about 15 minutes outside of the city. Security camera footage showed him coming into the building that Friday night, and him lurking around outside for the past month prior to that, just after his stay. Surprisingly, Park confessed to the murder, said he didn't know that Nari would be out of town, that he hadn't known she had had a guest that weekend. His wife had recently left him and taken the kids with her, and Nari reminded him of a younger version of his wife. Nari and I have both moved buildings since then. I still can't believe that all of this came because of broken trust. By giving a stranger a safe place to stay, by letting him into her home, this person was so twisted that he thought to make a copy of her key. If it had been any other weekend, Nari would have been at home, and what happened to Sue would have happened to her, too. Since my very youngest days, I was treated as a golden child. My mother heaped buttloads of affection onto me and bragged to her friends how great of a son I was. I fear my younger brother missed out because she had already spent all of the love she had on me, so to speak. I joke about this, but I am somewhat serious at the same time. His upbringing lacked much of the praise and attention I was given. When I began playing in organized sports, the rest of the world joined in. Soccer came first. It all came so naturally and before long I was the top scoring member of the team. Once I discovered football, everything else went by the wayside. Posters of Brady and Bledsoe covered my walls. My large, strong hands allowed me to grip and throw the ball with the power and precision not many twice my age had. All three years of middle school, I remained the starting quarterback. I did so well that by high school, I was playing on par with most seniors. My prowess in sports, of course, made me very popular in school. One of my teachers called me the big man on campus. I was never lacking the attention and approval of the staff and most of my fellow students. I didn't get a free ride though. Without good grades, I wasn't qualified to play. Luckily for me, I had always been good at most subjects, except for perhaps math in which I scored lower Bs. I had decided by my second year which college I would attend. I knew if I continued on my current path, I'd be quarterbacking for a professional team right out of college. To encompass all I had achieved, I quote a line I had once read that described a man as having the world in the palm of his hand. That's probably the best way I could describe the trajectory I had put upon myself. I was destined for success and nothing was going to get in my way. I tell you all this in order to show just how far I was soon to fall and exactly how much I was about to lose. I was a junior. I had already been named the starter on the varsity team. 
When not studying, I split my time between the weight room and practice. It was just before the third game of the season when Rosalind arrived. I had my mind off somewhere else when she entered our class. I still remember it like it was yesterday. A few of my classmates were grumbling about something and it caught my attention. I happened to look up just as she was passing near me, and her beauty was breathtaking. I can honestly say with confidence you've never seen her equal in Hollywood. The rich silkiness of her auburn hair, to the sensual fullness of her lips and her porcelain skin, on an inch of her image had a flaw. I gave her my heart in that moment and I knew nothing would equal her in my life. She took her seat at the back of the class. None of the shyness that usually existed in the newly arrived students showed in her actions. The room was hers completely now and she knew it. My focus was on her for the remainder of the period. She had to have known. My gaze would have burned right through her had my eyes been lasers. This day marked the beginning of a long downhill slide, and I would give anything to experience every second of that time again. Concentrating on anything else was impossible. Class after class, only Rosalind existed. Practice was much the same. I wasn't on a football field. I was still in that class, soaking in every inch, every curve of her body. From then on, my only thoughts were about her. I used my charm to get her address from an office worker. That Friday evening, as I led the team to another victory, my only desire was for the game to end. Afterwards, I sat outside her house dreaming about her and I walking hand in hand through the halls as everyone watched jealously. I resolved in that moment that I would own her body and soul until the end of my life. My first action upon arriving at school that following Monday was to locate Rosalind and bear my heart to her. I did just that, but her reaction wasn't what I'd envisioned. I spoke from my heart. Every word was true, but rather than collapse into my arms as I'd seen on TV so many times... She replied with four short words. I don't think so. I will admit to being disappointed, but her response left me with a ray of hope. She hadn't been cruel or mocking after all. Perhaps she had been playing hard to get. I knew I had to pursue her as a hunter pursues his prey. Maybe I would even be required to make a large sacrifice to prove my love. After all, that's the way it works in the great Hollywood films and novels. She would realize she belonged with me. I just needed to help her realize that. I searched my soul, day and night, for a way to make this happen. Suddenly it hit from out of the blue. If I gave up football, she would have to see how dedicated I was to her. That day I informed the coach of my decision. It went about as well as you would think. He was angry and yelled for almost an hour, but at the end of our meeting, he wished me well. I was elated. I had to tell Rosalind that very second. She didn't answer my text right away, but when she did, her only answer was, Why? The queasiness churned up in my stomach. Even after all I'd done to let her know I loved her, putting it into words still made me very nervous. I did it for you, I said. My hands shook as they moved to push send. It was now or never. She would be left with no doubt to how I felt about her. After sending it, the time seemed to drag on forever. The hours passed with no word from her, and I couldn't take it any longer. I sped over to her house and waited outside her window. I watched as she changed for bed. Every curve, every line of her body remains with me to this day. I sent a new text to let her know that I was waiting. She appeared at her window within seconds. Seeing her in the nightgown made my heart race, and there was only one reason she would let me see her this way. My mouth was dry with anticipation. I broke into a sweat. I expected to be met with soft words, but instead she began yelling, almost screaming. Her words didn't make sense. I was confused by her behavior. It only got worse when her father came outside. I tried to explain my love for his beautiful daughter, but... He was deaf to my words. Rosalind began to curse me from her window. Terrible things I don't dare repeat here. I never dreamed this could have happened. With every word, her curses knocked me lower and lower. It was a pain I'd not wish on anyone. I was so distraught I didn't hear the word police until it was almost too late. 
I fled just as I noticed flashing lights up the street. I laid down in my car as they passed and sped away as they pulled up to Rosalind's house. My sobs grew and grew until I was consumed by my grief. I laid curled up upon my bed wailing uncontrollably. However, as my tears began to subside, another fire kindled inside. My anger roared by the second, until it consumed any sadness I once had. By dawn, I had transformed into some sort of beast. A monster I never knew existed in me had taken control of my body. I began to rage. I thought, no one says those things to someone who loves them. They know the power they have over them. The idea of punishment fleeted in and out of my brain, briefly at first, then more and more until it set root and fostered a plan for retribution. I see now just how far I had gone. My love, if that's what you can call it, had transformed from obsession into hate. The quickness in which this occurred still terrifies me. In that day and in that time, I could only think of one thing. Revenge. She had to feel my pain. There was no other way she could learn what she had done. I entered the school that morning with a single, focused purpose. My anger had clouded my mind from considering the consequences of what I was about to do. I could see the terror in her eyes as I drew closer, and I can remember feeling satisfied by this. I said nothing. I just grabbed her by the throat, both hands gripping as tightly as possible, and I knew it wouldn't take long. My grip was strong and my hands were large. I was oblivious to the grabbing and pulling of others around me. Her face took on a dark red, then almost purple hue, and I knew it wouldn't be long now. I stared into her beautiful green eyes, eyes that I had dreamt of for countless hours and was awed by them even as they filled with the streaking of blood. My adoration angered me even more. The next thing I remember was lying on the school floor being held down. The din of their yells seemed muffled. I was miles away, lost in the confusing pattern of the ceiling tiles above me. I'm not sure how long it was before I was told Rosalind had survived. It appeared I had been stopped before I was able to achieve my goal. This news didn't anger me, nor was I relieved. I had become numb. It's taken me many months to reclaim the identity I once was. I was terrified to feel anything. I'd become nothing more than a frightened child. I've been fortunate enough to be sent to an institution that focuses on therapeutic rehabilitation. I'm by no means fully healed for the lack of a better word. There still are moments where I find myself giving over to my dark side. I don't necessarily blame the entertainment industry for the way they betray relationships or the pursuit of love in a wider context. I'm responsible for the way I handle the situation. Something inside of me is broken. However, in the same breath, I do question what impression they intend on presenting. A young, naive, and romantic man such as myself is inundated with talk of the so-called game and the premise of sacrificing for love, among other trite concepts. Without any real guidance from a more experienced adult or father figure, a young male often uses images from the popular entertainment around him. It is a discussion that should be had considering more boys are growing up without a positive male role model in their lives. Please pardon me for going off onto my own path. I still require a lot of work. The purpose of writing this was to recount the events that led me to my current position. My counselor and I agreed that it would be a good idea to put my story and my feelings at the time on paper. It could serve as a motivating factor for myself and others to see how far I've come in my therapy. Now that I have, it is certainly encouraging to see the progress I've made. At the same time, it's shed light upon the darker side of my personality and that has been a horrifying vision. Despite this, I'm confident I'm on the path to regaining my true self and perhaps one day you'll recognize the brother you grew up with. I've just about written down everything I can recall from that time and lights out is quickly approaching. I'll make a copy of this for my counselor minus a little epilogue to you. Of course, I'll be sending you this version for yourself. Feel free to share it with your mom or anybody else in the family that may be curious. I've written mom a short note just about regular stuff and sent it last week so she should receive that soon. 
if you have the time, I'd like you to do something like we discussed and seek out the proper place on the internet to share this. All I ask is that you leave out my name, but I probably don't have to tell you that. I'm sure you don't normally tell people your older brother is... psycho. I'd like young people to be able to read an authentic account of what goes on in the mind of someone like me without all the sensationalistic fluff. I don't seek notoriety or fame for what I've done. It is an inexcusable act against one I profess to love. My hope is that it can serve as a template for the young, a diagnostic instrument to help them recognize the same patterns in their friends or themselves and stop them before they get out of control. I'd like to think if more people had access to this type of information, things like stalking and the crimes that go with it may be able to be stopped completely or at the least greatly reduced. I'll continue to do all I can to stem the tide from here. Perhaps, if enough on the outside can see this, we can create a better world. For everyone. From my experience, most everybody had that creepy dude they knew from school or hung out with. In my school, we all called him Jay, and he was perhaps the creepiest of the creepy. I had the unenviable honor of being there on his first day. It was kindergarten and a lot of the kids threw a fit when they were separated from their parents. I don't hold that against them. We were only five after all. Rather than accepting the separation and joining the others in class, he made things even worse. His mom hadn't been gone ten minutes and he soiled himself. This wasn't a reaction to stress, like you may expect. It turned to be out of pure spite. He must have used this before to control people. When the teacher called his mother, she returned in a matter of minutes and took him home. He had such a smug look on his face as he left, and I knew even then as a little kid that things weren't getting better. The following day, his mother dropped him off in class and he repeated the disgusting behavior and, of course, his mother was called again to pick him up. This vicious power play continued for a week. His mom would leave, he'd ball his head off for five minutes straight only to soil himself again. You probably get it by now. That Friday morning would be the last time I'd see Jay for almost ten years. We moved forward to the first day of sophomore year. We were all sitting in our chairs and the teacher calls out everyone's names. When she called out Jay's, I almost soiled myself. I looked around frantically until this short, overweight kid raised his hand. He was almost a carbon copy of the little kid I remembered. Except now, he looked even worse. His hair was long and greasy, his face covered by patches of hair, and he was wearing this old gray jacket with stains all over it. I think it may have been a members-only one. This was 2013. I was unable to grasp why he looked so bad. As far as I was aware, his family wasn't poor. In fact, I believe his dad was a dentist with his own practice. My amazement toward him would only grow. As class was let out and he passed by me, a cloud of stink almost knocked me down. Man, did he smell. Similar to wet garbage. I probably should have expected it considering his appearance, but this level of funk was all new to me. I did my best to keep my head down and slip out unnoticed. As far as I could tell, he didn't remember me. And boy was I relieved. Little did I know, his hygiene would become the least of his cons. A month passed and school was as lame as ever. Jay remained offensive to the nose and eyes. His gray jacket had become dirtier than his hair. I think he even had Dorito crumbs falling off of it one morning. Unfortunately, his behavior would be far nastier. I caught wind of a story going around that some kid was showing other male students lewd photos of his sister. When I discovered it was Jay, I can't say I was shocked. Disgusted, but not shocked. Eventually, my time came. He approached me in my locker and shoved his phone in my face. Once I was able to focus on the screen, I realized it was indeed a photo of a girl who looked disturbingly similar to himself. I can't say I recall the quality of the picture. The stench was just too distracting. Even though I was in a constant state of discomfort, I was taken aback at how proud he was of the picture. His smile stretched from ear to ear. It was like he was showing me a hot rod he'd built with his dad. And perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the encounter was when I learned that the girl was only 13. I couldn't imagine how strange his relationship with his sister must have been. 
No matter how gruesome things connected to this dude were, he always managed to outdo himself. I guess the shots were so popular he took things up a level and began selling the videos of her showering. Although I was lucky enough not to see those atrocities, I was told by folks who did that rather than being some creep videos, the subject was well aware that she was being filmed. I can't say she was aware her brother was selling them though. Of course, Jay's dirty little secret wouldn't stay that way for long. It wasn't more than a week after he launched his filmic endeavor before it was shut down. The principal and others in power at the school got word of his actions and he was brought in for questioning. Once they had a full grip on what had been going on right under their noses, law enforcement was informed, thankfully. The rest came to me by word of mouth, so take it with a pinch of salt. According to some people, things between Jay and his sister were even more shocking than we believed. She would admit that her and Jay had been involved in some form of physical relationship for the last three years. In addition to that, he wasn't just selling videos around school. He'd been peddling far more explicit clips on the dark web, believe it or not, at least what I was hearing. The rumor mill was churning in overdrive. Jay's sudden disappearance led to all kinds of theories and suppositions. What I do know is that he was gone almost as quickly as he had arrived, and not many missed him. The same source I had gotten my information from prior claimed he had done a few months in a juvenile facility and was released. Basically a slap on the wrist. However, at the time, there was still the question of how hard the feds were going to go after him. Unfortunately, life moved on and I guess folks forgot about Jay. And I can't tell you his ultimate fate. Despite him being a disgusting mess of a person, I feel bad for the others who suffered because of him. The strain revolving around the situation caused his parents to divorce, but perhaps the person who suffered the most was his younger sister. Not only had her public life been ruined, she was forced to drop out of school soon after it all came out. The abuse she had suffered at the hands of Jay has to have done some major long-term damage. I pray she's been able to make something of her life. As for Jay, I could care less how he is. Creatures like him never change. They destroy lives of all those around them, and the world will be a much better place without him. I attended most of my schooling in a small town in southern Oklahoma. In a place with such a small population, you get to know everybody pretty fast. When you're a kid, this can be a big headache. You can't make a single mistake without everyone around knowing about it, including your folks. To this day, I can still tell you the name of the girl that ate paste in kindergarten and the boy who peed his pants in third grade. It's not a way I'd like my kids to grow up. Nonetheless, even in a place so small, there was one kid who managed to live a second, invisible life right under the noses of the nosiest of citizens. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Elliot. He was the last person you'd expect of having a secret life. His family had run the largest business in the county for a hundred years. If I recall correctly, he even had two uncles who had served in the state legislature. He had been raised to be a successful person and, on the surface, nothing about him gave you the impression that he was anything else. All the teachers loved him. His grades were always better than everyone else's and he never hesitated to make himself the center of attention. Even with every eye in the area on him, he had one habit no one had any clue about. Elliot liked to watch. This clean-cut, unassuming young man was a peeper. A peeping Tom. A voyeur, if you will. Of course, nobody knew this, or admitted to it at least. This would all change on the night of homecoming. Our classmates were all kitted up in their finest, each waiting their turn to get their pictures taken so they could head to their real destination a local hotel where loads of cheap booze awaited them. Normally, Elliot would be one of the few actually attending the dance with his girlfriend. Instead, while the rest of the town had their minds on the celebration, he was creeping through his quiet neighborhood in search of something to see. Just before 11, he came upon the open window of a 10-year-old girl. He later told the police that, on a prior expedition, he had noticed the girl's open curtains. Upon getting closer... He watched as she removed her clothes for bed. 
and despite knowing it was wrong, he realized for the first time that he was attracted to very young girls. He claimed he was disgusted by this and cut his nighttime journey short. As time passed, however, the urge to return overtook him. Because of all the people on the streets that night, he wasn't able to return early enough to relive the previous adventure in his mind. When he arrived and saw the open window, a little voice told him to go inside. The house is dark. Everyone's already in bed, so no one would see you. Besides, you just want to watch your sleep, that's all. Unfortunately, Elliot listened to this voice. Entering as silently as possible, he walked across the room toward the corner. He was just inches away when he stepped on a squeaky dog toy, apparently. The high-pitched noise echoed through the room. He froze and prayed the girl wouldn't be awakened. God was not with him that night at all. She shot up in bed as if she had been awaiting such a moment. And things just got worse from there. She turned on her bedside light and Elliot was fully illuminated. The terrified girl began screaming, and Elliot knew he only had a few seconds to flee. He turned and ran for the window, and he was mere feet away from where a strong hand grabbed him by the collar and yanked him back in. He'd barely hit the floor before a hail of powerful kicks and punches rained down upon him. The most he could do was curl up and take the abuse. A moment later, the violence stopped and he peeked out from his arm, and looking down on him was who he'd assumed to be the girl's father. The man's face terrified him. He'd never seen such anger until then. The police arrived quickly and within minutes, they had Elliot in cuffs. It wasn't long before the whole town knew. Although he hadn't done more than trespass into a house at night, the district attorney tried to charge him with every crime possible. Even with all the money and influence of his family behind him, there was no way he was getting off scot-free. He had foolishly spoken to the cops. They had his words to use against him. His lawyer was able to get the DA to drop most of the charges in exchange for a plea. Ultimately, he served 13 months in jail with an additional five years probation tacked on. The length of the sentence meant nothing. His life in town was over. After he was released, he became a prisoner in his own home. He didn't dare leave. A day didn't go by without some death threat or other harassment on his phone. To the relief of everybody, the day his probation ended, he quietly slipped out of town in the middle of the night, never to be seen again. Everybody in school knew Natasha was different. I suppose different is being kind. When you live in a town where everyone around you acts and looks very much the same, a girl like her would, of course, stand out. I'd have to describe her as a goth girl, if that term is even still used. Her skin had a naturally pale tone, but she did all she could to make sure it never got any darker. The Victorian parasol she carried everywhere with her blocked out any possible ray of sun from touching her porcelain-like skin. As if her skin and hundred-year-old umbrella didn't make her stand out, her choice of clothing just made her appear stranger to most. I don't think Naughty, as we called her, owned any color but black. From her coal black hair all the way down to the tips of her patent leather boots, only the chalkiness of her skin offered any contrast. If you were to guess that she was quiet and reserved, you wouldn't be far off. When she did speak, it was only in reaction to another's rude remarks. Even then, she was a girl of few words, she had a cutting type of wit. It didn't take her long to put folks in their place. Most people never got to see her other side. This version of Naughty was terrifying and most likely the cause of her future ghoulish behavior. Before I get to the meat and potatoes of my story, I want to warn my readers. If you are triggered or get excessively upset about the subject of animals getting hurt, stop here. Although I will try to be as family friendly in my descriptions as possible, some things just have to be said. You've been warned. With that out of the way, I'll finally get to the heart of the matter. Despite knowing not everyone who looks and dresses like Naughty are capable of doing the things she did, I think that look was a reflection of how she felt inside. I could never excuse her behavior, but coming from someone who knew her rather intimately, 
She had to have struggled with that evil inside of her. The naughty I knew was an intelligent and sensitive person. Nonetheless, she harbored a deep-seated anger that drove her to commit a string of unforgivable acts. I never learned exactly what caused it, but I suspect it stemmed from some form of abuse she suffered. I foolishly asked about her grandfather on one occasion. This regular everyday question caused a 30-minute tirade. Safe to say, he wasn't a good person. This is likely what led to her compulsion to have power over another living thing. I was already off at school for my first year of college. Naughty, who was a year younger than me, was a senior. We were still on speaking terms after our separation, but I'd not heard from her for a few months. When I had a spare moment, I called to catch up. Her mother answered her phone instead. This naturally surprised me. My surprise soon turned to concern when I was told that Naughty wasn't around anymore. I was shocked and asked what had happened expecting her to say that she passed. Mrs. Ellis coldly stated that Naughty had not died, but she wouldn't be free to speak to me ever again. Then she quickly said goodbye and hung up. I was confused and hungry for answers, so I called a friend who had stayed behind to work. The story I heard still chills me to this day. My friend's dad was a retired cop and still had a lot of contacts inside the department, I knew he'd probably know what happened. A lot of the details concerning her punishment were hazy, but the gruesomeness of her crimes were not. The story goes something like this. Not long after her and I separated, people's cats began to disappear. The ones that were eventually found, the bodies had been drained of their blood and ripped to pieces. Initially, the deaths were attributed to a coyote or dog attacks. With no blood found at the scene, this theory didn't hold up. A few of the wackier folks around town even claimed the deaths were the work of the chupacabra. A total of 22 pets would be lost to the cat slasher in all. Owners who had once let their cats out began keeping their pets in, and neighbors watched their fellow citizens with distaste and distrust. Then, late one evening, the true culprit was caught in the act. A man was out walking his dog when he took notice of a car driving slowly up and down the street. It had passed him several times, but he assumed the driver was searching for a particular address. This changed when he turned on to a new street and witnessed the driver get out and attempt to catch a cat. When the driver realized they'd been seen, they returned to the car and sped away. It was too late, though. The man copied down the license plate number and turned it into the police. The crime that hadn't had much attention from the police until then drew much more of their interest when the car's owner was discovered. Natasha was no stranger to the police. She'd had multiple complaints filed against her in the past. Most were actually just baseless accusations from older people who distrusted her simply because she looked different. She's a devil worshipper and other equally stupid fantasies. However, she'd also been caught shoplifting once or twice. Fortunately for her, she had some mysterious family connection that made everything go away. Things wouldn't be any different this time. Despite admitting everything to the cops that interviewed her, often in gory detail, she would be let off with no repercussions. In fact, the press didn't even mention a suspect had been arrested. Despite knowing her name and all that was said, it was almost as if none of it had even happened. The disappearances just stopped, and almost nobody even knew why. At first, I was in complete shock, but as time passed, it began to make sense. Naughty had always hated cats. I never discovered why, but something major had to have occurred to cause her behavior. And before anyone asks if she took this dark turn because of our breakup, just forget it. She was more than happy to be free again. In fact, I may have been the only thing keeping her from going down that path sooner. For all I know... It had already started prior to our separation and nobody had noticed. I'm guilt-free, my friend. During my visits back home, the subject was brought up a few times. One guy even said he had heard she had been drinking the blood of the cats. She wasn't beyond doing something so crazy, but the girl I knew would have thought something so ceremonial was stupid. Through the grapevine, I did eventually discover where she had gone. Mere days after her release, she was shipped off to a mental health facility out west. What happened to her after that, I have no clue. 
Despite the terrible and cruel things she did, I still catch myself hoping she'll call from time to time. Mostly, I just want to hear her explanation. Whether I do or not, I hope she gets the help she needs. I'd hate to know more people's pets could be in danger because she couldn't resolve the problems from her past. If she does contact me, I'll post an update. Watch this line and stay tuned. I'm just as morbidly curious as you. When I was much younger, I was considered one of the popular girls. You would think that this would be an amazing privilege for everyone to look at you and think that you were the best looking person in the room most of the time, to get all the attention from the guys that you could ever want, and sometimes even making other girls jealous felt kind of good. But let me tell you the truth about it. It really sucks. More often than not, I felt kind of bad for the girls who weren't as pretty as me, and I also felt bad for having to constantly reject a bunch of guys who were trying to date me. This was especially bad in high school. I got hit on all the time. It honestly became very distracting. I hadn't had a boyfriend up until that point. I really went out of my way to be a good girl. I always thought that if I just dated any guy that tried to pick me up, I wouldn't get the best guy that I could. So I just waited until I found a guy that I thought was worthwhile. I spent most of my time with my best friend Destiny. Me and her were really close, but... I remember she almost got kind of jealous when I finally got something of a boyfriend. Me and this boy, Jake, never actually dated, but we were talking for lack of a better term. It was one of those situations where people kind of knew that we were somewhat romantically involved. Like, we would talk on the phone at night and sometimes bring each other gifts to school, things like that. People always blew it out of proportion, but it was what it was. I remember Destiny being very disapproving of Jake. She said that he was a loser and that I could do way better than him. He definitely would have not seemed like the first guy I'd have gone after. At first, he isn't the best looking guy in the world, but I think he's really cute. Or at least I did at the time. I thought his real redeeming quality was that he was the most compassionate guy I'd ever met. Unlike most guys, he actually listened to me when I spoke. I felt like he really heard me. And that was of a heck of a lot more than could be said of any other guy that ever tried to date me before. And if I'm going to be honest, I felt more heard by him than anyone I'd ever met up until that point. The sad part was that Jake had quite a few issues. He wasn't just something of a loner. He also had this dark and mysterious side that I didn't really know anything about. Even to this day, I don't really know what was wrong with him. I just know that there is something about him that isn't quite right. Looking back, I was extremely naive to not have seen the signs before. He was disliked by so many people and it wasn't like your standard reaction where people think he's awkward or something. He totally was, but there was something else that was completely off about him. Even my dog had a bad reaction when I brought him to my house one time. And as anyone should know, if a dog doesn't like you, then there is really something wrong with you. Anyway... Nothing bad really happened between us until we had a field trip one day. Our entire grade was going to a theme park about 30 minutes away. It was supposed to be a really fun thing. As long as we stayed in small groups of at least three, we could pretty much go wherever or do whatever we wanted. The idea of not having to be followed around by a teacher all day was extremely enticing. On the day of the field trip, it ended up being me and Jake and Destiny in a group of three. He really wanted us to ditch Destiny so we could go and have some fun, but I wasn't about to do that to my best friend, nor did I really want to do anything like that with him on this field trip. Most of the day went by and it was actually pretty fun. There was one point when I had walked by a water slide. Some of the kids who were riding on it splashed some of the water and got me completely soaked. I had a spare shirt in my book bag and I went to the girls' locker room to change. But this is where things got weird. There was no one in the girls' locker room. I went in there and started to change, and then I heard someone else walk in. I just assumed it was another girl or a woman. It was a pretty crowded day after all, but no, it was Jake. He started touching me very inappropriately. I told him that I really wanted to do stuff with him, but just not under these kind of circumstances. But he wasn't getting the hint. 
and it really started to freak me out. I could feel it in his pants rubbing against my leg. His breath got heavier and heavier and he got himself really worked up. Finally, I just had to yell at him to stop. I told him that he was really freaking me out and I just got the rest of my clothes and I walked out. But he didn't follow me, he just let me leave. I stood outside of the girl's room for a few minutes waiting for him to come out, but it was a little while before he did, probably close to five minutes. As you might imagine, I was not excited to go back in there and get him. Destiny also gave me a look when I came out. I told her that Jake was in there, but I didn't tell her what he was doing. She just asked why he was in the girl's locker room at all. I couldn't think of a good excuse. I didn't want to tell her that he was being a complete and total creep with me that day. Destiny was fed up because she wanted to go buy a pretzel. She knocked on the girl's locker room door and told Jake that he needed to come out right now. We stood there for a few seconds and we all heard some strange grunting noises. It was honestly really awkward and me and Destiny just stood there and looked at each other. Jake finally made out one last grunting noise and a few seconds later walked outside. He didn't say a word. He was kind of out of breath and it was one of the most awkward moments of my life. We told him that we were going to get a pretzel and he just shook his head. He slowly followed behind us as we made our way to the snack bar. At the time I don't think I consciously knew it, but now that I'm a little older, I think I have a pretty good idea of what he was doing in there. As you might have imagined, that was the end of mine and Jake's little romance. That was the creepiest thing I've ever seen anyone do, and it was so shocking coming from him. I felt like I'd spent so much time getting to know him only to find out that he was even creepier than all the other guys. I went to a pretty rough state school here in the UK. It was only for three years as I ended up moving schools to complete my GCSEs, but it definitely made an impression on me, as well as leaving me with a handful of anecdotes that I don't think I'll ever get tired of telling. Most of them are pretty funny, childish antics and schoolyard gossip, that sort of thing, but one or two others tend to provoke horrified reactions from anyone I tell them to. In one of these stories, is the story of when Mr. Broughton had enough. So there was this kid in my English class called Francis, and Francis was one of those hard cases in our year group. He basically did whatever he wanted because teachers knew that it was just easier to ignore him and teach the kids who wanted teaching as opposed to rising to his bait. Try to discipline him and Francis might just decide to throw a chair or something. As you can imagine, most teachers didn't want the smoke, so... Francis basically ran year 10 for a while. And it wasn't just the teacher's lives he made miserable either. Anyone who wasn't in his little circle of friends was a target for his aggression. As I'm often fond of telling people, he literally fulfilled the archaic bully stereotype of stealing people's lunch money. And it was quite a while before the school threatened to get the police involved. I think they couldn't even expel him because he'd already been expelled once and no other school in his postcode would take him so we were kind of legally stuck with them I guess and apparently so was Mr. Broughton. Francis gave all his teachers a hard time but Broughton was a kind of exception. You see he was a big bloke, an ex-rugby player who tried and failed at setting up a senior rugby team when all the year 10 and 11 lads wanted to do was play football or get high. Given the chance he'd have crushed Francis in a second but given all the rules on how teachers couldn't touch students, Francis knew he was basically untouchable. But that didn't mean he wasn't cautious about it. Francis definitely gave Mr. Broughton an easier time than the rest, at least, until the day he decided to push the envelope. So, that day we're sitting in English class and Broughton is trying with all his might to get us to read through Act 2 of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Francis is up to his usual tricks, trying to put people off reading, making silly innuendos, generally making a nuisance of himself. Broughton starts telling him off for it, gently, mind you, but he's still telling him to shut up and behave. Whenever anything like that happened, I just learned to zone out and let it happen. Like, as weird as it sounds, there's only so much drama you can take before student-teacher verbal confrontations just get boring. 
so I'm not even sure how it happened, but I just heard Francis mention something about Broughton's wife. And then a big chunk of the class did like a subdued rap battle O oh, reaction, anticipating a sharp escalation. But by escalation, I purely mean verbal. There was never any chance of an actual physical fight happening, at least not between a student and teacher. That's what I thought anyway, and that turned out to be very wrong. Usually whenever Francis brought up something personal to do with the teacher, they had long since learned to ignore it. And the thing that really grabbed my attention here was that Broughton had most definitely not ignored it. He was looking up from his desk, redder than a beetroot, just staring at Francis after he made the comment about his wife. It wasn't even that bad, I don't think. From what I heard after, Broughton had said something about leaving the rest of us to get down to business, and Francis had said, Oh, just like your missus, sir. Honestly, it was still considerably less harsh than the majority of the abuse he dolled out to teachers, but still, Broughton was looking at him like he just slapped his wife in front of him. Young man, Broughton started, his voice is literally trembling with rage. I'm going to give you an opportunity to apologize for your comment. Francis should have taken the chance while he still had it, but it was never like him to quit while he was ahead. Oh, struck a nerve, have I, sir? Francis just gloated. He didn't recognize how serious the situation was about to get, and honestly, neither did I. I didn't expect Mr. Broughton to explode the way that he did. I didn't think he even had it in him, yet little did I know, he was about to teach Francis a lesson he'd never forget. Just apologize, Broughton said and we can leave this here. The way he said it was so seething that the whole class was silent, waiting for Francis's retort, and I remember shifting in my seat to suddenly watch whatever he was about to do. I think everyone and their dog could see something cataclysmic was about to go down. Everyone, except Francis. Oh, touchy subject, eh, sir? He said. What, did she cheat on you or something? having it away with a milkman on the side? At that, Broughton exploded, standing up so violently from his chair that his desk shifted a bit. He then marches down one of the rows of desks towards where Francis has sat, and Francis responds by standing up, stepping into the aisle, and throwing his arms up in the air like, come on then, kind of way. He'd done it before, Many times than I could count and it always ended with the teacher backing down and Francis firmly being king of the classroom. Not this time. Both of Broughton's massive rugby player hands shoot up and wrap themselves around Francis' throat. The choking sound he set out was honestly terrifying, like a sharp, constricted attempt at inhalation that just came out as a gargle. The entire class gasped as Francis threw a punch in Broughton's direction but his reach was nothing compared to the teacher's, and his swings missed wildly as he turned increasingly red in the face. I thought Broughton might throw a punch back for a second, but he didn't. Instead, he drags Francis just a few feet toward one of the windows. These are the kind that don't open up horizontally, like a door. They're the kind that open vertically and with just a crack, if that makes sense. Safety windows, so a kid couldn't just fall out, but with an angry teacher forcing a kid towards the opening, there was still enough room for a kid to be thrown out, which is exactly what Broughton appeared to be doing. He was forcing Francis' head towards the opening, pinning him down on the windowsill before forcing his head into the opening. Through a combination of choking and struggle, Francis had barely made a sound as the entire class just sat back and watched in horror. But as soon as his head was out the window, and he's looking down three stories at a concrete playground. His attitude changed completely. Sir, please. I'm sorry. Sir, no. If anyone had been about to speak up, hearing Francis talk in a way that sounded utterly terrified, it stunned everyone into silence. It was like seeing a unicorn or something you never, ever expected to see with your own eyes. A scared Francis seemed like a complete oxymoron. A total impossibility, right up until that moment. Tell me I wouldn't be doing the world a favor, Brunn said. 
He was angry that his voice was cracking as he screamed. Go on, tell me. Tell me who'd be sad if I just dropped you. At least a third of Francis's upper body is jammed out the window at that point. His legs are flailing, kicking at the chairs and desks behind him, and for one hot minute, I think everyone believed Mr. Broughton was actually going to drop Francis out the windows. And only then do they speak up. Kids were telling each other to go get the head, begging the teacher to leave it and let him go. But Broughton was just deaf to their pleas and continued to berate Francis as he forced him further and further out the window. It was only when Broughton once asked again, like, who's going to miss you? And Francis responded with something along the lines of, my mum, she'll be on her own, please, mum, mum. Hearing the hardest kid in our year literally begging for his mother, that disturbed me in a way that nothing else ever really has. In the end, when all is said and done and you're staring death in the face, it really is your mum that you think of last. Fortunately for Francis, I think that was the one thing that saved him, and you could sense the shift in Broughton's demeanor almost instantly. A few seconds later, he was dragging Francis back into the safety of the classroom, but instead of carrying on the fight, Francis ran out of the classroom, clearly crying, screaming about how, I'm going to have your job for this. And to foreign readers, this just implied that he was going to get him sacked, not that Francis was literally about to take over as English teacher. I'm sure it'll be a surprise to no one to hear that Broughton ended up losing his job, but we also found out why he'd reacted so violently, and that's because his wife, the same one Francis had so flagrantly disrespected, had recently been diagnosed with cervical cancer, and I'm pretty sure it was terminal. I'm not saying he wasn't out of order for kicking off on a student like that, but at the same time I can understand why that was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. I think it was the same for my parents too. Like once they heard about Broughton getting the sack for almost murdering a student, they went into overdrive trying to find a decent school for me to prep for my exams. I left that school less than two months after that incident and did a few weeks homeschooling while my parents petitioned the council for an emergency placement. It worked. I got out, and the rest is history, I suppose. But I still think of state secondary school teachers from time to time, how some of them must be living an actual nightmare on a day-to-day -day basis, and how fortunate I am that I don't have to do the same thing. One of my biggest problems is that I attract the weirdest kinds of people. There are a lot of people who say that, but you have no idea until you've met some of the people that try to hang out with me. There was one guy who took the cake, though. His name was Jonathan. He lived down the road from my parents' house. This was years ago, and thankfully I hadn't had anything to do with him in a very long time. I was your average-looking girl. I was in high school at the time, and I was extremely naive. I've had a couple of really bad experiences, I've kind of been shown the true horror of the world firsthand. Not trying to turn this into a pity party or anything, but you don't realize how cruel the world is until horrible things happen to you. And if you were idealistic about people the way I was, you'll just have to live through some bad experiences to find out. But anyway, back when I was a sophomore in high school and extremely naive about people and their intentions, I was friends with Jonathan. I thought that he was kind of a nerdy guy, but that he was capable of being a friend. Bear in mind, he was a 30-year-old who lived with his grandmother who collected social security. He didn't have a job, didn't have a girlfriend, and he thought it was a good idea to hang out with a girl in high school that lived down the street. That's the kind of guy Jonathan was. I wasn't really close with my parents, so they didn't really know anything about who I hung out with. I didn't hang out with Jonathan very much, but... I would say hi to him and have the occasional conversation from time to time. Looking back, I knew that he had some kind of crush or romantic feeling for me, but I knew that it would be against the rules for him to date me and I knew that he knew that too. But I remember when I got my first boyfriend, Jonathan was not exactly happy about it. He kept warning me about being used by boys my age. He told me that I should look for an older man who was more mature and could take care of me. 
Of course, he was always hinting that I should have been with him. He didn't want to come out and say it though, but every single time I ever talked about my boyfriend, who had only been dating for two weeks or so, Jonathan always had something bad to say or some kind of warning. I remember getting the whole possibly catching something from him talk from my parents only to get it again from Jonathan. I specifically remember the way he phrased the conversation. He talked as if though my boyfriend definitely had some sort of disease, and by the way, he didn't. It was a very strange ordeal nonetheless. But then came the day before our field trip. It wasn't a big trip or anything. My school was divided into certain sections, and it was an annual event where the science department would take certain sections of students down to the park and help us scientifically observe nature. For three days, the scientific department would take a third of the students down in this park. It was pretty stupid. Everyone kind of agreed that it was just a nice way to get out of those horrible classrooms that we sit in all day. Outside Science Day, that's what we would called it. I remember Jonathan asking about Outside Science Day. He asked what day I was going to be in the park. I told him and I was scheduled to go Wednesday. I didn't think anything of it. After all, he did go to the same high school I went to and it was kind of a tradition. I thought that he was just kind of curious or reminiscing. Well, was I wrong? Wednesday came and I was really excited to be going down to the park. I was hanging out with my best friend Rebecca. We got down there and started observing nature. The teachers made me bring notepads and pencils to make some scientific observations, but after a few sentences they didn't care what we did after that. The teachers sat by the picnic tables and drank lemonade, and us students were pretty much free to do whatever we wanted. Me and Rebecca were having a deep conversation about life. She said something about her stepfather and how it made her feel like marriage was a bad idea or something. I don't really remember, it was a very long time ago. I just remember being 100% engaged in this conversation with Rebecca. And all of a sudden, I felt a hand touch my shoulder. I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke on me or something, but I turned around and it was Jonathan. Things got extremely awkward really fast. Me and Rebecca were kind of in the middle of it and here was my awkward older neighbor showing up at my school class trip. Jonathan asked me if I wanted to go back with him to hang out at his house for a little while. I told him that I would get in trouble but he promised that the teachers would never find out. By this point I knew exactly what he was doing and I wasn't about to play into that. I told him that I couldn't leave my best friend Rebecca, but then he offered to bring Rebecca too, and that was even creepier. I remember getting a look from Rebecca like, why do you know this freak? After Jonathan kept pleading with us, me and Rebecca finally decided to just walk back to our teachers and hope that Jonathan would get the hint. But when we started walking through, Jonathan grabbed me. He grabbed me by the ankle and I fell to the ground. We were standing on wood chips and I remember getting some in my mouth when I fell. He started dragging me. We were far enough from the teachers that they couldn't see us easily and our view was mostly obstructed from the rest of the students by a swing set, so nobody noticed that this grown man was dragging me away. I lucked out in the end. Rebecca actually started fighting him. She punched him in the nose and started screaming for the teachers. Right after she did that, Jonathan started running. He ran as fast as I've ever seen anyone run away in my life. I didn't realize how quick he actually was. The teachers asked about the incident and questioned me as to whether or not I knew this man. I told them that I didn't. It turned into a giant headache. They called the police and everything. I told the police that it was just a stranger and that I was as vague as I could be when I described him. For some reason I felt like I would get in trouble if they knew it was Jonathan. Now, I understood that I should have reported him to the police, but I foolishly didn't at my naive age. The experience turned into a good thing for Rebecca too. She always bragged about punching a grown man in the face and him running away. I was pretty sure that Jonathan was running because he didn't want the teachers to see him and not because Rebecca's punch necessarily hurt him that bad but I never told Rebecca that. After that incident, Jonathan never showed his face anywhere near me ever again. I think he was familiar enough with my schedule that 
He knew when I got on and off the bus, and he just stayed away from me. That was the first time in my life that I was faced with this sort of dark reality. The sad reality that someone who claimed to be my friend actually had very dark and sinister intentions all along, and anyone with two eyes could have seen. If you're like me, do yourself a favor and be more cynical about people. At least that way, the only surprises will be good ones. The weird thing about dating someone with a mental illness is that they can seem like an otherwise normal person, at least until they snap in whatever way they do. This happened to me with the girl I dated back in high school. We didn't go to the same school though. She went to our neighbor rival school. There was something of a friendly competition between our two schools. Believe it or not, we actually met at a football game. Anyway, I ended up dating this girl. It was sad because she was actually a really nice person, but her mental illness made her extremely unbearable. She wouldn't get into this extremely depressive and anxious mood, and then would act really strange. And it would come about from the most random stuff. I had previously been dating a girl for about two years, even before I was in high school, and I totally had a crush on her for a long time before that. Things ended when I found out that she had tried sleeping with one of my friends, and thankfully, my friend put bros before hoes and let me know about it immediately. But yeah, I had just stopped with that relationship, so I was in need of a good rebound. And that's where this girl comes in. We'll call her Erica. It was a few weeks after I had been single. I was at this football game just trying to pass the time. That was when I looked over and saw the perfect goth girl. She wasn't overly goth or anything, she didn't even have any piercings or tattoos that I knew of, but she gave off that vibe if that makes any sense. I had always been interested in girls like that, so I made eye contact with her, got her phone number, and texted her that night. The thing that really made me like her was that she played Xbox. How many times do you ever get a cute girl's number and she also plays video games? I wasn't sure if I was going to ask her out until that point, but... She told me her gamer tag was Bad Chick X 42 and I knew I had to go for it. I was normally more careful about vetting girls that I planned on dating, but I figured it would make for a good time. Worst case scenario, I broke up with her because I didn't like her and then I never saw her again. I tell you all this backstory so you can get a good picture of what me and Erica had going on. It was very relaxed, it wasn't serious and I never once got the idea from her that things were a big deal. She also told me that she had really bad anxiety. When she told me, I didn't think much of it. I figured that everyone gets anxious once in a while, and I had no idea how bad her anxiety actually got. I remember there being this one day when I had a field trip in my school. It was as lame as you can imagine, but it beat sitting in class. So I signed up and was looking forward to the day when it came. The night before the field trip, I didn't text Erica, which was unusual because we normally text each other every night, sometimes into the early hours of the morning. I just wasn't feeling it that night. I was kind of sad and I just wanted to be alone and eat pizza rolls while I watched that 70s show. The next day came around and I forgot that it was the day of the field trip. I wasn't quite dressed to walk around, I had my jeans on, but it wasn't the end of the world. Me and two of my best friends sat together on the bus and waited to get there. I think there were about three or four buses from our school that left. It was a pretty big field trip and I think just about everyone in my school went. Now, on to the interesting part. I saw my ex-girlfriend on the field trip. She went to my school, by the way. It was around lunchtime and she approached me. She tried apologizing for being a bad girlfriend back in the day and tried to actually get back together with me. I wasn't a jerk toward her, but I did tell her no. I told her that I would never be able to trust her again. About a day or two later, she reached out to me again, but this time, she asked me if I knew someone. A gothic-looking girl. I guess this goth-looking girl had approached my ex-girlfriend and asked for a whole bunch of questions. I immediately knew it was Erica. I told my ex not to worry about it and that she wouldn't be hearing from this goth girl again. At this point, I felt uneasy about the whole situation. It just seemed like a really strange thing to do. 
Again, what me and Erica had was not very serious, and the fact that she was kind of stalking me made me feel really anxious. I only knew her for a couple of weeks at this point, and if this was what she was going to do, where is this possibly going to lead? I talked to her about it. She straight up admitted to stalking me while I was on the field trip. She said that she felt anxious about me cheating on her because I didn't text her the night before. Then she told me that she took a couple of pictures of me talking to my ex-girlfriend. She told me that she had somehow found her and confronted her. I felt really anxious at this point and tried not to act shocked. The entire time I couldn't help but think about how much I regretted asking her for her cell phone number. And this is where things seriously got out of hand. I guess you could tell by my facial expression that I was really freaked out and that's when she decided to threaten me. She looked me right in the eyes and said that she would kill me if I told anyone. I know what you're thinking. It doesn't sound as bad as it was. If you could see the look in her eyes when she said that to me, you would have been anxious about it too. I continued texting her and acting like nothing happened for a couple of more days. She apologized and said that she gets carried away sometimes. And I gave it about a week before I just kind of straight up blocked her. She really freaked out. I knew I was taking some kind of risk when I did so. I wasn't sure if she was serious when she said that she was actually going to kill me or not. I remember being really paranoid for a couple of days. She didn't know where I live, but she knew where I went to school, and she had the ability to track down someone that she only had a picture of. I have no idea how she tracked down my ex-girlfriend just from seeing her one time and having one picture of her. The scary part of the story is that she told me that she would end my life and then end herself. She sent it to me as a message and I read it through email so I'm not sure how serious she was about it. All I know is that she is an extremely capable person. Again, just think about how much went into finding my ex-girlfriend or even stalking me on the field trip in the beginning. You couple that level of capability with someone who is seriously mentally unhinged and you throw a violence threat as icing on the cake, and you got yourself a real recipe for disaster. I really don't want to say anything to anyone because I know that if the word gets out, my reputation could potentially be ruined. People would think that I'd be the kind of person to run and hide and start crying at the first instance of a small goth girl threatening me. I know that's not how the situation is, but I know that's how people would react to it if they heard. It's been a while since I've had any form of communication with Erica. I blocked her email, phone number, and every social media account you can imagine. I'm just hoping that she can let sleeping dogs lie and let me live my life. And as worried as I am about it, I still feel bad for her. I really hope she gets the help that she so desperately needs. It was August 28, 1984. Elizabeth Fritzel had just turned 18. What should have been a happy time in her life was soon to become a living nightmare. At some point that day, Elizabeth would disappear and not be seen again for 24 years. Soon after her disappearance, Rosemary Fritzel, Elizabeth's mother, filed a missing persons report. No trace of her daughter could be found. Then, almost a month later, her father, Joseph Fritzel, produced a letter postmarked from Braunau, a city a hundred miles from their home in Austria. According to the letter, Elizabeth was staying with a friend. She demanded her family not search for her or she would leave the country. Joseph told the authorities she had probably joined a religious cult. They must have taken him at his word, and nothing else was done to find her after that day. Another 24 years would pass until the world would hear from Elizabeth again. She was never missing. At least, Joseph knew where she was the entire time. As it turned out, that same day that she had turned 18, he had trapped her in a hidden chamber that he had specifically built for her, in the basement. From then on, he would visit her at least three times a week, bring her food and other supplies. What followed involved graphic detail. Because of Joseph's repeated indecent assaults, seven children would be born to Elizabeth in her prison, although one died soon after birth. 
Three of the children, Lisa, Monica, and Alexander, were removed as infants and raised by Joseph and Rosemary. This was all approved by local social services after Joseph claimed the babies had just been left on his doorstep. Upon the birth of the fourth child, Joseph was kind enough to allow the chamber to be enlarged. Elizabeth and the children were made to dig out every inch of soil by hand. The undertaking lasted several years. As terrible as all this must have been, it could have been far worse. The captives were allowed to have things like a refrigerator, television, and VCR. During their ordeal, Elizabeth taught the three remaining children, Kirsten, Stefan, and Felix, how to read and write. Occasionally, Joseph would shut off the power and forget to deliver them food in order to teach them a lesson. In a couple of different instances, he went as far as telling them that they would be gassed or electrified to death if they attempted to escape. Then, on April 19, 2008, the eldest daughter, Kirsten, fell unconscious. Elizabeth managed to convince Joseph to seek medical attention for her. She assisted Joseph in carrying their child out to an awaiting ambulance. It would be the first time she had been outside in 24 years. Although she was forced to return and stay another week, her nightmare was soon to end. Once again, Joseph arrived with a letter supposedly written by Elizabeth. Fortunately, staff at the hospital found many aspects of his story puzzling and called the authorities. That was when the investigation into Elizabeth's disappearance was reopened. Joseph was questioned, and an expert on cults found his story improbable. Because her illness was so severe, Elizabeth pleaded to be allowed to visit Kirsten in the hospital. Amazingly, Joseph agreed, and Elizabeth, along with her two sons, were allowed to leave the basement for the final time. During the visit, a doctor tipped off authorities and both adults were taken into custody. Once she was assured that she was finally safe, Elizabeth shocked Felice with a story of her decades-long imprisonment and abuse. Shortly after midnight, Joseph, now 73, was formally arrested. The next day, Elizabeth, the children, and Rosemary were taken into protective custody. It's believed Rosemary never had any idea of what was happening to her daughter. Over the next few days, DNA would prove Joseph to be the father of Elizabeth's children, although his lawyer would insist this did not prove false imprisonment. Police believe Joseph was planning on contriving a story of how he rescued his daughter from the supposed cult to cover for the unexplained appearance of Elizabeth. The trial of Joseph Fritzl commenced on March 29, 2009. He stood trial for the death of the newborn, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and several other despicable actions. Pursuant to an agreement made to her by police, Elizabeth would be allowed to give videotaped testimony before prosecutors. Joseph pled guilty on all charges except murder and threatening to gas Elizabeth and the children. The jurors spent 11 hours that first day watching footage of Elizabeth's testimony. The tape was said to be so upsetting that eight of the jurors could only watch two hours of the testimony at a time. Four alternates were put on standby in case any juror asked to be excused. Elizabeth's older brother, Harold, also testified to being abused by Joseph as a child. The second day, Elizabeth herself appeared at the trial. Joseph was visibly shaken by her arrival, going pale and breaking down. The next day, he would change his plea to guilty on all charges. He's currently serving out a life sentence at Garston Abbey Prison in Upper Austria. He is eligible for parole after 15 years. On a good note, Kirsten was reunited with her family after being put under an artificially induced coma. She has since made a complete recovery. For the sake of the privacy, I won't say where Elizabeth and the children are living today. I will include that they are doing their best to live normal lives and heal from such a traumatic experience. The house that bore witness to these crimes was put up for sale and purchased in December of 2016. The purchasers planned to convert the property into apartments. The basement itself was filled with concrete in June 2013 at a cost of 100,000 euros. Although in an interview in 2017, Joseph still showed no remorse for his actions, and in April 2019, it was reported that his health was in decline and he didn't want to live anymore. But we can only pray that he gets what he asked for.
after creating a generational nightmare in a subterranean prison. When we were kids, we don't always listen to the adults around us. Part of growing up requires us to push boundaries or we never know when we've gone too far. It's just a fact of life. Adults know this and try their best to let us learn on our own. Even then, they won't hesitate to put their foot down in the best interest of our safety. I know this now and did the same to my kids when they were young. However, there was a time you couldn't tell me anything. I constantly pushed the boundaries and never learned from my mistakes. That is, until I almost died. In my youth, I was a handful. Too much for my mother, in fact. My dad had been shot down and killed in Vietnam. I had only been two at the time. My mother didn't date and both my grandfathers had passed. I lacked any male role models in my life and mom tried but just couldn't fill this role. This was another time and mom was a small town simple lady. I was old enough to know that she was overworked and not the assertive type. I naturally exploited this. I had not yet fallen into crime but she feared I soon would. She searched out a solution and soon came up with a perfect one. Spring break would soon arrive. She would need someone to look after me during the day. This is when Dad's mother, Granny Jean, came into the picture. Mom and Granny Jean never saw eye to eye, but they kept things civil. As I'd soon discover, Granny Jean was just what I'd needed. She'd grown up in the Depression. It made her tough, a no-nonsense type of woman. She had no time for foolishness, but was still capable of showing love when appropriate. The two spoke on the phone and she agreed to take me for the week. I left for the farm on that Sunday morning and arrived by bus later that day. A daunting trip for a lone nine-year-old. Not that I would have admitted it. Granny Jean picked me up at the station and we drove the 25 miles back to the farm in silence. I say silence, but there was a preacher talking on the radio for most of the ride. I began to speak once until I got the stink eye from Granny and figured I'd be better off shutting up. Not until breakfast the following morning did she truly talk to me. Afterwards, I received a quick lesson on feeding the animals and then was left to entertain myself. So, naturally, I took off in search of trouble. Most of the day was spent walking the fields and exploring the woods. I returned briefly for lunch, then renewed my explorations. Around four, I came across this old abandoned farmhouse. It was a massive thing. Two stories and a big wraparound porch. I couldn't resist. I quickly looked through the windows to make sure no one was inside. Seeing nobody, I walked around back and entered. There wasn't much to see, but to me it was like a giant clubhouse. It was getting late, so I left, with all intention of returning. That evening at dinner, I happened to make mention of the old house. No sooner had I said it, Granny Jean jumped down my throat. That's not your property. Don't you go back there. It's old and dangerous, it's not safe, do you understand? I was terrified by her reaction and sheepishly I said, yes ma'am. I was shocked by my own words. I'd not been in the habit of respecting my elders, but she was in full control and she knew it. Well, almost full control. That night as I lay in bed, all I could think about was the old house. There was still so much to explore. I had to go back. And I did the next morning borrowing a flashlight on my way out. Beginning where I'd left off the day prior, I climbed the creaky stairs to the second floor. Had I been smarter about the layout of the old houses, I would have tried to explore the attic, but I didn't realize it was there. I did encounter a door that likely led to it, but it being locked, I moved on. I had much more to see. Having found nothing of note at this point, I returned to the kitchen. A door I hadn't yet tried was located there, it was difficult to open, but after a few hard yanks, it broke free. Ahead of me were stairs leading into a basement. The darkness before me screamed to come down. With my borrowed flashlight in hand, I descended down those stairs. One step had long since rotten away, and I jumped it. It's a miracle the step I landed on didn't snap too. Reaching the bottom, I swept the large room with the beam of light. I couldn't see much from my position. Therefore, I made the mistake of taking a closer look. I took two, 
maybe three steps and the door above me slammed shut. To this day, I'm not sure what caused it to close. A gust of wind is the most likely guess, but I'm almost positive I closed the back door behind me. I could be wrong. I was never good about closing doors, so no matter how improbable it is actually possible, I'll not entertain any other of the more outlandish theories. I jolted back up the stairs, skipping two or three at a time. I threw myself against the door, but it wouldn't budge. Again and again I did this, but to no avail. And I was trapped. I began panicking. Then, suddenly, I remembered the big swinging doors I'd seen when I arrived. I frantically raced back down, jumping steps in pairs. The second to last broke under my weight, sending me tumbling across the floor. The room was now very dark. I realized my flashlight wasn't working. I shook it rapidly and it came to life. I returned to my feet and renewed my sprint to freedom. The doors were two heavy wooden things that opened out. I need a lot of power to budge them. I summoned up all my strength and threw my body against them, but nothing. I repeated this twice more until I was too tired to continue. I took a break and tried to think. I closed my eyes and concentrated intensely. I pictured the doors as I'd seen them the day before. My mind's eye scanned every inch, every nail, every board. All hope I had disappeared in an instant. I should have remembered the large board straddling the doors from the outside. It was a sturdy looking 2x4 or something of similar size. It spanned the entire breadth of the opening, slid tightly under four metal braces. I would not lost complete hope just yet. I wandered back and forth around the room examining every square inch. There were a couple of small windows. Perhaps if I broke them I could squeeze out. A nearby brick was put into use but it just bounced off the panes. I know now that it was reinforced stormproof glass. No matter the amount of foolish optimism or stubbornness I embodied, as the hours passed, my courage began to fail me. Things wouldn't truly begin to suck until night came on. Although the days had been somewhat warm, the nights still dipped below freezing. As the sun set, my prison became colder and colder. Then, just after 11pm, the flashlight gave out, and shaking it no longer worked. With no moonlight, it was completely pitch black. Rats began scattering about all around me, and I was now at the lowest point of my young life. My surroundings terrified me more than the thought of freezing to death. Visions of rats gnawing on my limbs, being too weak to move, overwhelmed me. Sleep became harder and harder to avoid. Even then, I knew if I fell asleep, I might not wake up again. I had no doubt that help would be coming, but... Would they reach me before I froze, or worse, was eaten alive? Sometime in the early hours of the night I lost the battle and slipped into unconsciousness. In that sleep world I could feel my soul being carried upward. I was no longer shivering, my body was warm and I no longer hurt. This had to be heaven, I thought to myself. And but fortunately it was not my time. But rather than heaven I was back in bed. The smell of baked things floated up from the kitchen and was all very disorienting. Had I just dreamed this, I thought? I looked around, and nothing was out of the ordinary. The sun was shining through the white lace curtains. Rags, Granny Jean's tabby cat, was curled up in the chair watching me. I was wearing my favorite flannel pajamas and all seemed well. Yet just below the surface, something gnawed at me. I slipped quietly into my robe, not wanting to ruin the peace of the morning. Rags followed close behind and I stepped softly down the stairs. The rotten stairs of the basement flashed in my mind. Maybe I was in hell. A proper punishment for such an unruly child like myself. This would be a particularly bitter pill. I expected to be swarmed by a horde of rats any moment. Maybe Rags was their leader. He ran ahead of me and turned the corner and I braced for the gruesome onslaught, but it never came. I reached the bottom. Looking left, I could see Granny Jean, her back to me, the same gray hair wrapped into a tight bun. She sat at the kitchen table. The calm swaying of an old string instrumental flowed lazily from her little radio. I just stood and watched for a long time, 
a slight tug of tension lurking just below the surface. A few minutes passed and Granny Jean turned in her chair, kindly wishing me a good morning. I joined her in the kitchen, still unsure of what to say. Are you hungry? The words were comforting yet unsatisfying. Yes, I answered with a quick jerk. I stood still and watched as she gathered the food. She was consumed with her work, yet perhaps even then aware of the turmoil raging inside of me. She cracked two eggs into a skillet. The sizzle and captivating scent of bacon rose in the air. I don't think we need to discuss what happened last night. You're safe now, and I'm sure a boy even as stubborn as you has learned his lesson. The relief was indescribable. I fought back the tears, but a few escaped. The warmth, all the more soothing, I didn't want her to see, and I turned my back to her and spoke. No, ma'am. I see now just how difficult I've been, and I'm sorry. And that was it. Granny Jean plated up my breakfast, and we sat together as I ate, not speaking, the soothing, swaying strings blending into the warm, fragrant air of the kitchen. For the remainder of my visit, I stayed pretty close to the farm. There were plenty of reruns on TV and chores to keep me occupied. I had meant every word I'd said that morning. A veil had been lifted. All the trouble I'd caused, my willful headstrongness, had led me to that cold basement. The adults around me only had the best in mind for me, yet all I ever heard was no. The old version of myself did die that night. When the week came to an end, Granny Jean drove me back to the bus station. As we parted, she gave me a little peck on my cheek. I'd never felt so grateful in my life, and I still hold a very special place in my heart for her. On my way to the bus, I turned back and waved goodbye to her. Had I known it would be the last time I'd see her, I would have thanked her for it all. She'd not just saved my body that dark, cold night. She'd done one better. She'd saved my soul. Everyone around him knew him as Big Joe, but his parents called him Joseph. The Gibsons were friendly and cool for older folks. A lot of parents would have been overprotective of a child with Big Joe's disability, but he was allowed to live just like every other kid. I know now that Big Joe had a condition called Down Syndrome. As kids, we knew he was different, but we didn't care. If he was picked on, we were usually there to stand up for him. Those kids never spoke a word crosswise about him in our presence again. He was everyone's best friend and never expected anything in return. That's why his disappearance affected us all so much. I don't remember the exact date, but I do know that I was nearing 13. Several of us had met up to play baseball. We knew Big Joe loved playing and he would be sad if we didn't include him. We went to the Gibson's house and when Mr. G told us Joseph had went away... We asked when he'd be back. I'm sorry, boys. Joseph won't be coming back. He wouldn't say any more, so with a heavy heart, we walked back to the field and tried getting by without our favorite pitcher. Big Joe may have gone away, but he wasn't forgotten. My friends and I would do our darndest to discover the truth, but it seemed nobody had a clue, not even the adults. There were loads of theories, though. The most popular was that Big Joe had become too much to handle for his older parents. We assumed that he'd been sent off somewhere for his own good. It was an unsatisfactory conclusion, but there wasn't much we could do about it. Life went on and time passed quickly. I worked my way through community college and would eventually become a child psychologist. A few of my childhood friends would reach out now and then. The discussion would always get around to Big Joe. The institutional theory was taken as fact by then, and we hoped he was happy and well-treated wherever he was. My practice was just beginning to support itself, and I decided to take a short vacation with my family to visit my folks. Our first night was without note. It was the next morning when everything changed. The whole family was sat around the table for breakfast. My dad was talking about a new housing development being built, and that was when he dropped the bomb. Oh yeah. Did you hear about the old Gibson house? I figured he was talking about being leveled for the new development, and I was only half right. They did demolish it, but 
During the process, they found a body buried in the basement. He said it like it was an everyday occurrence. I began to choke. Something like this demanded an explanation. I'm sorry, son. I assumed you already knew. They were in the process of digging for leftover pipes or wires and exposed a skeleton. All kinds of questions were rushing through my head, all except the most obvious one. Both Gibsons passed long ago. No one had lived in the house for at least ten years. I asked if they identified the body, and it was obvious that he was about to make a guess. Come on, boy. You know who it is. You're avoiding the most probable option in favor of the most improbable. This is one of his favorite sayings. He'd throw it at me whenever he thought I was being dense. I fought for a moment, but nothing came to me. He could see the strain on my face. And I remember all of these words like they were yesterday. Okay, stop. Take a few breaths, close your eyes, and it'll pop out in front of you. My old man knew me well. I did as he suggested and calmed my mind. Then bang. It hit me like a truck. And my old man had always been able to read me like a book. Big Joe? My excitement quickly switched to confusion and concern. Once again, he could read my thoughts. No, son. It's not what you think. The doctors are almost certain the man died of natural causes. I do want to mention here that although we saw Big Joe as a kid like us, it turned out he was actually nearing 25 when he passed. Although relieved, I was unable to overcome my confusion and disgust. Why hadn't they just buried him the regular way? It's not fair that we didn't get to say goodbye one last time. I wanted answers, but asking Dad would have been pointless. Now that I knew, I had to visit his gravesite as soon as possible and after a small amount of research I did find it, and this was something I was going to have to do alone. I just remember as I stood beside the grave, I began telling him everything he missed since he went away. I told him about my wife and kids, how the Sox finally won the pennant, and then I realized he hadn't missed a thing. He had been with me all these years. I'd been carrying him in my heart the whole time. For the last few days, I've been reading about various Reddit members' run-ins with creepers, stalkers, and other downright freaky people. Now that I've gotten good and inspired, I figured I'd add my story to the list. This starts about five years ago. My family, consisting of myself, my brother Alec, and of course my mom, were moving around a lot. At this time, my mom was having a hard time finding a full-time job that paid well. On several occasions, we'd been forced to move out in the middle of the night. This would all change when she got on at a well-known lock manufacturer just a city over. The company even provided her with the money to rent a house near the factory, and things were starting to look up for sure. The move proved to be unremarkable, as was her first few weeks in the new place. Despite being nothing special, it was almost paradise to us kids. The neighborhood was a regular working class area loaded with other kids and plenty of things to keep us busy. Ever since our dad passed when I was about 10, life had been pretty touch and go. But now it was almost like things used to be, at least for a while. During this time, we all did our usual stuff. Mom worked as much as possible and Alec and I attended school. Then, we started hearing noises. I was the last to notice them. I think Alec mentioned them once, but I wrote them off as nothing. Mom hadn't bothered to say anything for a few days, but one morning at breakfast, we all heard it together. This one resembled a ring chime on a phone. It only happened twice that morning, one after another. We all three began comparing notes and were relieved to know we weren't the only persons hearing things. We agreed it was probably a bird outside. This was not the only sound we'd been noticing, but for the day, we put them out of our minds and began discussing more important goings-on. Nothing else of note would occur this day, but the idea had been brought up. We'd all be far more tuned in and probably wouldn't hesitate to mention anything new in the future. 
For the next few weeks, one of us would hear a bump on the floor or a scratching sound. We'd make a mental note of it and go on with what we were doing. On weekend mornings when we were all together, we'd mention the week's experiences. We even searched the house once and discovered a small hole leading into the attic. We figured a little critter was going in and out and making some of the sounds. There were still a few sounds that would have been impossible for a rat or squirrel to make. We thought we may have our answer, but some lingering doubts remained. The real trouble started when the food began disappearing. This part of the story affected me specifically. For as long as I can remember, I've had a problem with my weight. I've learned to control it in the years since, but my childhood was made very difficult because of it. This was made worse by my mom. She'd always been thin and beautiful and couldn't understand why I wasn't. When food began disappearing from the kitchen, she blamed it on me. This incident, in addition to a few others, damaged my relationship with my mom so badly, her and I still don't speak that often. But you aren't here to listen to my problems. You want to hear something scary, and that part comes next. I'd estimate we'd been living at the new house for around five months. Mom and I were barely speaking, and the noises were still an ongoing problem. We'd since decided the house was haunted. Almost a month after covering the hole in the attic and another leading into the basement, the sounds continued. What had once been a strange problem had become frustrating. We'd all had our own issues. Alec himself had been having breathing problems akin to chronic bronchitis. He just started his freshman year of high school and was playing in the school band. He had been up and down with his symptoms. On this particular week, he had been doing well enough to go on a trip out of town. Unfortunately, soon after arriving, his symptoms blew back up and he was sent home for treatment. He arrived back home in the middle of the day when my mom and I weren't around. Things were quiet at first, but soon he heard noises coming from the front bathroom. He called out, but no one answered. Not thinking anything was wrong, he went to the door and opened it. To his horror, a man he didn't know was standing half-dressed, staring at him. He said the man moved toward him. Believing he was going to be attacked, he fled from the house and ran to a neighbor's residence for help. This was where he stayed until the cops completed their search. What they discovered would destroy our newfound sense of peace and cause long-term damage. When I arrived home, Mom was still speaking with the police. My confusion quickly gave way to terror after hearing their story. As they cleared the home, nothing appeared out of the ordinary. That was until they searched the basement. There they discovered a makeshift bedroll under the stairs, hidden behind a large stack of boxes. Although the intruder was gone from what they found, it looked as if though he had been sleeping there for some time. I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach, and I became slightly hysterical for a moment. Once I'd gotten myself composed, I asked about Alec. He was still across the streets and refused to return home. His hands were shaking and sweat was pouring down his face. A few hours passed and the authorities had all they needed for the time being. We all returned to the house in a vain attempt to move on. The side effects began to show themselves almost immediately. Alec was eventually convinced to return, but he was never the same. Nightmares became a nightly occurrence. He was unable to sleep until Mom or I showed him the basement was empty. Worst of all, his breathing trouble grew worse by the day, and I too was greatly affected. Every minute inside the house made my skin crawl. As for Mom, she said nothing, but the strain showed on her face. Her sleep too had obviously been hindered. With no news of an arrest, we were all drowning in fear. We did all we could think of to comfort each other, but it didn't do any good. At the end of the seventh month, we moved into a new place. This was a three-bedroom condo without an attic or basement, and I remained there for another two years before getting my own place across town. I've been here ever since. After moving from the house, it seems all of our lives have improved. I'm fit happy and in a loving relationship. My mom found love with a gentleman from work and they married a year ago. Even poor Alec is doing well. His breathing problems slowly disappeared after the move. Doctors would discover his problems were likely related to the massive amounts of black mold we had been inhaling. 
After the diagnosis was made, the health department contacted the landlord only to discover the house had been demolished soon after we left. I see this as an omission of guilt. Alex's night terrors gradually lessen with the passage of time and, from what he tells us, he rarely thinks about the incident anymore. I'm not sure he's being totally truthful, but I'm happy to hear it nonetheless. The intruder is still on the loose, as far as I know. He's not even been identified. We'll probably never know the full story. He could have gotten in through an unlocked door or a window. At that point, he could have had a key made for the back door. Our big ring of keys that hung on a hook next to the kitchen wouldn't be hard to find. And from then on, he'd have free reign over the house during the weekdays. He more than likely heard us discuss our plans from his cubby in the basement. And that idea still gives me shivers. He'd be content in knowing when he would come and go safely without fear of being caught. That was until Alec arrived home unexpected. I suppose it's no longer important if he was arrested for his crime. All three of us have moved past the experience for the most part. Any long-term effects have dulled with time. A small thing does arise, however. I do wonder if our intruder has moved on to another basement. It's a part of the home most of us spend little to no time in. Perhaps you reading this are one of these people. Can you be so sure no one is lurking undetected below you, listening to your every word and move? Maybe you should go check, just to be sure. I'm 27 years old now. This happened when I was 13, my sister was 9, and my brother was 6. We were raised by our single mother. She usually worked nights on the weekends. I was old enough to be home alone, so whenever my mom was at work, I was the one responsible for my siblings. This all happened on a Saturday night. For a little bit of context, let me give you the layout of my childhood home. When you walked into the living room, there was a hallway. To the right was the kitchen, then straight ahead was the downstairs bathroom. To the left was the stairway. Once you got upstairs, the first room straight ahead was the upstairs bathroom. The first room on the right was my room, and the second room on the right was my brother's. The room across from mine was my mom's, and my sister's room was right next to my mom's. Now here's the story. Before my mom left for work, she had gave me $20 for pizza, then left. I ordered the pizza and we had a good night. About two hours after we ate, my sister went to the downstairs bathroom. When she came out of the bathroom though, she said that she heard someone knock on the window. I believed her and I told her that it was okay. Well, about an hour later, we heard yet another knock at the front door. I looked in the people and I saw a dirty looking man with long brown scraggly hair. He looked like he was homeless but I couldn't really tell. I then began to look down and I saw that he had a knife right in his hand. I then looked at my brother and I told him to turn off the TV and all of the lamps. I told my sister to grab my flip phone while I ran in the kitchen to grab a knife. I then told all of my siblings to go upstairs. I told my brother to go hide under his bed and my sister to go hide in my mom's closet. I then hid in the upstairs bathtub. I then heard the front door smash open. It was a really flimsy old door so it didn't really surprise me that that happened. I then heard doors opening downstairs. I started to dial 911. I heard the man start to come upstairs and then heard the bathroom door open. I held one hand over my mouth while the other was holding my flip phone. Very luckily, he didn't open the shower curtain. When the man left, I had started to worry about my siblings. I then got out of the bathtub and ran out of the bathroom. I began to run full force at the guy, stabbing him a few times. Right as this was happening, the police had finally arrived. I saw him trying to run out the front door, but the police were able to catch him. I then found my siblings and the police called our mom. My mom came home immediately. She even quit that job because of this. So yeah, that's definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me while home alone, but hopefully the last.
I'm currently a 15 year old female, but I was around 11 at the time of this event. It was mid-December in West Virginia, and there was a thin layer of snow on the ground, and I was home alone while my entire household was at the local Walmart. I didn't go because I had a terrible fever, but regardless of the fever, I typically stayed home anyway. I've always had some sort of social anxiety, and I've never really liked being in a crowd of people, with the fear that I'd be judged. Now starting the story... It had been about 15 minutes after my family left, and I was sitting on my bed with my protective pit bull. Keep that in mind, because it's a really important part of the story. I was watching some show on my laptop when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like a human shape, then very quickly passed my window. I tried to brush it off while attempting to rationalize the incident, but I had a gut feeling that something was wrong. Disregarding my gut feeling, I directed my attention back to my show, when about five minutes later, my dog jumped off my bed and then started growling while looking in my window. I didn't really think too much of it at first, knowing that she often growled at deer when they passed my window, but then I thought about what I saw before, and then pretty much instantly, I felt my stomach go numb. I slowly walked up to my window to see if anything was there, and at first glance, I didn't see anything. Then my heart sank. I then looked across the snow and saw boot prints. Boot prints leading to my window. I was terrified at this point, scared to look down. But still, I slowly let my eyes venture downward, and to my horror, right below the window pressed up against my house, I saw a man. He was about six foot from what I could tell, with dark brown hair, a beard, and dark green eyes and he was wearing a snowsuit. He then looked up at me, and the both of us were frozen in fear. We made eye contact for about 10 seconds, but that 10 seconds felt like forever. As soon as I snapped into realization, I grabbed my phone and ran as fast as I could up the stairs and then into my bathroom. I could still hear my dog growling and loudly barking, but I didn't care. I decided to call my mom. Stupid, I know. I should have called the police instead, but I was just so scared and the only thing making me feel safe was the sound of her voice. As soon as she picked up the phone, she heard how stressed I was and just how frightened my voice sounded. I explained the situation and she told me she was sending the police and that she would be heading home ASAP. Well, everything was starting to smooth out. Although I was still shook, I was feeling more comfort now. But then everything came crashing down when I then heard glass begin to shatter. I thought I was going to pass out. I was shaking so violently and I couldn't think straight. The next sound that followed up was a screaming. Just very loud, blood-curdling screams. And that's when I realized it. My dog was attacking him. I was still so scared shitless but felt a sense of happiness. Soon I heard my door being broken down while my mom and the police officers came into the house. My mom came up to the bathroom and I let her inside. I think I can honestly say that that was the most safe I'd ever felt in my mother's arms. She walked me downstairs and I could see the guy being taken out in handcuffs, crying and covered in blood. My dog then came barreling into me, licking my face and jumping all over me. I could tell right away that she knew she had done right. I still have the same dog. Her name is Metallic and she's 8 years old. She still acts like a puppy though. I will forever love that dog, and she's probably the reason I'm here today. So, I'm a big horror fangirl. I'm 20 years old, and over the past year, I've been collecting from the figures to the mask to even life size. I won't say this story was terrifying or anything, but to me, it basically saved me. I'll try and make it simple. I'm a big Michael Myers fan, and last October I bought a life-size figure of him. Oh, and a Chucky doll too. And not just one of the cheap ones, the replica-looking ones. Some may call me crazy, but what's not to love about horror, right? I keep everything stored away at the moment, apart from the life-size Michael, which he stands around 6 foot. He's not a cheap-looking guy either. He looks like the real deal. The replica mask, real coveralls with blood, and even a knife too. 
he stands in my room right next to my bed. And even though it used to creep me out seeing a dark black figure in my room, I eventually got used to it. Like to the point where I actually felt comfortable around him. I don't move him anywhere else though, as nobody in the house really liked him. Anyway, now that that's all out of the way, here's the thing that happened. So last year when I received him, I was home alone watching films downstairs when I then heard a thud upstairs. I froze, as I didn't really know what to think. I slowly got up and went up to my room, and then instantly heard the thuds from the downstairs door. I had absolutely no clue what the hell was going on because I was the only one there. I quietly sat in the dark as I didn't keep the lights on, and I listened. I heard what sounded like men talking, and then I realized someone had came in and that I didn't lock the door. The TV was also left on, so they had to have known I was there. Anyways though, there I was sitting face to face with the Michael figure in the dark. I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs to my room while I sat in the corner with my head spinning. I felt like I wanted to pass out. I even started to sweat a little. My door then opened and there I'd seen a hooded figure walk in and head straight towards me. He had something in his hand, something sharp, like a pocket knife. I was leaning against the cold wall more and more, wanting to grab something, until out of nowhere, Michael's arm then started moving. Bear in mind, it was still dark, so this guy had no clue that Michael was behind him until he heard it move. I also want to add that it wasn't an electrical noise. It was the material of the arm rubbing together. The man then turned around and instantly yelled. And I mean, I've never seen a man run so fast in his life. The man then started yelling, Go! Get the hell out of here! To some other guy that was in a van outside. I stood up and watched them as they drove off. I then noticed a crack in my window. Obviously these freaks were throwing rocks in my window, possibly to distract me, but I didn't care about that. I turned around and just stared at Michael because I really had no clue that he could even move. I started investigating and then realized he was an animatronic the entire time, but I was thinking he moved just at that exact moment and basically saved my life that night. I can even laugh about it now because of how scared the guy was. I got my window repaired and did mention to the police that I had a break in, but there was really nothing they could do about it, but it was still reported just in case they tried anywhere else. Luckily nothing was taken, as there was really nothing valuable downstairs. Obviously this Michael Myers looks like a real person, and anyone that looks at it, especially in the dark, gets the creeps by it. I know it sounds insane and maybe even funny, but this incident really happened and I'm so damn thankful that I have him in my room. I never even once thought it would save my life like this, especially if he never moved. I always wonder how he moved anyway. I mean, it happened all by itself. Was it some kind of coincidence? I'll never know, but thank you, Michael. God only knows what that guy would have done to me if you weren't here. A little bit of context. I'm a 27 year old female and I live alone with my dog. I purchased my home in December of 2019, so I'm still a bit new to the neighborhood. My neighbor to the left of me is a sweet old man named Leo, and we really get along quite well. We were chatting one afternoon and he was giving me the inside scoop on all of the neighbors. He was the first house on the block so he knows pretty much everything about everyone. When we got to talking about the man who lives on the right side of me, let's call him Tom, well, Leo seemed to become hesitant. Leo then said, well, you know that Tom was involved with that group that murdered that librarian, right? Obviously very confused, I told Leo that I wasn't really sure what he meant, and I asked him what happened. I'm not sure if Leo just regretted telling me in that moment or if his hearing is just bad and he didn't hear my question. Regardless, he immediately changed the subject, and I didn't dare pressure him to elaborate. After our conversation, I thought about the little that I know about Tom. He's tall with graying hair and seems to keep to himself. When I first moved in, I was honestly a bit concerned for him because I never saw any lights on in his home. Every single blind was pulled down consistently 
and his old truck rarely ever left his driveway. He's also the only one on our street with a privacy fence surrounding his backyard. Total red flags looking back now. Later that night, I decided to do a bit of research, trying to figure out what Leo had mentioned. And, well, it didn't really take long for me to stumble across the news article. One of the most gruesome murders in the county, it read. I read articles upon articles and full court documents all about the violent murder of a middle-aged woman. It turns out that when Tom was a young adult living in the next county over, he and his friend attempted to rob a neighbor by breaking into her home during the daytime, but she unfortunately caught them in the act. Instead of fleeing the scene, however, Tom's friend then knocked her out cold with a bottle. According to the friend's testimony, while he continued gathering valuable items, he then found Tom brutally sexually assaulting the woman on the floor, all while she was still unconscious. Afterwards, Tom beat her skull in with a baseball bat. The friend slit her wrists, and the both of them wrote all over her naked body with black ink. The men then stole her car and were later arrested after they ended up crashing it due to icy road conditions. When the deceased woman's son came home from school, he said that his mother looked completely unrecognizable. Tom's lawyers tried to plead insanity with the help from his family, who put forth evidence of Tom's erratic behavior as a child, even once pulling a knife on his own mother. Although the insanity plea was unsuccessful, Tom still ended up serving a pitiful amount of time in prison for what I see as the most disturbing role in the murder. Tom's friend was released in 2016. They didn't receive life sentences because of some weird discrepancy with the initial robbery being done during the daytime and not at night, which is absolutely ridiculous and shows just how crooked our criminal justice system really is. After finding all of this out, I've only had one interaction with Tom. I was going to take the trash out, and his dog, who was chained up in front of his house, then lunged at me while barking like crazy. Tom came and took the dog and apologized. I absolutely love dogs, and I wasn't upset by this, and I told him it was totally fine. Not that I would have argued with him anyways. I've interned in a jail before, and I've had conversations with inmates who were on trial for murder, so I'm not necessarily intimidated easily. And I do believe in the possibility for a criminal to reintegrate into society and then be successful after proper therapy. But something about a convicted murderer living directly next to you just really hits different. I was 17 years old and I had just gotten home from my summer job working grounds crew at a golf course. During the day at work, I had been talking with my buddy about hanging out that night, so I got in the car and headed over to his house at around 5 p.m. I live in Massachusetts, so midsummer at 5 p.m., it's broad daylight. My friend's family had a big old farmhouse in a rural part of the state. Right as I was driving, my friend gave me a call and told me that he was running an errand and he would probably get home after I got there. He told me the door was open and to just go in and he'd be back soon. This was really nothing out of the ordinary, and I pulled up to his house and parked the car. I looked in his refrigerator for a beer and went to the second floor, where there was this big den area with couches and TV. I flipped the channels for a bit and, after a while, felt nature calling. I walked down the hall to the bathroom, which is right at the top of the stairs on the second floor. I sat on the toilet, picking up an old comic book from the magazine basket. Well, after a few minutes, I had heard some steps on the floor below. Assuming it was my friend, I gave a shout and then made a crude joke about my current predicament, then expecting an equally crude reply back. Nothing. I shouted yet again, saying I was in the bathroom. Still nothing. At this point, I'm thinking maybe he has headphones in. No big deal. The thump of steps start up the creaky stairs, and they sound much heavier than my friend. I feel a chill down my spine, and that's when I felt it. Something was just really off. I hear the steps get to the top of the stairs, just right outside the bathroom door. Alright dude, stop fucking with me, I say. No response. I don't really know what to do at this point, but still just hoping it's my buddy being an asshole. 
I wait in silence for another minute or two. Then the steps start thumping down the hallway, away from the bathroom. I waste no time finishing my business, opening the door, then running down the stairs and out of the house to the front yard. Aside from my car, the driveway is empty. It wasn't my friend playing a joke. I'm the only one here. I grab my phone and call my buddy, but he doesn't pick up. The sun is setting at this point, but it's still a bit light out. And I'm also outside now, so I've chilled out a bit. But I still can't figure out what just happened. Before I have any time to figure out my next move, my friend pulls into the driveway. He can tell I'm freaked out, and I tell him what's going on. It's only been a few minutes since I left the house, so whoever is in there must still be in there. We're young and stupid, so we go into the shed and grab a baseball bat and golf club, and decide to head in and search the place. We head upstairs slowly, expecting somebody to jump out behind every corner, but it's dead quiet. Not a creak or a scrape, or any other noise. We slowly walk down the hall, in the direction I last heard the steps going. The hall ends in a big room that has no other exits, so we know this is where the search will end, but there's no one there. No footmarks in the carpet, no furniture moved, and nothing out of place. We look absolutely everywhere. Under the furniture, storage cabinets, everything. We take a look around the rest of the house, but at this point my buddy is just telling me I'm nuts. I must have imagined it. But to this day, 15 years later, I know what I heard. There was definitely someone in that house. There was someone waiting right outside the bathroom who knew I was in there. Whatever it was, whoever it was, I'm really glad they decided to leave me alone. I grew up in rural areas my entire life. Whether it was beef farms in Tennessee or living in the middle of nowhere Florida, I've done it all. Growing up without access to most commonalities we've grown accustomed to. Yeah, that's right. We had no internet, no TV, and yep, you guessed it, no cell phones. I know, the horror, right? I like to think of us as the last true generation before the internet age. Not to say dial-up wasn't around, but most of us at the time didn't really have access to it. But honestly, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, outside of the long, boring summer days where we'd be cooking alive in the fields. Living out in an old Civil War cabin in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, definitely showed out some interesting experiences. The story is going to be one of many that I share. That is, if you all enjoy this one, that is. The story starts off like any other, really. It was a typical Friday night, and my brothers and I were home alone. Being that we didn't have much of anything to entertain ourselves with, we began playing manhunt in and around the house. Most of the time we opted to stay indoors as it was pitch black outside. For a bit more context, our cabin was situated on top of a rather steep hill that had a long winding driveway running down it. Our cabin had a basement level, the main level where most of the house was, and the upstairs that only had my room. We also had a back deck that was situated about 10 to 12 feet up in the air, if I had to guess. Anyway, back to the story at hand. It was pitch black outside, and going much further than our porch at night wasn't really something anyone enjoyed doing out there. The game was fun, but was already getting pretty monotonous with the little room we had inside. At this point I had the bright idea to wander off outside and then hide on the roof to make the game more interesting. Well. This would soon be one of the biggest regrets in my life. At first, everything seemed fine. It was rather cold and it was nearing fall and the weather was just starting to change. There was a slight breeze and the air was really crisp and calming. After a few minutes of sitting up on the roof though, something felt off. I had been practically mesmerized by the sound of crickets and cicadas. I realized though that all the noise had suddenly stopped. This seemed very odd to me, but at the same time, being as naive as I was at the time, I didn't realize that this only meant something bad was going to happen. I sit there as still as possible for a moment, trying to listen as closely as I can. I just can't seem to hear anything aside from the slight breeze through the leaves. Then as quickly as the silence came, an eruption of noise came from the other end of the roof. 
For a bit more detail, we had a metal roof at the time, making it very easy to hear when things walk on the roof. It sounded like something had landed on the opposite side end of the roof. I looked over, but could see nothing. This of course left me rather unnerved, and my first thought was to exit the situation. Before panicking fully, I remembered it could be my brothers messing with me, since surely they would have given up on looking for me by now. I opened up my window and called my brothers. They both ran up the stairs shouting and complaining that the roof was off limits. As my older brother got to me, I had asked him if he had been messing with me and making the noise on the roof. He of course denied this and wanted to come up and investigate. So he and I slowly made our way to the middle of the roof and listened for a moment. Everything went quiet around us as it had earlier. At this point I was already on edge and ready to karate chop a demon right in the neck if I had to. We hear what sounds like a pounding noise on the far end of the roof and the opposite direction of where we were standing. After what I think were three sets of six pounding noises, it charged us. I think it did anyway. It sounded like hooves were running on the metal roof, but the only issue was we couldn't see a thing. The entire roof was clear, aside from us that is, but somehow we were hearing these footsteps. It quickly approached us and began running circles around us. I held my arms out to try and see if I could feel anything, but I couldn't. The weirdest part of it all though was that I could feel the vibrations of the footsteps all around us but I couldn't see or feel anything in the air. These footsteps circled around us for what seemed like many minutes, but were probably no more than a minute or so at most. It suddenly stopped circling us, and we could hear the steps draw off the roof and then disappear into thin air. We quickly ran inside, locked all the windows and doors, and huddled up inside, freaked the hell out. When I was nine, I was staying home alone. It was early morning and I had just gotten out of the shower and brushed my teeth. I put on my favorite outfit, set up a little area in the living room with a drink and a snack and then turned on the TV to watch something. The phone rang. I went across the house to go answer it. The voice on the other end was, well, really familiar and really comforting for me. He asked me about my day so far and he made small talk. After about a minute or so, he then said, I like your outfit. Is pink your favorite color? I replied back with, Oh, thank you. Uh, no, it isn't. What were you planning on watching on TV? He asked. It took me a few seconds to understand what was happening as I was only nine years old and very naive. The voice on the other end of the phone then changed. It became deep and raspy and horrific. The voice then proceeded to describe all these horrible things that they wanted to do to me, and in detail. I went numb. My skin felt as if it were on fire, and my heart was racing. I had never been more terrified in my entire life. I slammed down the phone, and then I called my mom at work. I tried to explain what happened, and I'm not sure I was making much sense. She got on to me for answering the phone, and she told me to go back about my day. I remember trying to explain to her that he was watching me and that he told me what I had been doing and that he knew what I was wearing. I also mentioned that I was going to call 911 because I needed help. That isn't necessary. I'm not coming home. Just don't answer the phone and go watch TV, she said, and then I hung up. I was really confused and I was scared. I could feel his eyes on me. I pulled the curtains closed and I raced around the house torn between doing what I felt was right and doing what I had been told by my mother. This whole time, the phone was ringing. The second it would stop, it would just start up yet again. The sound of the phone ringing would pulse through my entire body like electricity. It was practically paralyzing me. It was like I was frozen but also on fire at the same time. I waited for a pause in the ringing and called 911. I'm home by myself and I'm nine years old and someone's watching me and telling me they're going to kill me. I told the operator. She tried to keep me calm and she said that she would send help for me. I remember standing there listening to this kind voice just trying to help me, but I could feel every scary movie scenario just playing out behind me. Was he creeping up behind me with a knife? Was he going to shoot me through a window? Was he going to throw a rock through the glass and open the door? I just didn't know. 
I couldn't breathe and I couldn't feel my body. In a moment of panic, I set off the alarm to the house and ran outside. I remember this sense of relief, but also this overwhelming feeling of having a separation in my reality. The house felt small and dark and really dangerous and cold. Outside felt open, as well as safe and warm. I could hear lawn mowers and the sounds of birds chirping. It was a beautiful break from that bone-chilling feeling of the phone. It was like I was watching a movie and I could see myself experience both of these environments at the same time. A neighbor was pushing his child in a swing. He was concerned. He let me stand next to him and he protected me. I could hear the sirens now. The blaring sound getting louder as they grew closer. It felt like it took an eternity, but the police finally arrived. An officer walked over to me and he asked me what happened. I did my best to explain it, but so many of the words on the phone that were used were just so embarrassing. I couldn't bring myself to use such adult words to a police officer. And his other words were just bone chilling. I couldn't say those either. To this day, I can still hear my young voice repeating the words. He was watching me. He said he was going to kill me. Not long after, my mom's car pulled into the driveway. She, for some reason, decided to come home. She didn't look for me or come to speak to me. She just calmly got out and then walked over to the police officer. I was standing in the doorway from the house to the garage just facing the driveway. I could see my mom and the police officer. I was watching and trying to understand, trying to figure out what was happening. Then I saw it. She was laughing. My face was swollen from tears, my heart still racing, and my skin was on fire. And my mom was laughing? What the hell was going on? Very slowly, I crept a little closer, and I then overheard. I'm so sorry about this. I guess she just got scared being home alone and overreacted. I'm really sorry. What the hell's happening? What did I do wrong? Did I imagine this? Was this a dream? Should I not have called 911? Did I actually overreact? My memory of what happened after that is a little hazy. I remember refusing to stay home alone and the sound of the phone ringing just rippling through my body. It wasn't something I liked discussing. I refused to repeat what had been said to me by the voice on the phone. My mom decided that she knew who did it, but she didn't even know the details. There was no investigation. No one was questioned. She told me it was a boy who was the same age as me who lived across the street. I knew that was impossible, but no matter how much I protested it, I was always told that it was him. Many years later, after I was an adult with my own children, we were at Christmas. Everyone was in the living room and I had gone into the back bedroom to change a diaper. As I was walking out of the room and back into the living room, I could hear my mom laughing, her voice as if she had been telling a joke. The faces of everyone else in the room told a different story. Discomfort, anguish, shock, fear, yet she was still laughing. It felt as if I was walking in slow motion. One of my older children had actually stopped me from entering the living room and sort of pushed me back into the room that I had just come out of. She just told the story of you being home alone and the man threatening to kill you. She told it like it was a joke or something. Like some funny story from your childhood. My child told me. To this day, I never learned who it was that called me. I deal with my fear of ringing phones and phone conversations on a daily basis. We're going all the way back to the fall and winter of 1976 for this one. I know, I'm old. And granted, it's an old story, I promise you, it's a good one. And in the summer of 76, my stupid self decided to move out to California. It was a well-meaning venture, I assure you, but a failed one in every conceivable aspect. I'd moved back to Arkansas less than a year after I moved out there, in a place like home, I suppose. But it also might have had something to do with a roommate I had when I was living in Sacramento. I was kind of a late comer to the hippie movement, too young for the summer of love or the Vietnam protests, but seeing what the war did to my old man was just awful. I was young, real young when he came back, but I remember how different he was, just like a little piece of him was lost over there somehow. 
So, it wasn't until the mid-70s that I got a wild hair up my butt to move out to San Francisco. My old man said he'd give me $100 in bus money if I stayed in high school long enough to graduate. So, I did. And that same summer I headed out to San Fran on a Greyhound bus. Only I didn't quite make it. I stopped to see a guy I used to go to camp with in Sacramento and, well, just sort of stayed there. His parents offered me their spare room until I had enough money to carry on to Frisco, but living there made me feel like a bum. So, after squirreling away my first two paychecks, I decided to move into a shared apartment with two strangers. I meet up with a landlord at the house in question. We do a little walk around and he shows me where I'll be staying. The place was really nice. Three separate bedrooms, two bathrooms, and all the ground floor facilities you could imagine. Kitchen, laundry room, TV room, garage, and the rent was enticingly low considering it was such a nice place. Both guys who lived there were out at work at the time so I didn't get to meet any of them in advance and obviously I wasn't permitted to nosy around in either of their bedrooms so I really didn't get a sense of their personalities. But boy was that about to change fast. A week later, I moved into the free room and met the two guys I'd be living with. One guy was named Richard, and the other guy was named Brad. Richard seemed kind of weird and untidy, but he seemed to mostly keep to himself, while Brad was much more friendly and outgoing. The thing was, Brad was moving out at some point over the following two weeks, and he wanted to give me the skinny on Richard before he left. Basically, he asked me how badly I needed the room. I told him real bad. It was either there or be homeless for the foreseeable future. And that's when he tells me that Richard can be cool when he wants to be, but he's definitely a few cards short of a full deck. I asked him what he means by that, and he just replies, You'll see. Just keep your eye out for other apartments. The B generally has some good listings. At first, I just... Figured I'd waded into some slightly bitter roommate rivalry or politics, and I wanted nothing to do with it. I wasn't about to take sides after having been there for a grand total of five minutes, so I decided to play it diplomatically. But Brad was right. Richard was really weird. And not even weird in a fun, hippie way. He wasn't just waving his freak flag high, man. He was the freak flag all on his own. First time I noticed was when I walked into the kitchen and Richard was sat at the table, reading a newspaper while holding an orange on top of his head. I asked him what he was doing and he replied something like, absorbing vitamin C. I laughed, thinking he was just being silly, but when I turned to look at him, deadpan. The guy was deadly serious. I start explaining that's not how nutrition works and he responds by telling me not to lecture him on what goes on in his body, how it was his body and he knew best about it. Naturally, I'm just like, okay dude, whatever you say. Being as non-confrontational as possible, but the second I saw Brad, I conceded that he was right. Richard was crazy. Just how crazy, I had no idea, but I was sure about to find out. Richard's behavior remained curiously strange until the time that Brad moved out. It wasn't anything too scary, just stuff that made you roll your eyes or shake your head. Like at one point we're eating dinner in front of the TV and Richard kind of sits up, stares into space for a moment, checks his own pulse, then says, My heart just stopped beating. Brad seemed to have learned his lesson how to deal with such insane behavior because he falsely expresses some mild concern before suggesting Richard go take a nap. Which he then does. Like some hypochondriac child, he finished his dinner, then goes to take a nap to alleviate his... what? His dead heart? I have no idea. Like I said, it wasn't scary, just kind of annoying. All the scary stuff came after Brad moved out. In fact, I think Brad was the only thing keeping a lid on Richard's behavior because the same day Brad leaves is the same day Richard took a turn for the worse. So, like I've mentioned, I was working part-time in Sacramento, working five-hour shifts four days a week over at a nearby grocery store. One day I get back from my shift and Richard is standing over the bathroom sink, looking into a piece of broken mirror he'd 
propped up against the counter, and he's shaving all his hair off with a straight razor. New haircut, buddy? I remember asking him. No, it's my skull. I think it's fractured. Well, better get down to the hospital, dicky boy. I hear those can be quite serious. I'd pretty much adopted Brad's approach wholesale by that point. Kindly acknowledge and then disengage. But Richard responds by telling me that not only is his skull fractured, but that he can feel the plates moving around under his skin. Now, I'm no doctor, but I was 99% sure that that was impossible. And when I took a look at his request... There was no bruising, no blood, nothing. He's just having another one of his hypochondriac health scares. One time we're having dinner and Richard dropped me a compliment on my sausage gravy. It was like a double compliment since it was my mom's secret recipe too. Turns out Brad was right. Richard could be nice when he wanted to be. But then he somehow managed to ruin the moment by saying something like, Yeah, you're a real good cook. Much better than my mom. She used to try and poison me. Again, like the thing with the orange, I thought he was cracking a joke, so I laughed. But just like the thing with the orange, he simply stares at me, totally straight-faced, and I realized that it wasn't a joke. Only this time he's actually kind of offended that I didn't take him seriously, and that's the first time I saw Richard's mean side come out. He just stared at me, holding his knife and fork so hard his fists were shaking. And for a moment, I was actually scared he was just going to lunge at me from across the table. Instead, he picks up his plate, clears it, then marches off up to his room. A few hours later, he apologized for being so rude. I forgave him, and thus the cycle began anew. He'd act perfectly normal, then some weird outbursts would have me reconsidering Brad's suggestion on keeping an eye out for a new apartment. But until I could get more hours at the Safeway, that just wasn't an option for me. If you remember, I moved into the apartment during the fall, and Rich's behavior had been, at worst, amusingly bizarre for the majority of my stay. But the closer and closer we got to Christmas the more he seemed to be slipping further and further into some downward spiral, and it had turned out to be one he'd never fully recover from, and it was definitely one that was made entirely worse by our use of recreational drugs. Like I said, late blooming hippie here, so when Richard suggested we get our hands on some pot and LSD, I just thought, groovy, you know? I didn't stop to consider that might be a terrible idea given his psychological issues. I actually kind of thought drugs might help him, but good lord did that turn out to be total naivety. Like I said, I thought a trip or two might help Richard out, give him a little perspective, but using drugs just sparked some sort of fire in him. He didn't just use them recreationally like me and my buddies had back in Little Rock. He used them habitually. He tripped every night for a week, until I literally had to hide the little eyedropper of acid I'd bought for us, and when he finally came out of it, he was all kinds of messed up. The day after he sobered up, I heard him coming down for breakfast, and when he walks into the kitchen area, and I look up, I see he's as naked as the day he was born. Obviously, I'm like, screaming, Richard, put on some clothes for Christ's sake. He just responds with, why? grabs some cereal, pours himself a bowl, then just sits down to eat. I was just getting progressively insanely more uncomfortable, and I couldn't bring myself to eat in front of a naked man like that, so I just got up and walked out. Huge mistake. Because I didn't properly address the whole nudity thing, he took that as him having a free pass. So, with an infuriatingly ever-increasing frequency... I'd have my roommate stumbling around the house, totally nude, while taking poles on a bottle of Jack Daniels. Now most people I've told this story to, they have said that they'd have been gone the moment the nudity thing started. But what can I say? It was the 70s. I was something of a freak myself. And if I couldn't handle one little weirdo in Sacramento, how was I going to stomach rubbing shoulders with hardcore Frisco hippies once I made it out there? Nope. 
Instead, the final straw was coming home to find him making cocktails. So like I said, I walk into the house one day and I hear the blender in the kitchen whirring. I wait for the break in the whirring to call out to him as I walk into the TV room. He had to walk that way to get to the kitchen, asking him what he's making. He just replies, cocktails, in this dull, flat tone that let me know that he was wasted. But when I enter the kitchen, I get this strong odor of whiskey, along with something else. Following whatever he'd been doing, Richard had evidently made this very out-of-character attempt to clean up after himself, but he hadn't been completely thorough, as on the plain white countertop, I could still make out what looked like streaks of some thick red liquid. I walk over, run my finger over a patch of it, rubbing it together between my fingers before feeling that it has a distinctly sticky texture to it. Richard? I said. Is this blood? No, he replied. Suddenly I get this sudden urge to lift up the lid of the trash can, but at the same time, I'm also filled with dread. Whatever, or whoever that blood belonged to, there'd surely be remnants of it in the trash. In fact, upon seeing a small, bloody fingerprint on the trash can's lid, I'm sure that's where I'd find the remains. Then, of course, I open the trash to see a bloody paper bag with what was clearly a stripy raccoon tail sticking out of it. During the mother of all arguments that followed, when I asked him what in God's name he was doing, he tried to palm me off with an excuse I've never, ever forgotten. He briefly stops the blender from whirring and says, It's going to stop my heart from shrinking then carries on grinding up this reddy brown mess of soda, ice, and what I could only assume was raccoon meat. This crazy monster thought he had some rare medical condition where his heart was basically wasting away, and the cure was to blend the organ meats of trapped animals with Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola, of all things. Like I said, that was the final straw, and by that time, another guy was living there with us too, we discussed giving Richard a kind of ultimatum, either shape up or ship out, but considering he'd reached the butchering animals and eating them raw stage of his madness, we agreed the best thing was for us to just get out of there. I called my old camp buddy that night and begged my way back into his parents' spare room. I carried on working at the Safeway for a time, got some more hours, and since I wasn't paying rent in my buddy's parents' place, Getting some bus money and a security deposit was much easier. I didn't hear no more of Richard, and when I finally left San Francisco in January of 77, I never looked back. Cut to just over two years later, I think about March of 1979, I'm living back with my parents in Little Rock, and I've cleaned up my act, and I'm working at another grocery store with my mind set on applying to colleges. Sometimes I used to get up real early and head down to the grocery store at around 6.30am to help the owner prep for opening hours and a real small part of that was unpacking and arranging newspapers near the smaller front counter. I used to kind of take my time with this particular job on occasion, sipping my coffee, flicking through the sports section, all away from the prying eyes of the owner who was counting cash or whatever in his office. One morning... I catch a headline and I think was the National Enquirer, saying something like, Cannibal Killer's Trial Date Set. Obviously, that's not the sort of headline you read every day, so I start reading the article to get more details. And guess whose name I see, just a few lines down. Yup, my insane, crazy old roommate, Richard Chase. There's even a little picture of him in the margin, and clear as day, it's him. Same guy I lived with for the better part of five months. This is all from memory, so you'd have to ask Google for all the details, but here's what I remember. After I left the home I shared with Richard, his condition worsened and worsened over the course of the year, until finally in the winter of 77, he commits his first murder by randomly shooting a guy in the street. A few weeks later, he tries a home invasion, only the family isn't home, so 
he can't hurt anyone, so he decides to wait. But when they do get home, he gets the heebie-jeebies, turns tail, and runs. The family then arrives home to find that Richard had broken into their baby's nursery before going to the bathroom on the kid's clothes. He was absolutely sick in the head. A short time later, he tries another home invasion, and this time, he kills a pregnant woman. But here's the really messed up part. Before sleeping with her corpse, I read he put dog feces in the poor girl's mouth too. It makes you wonder what goes through a man's head to do something as absolutely insane as that. I followed the case for a while after and I was happy when I heard he got the death penalty for the things he did. He ended up taking his own life before they could get him to the gas chamber though. Figured he wanted to go out on his own terms. Only thing that messes with me is that some people say he wasn't crazy. That he knew what he was doing when he killed those women and did those awful things to them. I'm not saying he didn't deserve to die. That's not what I'm saying at all. Heck, I'd even kick the chair out from under that guy in a hot minute if he gave me the chance. But the only thing that's crazy is saying that he ain't. You understand me? I live with that man. I ate with him. I tripped with him. I know Richard Chase. And the cheese slid off that boy's crackers a long time before he started killing. He was crazy as a dog in a hubcap factory the whole time I knew him. And although what he did was a tragedy, I was entirely surprised by it. I feel lucky to have gotten out when I did. Hang around for another year and it might have been me getting shot dead at the side of the road. But the thing that really sticks with me isn't the survivor guilt, or whatever people want to call it. It's wondering how evil like that even comes into this world. I used to live with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. Hector was this six-foot Afro-Latino dude from New Jersey who had two distinct modes of being. Either he was a tornado of anger, or he was manically laughing at something. Rarely was there any in-between. When you caught him in his laughing mood, he was tolerable at best, but catch him in one of his angry moods and he was totally unbearable. He was a roadie for some post-hardcore band that toured up and down the East Coast a bunch, which was one of the few good things about being his roommate. The fact that he spent weeks away at a time from the apartment, but still paid rent. But whenever he was home... Well, here's an example. It's July in East Harlem. I have the windows open. Latin brass band music is flowing through the afternoon air from some other open window, and I'm sipping southern peach lemonade like life is good. Out of nowhere, Hector bursts into the apartment, covered in brick dust like, I need bricks, bro. You got bricks? I just started driving Uber while trying to get my stand-up career up and running, so no, I didn't have any bricks. And even if I did, I wouldn't have been sharing them with Hector. And suddenly he's like, there's bricks on the roof. And as he runs out of the apartment and towards the stairwell of the building, I hear these kids shouting from outside the window. Then I look out to see this group of kids, like 11 year old kids all shouting stuff in Spanish at our building. They see me, start flipping me off and whatnot before they suddenly scatter in all directions. Then bam, a brick lands right in the spot where they were before they scattered. See, that's the type of guy Hector was. He could go out for a pack of rips and find himself in a brick fight with a bunch of Puerto Rican kids on the way back. Never in my life have I ever had a fight with a preteen, let alone one involving projectiles. But around Hector... That stuff was like a daily occurrence. So come that October, Hector is headed out on some big Halloween tour with one of his bands and he tells me he won't be back till the second week of November. That meant I'd have to cover half of the rent until then, something I'd have to borrow money to do. This causes a big fight and for the first time since I moved in, I thought Hector might actually hit me. And being the kind of guy that he was, I knew for a fact that if it came to violence, he wouldn't just stop at one punch. So when the time came for him to go on tour, and the mood in the apartment isn't just at its low point, I'm legit scared for my physical safety. He leaves, 
I'm looking for a new apartment and life is not so good anymore. So a few nights later, the night before Halloween actually, I'm sitting in the little kitchen area, eating arepas and looking for other apartments. Someone buzzes the apartment so I go to see who it is. This is back when we had intercoms but they sucked and barely worked half the time so when I hear some guy with an accent says something like, I need an apartment number three, but the buzz is not working. I just buzz the guy in without a second thought. New York is a city built on takeout, delivery, and street food, so I'm hardly going to be all suspicious over a delivery driver. But I should have been, and I almost paid with my life for it. Those guys busted our front door open like it was nothing, just smashed the lock right through with a sledgehammer. I actually thought it was the cops at first because they just piled in, guns drawn, shouting get on the floor, get down. But then the way that they were talking to each other once I was lying face down on the linoleum, that clued me into the fact that they were just stick-up guys. But what were they doing in my apartment? My first thought was, Jesus Christ, Hector, whose toes do you step on now? But before I can wonder anymore, one of the guys starts asking me, Where is it? Where is it? I'm like, where's what? But that just makes them mad. I get this flurry of kicks that have me balled up in the fetal position, then they ask me again. I can't tell them anything else, so I just say, I, I don't know what you're talking about, there's $20 in my wallet, that's all I got on me. The offer of 20 bucks just offended them, and I get more kicks before they start tossing the apartment like they're looking for something. And when I say tossing, I really do mean trashing. They're deliberately breaking stuff, pulling drawers all the way out and then throwing them at other stuff. It was just destruction in every sense of the word and it was around then that I got a look at a couple of the guys. They're all masked up or have stuff over their faces. They're wearing all black, gloves and the works. They were professional stick-up guys, probably robbed drug dealers for a living, but Hector wasn't dealing. I mean, I think I'd have noticed at some point. I saw a lot of broken guitars and amplifiers around the apartment, but not too many piles of coke or money. Then right as I'm about to think it, one of the guys comes out with it. You sure this is the right place, man? Uh, I don't know. Homie told me he keeps it behind the bathtub sometimes, but these people only got a shower in there. I feel this wave of relief washing over me. They got the wrong place, so they're gonna just walk out, right? Maybe take my phone so I can't call the cops. So, like I said, I told them my phone was on the table, next to my food, and that I wouldn't call the cops if they just left. Cuck move, maybe, but it's amazing how zen you get about material possessions when you see a Glock in someone's hand. The stick-up guys kind of pause and look at each other. Then right as I think they're about to just leave, one of them says, I think you see my face, man, when we were breaking in. He's got to go. One of them has the gun, and the guy who wants me dead starts reaching to take it off the guy who has it, but the guy who has it doesn't want to give it up. That was my cue, to soil myself and start begging for my life. It wasn't my proudest moment, and peeing my pants was by no means metaphorical, but it is what it is looking back. They're arguing over shooting me. I'm begging for my life. It's just chaos and them shouting in there and and I'm amazed no one had called the cops already. But then boom. The front entrance of the apartment building slammed shut and I can hear a very familiar voice coming up the stairs. I'm not even going to type out what Hector was saying. I'd be cancelled and deleted from the internet within seconds after posting but let's just say someone had cancelled their tour three days in and he was livid about it. Going on calling them every name under the sun ranting and raving as he pound his way up the stairs and, in the apartment, both me and the stick-up guys are about frozen in anticipation. Then right as Hector is about to come into the apartment, he says something like, Hey, I got your money, you whiny little baby. What the f- The guy with the gun aims it at Hector as he walks in, looking around at the pure destruction that greeted him. Who are you people? He screamed. Who are you? The guy with the gun screamed back. Hector is just gone by this point, foaming at the mouth, 
looking like he's got one of his eyeballs about to pop when he comes back. I live here. Then, I swear to God, I watch as Hector basically turns into a drunk, slightly overweight Jason Bourne. He swings his backpack off his shoulder and just launches it at the shooter. He knocks the guy slightly off balance, messes up his aim, but by the time he can like rearrange himself, Hector like football tackles this guy onto the carpet and just starts wailing on him. The two other guys then jump in and I'm thinking, oh Jesus God, someone's about to get shot. When out of nowhere, Hector comes up and is just windmailing punches at both guys, holding his own until he goes down again. Then almost immediately, both guys start backing up, hands in the air, and there's Hector, holding the gun he'd almost just been shot with, telling both the guys to back up. His face is bleeding, he's totally gassed, but there he is, having just won a freaking fist fight with three guys, one of them armed. He then sits on the KO'd shooter's back, tells the other guys to get out of his apartment, and tells me to dial 911. And only when the cops show up to arrest the guy he'd managed to detain did he realize he'd been stabbed in the shoulder. That night, as he got stitched up at the hospital, I sifted through all the broken and non-broken stuff, swept up all the broken glass and ceramics, and generally tried to put the apartment back in order. He got back at around 1 a.m., still drunk after the doctor told him, do not drink on these painkillers, and immediately started complaining about the break-in. I just carried on cleaning up, stopping only briefly to say something deeply heartfelt. Hector, dude, I just wanted to say I think you might have saved my life today, dude, and I just wanted to say thank you. I felt my throat kind of tighten as I said it, very similar to the way it's doing now as I'm typing this, remembering. Hector looked up at me, with this look in his eyes that almost made it look like I'd gotten through to him, until he replied with, Whatever, you could have jumped in at any time. <sighs> I didn't mind. I knew Hector well enough by that point to know he wasn't exactly in touch with his feelings. But as he immediately sought to leave the room due to the uncomfortable amount of emotion in the air, he turned and said, did you see the look on those guys' faces, though? It's hilarious, dude. And he just walked off to his bedroom, laughing that evil toddler laugh that makes my skin crawl, even today. You see, for just over a year I shared an apartment with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. And I owe that idiot my life. Please, New York, don't ever change. After I had moved to London, the first flatmate I had legitimately tried to kill me. I think he was only keen for me to move in so I could cover all the rent he was missing, and after a while, petty arguments about cleanliness and money management turned rather vicious, and I was forced to find a new place to live. Once I found a place, I had to wait two weeks to move in, and although this definitely wasn't the right move, I thought I'd have to leave it until the last minute to tell my stupid flatmate because... Screw you, that's why. And instead of waiting until the day before, I ended up dropping that little tidbit into an argument we had about a week before I was due to move out. He started playing the victim, telling me I was basically condemning him to being homeless, but if it wasn't for his silver spoon up the butt attitude to work, I might have had a bit more sympathy for him. We both smoked and did so in the flat, so the morning after our argument I wake, roll over, and grab my smokes to light one up in bed before facing the day. Not my proudest habit. I hold my hands up, but smoking in my room was better than facing him in the morning. I pop a ciggy between my lips, grab my lighter, but the bloody flint on the disposable piece of crap is bust. I try time and time again, but nope, it's buggered. So I roll out of bed, walk down the hall towards the kitchen, still trying hopelessly to get a light. Then suddenly, as I stroll into the kitchen, the absolute reek of gas hits me, and just under the humming of traffic outside, I can hear gas leaking out of the stovetop. That freaking psychopath had turned on all the gas in the kitchen, knowing I'd have sparked up first thing, blowing the whole flat sky high. I rush to turn them off, 
opened all the windows in the flat, ran downstairs and called the fire brigade. My flatmate was interviewed under caution, but because they couldn't prove a bloody thing, the police had to let him walk. The landlord was much more understanding though and we basically made an agreement to cut him out of the lease while we arranged for locks to be changed. Apparently, he'd been looking to get rid of him for quite a while before the incident so I ended up staying put. The only worry was the ex-flatmate, but since he was under suspicion over what he must have called an accident, I think he was too scared to follow up on it and try for any serious revenge. Still, mess with my head for quite a while after, thinking someone would be that vindictive over me just wanting to move out. Do your research on who you're going to be living with people. It might just save your life. I moved to South Korea for university when I turned 18. I'm now 21 and this happened over two years ago. Whilst there has definitely been unwanted attention from some guys in the past, most of them get the message that I'm not interested. This however was a little more unsettling. The university I go to has an institute for language, which is where all of my classes were at the time, and it's pretty common knowledge that most foreigners in this part of Korea would know of or study at this institute. It's not abnormal for me to receive random Facebook requests from guys wanting to learn English or make foreign friends and most of the time I just ignore them unless we have a few mutual friends or I've met them before. I got a friend request from this guy named Nico and we had quite a handful of mutual friends and he'd messaged me too saying he was sorry for the randomness of the request but he was just trying to make as many foreign friends as he could. I thought what the heck and I accepted and messaged him back saying it was no bother. From what I could tell by his Facebook photos he was heavily pierced and tattooed and stated he was Japanese, but had studied in Canada and could speak good English and also a foreigner studying at my university. After a few days he messaged me again and I replied, and it was casual conversation and he would often bring up maybe meeting for coffee or a movie, which I declined until he started getting more aggressive for no reason. Every time I'd make a comment, he'd find some way to turn it into an argument, which grew tiring super fast so I just ignored him. He'd often ask if I had a boyfriend, to which I'd reply no and he'd bluntly say that we should be together. It was at this point where I decided that I didn't really want anything to do with him, so I politely declined on the basis I didn't know him, we'd never meet and we hadn't even known each other a week. He didn't take my refusal well and began throwing insults at me based on my looks and saying overly graphic things that he'd do to me if he ever saw me. Apparently I was being stupid not to take him up on the offer because I'd never do better than him and he'd make me see that. It creeped me out beyond belief so I just blocked and deleted him on Facebook and tried to forget about it. I mentioned it to a friend of mine and she immediately knew exactly who I was talking about. Apparently I was not the first girl he added on Facebook and tried to bully into meeting him and being his girlfriend. After asking a few more of my friends who we'd had as mutual friends on Facebook, they'd all describe pretty similar situations involving this Nico. One girl even told me that she'd given him the benefit of the doubt and met with him and it turned out that he didn't even go to our university, but actually lived over an hour away and would travel there daily, probably to watch and obsess over which girl he would find on Facebook next. He told her he was born in America and had never been to Japan, yet he told me he was Japanese and studied in Canada, so who knows how much of what he said to anyone was actually true. I felt a bit freaked out by this, but tried not to let it bother me. I'd never see him around and I'd blocked him, so I forgot about it. And that was until about a week or two later I received a message from him on Facebook on another account saying how he'd see me that day at school. This shook me up a bit since I hadn't even considered that he might actually be watching me at school. I ignored the message and blocked the account. A few days later I got numerous messages from different accounts claiming to be Nico's friends, saying how he had his account hacked 
and could I please unblock him so he could explain and we could talk it over. I ignored these messages too, but I kept receiving more, all of which I am pretty sure were just Nico himself trying to reach out to me to get my attention. The more I ignored him, the more violent and aggressive the messages became, and I could tell that most of the time when he said he'd seen me, he was lying. He'd say things like, I saw you today at the library all day, you fucking slut. You're a fucking four-eyed slut who can't get laid, and other messages to that extent. I knew he was clutching at straws because I never used the school's library to study, and although I wear glasses, I never wear them in public. So I just kept blocking the accounts and tried not to let it bother me, figuring he was just some desperate idiot. I figured he'd get bored of me soon enough and let it go. Until one day after classes had finished and I was browsing the small convenience store in the building to grab a drink on my way home. I opened up the fridge to get a bottle of water when I closed the door. He was literally standing right beside me. He didn't say anything, he was just staring at me. I hadn't seen him in person before because I had never agreed to meet him, but I knew straight away it was him. And I freaked out. I dropped the bottle and I just left the store. I didn't walk home because I was afraid he'd follow me and find out where I lived. So I just went back into school and stayed around areas where there were lots of people until a friend of mine came to meet me. After that, I saw him a handful of times when I'd leave class. He'd just be standing there doing nothing in particular, watching people as they walked past and he'd stare at me intently. I'd made sure to always be with friends when I went to and from class and didn't go anywhere alone for a while, but after a week or so the messages stopped and I didn't see him again. The last time I heard from him was a year ago when he messaged me on yet a new Facebook account asking if we could be friends again because he'd changed and it was all just a joke. Needless to say, I ignored the message, blocked the account, and will not be taking up his offer on being friends. I dated my last serious boyfriend for around six years, and throughout the whole of those six years, I always received pokes off of a fellow on Facebook. I didn't think too much of it, and we had like 30 friends in common, so I figured maybe I had met him somewhere along the way. Besides, he was muscly and quite attractive, so having the additional attention was fun, I guess. A couple of weeks after my ex and I split, he private messaged me asking me if we could meet. We chatted for a while and I eventually agreed to go for a meal with him. On first date terms, it was a pretty lovely one. Nice meal, walk under the stars, blah blah blah. After a few weeks of seeing him, I noticed little traits in his behavior that I found to be particularly strange. He would never let me in his house and would leave me standing outside. One day I stood outside of his house for 45 minutes at 10.30pm as we had walked there. I didn't know where the hell I was and he decided that I had given him the hump for no apparent reason. This is where I should have bailed out. The following Friday I figured I would give him the benefit of the doubt and invited him round. He stayed for 9 days. I had to text a friend asking her to pick me up and not invite him just to get him out. I figured I would leave it now until he turned up on my doorstep the next day. I told him I wasn't very well and that I had a pretty serious urinary tract infection which was met with a lot of accusations of cheating and even being a slag. This was the final straw and I told him to leave and not to bother contacting me. Every day I received text after text, missed call after missed call. I blocked him on Facebook so he messaged all of my friends begging them to convince me to take him back. Hell no. I figured that after some time, he would back away. Things went quiet for about a week. It was bliss until I received a call off a number I didn't know. It was asking me who the man was who had just walked in front of my door. It was my father, by the way. This happened every time someone walked in front of my flat. Male, female, it didn't matter. Turned out he knew someone who lived across the street from me 
and had him and his lovely girlfriend watching my every move. Things calmed down again after speaking to the couple and explaining the grief it had caused me. He told them that he was still together with me and he was concerned for my safety. And I thought he had got the message until one day when I finished work and caught the bus home. I had this perfectly timed so that I would always be pulling up to my estate at 6pm. As I strolled down the hill to my estate, ready to cut through the alley towards the garages, I noticed a figure tucked away in the shadows in the corner. It was him. I kept my head up and marched onwards to my front door. He followed the distance behind until I reached the door and ran after me and chased me up the stairs in the block of flats I lived in. I told him I wasn't interested, that he was scaring me and that he needed help. And this is where he thought that maybe a hug would change my mind in this situation. After letting out a massive scream from my neighbor, he was escorted out of the building and was told that if he returned, it probably would be the last thing he had ever done. At least I have learned now not to date people off of Facebook and at least run a background check on any future partners. I am an uninteresting man in my late 20s with a stable job and happy family. Being so, I had never even entertained the thought that I might, one day, be the target of a stalker. So here's my story as a warning to everyone. You don't have to be a typical, pretty young lady to catch the eye of a stalker. I don't know if this makes sense, but I am a habitual yet very casual Facebook user. I don't post a lot, but I do check my news feed often. One Saturday night I was doing a quick round on Facebook before I went to bed, when I received a friend request. I accepted it without hesitation. Just about every friend request I receive gets accepted because I don't ever post anything very personal. As I said, I have a very casual approach to social networking. I do a quick glance on the profile that had friended me and saw that it was an obviously fake account. Not thinking much of it, I put my computer away and fell asleep. The next day, I was having lunch at a friend's house having completely forgotten about the friend request from the night before. My phone buzzed and I saw that I had gotten a message from a coworker of mine, Maya. Although Maya and I worked together and had a few mutual friends outside of work, we didn't communicate much other than when it was about work. I checked it, assuming it was work-related. I guess looking back you can say it was. To get the gist of it, the Facebook account that friended me also friended Maya and had bombarded her with insults and accusations of being a whore, slut, and every name in the book. The person took it a step further by messaging Maya's husband, saying that she was cheating on him with a co-worker. Maya wanted to know if I knew who the person was, because I was the only other person that accepted the friend request. I explained to her how I accept every request and have no idea who it was. I then proceeded to unfriend the profile in question. Maya explained to me that she already had suspicions on who it was but just wanted to see if I could confirm it. She believed it was Carrie. Let's rewind to a few weeks earlier. I had received a friend request from Carrie. It struck me as odd because, although we worked at the same place, we had never met, never spoken, nor had we ever made eye contact or been within 20 feet of each other. We worked in different departments, but I walked past her every day because I had to walk through her department to get to our lounge. That was the furthest extent of our interactions. I only learned her name from when she friended me on Facebook and I recognized her picture. I'm not sure how she found out my name. Carrie also friended my wife's profile and subsequently began to sift through years of my wife's posts and pictures, liking and commenting on several of them. She began interacting with my posts too, as though she knew us as well. It worked though. I'd walk by like usual and still no interaction. I found it odd but didn't look too far into it. So back to the present, the mysterious Facebook account continued to harass Maya until she told her that she knew it was Carrie and was going to call the police. I thought that was the end of that but boy was I wrong. 
Over several weeks, I began getting more friend requests from girls looking to hook up with me. Obviously, I knew they were all fake and for the most part, I ignored them. I also began getting notifications from Google and Facebook accounts about suspicious activity on my profile. Most of the time, it warned me of failed login attempts. One I specifically remember said my Facebook account was actually logged in from somewhere unusual and asked whether it was me. It wasn't me, and I should have been more concerned, but for some reason I didn't care at the time. I was stupid, and even after that, I didn't bother to change my password. At the time, I viewed all of these happenings as random, isolated incidents. I had no valuable stuff on my account and didn't have any private secretive messages. What harm could they do, right? A few months pass when one day my wife gets a message from Carrie stating that she had bought a high-end video camera and was looking to start some amateur filming. She wanted to know if we could help her by letting her film our family for a day. Remembering what Maya had said a few months ago, I was reluctant but wanted to give Carrie the benefit of the doubt so we agreed to tell her that we'd schedule a time for her whenever we weren't busy and left it at that. Once again, I have yet to actually meet Carrie. More weeks pass by and we completely forget about scheduling the film shoot when Carrie messages me about it. I turn her down. Then things got weird. She sent several GIF files of stick figures doing sexually suggestive motions and gyrations. I didn't respond, so she asked, Funny, isn't it? I immediately texted my wife to log into my Facebook profile to observe the messages. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed with Carrie as of the humor in the GIFs she sent and carried on the conversation. She proceeded to send me old photos from my abandoned MySpace account that I had completely forgotten about. That was around the time when MySpace had been revamped and people lost a lot of cherished memories. Somehow she dug mine up and decided to share them with me. It was creepy to me. Things escalated quickly from there. She began talking about her body and how she wasn't attractive, trying to bait me into complimenting her looks. She was not beautiful, but she was an attractive person. I didn't bite though. Then she hit me with something out of the blue. She asked me about my penis, calling it my cock and suggesting that it was probably pretty big. I decided that was enough and stopped responding. Of course my wife was reading the whole time and we were texting back and forth about how funny and weird this all was. I continued to go to work and still awkwardly never actually met Carrie. I especially didn't want to strike up any conversations after that. Carrie messaged me one final time asking for a favor. Maya had blocked her profile and Carrie suspected that Maya was saying bad stuff about her so she wanted me to check her profile to confirm. I told her that I wasn't going to stalk Maya for her and that was that. Just between us though, I did check and no, Maya couldn't care less to waste her time talking about Carrie. Around this time my wife got a text from an unknown number. The person knew her name but was trying to remain anonymous and was trying to flirt with her. We were with a bunch of friends at the time and we all thought it'd be funny if we all text flirted with this person at the same time to annoy them. Once again, I never thought to connect any of the incidents. Carrie eventually quit work and I never saw her again, but I continued to get suspicious activity and friend requests that I, stupidly, continued to write off. I had all but forgotten about Carrie. Then, I'd say over a year later, I get a bomb from my wife. A good friend of ours texted her that I was sending her very inappropriate messages on Facebook. I had been busy running errands all day and hadn't really checked my Facebook at the time. I found that my password had been changed when I finally logged back on. All of my messages had also been cleared. I had no idea the extent of what happened until I started hearing from people that I was being very suggestive and nasty to them. The thing was, these weren't random women on my friends list that were targeted. These were women that were close to me, good friends, my wife's sisters, my friends' wives. These messages weren't holding back either. 
They went all out in graphic detail about what I wanted to do to them. I felt completely violated and humiliated. I couldn't imagine how the women felt. My wife and I were really close to our families and friends and every other week or so, all of our friends would get together and drink, BBQ, watch movies or sports and hang out. We'd seen several families over and never had a problem. All of them said they understood what happened and that they know it wasn't me. Deep inside though I could see that they felt that it possibly, potentially, probably was me. Over time, more and more of them stopped coming over to the point where my home started to feel empty. I confided in my wife how I felt that they think it was me and she rebutted that I was just being paranoid. She argued that our friends were just busy with their lives, that they'd eventually come over when they were free again. I then learned that someone had created a Facebook account using my name and picture and had continued harassing the same women. One of them posted a picture of the conversation with this false me on Facebook. She commented that it could really be me because that mystery person has used some words that I typically would. She also stated that the person knew my friends and family extensively. My heart instantly shattered reading that. I quit checking my Facebook for the longest time and I guess I fell into a mild depression. I felt miserable. I told my wife that I wanted to disappear and strongly considered quitting my job of seven years and moving away to start anew. I now know that I was being quite irrational and thankfully my wife stayed strong for me through it all. I felt like I needed to defend my honor and started gathering alibis of times, people and places I was around during the time of many of those messages. My wife brutally told me that she couldn't believe I was weak enough to let a no-life dumbass on Facebook put me down and make me feel that way. Which is true. I am and always have been a very mentally strong person. I always look for the best in a bad situation, but for some reason this affected me differently. I can't explain why, but I felt extreme shame and guilt for something I didn't even do. Without my wife's support knocking me back to reality, I don't know what would have happened. We advised our friends just to ignore the person and eventually everything stopped. From time to time I still get a random friend request, but I don't accept them anymore. I don't have any proof that this was all the work of Carrie. It just all happened during a time when she injected herself into my life and eventually stopped after she left. My friends have started coming over again, but it hasn't felt the same ever since then. I don't know if it's them or just in my head. My wife and I came to the conclusion that Carrie reveled in the misery of others. After tormenting Maya, she moved on and targeted me trying to ruin my marriage and distance me from friends for no other reason than the fact that she enjoyed doing so. I'm sure she hasn't stopped and only left me alone because she found a new victim to harass. I'm a 20-something woman, American and a Francophile fluent but not native in French. Since 2011 I've been in correspondence with an eccentric French guy I met because he posted a clip of a super rare telefilm on YouTube. We had a bunch of mutual interests and eventually met in real life so he could give me the movie on a flash drive. He also gifted me a book from his personal library that he thought I would like. We stayed in contact and I recently returned the favor by buying him a DVD off Amazon. It's been good. Our conversations are enriching, and he's a sweet guy, just odd, as am I. He sort of switches between identities online, his real name, Jean, and then an Italian surname, and a fictional character from gothic literature. He's very into dark romanticism. I knew him on Facebook under the name of the character, and for a while that was his email address as well, although last summer he started using an address based off his real name so it was kind of a mix of the two. He can be hard to keep tabs on because he often disappears from Facebook without warning and then reappears as soon as he came. He's gone through two or three different accounts, 
all using the fictional character's name. It wasn't a surprise when he vanished sometime last fall and I just kept my eyes peeled for him. Occasionally I'd do a search and one day I found an account with his real name, although not one with the fictional character. There was no face pic, but that was typical. Since he sometimes uses his real name online as well, I added that person, figuring if he wasn't the right person he would just decline my request slash send me a message asking how we knew each other. When he accepted my request without asking me who I was, I figured it was him. This seemed to be confirmed when I first started messaging him in late February. Between then and now we've exchanged just over 900 messages. I started things where they had left off, saying how it was good to see him back. I had just been thinking of him. I was going to email him something but now I could do it over Facebook chat, etc. He greeted me warmly and then when I sent him a YouTube video I thought he'd like, he proceeded to discuss it with me. He was a little less articulate than I remembered, but not so much that it became noticeable except in hindsight. I think the incoherence isn't quite as glaring to me in French as well since it's not my native language. And he was odd, but that was normal. In April he returned to Facebook under the fictional character's name. We added each other and started Facebook chatting. I would chat with the two accounts indiscriminately. They were never online at the same time, so I would just talk to whichever one was on. Again, I noticed that something was off with John. He would say things that didn't make sense and then refuse to explain when I said I was confused. He would use flirtatious terms of endearment, which made me uncomfortable. He made a lot of typos that made it hard to follow him too. It was only later that I noticed all the typos, all the cryptic statements and non sequiturs. All the flirtation happened when I was talking to Jean and not when I was talking to the account with the name of the fictional character. Likewise, all the most legit stuff happened with the fictional character account, like me getting his address to send him the DVD. He was just straight up nicer on that account too. I had some unpleasant arguments with real name Jean and only him. I didn't notice that at the time though, because there otherwise seemed to be a continuity between the two accounts. We discussed the same topics on both, and while the speech patterns were somewhat different, like I said, more lucid and friendly on the fictional character account, there were also notable similarities. The same Italian expressions got used, for instance. Real name Jean called me Bella Ragazza, a flirtatious gesture that made me slightly uncomfortable. Fictional character Jean, while making fun of a Roberto Alagna album cover, called him Bel Oyomo. They both used the expression no problemo at various points. They both complained about the French far right. It seemed seamless. Until it wasn't. On Saturday I saw a real name Jean online and started chatting with him, asking him if he heard about all the stuff that had happened that week in the US. When I brought up marriage equality, he became very homophobic, which surprised me because I had known him to be a decent guy. We'd argued about non-binary gender before, but straight up vicious homophobia, slurs, etc., and it came as a shock to me. I started to fight with him and he became very hostile, saying nonsensical and paranoid things like, if I come to your city, you'll hide with your friends so as not to show your face at the supermarket and telling me to stop talking to him. None of this made any sense to me given our four-year history, his past affectionate behavior, etc. And I asked him, so we're not friends anymore? Trying to figure out what the hell was going on. He responded that friendship means nothing on the internet, which I found bizarre because we met in real life in the summer of 2011 and had been planning to meet again last year, except that he had been out of town. A while later, I saw that fictional character Jean had liked and commented on one of my photos. Another thing I only realized in hindsight was that all the likes and comments were from fictional character Jean, not real name Jean. I went to Facebook chat, only real name Jean was on. I asked him why he was liking my stuff when he told me to stop talking to him. Furious, he responded that he hadn't liked anything. Where do you see my name? I said. Well, not your real name fictional character. He said, so? And told me to fuck off. 
At this point, I was reeling in confusion. What the fuck was happening? Was he having a dissociative episode? I resolved to talk to real name Jean when he came online to see how he acted towards me, and if he was civil, to confront him with his behavior under his other account. He came on early in the morning, and I rushed to talk to him, both deeply unsettled and dying of curiosity. Hi, can I talk to you? It's kind of urgent, I said. Him? Urgent? Sure, what's up? So when I was talking to real name Jean, you're the only one I'm talking to, right? This man is you, and I linked to the Facebook page, to which he responded, Not at all. In fact, I don't have a Facebook account under my real name. This person is simply homonymous. He confirmed that he only been back on Facebook since April, the time when the fictional character account reappeared. He was pretty distressed to learn I'd been talking to this guy for four months thinking it was him, and even more distressed to know that the guy was a dick and I thought even for a moment that he also was a dick. You're probably wondering how it took me so long to figure it out, and all I can say is that because I took for granted the real name Jean and fictional character Jean were the same person, it never even occurred to me that they might not be. Them being the same person was the null hypothesis and the idea that they might not be, that real name Jean might be pretending, was so incredibly crackers that it never crossed my mind not once. You're probably still wondering how I could simply have taken for granted that real name Jean was my friend when he gave so many hints that he wasn't, and I have to remind you the degree to which he simply went along with everything I said. I would talk about stuff specific to my friend, stuff that must not have made any sense to the man I will now call fake Jean, and he would act like he knew what I was talking about. The idea that he was lying faking or delusional was unthinkably bizarre. Just after noon on Thursday, May 14th of 2020, the 72-year-old Long Island man Dwight Powers was participating in a Zoom call with around 20 other people. They were all part of the local chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous and, like millions of other people during the pandemic, were attempting an old system around new and frightening conditions. It wasn't like Dwight to miss a meeting. His long-held sobriety was precious to him, and his own slight technophobia wasn't going to stand in the way of that. Dwight sat at his computer in the small office he put together at his home on Dixon Avenue in Amityville and warmly chatted with those in attendance before they noticed something moving in the background of Dwight's video feed. To their horror, they saw a figure walk into the room, slowly approaching Dwight from behind. Given that he was concentrating on the conversation unfolding on screen, Dwight was completely unaware that anyone was creeping up on him, and the first he knew of the intruder's presence was when they began viciously beating him about the face and neck. Other users in the call gasped as they saw such a cruel display of violence unfold before their very eyes, inflicted by a man who turned out to be completely naked. When the figure finished hitting Dwight and turned to leave the room, other callers asked if he was okay, but Dwight could barely respond. He was bleeding from a busted lip and the sheer speed and intensity of the ambush had clearly shaken him. But to his viewer's horror, the attack wasn't over. The figure returned to the room holding something in each of his hands, things that glinted in the light of an overhead lamp, and in full view of almost twenty other Zoom callers, began stabbing Dwight in the back and side, over and over and over again. Those watching could do nothing but call 911 as they watched Dwight gargle blood before falling off of his chair, but even this was a fruitless task, since no one actually knew Dwight's home address. When Dwight fell, his attacker went down with him, plunging the large kitchen knives into Dwight's fallen body in a frenzied and bloody assault, until all people could hear over his computer's microphone were his dying breaths. The callers managed to give a vividly detailed description of Dwight's attacker, thanks to the quality of his computer webcam. But when the police honed in on a man fitting that description, who also happened to have Dwight's blood all over his change of clothes, they discovered something horrifying. The Dwight Powers murderer was none other than 32-year-old Thomas Scully Powers, Dwight's own son. 
In a statement given to homicide detectives shortly after his arrest, Thomas Scully Powers admitted stabbing his own father around 20 to 25 times. He told them he returned to the kitchen at one point to change knives because the smaller, cheaper blades kept bending whenever they struck bone, and to fully decapitate his own father in a horrendous, unprovoked attack. Thomas had to use a bread knife to saw through the dense bone and cartilage of his father's spine. Suffolk County District Attorney Tim Seney said, This is a shocking and disturbing case. By the defendant's own admission, he brutally stabbed his own father repeatedly until he was certain he was dead. The investigation into this horrific murder is still ongoing, but rest assured we will obtain justice for the victim. Shockingly, when Thomas Scully Powers was charged with murder and appeared before a judge via video link to enter a plea, he insisted he was not guilty by reason of insanity. However, a psychiatric exam showed Thomas to be quite lucid, and in light of this, the judge ordered that he be held at the Riverhead Correctional Facility without bail, and that a maximum sentence of 25 years to life should be handed down should Thomas be found guilty. In the run-up to the trial, Thomas's defense attorney insisted that he would be exploring Mr. Power's mental health and capacity in relation to this incident. It seemed obvious that they would be playing the insanity card, as I'm sure neither they nor the general public could comprehend any sane reason why a man would just murder his own father out of the blue. The prosecution argued that Thomas had murdered his father when he was completely lucid, owing to the fact that he tried to flee the scene when the cops arrived. He knew what he had done was wrong, and had attempted to hide the evidence of his crime by mopping up the blood and disposing of a bloody bedsheet in a trash bag. On top of that, when the cops arrived at the assisted living facility that Dwight Powers called home, his son tried to escape arrest by jumping out of a second floor window. Despite being injured in the fall, Thomas ran across a busy highway and into a corner store where he attempted to use Dr. Pepper, of all things, to wash the blood from his clothes. Obviously, he was quickly spotted by the store's owner, who called in the police officers that arrested Thomas shortly afterward. In a statement to local media outlets, Suffolk County Police Department said that although they had yet to determine a motive for the stabbing, they could safely rule out any tensions stemming from father and son being quarantined together. Prosecuting attorneys were also confounded by the killing, saying Thomas had mentioned during his police interview that his father had tried to slit his wrist with a knife, but they had a physical inspection that revealed what they characterized as only a slight mark on Thomas's wrist, and dismissed the claim of self-defense as a flimsy attempt to mask a markedly darker motive. Two neighbors of Dwight Powers, Steve and Mary Englert, said they have been close friends of his family for the majority of the 40 years they'd spent living side by side. They said he was very close to his family, but although he undoubtedly had a lot of love for Thomas, Dwight seldom talked about his wayward son. With a euphemism that seemed to hide something much more sinister, Mary Engler told reporters that Thomas had struggles and would move in with his father during tough stretches. Dwight never hesitated to take Thomas back in, with Steve and Mary testifying that Dwight was a very devoted father. When his sons needed him, he was there, Mary told reporters with a glint of melancholy in her eye. As it turned out, Mary actually grew up with Dwight in the small town of Levittown, New York State, and said that he had been absolutely horrified to hear of her beloved neighbor's untimely death. At first, she simply refused to believe it was true, insisting it must have been some terrible mix-up, although the angler had been unable to call over at Dwight's house due to the pandemic. They made a point of calling him on his cell phone to wish him a happy birthday, which had only been a few weeks prior. How could we have known that was the last time we'd ever talked to him, Mary said. It just didn't seem real that he was gone. Dwight loved his family so much. They were everything to him. I just can't imagine why it all happened. By all accounts, Dwight Powers was a stand-up guy. He had served as a rifleman in the United States Marine Corps and had a tour of Vietnam under his belt. When Dwight left the Marines, he got himself a job as a customs agent, opting for a quiet life in the suburbs where he could keep his family safe and happy. Folks said there wasn't a darn chance he had skeletons in his closet. He was just too much of a goof. 
He was 50 years old when he joined a rock band that played charity shows for children's foundations. Then when he was 60, Dwight grew a passion for the environment and began volunteering with Habitat for Humanity. When he wasn't making the world a better place, he could often be found watching reruns of the Three Stooges, laughing his butt off at wholesome slapstick humor. There have been plenty of suggestions that Dwight wasn't the family man he made himself out to be, and that a dark and sordid history of patriarchal abuse led to Thomas lashing out in some kind of psychotic frenzy. But every attempt to paint Dwight as some kind of abusive smiling sociopath has either been based on circumstantial evidence or downright lies. But the question remains, will we ever find concrete evidence or testimony of Dwight's secret abuses? Or was a good man just unlucky enough to have a son who was violently and criminally deranged? Maybe people just want to find a rational excuse as to why a young man would murder his own loving father while completely in the buff. Because there's nothing scarier than the idea that we live in a world where those we shower with love, support, and affection can just snap one day, leaving us choking in a pool of our own blood, with a digital audience just having watched us die. On the morning of August 12th, 2020, the young daughter of 32-year-old Maribel Rosada Morales was logging onto her computer for her first day of Zoom classes. Her home state of Florida had been one of the hardest hit by the pandemic, and like many of her Warfield Elementary School classmates, the closure of her school meant she was forced to participate in one of the great educational experiments of our time, one in which millions of children all over the world would be educated remotely using a piece of conference call software called Zoom. This new ad hoc method proved to have its fair share of problems, and scores of teachers reported difficulties in remote education almost immediately. But the teacher that morning must have had no idea what kind of horror she was about to face, a horror she would be unable to hide from young, innocent eyes. Around 8 a.m., the 10-year-old student was taking part in a roll call with around 30 other children when her teacher began to hear something in the background of her audio. It sounded like voices, hushed but strained, and as the minutes passed, the voices coming from the feed of Maribel Morales' daughter grew louder and louder. It got to the point where a full-on argument seemed to be breaking out in the home, and by the time profanity began to be used, the teacher realized that some kind of potentially violent domestic altercation was on hand. Then, the teacher, along with 30 other young children, watched in horror as the young Morales' girl looked off camera and quickly covered her ears with a terrified look on her face. A series of loud pops could be heard, sounding strange and tinny when picked up by the laptop's cheap microphone. Many of the children asked what they were, but their teacher knew, and she was quick to mute the girl's mic so they couldn't hear what came next. The last the teacher in class saw of Maribel Morales' daughter was just before her screen suddenly went black, as a bullet fired from a 9mm handgun smashed into the computer's motherboard. Police officers responding to the teacher's 911 call arrived at the Morales' residence just minutes later, but they were too late. Lying on the floor, surrounded by screaming, terrified children, Maribel Rosado Morales had been shot to death in front of four of her own kids and two young cousins by a man who had apparently fled the scene on a stolen bicycle. Just a few hours later, police received a phone call from a city bus driver saying he and his passengers had been taken hostage by a man armed with a pistol. The man had ordered the driver to take him to a destination off of the bus's route and was in the process of subduing and intimidating the bus's many passengers, thus giving him an opportunity to call. He didn't seem to have made any demands, but he was armed and extremely agitated. It was a painfully volatile situation, but by some insane stroke of luck, a police SWAT team happened to be on a training exercise in the general vicinity. Once the bus was cornered, they stormed the vehicle and subdued the hostage taker without a shot being fired. As he was being cuffed, the hostage taker made a shocking confession. He told the heavily armed policeman that his name was Donald Williams and that he had shot and killed his ex-girlfriend just a few hours before. And as it turned out, 
His ex-girlfriend was none other than 32-year-old Maribel Rosado Morales. Donald was subsequently charged with first-degree murder as well as several other felony charges, including being a convicted felon in possession of a gun. The local sheriff's department said that he would also be charged with armed burglary and armed home invasion, and that there would obviously be additional penalties due to the presence of children during such a horrific killing. In the aftermath, the Florida Department of Children and Families was faced with the heartbreaking task of finding new homes for poor children who had been orphaned during the attack, who were all between the ages of 10 to 17. The shooting rocked the local community, especially given that some of their own children had witnessed a life being taken, all thanks to advances in communications technology. Warfield Elementary and the Martin County School District released a statement saying, Our deepest sympathies and condolences go out to the victim's family, including children present in the home who were witnesses to this heartbreaking and senseless tragedy. We have our grief team deployed to assist students and staff who will undoubtedly feel the impact of this horrible incident. We stand ready to assist and offer support in any way we can. But no amount of grief counseling will really put a dent into the immense trauma suffered by so many children that morning. Not to mention their teacher, who for a few grim moments must have thought that she'd witnessed the death of a child while on the job. And once again, such an incident proves that as much as advancements in technology have the capacity to enrich our lives, allowing us to stay in touch with people we're otherwise unable to see, it also has the capacity to darken them, too. Remember when the quarantine first started and everyone was using Zoom for everything from work meetings to virtual birthday parties? Let me tell you, a lot of people weren't using passwords on their rooms, and if they were, the number of times that it was a 123 or a password was astounding. Point being, I broke into a whole lot of Zoom calls last summer, mostly with hilarious results. I hacked my way into some regional management meeting and told the exec he was fired. I got into what I figured was a remote learning session for a middle school where I successfully pretended to be a kid for like 15 minutes. I also caught some grandpa waiting for a call from a relative and almost convinced the guy that I was his grandson. The guy had to squint at the screen before telling me to go F myself. Okay. It was super obnoxious of me, and I know I'm a jerk for doing it. But does it warm the cockles of your heart to know that I got my comeuppance? That I got what I deserve for sticking my dumb head where it didn't belong? I bet you are, even if it's just a little. But let's just see if that changes by the end of this story. So right after I had gotten to some afternoon mother's meeting to give them all the sad little life Jane speech from Come Dine With Me, I figured I peaked. There was nowhere to go, no more mountains to climb, so I gave Zoom sniping a rest for a bit until the cravings returned to me later that evening. The fun thing about Zoom sniping at night was that you occasionally found something a bit saucier than you would in the daytime. For example, I once got into a Zoom call between a few girls having a virtual sleepover in various states of undress. I'm not saying I stayed longer than a few seconds. I'm not that much of a perv, but you get my point. So I'm typing in random words in the search bar to bring up potential sniping targets. I accidentally hit a punctuation mark and happen across a room with a very distinctive name. Most are just called like Andy's Room or Queens Park Regional Subway Manager's Meeting, boring stuff like that. But this room didn't even have a name. It just had a series of punctuation that made up a kind of shape, like a kind of curve or wave shape. Usually I had a plan of what I was going to do before I got into a call, a goof or a bit that I had in mind. But that time I didn't. That time I just had this nagging curiosity to see what was going on in it. But you know what they say about curiosity, right? Instant regret. When I loaded into the call and saw what was happening on two of the four panels, I immediately exited the call. It was like a gut reaction almost like a physical reaction to being burned by something. Like I legit shouted, whoa, and backed up from the keyboard before my hand jumped to the mouse. Then I just sat there, kind of dumbstruck, just processing what I'd seen. 
I don't want to go into what it was. I don't think I have the words or the emotional capacity to go into detail regarding what I saw that night. But put it this way. Imagine the sweetest, most innocent looking child you've ever seen. Now imagine the worst possible thing you could do to them. The worst thing you could ever possibly conceive of. Whatever it is, you'd rather see it happening to the kid than what I actually saw for real. It absolutely positively fried my brain for about 30 minutes, because that's about how long it took for me to realize I should have called the cops. As much as the concept filled me with dread, I actually set about trying to find the room again. I had to at least try to jot down some details, backgrounds, physical descriptions, anything that I'd be able to hand over to the police to aid them in arresting the scumbags responsible for what I can only describe as ritualistic abuse. I wasn't even sure which piece of punctuation I'd punched in erroneously, but you can bet I tried every single one in my attempt to find that godforsaken room again. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find it. I wasn't even sure what I could do at that point. I didn't think I could just call the police and be like, I saw some kid getting uh, messed with online, but I have zero details. But apparently that's exactly what you're supposed to do. From what I found out over the next few days, after talking to a few greater Manchester police officers, just telling the police what platform you see something dodgy on can help them pin down the people perpetrating the abuse. I didn't mean for this to turn into some internet safety infomercial. There was just so much I didn't know about how the police tracked down and removed that kind of indecent online material. We hear about stuff like that, and it all seems too abstract, like it's happening someplace else far, far away. But seeing it online like that, hiding in plain sight, it made me realize how kids are suffering like that every single day, all over the world and we're not doing nearly enough as a society to stop it. But anyway, the point is, just be careful when you're snooping around online. You might just bite off considerably more than you can chew. That, and if you do see something, always, always report it. It might seem pointless, but just know your actions bring us all one step closer to ridding the world of dangerous predators. It all started with a Zoom call. At least, I only became aware it was happening because of a Zoom call. For all I know, it could have been happening for much longer, but the day of the second post-lockdown work meeting was the first time I noticed it. We're in the middle of a pretty tedious brainstorming session with a few members of marketing when a coworker interrupts whoever's talking to address me by name. It actually made me jump at first. I was totally tuned out, so... Hearing my name brought me right back around again. I respond, Huh? Uh, yep, I was listening. When I notice the person who addressed me is now closely studying their own laptop screen. I don't mean to alarm you, they said, but I think someone's watching you through the window behind you. I know exactly which window he's talking about, so I turn, a bit nervous at the idea of discovering he's right, only to see that there's no one there. I'm more relieved than anything, to be honest. I figured he was playing a joke on me because he clocked that I was nodding off during the meeting, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't maybe deserve it a little bit. <laughs> Very funny, I said, and a few of the other callers had a little titter at the impromptu prank. I'm sorry, but I wasn't joking, the guy said. Did no one else see that? I'm so sure... Eh, hey, you're probably just seeing things. Someone else chimed in, and within a few minutes, the whole thing was completely forgotten. A smudge on the screen, a bit of lag on the call, eyes playing tricks. There were a hundred ways to explain it. The truth was literally unthinkable at that stage. A short while later, the exact same thing happens. The same guy interrupts, only far more urgently this time, saying, Look, look, it's right there. I'm not imagining it. You can all see that, yeah? I know what he's talking about, only I don't turn around immediately. I look at my own webcam feed to see what he was talking about, and right when I see it, what's clearly the silhouette of a head in the window behind me, I hear one of the other callers say like, 
Oh, wow, I see it too. I spin around just in time to catch the quick blur of whoever was watching me, ducking out of view. I'm actually really creeped out at this point because it obviously wasn't just somebody walking past my ground floor bedroom. Someone had actually stopped to stare inside. My window isn't even facing the street. It's at the side of the apartment block like you have to actually go out of your way to find it. Now I'm only 5 foot 3 and I'm 8 stone which for any Americans reading this means I'm tiny. And I had to make sure if someone was actually creeping on me they weren't just hiding out and waiting until I was vulnerable. So, phone in one hand, kitchen knife in the other, I tell the Zoom call that I'll be right back and then head out to make sure that everything is kosher. It's peak lockdown during all of this, so the streets are pretty much deserted, so I think I'd have noticed anyone wandering around. But there was no one, not a soul in sight. So I guessed, or rather hoped, that it was just some neighbor kids messing around, maybe looking for a wayward ball or something. About a week goes by and the whole window face incident has been at the back of my mind the whole time. For a lot of young women who live alone, the idea of being targeted where we're most vulnerable is frankly terrifying. So the prospect of that nightmare coming to life just didn't bear thinking about. I'm not saying I was on edge the whole time or that I lose sleep over it or anything, but let's just say I held my keys a little tighter in my fists whenever I walk down the street my apartment block is on. But anyway, at one point I head out to the grocery store to pick up food and I end up caught in one of those super long COVID lines that you're stuck in for like 40 minutes before you're allowed into the store to buy your stuff. This is on top of the fact that the store near me had implemented this dumb one-way system in the aisles in an attempt to stop the spread. My point is, a trip that would have normally taken like half hour ends up taking more like 90 minutes and an annoying amount of my day has been completely wasted. So, I'm already in a bad mood by the time I get back to my apartment, only to find that the front door has been bashed in. Apparently, there had been a break-in while I was out. If only criminals could work from home. It seemed obvious that it was a burglary at first. All my stuff had been strewn around, drawers and cabinets were opened and emptied. The TV was still there, along with my PlayStation, but... Most break-ins just go for jewelry and phones I heard, anything small that they can pawn easily. Obviously, I call the cops like there and then, who arrive within a half hour or so. They advise me to help them look around the apartment for anything that might be missing, valuable electronics and whatnot, but I told them I already looked and that nothing obvious seemed to have been taken. My bedroom looked like it had been hit by a bomb. Clothes had been strewn all over the place. Whole drawers had been pulled out and flipped, like whoever broke in was looking for something. One of the cops spends some time looking around in there before he called out to his partner. Hey, we need forensics up in here is what he actually said. I asked him what the deal was, if he'd found something that I should know about. Both cops had been warm, friendly, and helpful up until that point, but when I asked him why forensics was needed... One of them told me not to worry about it and to stay out of my bedroom for the time being. It was no big deal at first. I was just grateful that they showed up so fast, even if they did wear masks and insist on keeping six feet between us at all times. So by the time forensics team showed up, I'm out front of my apartment building talking to my mom on the phone. Only when I see what they're actually doing in my apartment, it triggers what I can only describe as a mini freakout. Guys in gloves and white coverall suits have been scooping big handfuls of my underwear into bags, sealing them, then taking them out to the truck outside. And then it dawns on me. Whoever broke into my apartment had left DNA on my underwear. Now, I probably don't need to tell you how exactly they done that. The whole thing grosses me out too much for me to actually type it. But the thing that really got to me was, if I'd actually been home that afternoon... There's no telling what would have happened if some violent perv had actually gotten their dirty hands on me. But anyway, the story does actually have something of a resolution and thankfully a happy ending. Because they had this guy's DNA. Police were able to match it on their database with a guy who'd had multiple run-ins with the law for public exposure, among other things. He was arrested, 
and is now looking at three years in prison for aggravated burglary, some kind of charge like that. But the whole thing came full circle for me in an interview with some detective who'd mentioned that this guy liked casing his victim's places before he struck. Over the past month or so, have you seen anyone hanging around your apartment who doesn't live there, maybe someone looking through your window? He said it. He literally said it. It was him, that day when I was in the Zoom call. It was him that had been looking through my window. He'd been stalking me for God knows how long, and when it came for him to actually get me, only by the grace of God was I lucky enough to have been out grocery shopping. Otherwise, it doesn't bear thinking about what might have happened. I'm 20 years old, female, and this was the last time I willingly stayed in a room alone with a child. I used to babysit on the weekends when I was 15. Most of the families that I babysit for were nice, sophisticated families who had sweet children that I loved. However, the Cooper family were the exception. Mr. and Mrs. Cooper had two children, Michael, who was 10, and Antoinette, who was 4. Michael was quiet, though misbehaved and crazy demented. Antoinette was loud, cheerful, and the complete opposite of her brother. She was so innocent. I truly adored Antoinette, yet I despised Michael. He was an absolute terror. I'd watch over the two children on Friday nights for three hours while their parents went on a date, meaning three awful hours of psychological, emotional, and physical torture from psycho Michael. There were many times that I would catch Michael staring at me while I was sitting at the dining room table doing my homework. I'd tell him to quit it, but he wouldn't stop until I moved out of view. Michael was really cruel to his sister. He would push her down the stairs, pull the heads off her Barbie dolls, and cut up her clothes. Michael would also hit the cats with a sock full of quarters. One cat actually ended up dying from internal injuries. He would growl at the neighbor's dog on a good day, and tape stuffed animals to windows with scissors sticking out of their heads on a really bad day. He was a horrible little kid to say the least, but the scariest part about babysitting the twerp was the night that he came for me. Let's keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to even be there that night, but Mr. and Mrs. Cooper called my mom and asked if I could babysit for them since their other arrangement had fallen through. My mom agreed without even asking me. I was supposed to babysit from 5 o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night, it was storming out so the television had no signal and my cell phone didn't have any reception and Antoinette was staying with her grandmother, leaving me alone with a psycho child for five whole hours. I'm glad to say that the first few hours went by pretty quickly and without incident. He was fed, bathed, and put to bed at around eight. Michael had fallen asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. I breathed a sigh of relief and lay down on the couch with headphones in not knowing it would be a mistake. The music was loud enough to drown out any other sounds. I stared at the ceiling for a while because there was no use in trying to delve deep into the realm of social media. I drifted to sleep at some point only to be scared awake because of an intense pressure resting on my throat. Michael was standing over me with a wide smile, gripping the handle of a kitchen knife. I wasn't able to ask what he was doing due to the sudden fear that filled me. He pushed the blade harder and harder against my neck until I could feel a burning sensation. He laughed maniacally before running out of the room. I wiped the small amount of blood from my neck while searching the entire house, only to panic when he was nowhere to be found. The sound of the cat's screeching caused a breath to hitch in my throat. I quickly grabbed the baseball bat from the linen closet and hurried up the stairs. My hand hesitantly grabbed the doorknob to Michael's bedroom. I pushed the door open, which I still regret to this day. My screams of terror were drowned out by his laughter. Michael was sitting in the open doorway of his closet, with the carcass of the cat lying in his lap. I really do wish I could say that the horror had ended there, but it didn't. No. That twisted boy chased after me, attempting to slice my back open with every step he took. The deranged psychopath managed to get close enough to plunge the knife into my shoulder. Needless to say, I ran out of the front door and didn't stop until I was hunched over trying to catch my breath a block away from the police station. I packed up my things a few months after that, 
moved into an apartment with my now husband 1,000 miles away from the town that I grew up in. I had to move 1,000 miles away from Psycho Michael in order to feel safe, but even that made me crazier. I attended therapy for several years afterward. I couldn't sleep without the lights on because the image of him holding a dead cat had permanently seared itself into my mind. I was paranoid for months, afraid that he would jump out from behind a corner, and yet I still harbored the idea of having my own children one day. Truth be told, I honestly did care about the Cooper kids, but after the injuries I suffered, physical and psychological, my parents and I had no other choice but to press charges, at the very least to pay for medical bills and counseling. Michael, being as young as he was, was committed to a psychiatric treatment and juvenile detention for nearly three to five years from what I heard. But after all the legal processes were complete, I couldn't bring myself to digging any deeper as to not relive that memory. Looking back on the incident now makes me feel silly for even being scared of a ten-year-old. It's strange how life works sometimes. It's strange how I just froze there. I eventually realized that I don't want children, and I absolutely refuse to babysit for anyone. Babysitting wasn't the job that I had imagined having while I was a senior in high school. I was paid a decent rate by the hour for watching kids that only needed to have an adult around while their parents were out. I know exactly what you're thinking. Why would you willingly waste your time watching children when you could have been working retail or some other halfway decent job? Am I close? Well, as you can imagine, the majority of kids I've looked after were happy, normal children, but my sister's children... Let me get to that. Here's a little background just to help you better understand why I don't foresee myself having children anytime soon, if ever. I'm a male and a social outcast at that. I was 16 when my mom told me that I'd be babysitting for my older sister. Naturally, I shrugged it off as it were no big deal because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? My sister needed to go out of town on a business trip for two days, which then caused my mom to decide that I was the right candidate for the job. I learned very quickly that kids are hungry literally every five minutes, and they have no respect for the babysitter, and they are totally out of control without their parents around. That was a bummer. Kids are perceived as sweet, innocent, and all-around pure, yet I have first-hand experience on just how truly creepy some kids can be. I had been around my nieces and nephews dozens of times before, so there wasn't any reason for me to think that they were a bit peculiar, aside from the fact that I walked in on Nat, short for Natalie, attempting to sacrifice her sister to the devil in order to bargain for immortality by shoving Lux's hand into a blender. Luckily, I was able to pry her away from the blender before she could turn it on. I had been watching them for less than 20 minutes when that incident occurred. Fast forward to this first afternoon, the kids were playing in the toy room, so I decided to watch television before doing my homework. I was in the middle of a funny movie when I cut the side of my neck with scissors. He drew a pentagram on the floor with ketchup, chanted something in a language that I didn't recognize, they probably made it up, and locked Jay in the basement. Tony was the good kid who explained that Mike was trying to summon a demon. Someone that is close to the devil so that he could bargain Jay's soul for immortality. Mike angrily hissed at me when the plan didn't work. I swear to God, those freaking creepy pastas they watch really don't help them. It was then that I learned that they had a crazy obsession with vampires. The need to be immortal and trying to draw blood from people is their way to fulfill the desire to be like the people in movies or books. These kids were actually trying to figure out ways that they could become immortal without having to stay so small for all of eternity. I thought that was a bit unhealthy. I still have no idea how the internet or horror movies when their parents weren't looking really activated this, but I'm honestly still scared of what could have happened. Nat was the eldest child. She was the bad influence on her siblings. She was the entire reason why everything went down on the second night. I was studying for a calculus test that I had the next day. The kids were supposed to be playing in the backyard, which was the mistake. All I really remember about studying is that I had been exhausted from chasing around those brats the night before because I ended up falling asleep at the kitchen table. 
I woke up sometime in the afternoon with my hands and feet tied to a metal pipe in the basement while my deranged nieces and nephews stood over me with a weird look in their eyes. I struggled for a good ten minutes to free myself from that stupid rope as they chanted some weird language again. I assumed that they were really trying to sacrifice me, however, I was relieved when I saw one of the cats knock a candle off the windowsill. The carpet and lengthy silk curtains immediately caught fire, which caused the kids to untie me. We rushed out of the house and to safety just in time to watch the house burn, literally to the ground. I stood motionless for what seemed like hours before eventually the police were called by the neighbors. I called my mom to come get the kids before being questioned by police for over three hours. The detective that was interrogating me surely was about to arrest me, but the fire department later ruled that the fire was an accident. My sister angrily barged into my room once she arrived home and informed me that I was no longer allowed to babysit her kids again and literally almost beat me senseless if it wasn't for my parents stopping her fury. I cried tears of joy at the news and never babysat again. I tried to explain the story to both the detectives and my family, though my nieces and nephews' stories all apparently corroborated against my own, and there was nothing I could do. Needless to say, I never visited their family again, both by being shunned and by choice. Natalie and the other kids all grew out of the vampire phase from what I heard once they hit junior high and acquired less creepy, less dangerous interests. I'm 28 years old now, incredibly far away from my family, married to the most amazing woman, yet I still refuse to think about having children. You never know what they're going to get into. I've had a lot of scary experiences, but I really think this one's the scariest. It was October 2015, and my sister was giving birth, and I was babysitting her son, who was nine at the time. The second night I was there, this happened. I would put my nephew to bed in his room, and then the dog in his cage in my sister's room, which I have to get past to get to his room. I then go downstairs, and I get on YouTube on my computer. Well, about an hour later, I hear a door slam. I just assume it's my nephew going to the bathroom. I then hear another slam. I assume it's just him wanting privacy, and I then hear a third door slam yet again. I don't know how to explain it, but I kind of just knew that it wasn't my nephew. I kept hearing things being moved around, kind of like a dresser being moved across the floor. I then start to remember that this house was built not as a regular house back in the day. The attic is apparently connected to the house next door. All you have to do is go up the attic, walk a little, then lift the top and climb down the ladder. I had no choice but to go check on my nephew. I'm still hearing noises as I go up. I hear the dog in his cage going absolutely crazy, like he was trying to get out or something. I walk halfway up the stairs, then all of the noise just stops. I look in his room and he's sleeping with his door open. There was no way in hell I was going to walk past that pitch black room. In my mind, as long as he was safe, that's all that mattered. I then walk back downstairs. As soon as I walk back downstairs, I then hear footsteps running, followed by a door slam. Well, the next day I decided to tell my sister and brother-in-law. After I told them, what they said next to me chilled me to my core. Without any concern in the world, they went on to tell me that it was the spirit of our dead neighbor. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't I just call the cops already? Well, I wasn't really thinking straight at the time. I was just way too scared, and I guess now it's a good thing that I didn't. A few weeks later, my mom had told my oldest niece, who was 16 at the time. She said that whenever she was in there, she always felt the feeling of being watched. To this day, I still don't know if I believe it was a ghost, or maybe an actual living intruder. All I know is that I for sure wasn't alone that night besides my nephew and I. Never again will I babysit there. Screw that. I think I was only 13 years old when this happened. I would be paid extra since I was going to be babysitting so many kids. I don't recall how many, but there were a lot. 
The reason why I was trusted with so many was because I knew them since my parents and their parents were all friends growing up, making us kind of form into a group. Now, I was the oldest out of every single kid, which was the reason I was in charge. Of course, it was going to be a long night, knowing that our parents would be at some bar far away until like around 2 in the morning and then stay at a hotel. For some background, I knew the kids and they knew me. I being the oldest, 13 at the time, and the youngest being around 4. There was definitely a little bit of an age gap. The majority of the kids were around 9 to 10. Anyway, the parents left and when they did, it was already around 4 in the afternoon. About two and a half hours later, I made dinner for them. We sat down and everyone ate their pasta. Because all the kids were together and they all knew each other, things got pretty crazy. I won't go into detail on exactly what went down, but some of the kids were just totally wild. I didn't really mind it though. It was pretty funny at the same time, but that's besides the point. So after a couple more hours, it was getting pretty late. I recall it being around 11.30 when kids were starting to settle down. I had to take care of some of the kids who injured themselves by doing some really stupid stuff that was really dangerous and I couldn't make it in time since I had to deal with some other problems as well. But I would consider myself a very caring and kind person because I always did what I needed to do to calm them down. So like I said, it was around 11.30 when they were starting to settle down and then not too long after they were starting to pass out. I brought and carried them upstairs and put half of them in one of the two kids rooms. For the sake of keeping the real names out, basically we were at the house that belonged to the Abel's family. Ava and Dom were the kids in the family, making it their house. I put half the kids in Dom's room and the other half in Ava's room. They passed out very quickly after that. I went back downstairs to chill out and then listen to some music. After listening to music for a while, Ava comes downstairs and this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. I had to look because I was listening so loud that I couldn't even hear her calling my name. She then said in a really scared tone, something keeps being thrown at the window in my room. I'm really scared. I was a little uneasy to be hearing this since this was such a weird thing to be happening at this time of night. I gave her a hug and I assured her that everything would be alright and that I would go check it out. The bedrooms were on the third floor so this was especially weird since the room's windows were really high up. I went into Ava's room and I saw that the kids were sleeping. I guess no one else had heard the something hitting the window. I started to think that Ava was just making this up or something. I went back downstairs and I went to the couch where Ava was. I was a bit surprised to see that Ava wasn't there. This is when I then hear something from downstairs. It sounded like a muffled girl scream for help. I quickly ran down there to see Ava in the garage, then being dragged out of the garage by a dark figure. Someone had forgotten to close the garage door, so it was just open. I was so scared and I went into full on panic mode. I then went back inside to go grab a weapon or something that I can use in quick defense. I found this spear looking thing that's used for fires and also pushing wood in other areas. I picked it up then ran outside to look for Ava. I soon saw Ava in this really dark figure, which was taking Ava in the backwoods. I then hit the dark figure in the back of the knee, practically stabbing the figure since it had a sharp edge on the side of it. The figure fell back and let out a yell of pain, which is when I grabbed Ava and then practically carried her back into the house. Very stupidly, I left the weapon I had outside. Since I was in a panic, I think that I just didn't have time to think about it since Ava was the main priority for me. I get back inside and close the garage door, hoping that was the end of it. I decided not to call the cops because I get really nervous when it comes to cops, so I just wanted to avoid that. I ran upstairs but try not to make too much noise to see if any of the kids were awake due to hearing the commotion from outside. There were only about two kids who were awake and they asked what was happening. I told them to just fall back asleep and that there was a situation that happened. They really wanted to know what, but I just told them I told them in the morning. I really don't blame them. I think I would also want to know what was happening, especially after all that commotion. So anyway, I go back downstairs on the couch where Ava thankfully was this time, and she falls asleep with the comfort of me there the whole time. Fast forward to the morning. 
It's around 7.30 and I can hear some commotion from upstairs. The kids were up and playing. Aved woke me up and she was really happy to see me there. I think I really made her feel safe. After that night, me and Ava's connection was a little bit different from before. As the story is becoming better, the final spook is yet to come, so get ready. I walk downstairs to see if anything had been stolen. I check and I didn't really see anything out of the ordinary. Well, nothing out of the ordinary, except for one thing. There happened to be a paper that was in the garage. It was taped to the sliding door, and I think that's why I paid attention to it. I started to read it, and it said one word. Revenge. I was really scared reading this because how the hell could someone have put this here? Then reality hit me that someone had to have come inside after the garage door had been closed, which is when I thought we were safe. I haven't shared this story with Ava because I don't want her to feel scared or threatened more than she probably already does. I do still have a few questions left unanswered though. Who did this? Why did they target this house specifically? And last but not least, did the intruder purposely try and take Ava out of everyone there? Why did he want her specifically? I know I'll probably never have my answers to these questions, but it's absolutely chilling to think about. I'm a female, and I'm 15 years old. This all started a couple months back when I got my very first job as a babysitter. I babysit on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. Keep that in mind. The people I babysit for don't even live that far away from my house. Their house is like a block away from me. So by now you've probably guessed that I walk to work. Now, I've always been a very cautious person and also a paranoid one, so keep that in mind too. The first time it happened was after a month of doing my job. One day I got done babysitting and I just walked to my friend's house that's a couple of blocks away from their house. So as I'm walking there, I hear someone behind me. I should also mention that I was snapchatting my friend to let her know how far away from the house I was. Anyways, I hear someone behind me so I turn around and see this guy on a bike right behind me. I didn't think too much about it but I was keeping him in mind. I don't pay much attention to him and I keep snapchatting just in case he tries something. I then turn to the left and so does he. At this point I'm really aware now of what this guy is doing. I'm pretty sure he's following me. The guy looked tall as hell, and I'm only 5'5", five five. so again I make a turn, and so does he. By now I'm getting pretty panicked, and I'm very much aware that this guy is following me. Anytime I slowed down, so would he. If I sped up, again, so did he. My friend's house comes into view, and I speed walk over there with him telling me. I reach her front door, and I start knocking, and then I hear someone say, Hey, you better watch out. I'll get you. And I turn around and the guy was right behind me in front of her house. By this point I'm very panicked but I just keep knocking and before she answers this guy then pulls something out. At first I didn't know what it was until I looked a little closer and you guessed it. The guy literally pulled out his penis. Right as he does that I pull my phone up and I catch him in the act and my friend then opens the door. She lets me inside and she asks me why I'm shaking. I then show her the video and she tries calming me down. Fast forward a week later as I'm walking to my job and I see him yet again. My heart instantly drops and I just speed walk to the lady's house which I worked for. And he didn't really say anything. It was more like he was just watching me this time. This happened every single time that I would walk to work. But he wouldn't try anything because it would be daytime and most of the time someone was around. That all changed when they asked me to babysit their daughter at 10 p.m. I wasn't really going to walk to work alone, so I asked the lady if she'd come pick me up instead. She did, and of course nothing happened. We then started doing that until I was calm enough to walk by myself to work. The following week, she asked me again to babysit at night, so I decided to take a knife with me just in case something happens, and I told my mom goodbye. I walked out in the really dark street, and the lights in that area weren't really good, which is why I was so scared to walk there in the first place. But anyways, I was walking to work, and I then hear a crunch behind me. 
My body then immediately tenses up. I knew someone was there, but I really dreaded thinking it was him. I decide not to look back, but instead just speed walk again. For a few minutes, I didn't even hear anything, but I then turn around, and there he fucking is. I don't say a single word and just straight up bolt to their house. I tell them what happened and she told me not to worry and that he wouldn't do anything, then left me to babysit. Fast forward the second day and I walk to work and nothing happened this time. I was checking all my surroundings like a really crazy person, but no one was there. I then turn to knock on their door and from the corner of my eye, I see movement. I look and this guy's leaning out from behind trash cans and I, and I barely caught him. My heart started going crazy. I then knocked harder on the door and I saw him from the corner of my eyes just looking at me. He probably didn't even know I saw him, but I did. Fast forward the next day and the walk to work wasn't really that much. I didn't see him, but the walk back, that's a different story. I was walking back and I think it was about 12 a.m. I texted my mom that I was on my way home and she told me to stop by the store. Now this store is like right across from our house, so it wasn't really a big deal. This weird creep follows me, all the while making kids noises and saying really weird things like I love you over and over again. I just walk to the store and this guy literally stands right in front of the store. I get very angry at this point and I tell the cashier what's going on. He then looks at the guy for a minute and then tells him to leave. He says he wants to buy something, but the guy just tells him to leave. Well, he doesn't leave and he just keeps on standing there. So I then say to him, Why are you following me? He then says back, I'm not following you. And I said, Yeah, sure you're not. And I just stand in line and get my stuff and then walk out the door. The guy has the audacity to continue following me, all while making kissing sounds and then repeatedly saying, I love you. I die for you. I was just so fucking mad at this point that I snap back and say, Look, fuck off you creep. Leave me the fuck alone already. With a very angry tone. This doesn't even have an effect on this guy, and he just keeps repeating the same shit. I then tell him, Look, I know where you live, and I'll tell your mom about this, because I've actually seen him leave the apartments that are near the store. Anyways, he doesn't even care what I'm saying, and he's making eye contact with me the entire time. I just walk to my house and I finally get there, but right before I get inside and slam the door, I then say to him, if you ever follow me again, you're gonna fucking regret it. He responds to this by laughing, then saying, oh yeah, what the hell are you gonna do? And proceeds to blow me a kiss. I then just walk inside, feeling very numb. I had just finally got home and I just started sobbing. My sister asked what was happening and I told her everything. She's extremely overprotective with me and she got really pissed off after I told her. She tells me that she's going to walk me to work and that if we see him she's going to kill the guy. Obviously I know that's not true but it really made me feel better. All of this happened last week and today in a couple of hours I have to babysit again. I know it doesn't seem like much, but I'm still really scared of what will happen to me in the future. I really don't even know what to do at this point. If any of you guys that are listening have some advice, please tell me what to do. I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and if anything else happens, I'll definitely give you guys an update. Be safe out there. In June of 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin accompanied his family on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in the southeastern United States. The name Great Smoky Mountains comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the range, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance. Interestingly, this fog is caused by chemicals emitted from the local flora, chemicals that have a high vapor pressure and easily form vapors at normal temperature and pressures. Yet even having heard the scientific explanation behind the phenomenon, seeing all that fog clinging to the hilltops is a very eerie sight indeed. Hailing from nearby Knoxville, Tennessee, the Martin family had a long-running tradition of celebrating Father's Day by taking camping trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. 
and 1969 would mark young Dennis's first trip into the woods in the company of his father, older brother, and grandpa. The group drove out to Cades Cove, an isolated valley located in the Tennessee section of the park, then hiked out towards Russell Field, where they set up camping and began preparing for their first night under the stars. The following morning, they set off for a place known as Spence Field, a picturesque highland meadow and popular camping spot which was bisected by the rolling hills and jagged mountain peaks of the Appalachian Trail. When the group arrived at Spence Field, Dennis and his older brothers set off to explore the campsite and reportedly talked to many of the other campers who had pitched their tents nearby. This is how they got talking to a ragtag group made up of other campers' children who made fast friends with the Martin boys. Dennis' father was pleased to see his son getting along so well with the other kids, and having his sons occupied meant the adults could get on with the important task of assembling their four-man tent. Once the task was completed, Dennis was still playing with the group of other kids, and his father says he watched as the group gleefully took up hiding positions from which to playfully ambush a group of approaching adults. When the grown-ups entered the kids' make-believe kill zone, they all jumped out, growling and roaring like wild animals as they set upon their laughing parents. All but one. All but little Dennis. His father watched with growing concern as the seconds ticked by, and Dennis had yet to emerge from his hiding spot. Eventually, he couldn't bear it anymore, and after rising from his camping chair, Dennis's father marched off the spot where he had last seen his six-year-old son and began calling out his name. But what started out as stern, fatherly commands soon degenerated into terrified pleas, and as he continued to call out in desperation, the other families began to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once Dennis's grandpa knew he was missing, he set the group into action, sending one group two miles up the Appalachian Trail with his son, while he led another group back towards the Cades Cove Ranger Station, arriving there around 8.30 p.m. that night. Thus began an extensive, well-publicized search and rescue operation, in which National Park Service personnel was supplemented by National Guard soldiers and even a unit of Green Berets. At the peak of the search operation, more than 1,400 people were operating in the few square miles around Spencefield, but not a single one found anything that could lead them to the missing boy. However, in the aftermath of the operation, the search efforts drew a great deal of criticism from search and rescue experts far and wide who said the large number of personnel involved potentially obscuring tracks and ground that was already difficult to track over due to heavy rain. Shockingly, a shoe print belonging to that of a child was actually found at one point, but the track was dismissed as belonging to one of the Boy Scouts that was helping with the search. Later, however, Investigators kicked themselves when they found that the tracks were determined to have come from a child who was missing one shoe, which disappeared on the banks of a stream. Some suggesting it was possible that the tracks belonged to Martin, and this theory was supported when a discarded child-sized shoe and sock were found just three days later. Although search and rescue personnel continued their search for more than two weeks, scouring the hillsides night and day in continual shifts, no further clues to Martin's whereabouts were ever found. The Martin family was so understandably desperate for answers that they offered a $5,000 reward for any information that would reunite them with their beloved Dennis. This got the attention of a handful of so-called psychics, who some might argue sought to exploit the Martin family's grief and maybe cashing in if they guessed the right area of the Smokies to search. Surprisingly, None of these psychics ever proved to be of any help. Many years later in 1985, a man who had apparently been illegally collecting American ginseng in the park claimed to have come across the skeletal remains of a child while exploring the woods. The man said he should have reported the find, but was terrified of being prosecuted for his prohibited herbal hobby. Not only that, but he was also unable to point investigators in the direction of the site he'd found the bones in the first place. There have been many theories that have attempted to explain what happened to young Dennis Martin that day. Most detectives, both amateur and professional, believe that Dennis became disoriented whilst looking for a hiding place, maybe even forgetting his way back to camp when he emerged from it. Either way, Dennis then strayed further from the camp, 
and could easily have fallen down one of the many steep slopes and ravines that dotted the area surrounding Spencefield. However, Dennis was wearing a bright red t-shirt when he went missing, not something that would be easy for search and rescue teams to miss. Dennis would have to be completely covered in foliage to remain undetected with that color of shirt, and despite it being feasible due to his small size, the likelihood of that is extremely low. Others are quick to remind us of the presence of black bears in the area, as well as copperhead vipers and feral pigs, all of which would have posed a considerable threat to six-year-old Martin. Park rangers told investigating police that an underweight bear had been caught in a boar trap in the Spencefield area just two weeks earlier. Although the bear was released safely, the incident suggested that it may have been struggling to find enough food, prompting to turn to a less familiar source of food. Yet however tragic and brutal the aforementioned theories are, Dennis's father believes something considerably more sinister. Based on the eyewitness account of one Harold Key, who says he heard a loud scream on the very same afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Dennis's dad firmly believed that his son was kidnapped by an opportunistic predator. Shortly after he heard the scream, Harold Key claimed to have seen a disheveled, bearded man with wild, unkempt hair fleeing through the woods in an apparent bid to remain undetected by the nearby campers. Harold's family went on to explain that they saw a flash of red on the figure's shoulders, which some believe was actually Dennis himself, slung over the shoulder of this mysterious figure as they carried him away. Harold later speculated that the man may have been a moonshiner, explaining his reluctance to be seen. Despite the report, FBI investigators ultimately dismissed it, saying that as much as Harold meant well, his account was frankly unreliable as his timeline of events were off. But one retired park ranger lamented the failure to properly follow up either the footprints or the sighting of the rough-looking man, arguing that as the location of the sighting was downhill from where Dennis disappeared, it was possible to cover that distance in the time frame, even carrying a child, but that the individual in question would have some impressive strength, stealth, and endurance. So if this is the case, who is this hairy mystery man, this bearded vagrant who was apparently capable of such an impressive physical feat, even if it was in the context of the despicable abduction of a child? Given the lack of investigation into his sighting or his tracks, it seems we might never know. But even if we did get to the bottom of the mystery of a man living in the Appalachian Mountains with a penchant for kidnapping children, I don't think the answers would bring us any solace. Maybe the closure would be worth it, especially for the family, but nightmares can be a high price to pay, and wondering what happened to young Dennis Martin can give even the most hardened true crime reader some very sleepless nights. We moved to Connecticut the summer before I entered 6th grade in 2001. We moved into a beautiful new house in one of the most beautiful towns I'd ever seen. It was a bit more rural than we were used to in New Jersey, but it was an adjustment. My sister is two years younger than me and she was going into 4th grade at the time. We came from a neighborhood where we were all super close and everyone knew one another. Block parties every summer and kids running back and forth to one another's houses, and we were sad to leave it. Within the first few weeks, we met some of our neighbors. Everyone was what we soon defined as very Connecticut. It was all a bit surface and nobody had that New Jersey warmth that we had been used to. In particular, our neighbors directly across the street seemed a bit odd. The mom would come over to vent to my mom about her sons and husband, and my mom was a sweetheart and was very welcoming and warm. The holidays came around and the neighbor boy across the street was in my sister's fourth grade class. My sister came back slightly alarmed with what had happened in class that day. The students were asked to make a Thanksgiving turkey out of a trace drawing of their hands. On each finger, they were supposed to write things that they were thankful for. The neighbor boy wrote things like, being a loser, hating myself, etc. Very, very dark things for a fourth grader. Fast forward to Christmas and my mom hears that they have nowhere to go for the holidays, so she politely invites the mother and two of her sons to our annual Christmas Eve party. The boys were so strange. They listened to Japanese techno with headphones on and didn't speak to anyone. They headed straight to our basement to play video games. It was weird. 
The younger one though was always much stranger than the older one, and the neighbor mom would always open up to my mom and aunt about how he would hurt himself, and how he needed to be put in special needs programs but that he could never quite be diagnosed. They thought that he was on the spectrum at first, but that quickly proved to not be the case. We always assumed that she'd been confiding in them because my aunt was experienced with special needs kids and that she was looking for advice from her. The Christmas Eve stands out to me because they were at our home in a very intimate setting, but we saw them on a daily basis. My sister and I would come home from school telling my mom about how weird the younger neighbor boy was and that something was just really off about him. I will never forget her telling us just to be nice to him and that we don't know what he's capable of. That struck me as so odd at the time, but we listened. I don't know if his mother told my mom something that scared her and made her say that, or if she just had a gut instinct. Recently after that, and I can't quite remember if this was in middle school or high school, I think I was in ninth grade, and my sister and young neighbor boy were in seventh, so we all rode the bus together. What my mom then said stuck out in my mind, so today I decided to be friendlier than usual. There was snow on the ground and the younger neighbor boy was drawing something in the snow and muttering to himself. I decided to greet him. Hey Adam, what's going on? Nice morning today, huh? He made no eye contact. I'll bomb you, he said, still making no eye contact. We let it slide. We came home and told my mom. She reiterated, just be nice. We have no idea what this kid's capable of. Keep in mind, we were kids. We didn't know what to take seriously and what not to. I wished we had done more. Keep in mind, he wasn't someone who was bullied or made fun of. He was always off in the sense that he could not hold eye contact or hold a conversation or even a hello. Kids didn't make fun of him. He was a loner, but it seemed to be by choice. I never knew why we were cautious or afraid around him other than the fact that he showed zero warmth and zero humanity. We knew he had special needs, so we never really second-guessed anything and just tried to be polite as possible. When the bus would drop us off at all of our respective houses, he would run all the way up his driveway on the hill with his hands by his sides and then would turn around and make this weird hiss noise at everyone, making claws with his hands. It was always so odd, but again, we were kids and there's always a couple of kids in school who are a little strange. We took it as just that. They were invited to several Christmas Eve parties, so memories kind of blend here. One year, the neighbor mom started screaming at my innocent grandmother for being a Yankees fan as she was a Red Sox fan. It was beyond strange, because my grandma is the cutest little lady of all time and was in no way trying to argue over sports. It was though as the woman clearly had a weird switch go off. She was always nice to me, but I'll be honest, we always rolled our eyes every single time my mom invited them over. It was always such forced conversations with her, and as a teenager, I wanted nothing to do with being cornered into another chat. I think she must have just been lonely. The following and final year they were invited to Christmas Eve was when she got into it with my mom about having guns in the house. The boys only attended the first couple of Christmas Eve, so it was just the mom this time around. The topic of guns came up. The neighbor mom started telling my mom about how she has guns in the house and how she takes her younger son to the shooting range all the time. My mom said that she didn't agree with having guns in the house. She wasn't trying to argue, but the neighbor mom got out of hand about it. Very defensive and ultimately getting aggressive about how she grew up in New Hampshire and that's just the way of life out there. The neighbor mom told us about how brilliant that her younger son was and that he hacked into some of the government's highest levels of security and that the CIA showed up on his doorstep. We have absolutely no idea if this story is true or not, but this is what she told us, so it became our ongoing joke when anything strange happened at our house. There were a few odd things that happened throughout the years. Our internet had clearly been messed with, lights would flicker in the house, and we would joke that it was the younger boy each time. It wasn't until December 14th, 2012, that we knew just what he was capable of. I was out of college working outside of Philadelphia, my sister still a student in college, and my youngest brother a student at the high school. It was the worst day of all of our lives. My dad heard the gunshots in the morning that killed the neighbor mom, Nancy Lanza. He assumed it had been a hunter in the area, maybe a little closer than usual. That is until the FBI showed up and had to evacuate the house as snipers had lined our driveway. 
My mom was at the mall and we were all frantically calling one another as the news slowly broke throughout the day. At first they had his identity all wrong and said it was his brother, but we knew it had to have been him. Thank God for my mom making sure we were as nice as possible, although I don't know that it would have stopped him. I wish we had done more at the time. I wish we knew to do more at the time. We didn't. We didn't want to assume the worst out of someone, but I wish we had. Approximately 20 students and 6 teachers were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School that day. The worst act of evil I have ever experienced so directly in my life and I hope I will never experience again. I'm very thankful that we survived growing up across the street from him, but I'm so gutted for those who didn't get so lucky. These were kids, little kids, in a place that should have been the safest haven for them in their youth. I hate it so much. I know I will never see him again, but regardless, Adam Lanza, you sick and twisted individual, I pray and hope to God that we never see you again. I used to work at a 24-hour McDonald's during my first year of college, right in the town where I grew up. I was 18 at the time, and I'm still a petite girl. Our store owners were greedy scumbags, so for our large city, we were the only McD's staying open for Christmas, so I switched around on the schedule that I'd come in after family stuff on Christmas Eve and be home in the morning to open presents and then sleep. Somewhere around midnight, a mid-twenties man came in. He was slightly overweight, tall, his clothes kind of fit in an awkward way that's hard to describe, like he wore the same things every day and put zero thought into his appearance, the way his shirt was tucked in the way his belt bunched his pants, that his pants were a bit too short and showed too much ankle. His beard was patchy and uneven and grew down his neck, and you might wonder why I have such a thorough description of him, because he stayed in the dining room for at least two hours within sight of the counter, and almost every time I checked he was staring at me. He would come back to the counter at least twice or more to order additional small items off the value menu. After the second time I caught him staring again, and he gave me a creepy smile while he still had food in his mouth. I'm bad at hiding my facial expressions, and I'm sure I wrinkled up in a disgusting face and turned away to go to the back. I told the one guy on our skeleton crew that night that some lingering dude was creeping me out and asked him to switch with me on the front. It was a pretty dead night, so it really didn't matter where we were stationed, so he switched with me. After a bit in the back, it was normally the time that night shift would clean the customer areas for a jump on the next day before morning rush started. My coworker said the dude was still out there, so I asked to clean the bathrooms instead while he wiped down the tables and then we'd tackle the floor together so it was quick. I started in the men's bathroom since the only guy in the place was currently at his table. But just to be sure, of course, I knocked on the door first, then called out to anyone inside that it was time for cleaning. It's not a glamorous job to clean a bathroom, but it had been a quiet night, so it wasn't that bad. Then I did the same knock to check to start cleaning the woman's bathroom. It was a bit of a maneuver both times to bring in the mop bucket and the tote with the cleaning supplies, so I was a bit distracted when I came in and went to place the tote on the sink counter which is probably why I didn't notice the shadow in the stall closet to the sink. I was pulling items out of the tote right away when I kind of noticed movement in the mirror behind me and looked up to see Creepy Guy almost fully behind me only seconds before his hand closed on my arm. He was grinning in a way that made me feel sick right away. He pulled my upper arm in a way that made me turn around towards him and he must have seen my face screw up as I took a deep breath because... He started to try and cover my mouth with his other hand, saying something like, Don't. No, it's okay. I think you're pretty. Not sure exactly what he was saying because I was already screaming at the top of my lungs and turning my mouth and body away from him as much as I could. With my free arm, I started whacking him with the first thing my fingers touched, which happened to be a bottle of glass cleaner. It seemed like it only took seconds for my male co-worker to burst in the door. He took one look at the man in the bathroom and started screaming at him too, telling him he can't be in there, calling him a sicko, trash, scumbag, among other more colorful words. 
The creeper dashed for the door, trying to squeeze by my co-worker who stayed with me down the short hallway, continuing to yell at him, and kept it up till creeper was all the way out the door, and a minute later, a car sped out of the parking lot. We called the cops, statements were taken, managers contacted, I went home early and quit soon after as I was always scared he'd show up again, or try to grab me on my way to my car, or even follow me home. So... Christmas McCreep, let's not meet again. So for context, I'm a 22-year-old male, and I live in a large city in the Midwest. Now, I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I also drive for other similar companies, but that's besides the point. I have many, many horror stories from those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out driving for Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mom's with my new baby and wife. Nothing really special going on for the night, just the usual. I get a ride request. It happened to be a pickup from this kinda lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive, find my passenger and he has all of his belongings with him, like several boxes of stuff. Now, my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not really too big. We get all of his stuff loaded up, barely, and we're on our way. Now, during the ride, the guy was crying and saying that his girlfriend was cheating on him, and he had apparently walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because her name was on the lease, so I was taking him to a hotel. Now in my city, we happen to have a street that is pretty well known for having vices. Hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and shady motels. You know, the works. We get to the motel and he asks me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man, I say. I'll confess, I break the rules a little when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being, driving Lyft and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me, as well as having people try to fight me, rob me, and all kinds of other things. But like I said, stories for another time. This motel was on that street that I had mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed right out against the building. And I'm a pretty big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm on edge. He gets his key. The whole motel is ground level. So to help the guy out, I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff. So I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip getting stuff, I would saw a guy come out of a room just south of my car, then followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to, one of the ladies then pounded on the door, then opened it. That's when I then saw the guy raise a fucking shotgun right out of his long coat and then storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, then slamming the door behind them. Following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was honestly just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this man. Go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas and he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice that he took the boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill in my pocket. I was frozen. I knew what may have been going down in that room. I had to leave or at least go to where I could get my gun. I know that the guy and the ladies both saw me and I know that they knew I saw the gun. I just had to get the fuck out of there. You know how it goes. No witnesses. I got in my car and then sped away as quickly as possible. I got a block or so away and then called the cops. I gave them every detail I could. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed out a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops investigated. They never found the gunmen or the women. They never answered the door that I saw them come out of, and the occupants of the room they went into said nothing happened and that I was full of shit. Well, I definitely wasn't. I know what I saw. So, 
So this happened last year, the week before Christmas. I was 13 years old when this took place. Now, this isn't really as scary as some of the other stories submitted, but it's still pretty unsettling. On this day, I decided to hang out at my mom's workplace, as she owns a small business with no other employees. For some backstory, the area where she's located in isn't really the best. It's pretty much known for drug addicts. The tenants in the building two doors down from us actually got evicted for destroying and building and creating a living space for drug addicts and homeless people. They found beds and makeshift showers in there. Anyways, it was around 5 p.m. and clients were coming in and out. Then this guy walked near the large window in the front. Now, he stood there for a while, and I didn't really think too much of it since there's always homeless people roaming around the center. I went to the back to go sit when I then heard the door open. My mom asked if this person needed anything. This raised some red flags since the person never answered the question. I got up to see who it was. The wall was set up so that I could see them, but they couldn't see me. I saw this six foot something white guy just standing there. He was really dirty and his clothes were all torn up. My mom kept asking this guy questions, but he never answered. He just stood there, staring at her. I was literally shaking. I don't know how to explain it, but the way that he was staring, it just seemed threatening. She threatened to call the police. Nothing. I started recording just in case something happened. She ended up calling the police, as well as my dad. The police showed up right in time, as the guy then started grabbing his bag for something. They searched the man and they found two large knives, as well as some really hard drugs in the bag. The guy was obviously arrested, but I'm not really sure what happened to him afterwards. Although nothing insanely really bad happened, I don't really want to think about what would have happened if the police didn't arrive on time. We got lucky. I'm a 30-year-old female, and I'm a current student in nursing. 2020 Thanksgiving went from really exciting to creepy for me. It all started off with me passing an exam at 86% and spending a pre-Thanksgiving with my boyfriend and his family. This particular night right before Thanksgiving, I spent at my brother's house. I left for home around 8 a.m. I woke up exhausted, but my mental state turned manic. I was awake and I was wanting to give my sister a surprise gift for me and her kids. Because she hadn't replied yet, in my manic state, I decided to go to her house. The day was fun. A lot of food, booze, and dancing. I loved it. At around 6 p.m., I had planned my trip out to my boyfriend's temp house. We got into a bit of an argument. As I told him since it was a three-hour drive, I'd start around 1 a.m. He didn't really agree with this, as he thought it would be too late and dark to travel to a rural area which prompted me to remind him, I'm grown, which was a bit of a mistake on my part. He became a bit annoyed and upset. However, we later agreed on my arrival. The festives went on at my sister's. Alcohol fun, Thanksgiving family pictures, and a lot of food. Around 11 p.m., I decided to take a nap. However, my manic brain thought to shower. Due to me needing help with running the shower and attempts to fix my hair, I ended up laying down around midnight. I had set an alarm to wake up at 1am, but of course, I slept through it. I was woken up at 3.30am when my sister then asked me, Why didn't you leave? I woke up and desperately moved as fast as I could out of her house. I left my phone and I had to turn around and go back. Once I retrieved the phone, I was finally on my way for a second time. I ended up going in the wrong way as I mixed up two cities names because they both started with CH. Once the GPS was on and I realized I was going in the wrong direction, I was on my way. Once leaving the city lines of Sacramento, I got into a race with a Silverado that was lifted. In my jealousy that I was in an SUV versus a really beautiful truck, I decided to take on the race. 
That is, until I reached 120 miles per hour for about 10 minutes and decided it wasn't worth the ticket. At the time, it was only me, the Silverado, and a fellow Ford on the road. About five minutes later, the Silverado took an exit. Now it was only me and the fellow Ford in a rural dark area. During the drive, I had noticed the Ford was on the side of me, and at one point, they seemed to be close enough right on my right side to swipe me. Due to my blindness in the dark, I was way more focused on making it safely that seemed to even cut off other cars to be on the side of me. We made it to a small town which meant taking a major street for about three to five miles, just going through stoplights. At one point I thought, damn, I really hate when people are so close to me like that. It was really annoying to me, but after two lights, the fellow Ford turned off and I honestly felt a bit childish for even caring. Two to three lights down as I made it through the green light, I noticed a car turning onto the street. It was the same car. At this point, my body started to shake as the car made sure it was back on the right side of me, keeping up with persistence this time. My head began to hurt, and at first, I don't think I understood that fear was kicking in. Why would this car come back to the main street? There's only three other cars, and he's the one on the side of me. The fight or flight response began to creep up on me, and I didn't want to turn my head as if I noticed. In that moment, I didn't want to call my boyfriend. What if I'm just paranoid? I mean, I've traveled alone for longer distances at night before. Is alcohol still in my system? My boyfriend and mom will lose it if I call them. Why is this happening? In that moment, I saw a light turning yellow as we approached side by side. My brain went into rationalization, and I thought, Do not panic. Stay calm. Ignore the headache. When the light turns green, stay. See if he goes. We approached the light, and then stopped. The light seemed to be much longer than the others. I moved my eyes towards the fellow Ford on the side of me. The windows were lightly tinted, but I could see a hat and a person looking towards me. Then seconds later, look up at the light and then peer back into my passenger window. My head and my heart began to become one, both in pain and fear. Then the light turned green. There were two cars behind us, but I stayed on my brakes. I didn't move, and I didn't see his car enter the intersection either. I turned my head to look, and I could now see more of the silhouette of the man's face under the hat staring at me. I took off slowly to collect my composure and not seem to be scared keeping my pace of slowly going through the intersection. I heard a car behind us beep the horn, and it was like a light switch. I noticed a truck in the distance through the last light that was making it through the abyss of the rural highway that was only a one-lane road. I decided to speed up to make the last light, but so did the fellow Ford, keeping up with my pace. It seemed that he was trying to cut me off, but I went from 45 to 65. The trucks were going slow, and now he was behind me and so close that I could see his lights in full. In a panic, I went off the side of the road as to pull off to pass up the truck, and so did he. When I noticed he passed the truck and was still just as close behind, I noticed the second truck. I sped up to 90 miles per hour and went towards the left, which was into incoming traffic to cut off the truck. My rationalization was to speed. And even if I was pulled over, I'd be safe. I hoped anyways. I cut off the big rig truck and began to speed up. Now able to see far behind me in the distance through my rearview mirrors, I could see the car trying to cut off the truck to the right and left. But cars were oncoming in the opposite lane and due to trees to the right, the Ford seemed to weave in and out of the lane. He was trying to erratically cut off the truck. By now, even the truck lights were far behind me. I was going about 120 miles per hour and continued it with no effort. As I'm experienced with driving fast and my adrenaline to flight made it easy. After about five to 10 minutes, I slowed down to 80 miles per hour and then to 65 miles per hour after about 30 minutes. An hour later, I stopped at a store that appeared to have many customers, which prompted me to stop. As I was paranoid and couldn't be 100% sure the fellow Ford wasn't near me, I went into the store to grab food and coffee, but my appetite was gone, so I just decided on coffee and a smoke. Walking into the store, 
I saw both customers and employees give me a wide-eyed look, followed with a look of sorrow, which made me feel embarrassed. I was shaking really badly, and my makeup had run all over my face from the crying, and I'm sure I looked like I was coming off of drugs from the fact that my sympathetic nerve was transferring its hard work over to the parasympathetic nerve. In other words, my body was coming off the adrenaline. I went to pay for my coffee and request smokes, but the shaking made it really hard for me to enter my pen for my debit card. I actually had to try like three times. Back to the car I went in fear. My head pounded into my ears. I hoped some tobacco would calm me. The smoke seemed to help calm me down slightly, but the shaking and headache persisted in a bearable manner. The sun was now coming up, and I was almost there. I was still shaking and still upset, and crying on and off. Of course, when I finally made it to my boyfriend's, he could sense it and was able to get the truth out of me. I could see he was upset, but he had tried to console me with a hug and kiss, and encouraging our rest so I could calm down. It was really hard to study that day. The headache really persisted, and I stayed in bed. My boyfriend made the decision for me to not take any more late night drives, and even made sure that I stayed in his dwellings until he was off and with me. It's now days later, and it's dark out, and I'm scared to go out. I really wish I would have listened. 30 years old or not, no person, male or female, should ever think it's okay to drive into rural areas at night. There really are some crazies out there. So this happened all the way back in the late 1990s when I was a college sophomore. Me and the girl I was dating at the time had been going steady for about 8 months and since she was my first real girlfriend, my mom was pretty keen to meet her. And what better time than the holidays to introduce her to the folks. During the week before Christmas, my mom's family traditionally held quite a large gathering up at my uncle's place over in Sandy in my home state of Oregon. Pretty much all my extended family head out there year after year from all over the Portland area and since they've gotten word that I was bringing my girlfriend, the hype to meet her was huge. I won't lie, I was kind of nervous that they'd embarrass me in front of her but that anxiety was totally misplaced. She got along really well with all of them and despite some playful humiliation when the cousin of mine told her the story of how I literally peed my pants at the haunted mansion ride when I was a kid, they were a credit to me. And when it came to driving her back home, she seemed to be more into me than ever. We'd agreed to drive back down to Eugene at like 7pm so I wouldn't be too tired driving back. But since we had such a good time, we stayed way later than we had planned to and didn't get on the road until about 10.30pm that evening. In the hopes of making the journey a little faster, I ended up taking the OR211 instead of just sticking to the I-5S for the whole drive. Annoyingly, this didn't quite actually make the journey any faster, but point being, the OR211 was pretty much surrounded by farms or these huge swaths of dense pine forest. So as you can imagine, big stretches of it aren't lit very well at all, and for some parts of the drive, we were moving through complete darkness, saved only by our car's headlights. But honestly, I wasn't all worried about it, I was pretty good at reading a map, and once I was back on the I-5, a road I knew pretty well, I figured everything would be all good. So we're just cruising along, in high spirits, talking about how goofy some of my family were, but generally my girlfriend was singing their praises and telling how she couldn't wait to meet them again. It's right around then that we hit a section of the highway that descends down this big old hill, heading up to the bridge crossing over Deep Creek. There, the highway is sandwiched by some of the densest forests you've ever likely seen, and there is absolutely nothing lighting up the highway. It's the only thing we can see from the front seats of the car is like maybe 20 or 30 feet that our headlights are illuminating and pretty much nothing else. But like I said, we're in high spirits, completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Right as the highway was starting to level off, something darts across the front of us so fast and so suddenly that I barely miss smashing into it. I brake so hard that I almost gave the pair of us whiplash, then when we're stopped, both me and my girlfriend are in a complete frenzy of, oh god, did you see that? What was that? There are plenty of deer in that area of Oregon, plenty of coyotes too. 
but the thing that ran out in front of us was way too big to be a coyote, and something about the way it moved gave me this gut feeling that it wasn't a deer either. The shape was just way too slender, almost like whatever was out there had moved on two legs, not four. Now next thing, I know how completely dumb this sounds in retrospect, but my curiosity just got the better of me and I decided I wanted to investigate. So again, this was also incredibly dumb, I turned the car like 90 degrees in the highway so I could point our headlights into the woods. Yes, this could have caused a horrible accident if another car had come along at the same time I was doing this, but I don't think I was thinking straight at the time. You see, as a kid growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I've heard a lot of stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and I'd be lying if I said that they didn't capture my imagination. No, I'm not saying that I thought I'd caught a glimpse of Gigantopithecus or anything. I know the stories are mostly exactly that, just stories, but... A part of me just wanted to be sure. So like I said, I turned the car 90 degrees, turned on the high beams and stepped out of the driver's side and onto the highway. I stare off into the trees for a minute or two, but I don't see a thing. Nothing is moving out there, and the whole scene was as quiet as the grave. But as I'm looking, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach and start to feel as if though I'd made a huge error of judgment. It was one of the most intensely terrifying feelings I'd ever felt in my entire life, a feeling like I was being watched by something predatory. I know it's a huge cliche and the whole I felt like I was being watched thing is such a tired old trope, but I don't really know any other way to phrase it. My heart was pounding, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing on end, and my gut just turned to ice. So without turning my back to the woods where I expected the danger to come from, I started edging back towards the car. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, I practically jump out of my skin when I hear the car's horn letting off one long, excruciatingly loud, extended blast. I mean, it scared me so bad that I almost straight up peed my pants haunted mansion style. My first thought was that my girlfriend had ended up leaning on the horn as she climbed over into the driver's seat for some reason because she'd done that once or twice before. But as I turn back around, I can see she's still on the passenger side, but that she's actually leaning over to push the horn in what was evidently a frenzied attempt to get my attention. I run back to the car and ask her if she's okay, but she doesn't say a single word to me. She just points off to a spot about 50 feet away from where we parked. I spin my head around to see what she's pointing at, and that's when I see it. What was, without a shadow of a doubt, the thing that had run in front of our car just a few minutes prior. Lit up by the residual light of our high beams, what I saw was really obviously a man, but he was covered in animal furs, what looked like a mishmash of deer skins, bear skins, and elk skins, and on his head, secured in a way I'm not even sure of, were these antlers. At the time, because of how closely it was to the holidays, I remember the words reindeer man just flashed into my mind, maybe in the naive hope that the dude was dressed that way out of some misdirected festive spirit, but he certainly didn't seem in any kind of festive spirit, not in the least bit. Like I couldn't see his eyes because of the weird kind of head covering he had on, but I could see his mouth, and at first he kind of looked like he was giving us a smile, only as I looked I could see it wasn't a smile at all. This guy was just baring his teeth to us, like the way chimps do as some kind of warning. After that, he turned and walked off into the forest, never to be seen again. Obviously right after that, me and my girlfriend just got out of there and got back onto the roads towards the I-5. It took us both a while to calm our nerves, but my girlfriend was particularly shaken up, and that's because she'd seen something that I hadn't. And as we drove on, she explained exactly what that was. While I'd been staring off into the woods looking for Sasquatch or whatever, she'd noticed him out of her peripheral vision, but was basically frozen in fear for a moment or two as she watched him walking slowly towards me. Or rather, walking isn't the right word. From how she described it, this guy was stalking, the way a hunter might stalk a deer. The way she puts it, she had to summon up pretty much all of her courage to be able to lean over and honk the horn the way she did. 
Then when Reindeer Man had heard the honking, he backed off a little before I saw him and like I said, he kind of just froze in place before disappearing. I did a fair amount of online research when I got home to try and find out if anyone else had any run-ins with this guy, but there was absolutely nothing online about him. There are plenty of crazy survivalist types up here in the Pacific Northwest and I'm guessing he was one of those, but they tend to be pretty open about their existence, sometimes even advertise themselves as militiamen or whatever, whereas the reindeer man seemed like he was living completely off the grid. I don't live in Oregon anymore. Me and my girlfriend during the encounter broke up at the end of college, but when we were still together and I happened to be driving down towards Eugene, I always avoided the stretch of highway that I saw the reindeer man on. I've told this story a lot over the years and some people honestly just think I'm making it up as like a campfire tale or something, but it's not a tale, it's not made up, and it's definitely not just intended to be some dumb spoopy story. It's most definitely a warning to anyone traveling on that road at night because if my girlfriend wasn't with me when he ran out in front of the car, if she wasn't there to spot him before he crept up on me, only to scare him off with a blast of the horn, I honestly might not be here to warn you guys. So please, this holiday season, drive careful, drive slow, and do not stop for any reason on dark, deserted stretches of forest highway. During college Christmas break of 2016, I had traveled all the way back to Pennsylvania from California to spend the holidays with my parents. It was kind of weird going from being a mostly independent college kid in a place that hardly ever gets cold to going back to living in my childhood bedroom in a state that becomes a legit winter wonderland around December and January. But I love my mom and dad and I don't care how much the flight costs, there was no way I was going to spend the holidays alone in Cali. So anyway, my old room is on the second floor of the house, directly above the sliding door that heads out onto the decking in our backyard. It's a really heavy door, so anytime someone opens or closes it, it rumbles right up into my bedroom. This was in a house that was built back in the 50s too, so as you can imagine, the whole place has a lot of creaks and groans to it, but is otherwise pretty sturdy. I should also add at this point that part of the town that my parents live at is pretty safe, with a relatively low crime rate, especially to that of nearby Philly. The most intrusive calls they ever got tended to be from magazine salespeople and the odd Jehovah's Witnesses, and after my dad insisted on debating scripture with them, they stopped calling altogether. Point being, they never had anything remotely close to any kind of break-in or home invasion for the entire time they were living in that property. Next thing is a brief confession from myself here. I picked up a pretty horrible smoking habit during my freshman year of college, so whenever my parents went to bed, I tended to stay up late playing Civ on my laptop, sitting next to my open bedroom window while I smoked and drank tumblers of scotch that I'd pilfered from my dad's liquor cabinet. After midnight, I'd have my window open from anything of 30 minutes to 2 hours. I mean, it would purely depend on how cold it was outside or how tired I was, but I generally let the room air out before spraying some air freshener so that the tobacco smell didn't cling to anything too bad. I also had to use headphones to watch TV and listen to music so it wouldn't wake my mom and dad up. But I tend to only ever use one earphone so I could keep an ear out for anyone coming down the hallway since they really wouldn't be happy if they found I was smoking in the house. So one night, I was in my usual routine of conquering the known world in an online multiplayer game of Civ when our house alarm suddenly starts blaring. I don't think I'd heard that thing since I was about 6 or 7 years old, and I had completely forgotten about how loud it was, so hearing it had me practically filling my underwear from being frightened out of my skin. Point being, everyone in the house is now wide awake and ready to head off whatever is about to go down. Now my priorities might sound way, way off here, but initially my big worry wasn't so much that something bad might be happening, like a home invasion or something like that. It was more like me being terrified that my parents were about to realize I'd been smoking and stealing booze from them. I was 20 years old at the time, technically underage, and my parents were old-fashioned types, real sticklers for the rules. If they found out what I'd been doing, there'd be drama and lots of it. 
but somehow when my dad stuck his head around my door all bleary-eyed to make sure he knew where I was, he didn't seem to smell anything. I don't know whether this was because he was too tired and freaked out about the alarms to notice or that he noticed and actually just didn't care, but either way, he told me to go into their bedroom and stay with my mom until he could give us the all clear. So my dad goes downstairs, I'm assuming with pistol in hand, and gets to work clearing the house, as well as checking the front and backyards to make sure that there's no one hiding in the darker areas out there. He comes back up, tells me and my mom he couldn't find anything and it was probably just a false alarm, and then we all head back to bed. Or rather, they went back to bed. I just went back to being a diplomatic genius on Civ 6. About an hour goes by and I start getting pretty tired so I get up to close my bedroom window before heading to bed when the alarm goes off again. Once again, my dad goes downstairs, does a sweep of the grounds floor and the yards, then comes back to tell me not to worry and that he figured it was just the wind or something. I mean, it had been a pretty windy night, which honestly suited me because it meant the breeze aired my room out. Like I said, it was an old house, so it wasn't out of the question that the wind could have rattled the doors or windows and set the alarm off. The point being that both me and my dad were chill about the alarm going off. Neither of us thought there was anything to worry about. So the next morning at breakfast, my dad is going through the alarm systems app on his iPhone, checking out some of the data readouts from the night before. All of a sudden, he's all like, Okay, that's weird. Apparently the backsliding doors were open 14 times last night. Number one, I was impressed the alarm system was so sophisticated that it could feed him that kind of info. I guess he shelled out big boy cash for that thing. But number two, how could it have been open that many times? Then I'm not kidding, like five to ten minutes later there's a knock at our front door and it's the neighbor guy from the house down the street. He asks us if we had any intruders over the previous night and we tell him no or that at least we didn't think so. It's then that he tells us that he actually caught someone on a security camera trying to break into his house, that the dude had tried to jimmy a lock or something before looking right up into the camera before getting spooked and bailing. We assume that this is about the time that he moved on to our house, then capped at it when he realized it was the weaker target. That seriously freaked me out. The whole time I'd been sitting there innocently playing games sipping stolen scotch, there had been a guy trying to get into our house, maybe only six or seven feet below me. If I'd have bothered to look out the window at any point and directly downward, I'd have locked eyes with the guy. He must have smelled my cigarette smoke, known someone was home, and it just didn't bother him in the least bit. He was more than prepared to face off with someone, although apparently not when he'd seen my dad with his pistol, sweeping the house and yards in the dark. I've always liked a scary story or a good horror film. Ghosts, vampires, werewolves, they're my jam. I've never found like serial killers or whatever to be that scary though. Like I didn't think that the human element to the horror was particularly potent. After that night though, that all changed. It struck me how evil and predatory human beings can really be. How that guy had been creeping around in our backyard for basically hours right under my nose and I had absolutely no clue he was there. It's how he managed to just disappear when the alarm went off too, and how he had the balls to come back once we'd all gone back to bed. I mean, he was like a ghost or something, just vanishing into the darkness. I mean, think about it. My dad had checked out the backyard, tried to make sure that there was no one hanging around, hiding out in the dark spots underneath the trees, and there had been. There had been someone there, just watching my dad walking around in his slippers or whatever he had on, just waiting for him to call off the search before creeping back up towards the house. Just thinking about it now gives me shivers, and now that I'm back in Cali writing this, I always make sure that all the windows and doors in my dorm are locked, and that I double or triple check whenever I think something bad is about to go down or whatever because sometimes it seems you'll never know if someone is just lurking in the shadows until it's way, way too late.